This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Railroaded, The Transcontinentals and the Making of Modern America by Richard White Narrated by Paul Woodson Introduction The idea that railroads remade North America and in doing so created the modern corporate world is hardly new. Modern scholars have proclaimed it repeatedly, and in this they only follow the nineteenth-century intellectuals and promoters whom they cite. All of the possibilities that arose with railroads seemed magnified in the transcontinentals, which came to epitomize progress, nationalism, and civilization itself, not just in the United States, but in Canada and Mexico as well. I have my doubts about civilization, but I will accept the rest. All I would change is that they created modernity as much by their failure as by their success. The very term transcontinental communicated the hubris and power of a new technology that wrapped the continent in iron and steel bands. But the term also communicated the illusory and deceptive qualities of these corporations, which were never quite what they seemed. For the transcontinentals did not really span the continent. In the United States they had their initial eastern termini in cities and towns along the Missouri River, for connections to Chicago they depended on what were often far more powerful and better run roads, the Burlington system, the Chicago and Northwestern, the Rock Island, and others, that sometimes dallied with the idea of becoming transcontinentals themselves, but settled for competing with the lines that reached the Pacific in their richest territories. Only later would the American transcontinentals directly connect to major population centers in the Midwest, and they never stretched to the Atlantic coast. The Canadian Pacific eventually patched together a line to St. John, New Brunswick, but originally it terminated at Montreal with a connecting line to Quebec. It, together with the roughly 130-mile railroad across the isthmus of Tehuantepec in Oaxaca that joined the Pacific to the Gulf of Mexico, were the only true 19th-century transcontinentals north of Panama, although numerous railroads terminating on the Pacific coast took the name. When I write about transcontinentals and other western railroads, I'm not necessarily talking about railroads in general. I don't have the evidence to do so. But I am still talking about some of the largest corporations in North America. In the late 19th century, large corporations mainly meant railroad corporations and a few other powerful organizations— Standard Oil, Western Union, and Carnegie Steel, that were intimately associated with them. Although Americans still celebrate the West as a bastion of individualism, corporations, along with the federal government, were central to its creation. Nineteenth-century North Americans became quite aware of what transcontinental railroads failed to do, but initially they embraced them, as they embraced all railroads, as the epitome of modernity. They were in love with railroads, because railroads defined the age. The claims made for railroads by men who wrote about them were always extravagant. The kind of hyperbole recently lavished on the Internet was once the mark of railroad talk. Here, wrote Charles Francis Adams, the railroad reformer who eventually became president of the Union Pacific, is an enormous and incalculable force practically let loose suddenly upon mankind, exercising all sorts of influences, social, moral, and political, precipitating upon us novel problems which demand immediate solution, banishing the old before the new is half matured to replace it, bringing the nations into close contact before yet the antipathies of race have begun to be eradicated, giving us a history full of changing fortunes and rich in dramatic episodes. Joseph Nimmo, who wrote prolifically about railways, thought, The railroad, with its vast possibilities for the advancement of the commercial, industrial, and social interests of the world, ran directly counter to the pre-existing order of things. Theodophilus French, a federal auditor of railroad accounts, whose honesty was more suspect than his expertise, thought them the great civilizer of modern times. 
I am far more interested in the operation of the transcontinentals and other western railroads in the United States, Canada, and northern Mexico than in the initial construction of these roads, on which there is already a vast literature. What concerns me above all are the entrepreneurs who created them, the men who worked for them, and the large numbers of citizens who came to oppose them as dangerous, corrupt, and threatening. I group the trunk lines of western Canada and northern Mexico with the American transcontinentals because the American roads were so tightly linked to the Canadian Pacific and the railroads of northern Mexico that they cannot be unhooked. Taken together, the American, Canadian, and Mexican railroads were sources of great national pride and great national discontent. But in many ways their most striking quality was that they formed an international network linking the three countries. At one point I had illusions that this would be a comparative book, but I found that I was dealing with one large interconnected railroad system financed from the same sources and controlled by a relatively small set of interests. The transcontinentals, more obviously than other railroads, were entwined with the state. Governments subsidized them, secured their rights of way, regulated them, and protected them. The first transcontinentals began as hybrid public-private enterprises and ended up as private corporations, but their public roots remained. By the end of the century, with the transcontinentals under political attack virtually everywhere, the government suppressed their workers and protected the rights and enforced the obligations of their owners and managers in the name of public good and public order. The railroads, in turn, were agents of the expansion of these states. What these railroads allowed the governments of the United States, Canada, and Mexico to accomplish in the late 19th century was remarkable. In the United States they took credit for conquering the Indians. As Charles Francis Adams put it, the Pacific Railroads have settled the Indian question. The railroads also took credit for settling the West. They took credit, indeed, for all of the development between the center of the continent and the Pacific. Non-Indian settlement had taken two and a half centuries to reach just beyond the Mississippi River in the United States, and had crept only along the eastern Great Lakes in Canada. Neither Spain nor Mexico, despite centuries of struggle, had managed to control the northern reaches of Mexico. Together these railroads formed a lever that in less than a generation turned western North America on its axis, so that what had largely moved north-south now moved east-west. Railroads poured non-indigenous settlers into a vast region that nation-states had earlier merely claimed. They did not do this in response to a popular demand for development of these lands. Instead they created the demand through vast promotions unlike anything seen until that time. Having promoted new settlement, they helped integrate these settlers into an expanding world economy, so that wheat, silver, gold, timber, coal, corn, and livestock poured out of it. It may seem both churlish and mad to question the railroad's accomplishments. No one, after all, claimed that they came without a cost, particularly to Indian peoples, or that mistakes were not made and a certain amount of corruption generated but these admissions tend to be of the say-what-you-will variety. Say what you will, the result was worth the price, and the lives of tens of millions of people were the better for it. But questioning these accomplishments is what this book does. The issue is not whether transcontinentals eventually proved to be a good idea. It is whether they were a good idea in the mid and late nineteenth century. The idea of a transcontinental railroad was not in and of itself bad, but why were so many of these railroads built at a time when there was so little need of them? The nineteenth-century critics of the railroads were often right. These western railroads very often should not have built when and how they were. Their costs over the long term and the short term exceeded their benefits. In all three countries the railroad corporations either failed ending up in receivership, or were rescued by nation-states which forgave loans, renegotiated terms of payment, or nationalized the roads. Their failures as businesses were only the beginning. The railroads were also political failures. Having helped both to corrupt and to transform the political system by creating the modern corporate lobby, which they used to compete against each other, 
They then found it an expensive and sometimes nearly impossible burden to bear. Their political activities in the western United States and Canada were by the end of the century increasingly counterproductive. Politically, as well as financially, they often became wards of the courts. Finally, they were, in part, social failures. They lured settlers into places where they produced crops, cattle, and minerals beyond what markets could profitably absorb, and where their production yielded great environmental and social harm. It was no wonder that railroad corporations came to be hated, and that opposition to them as monopolies, one of the key words necessary in order to understand late nineteenth-century American and Canadian politics, fueled the reform movements of three countries. These railroad failures are essential to understanding the complicated development of modernity and the historical role of corporations in it. This book owes much to the great economist Joseph Schumpeter, although many listeners will find such a claim astonishing. It is about the utter uprooting of older ways of life and older ways of communication and travel by a new technology in the hands of new men with a new form of corporate organization. It is at first glance, at least, about Schumpeter's creative destruction, the necessity of capitalism always to uproot the old in order to institute the new. It is a book whose central figures are entrepreneurs, and it was Schumpeter who made the entrepreneur the central and heroic figure of American capitalism. Railroads were, in the words of Schumpeter's biographer, Thomas McCraw, Schumpeter's favorite example of innovation by new men and new firms. Like Schumpeter, Railroaded emphasizes finance capitalism, the use of credit and the financial markets, as the central engine of corporate growth and expansion in late 19th century North America. It was not capital that built the railroads, but credit, and the capital that was ultimately at risk in the railroads did not belong to the men who controlled them. Thomas Scott, Jay Gould, Collis P. Huntington, Henry Villard, and others were entrepreneurs. The capitalists were the far more anonymous and numerous figures who bought the bonds that allowed the railroads to proceed. The markets these entrepreneurs used and exploited were historical. They comprised particular practices, most with active state involvement, subsidies, regulations, military protection, and so on. In this book there is no such thing as a market set apart from particular state policies, institutions, and social and cultural practices. The question is not whether governments shape markets. It is how they shape markets. The transcontinentals were, as the economic historian Robert Fogel has written, hothouse capitalism. But the distinctions between hothouse capitalism, garden variety capitalism, and, to extend the metaphor, Natural capitalism were ones of degree. A wild capitalism is as much an oxymoron as wild agriculture. Markets are cultivated. They can be cultivated in many different ways with many different possible results. Although the transcontinental railroads emerged in markets shaped by large public subsidies and particular legal privileges, neither subsidies nor privileges were new in and of themselves. American states had subsidized and granted special privileges to canals, banks, and railroads in the 1820s and 1830s. These proliferating and often financially disastrous subsidies had brought about a constitutional reaction in the 1840s that dramatically curtailed the ability of states to subsidize development and lend their credit. It left the ground open for the federal government. Railroad entrepreneurs were innovators. They sought advantage by adopting new techniques. But whereas the celebrations of entrepreneurs usually make their success synonymous with the firm, the men I examine usually succeeded at the expense of the firm. The paradox at the heart of this book is that such individual success as there is usually comes at the price of corporate failure. Personal wealth often brings with it social failure. The innovations entrepreneurs brought to the railroads, financial mechanisms, pricing innovations, and political techniques, were as harmful to the public, to the republic, and even to the corporation, as they were profitable to many of the innovators. Many of my entrepreneurs obtained great fortunes, 
but they created inefficient, costly, dysfunctional corporations. These corporations did spur innovations in production, but that was the problem. They built railroads that would have been better left unbuilt, and flooded markets with wheat, silver, cattle, and coal, for which there was little or no need. They set in motion a train of catastrophes for which society paid the price. They often squandered large amounts of capital and labor for no good end. Many of the investments would have been better made in other sectors of the economy. There is a great truth in the idea of creative destruction, but when applied indiscriminately it begins to look much like a kind of trust in the ultimate benevolence of markets and entrepreneurs that is little different from the older trust in God's plan that Voltaire skewered in Candide. No matter what happens, tout est mieux, all is for the best. The late nineteenth-century West was more Voltaire's country than Schumpeter's. All was not for the best. The basic problem of the transcontinentals is that they were built ahead of demand. That a transcontinental railroad might be a good idea in 1900 does not explain building it in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, particularly when the results contributed to two depressions in the 1870s and 1890s, and a sharp, if short, economic downturn in the 1880s. The North American West needed railroads in the late nineteenth century. What it needed was what turned out to be the functional, if still often mismanaged, part of the system. Feeder roads into Chicago, St. Louis, and San Francisco. It did not need transcontinentals, at least not the multiple roads that ran from the one hundredth meridian to the Pacific. These were the roads that never paid for themselves in the late nineteenth century and left disaster in their wake. They came too early, in too great an abundance, and at too great a cost. The interesting issue is how this happened. To examine these railroad corporations is to see half a continent, the western United States, western Canada, and northern Mexico, in a new light. This is the story of the opening up of a continent that could easily have been opened up more slowly, more gingerly, and more humbly. This is a book about corporate failure and corporate mistakes that were by almost every measure, economic, social, political, and environmental, transformative mistakes. The railroads were like bad art. They were not accidents. People planned these things. They were purposeful. And insofar as their repeated failures and collapses were part of larger failures and collapses, the railroads also seeded the financial clouds that produced the storms that overwhelmed them. This history of the transcontinentals begins with the genesis of these railroads in the Civil War and ends with the last and largest of their nineteenth-century failures in the Depression of the 1890s. It runs against the grain of what is still a powerful, if long criticized, triumphal narrative of the opening of the West, particularly the Western United States. In this traditional view, the West is about promise, progress, and success. It is the homeland of the American future. It is where people go to succeed, not to fail. It is the realm of individualism, not of the state and corporations. This history also cuts against another powerful narrative, again much criticized, about the evolution of corporations and economic development in the United States. The simplest explanation of the emergence of railroad corporations is that they are an expression of a universal economic rationality, and that basic market factors, the costs of producing transportation and the revenues from selling it, determined the form of corporate organization. But if this is the case, then similar technologies and similar economies should produce similar corporations. Great Britain, France, and Prussia, however, did not replicate the American form of railroad organization, although each was a capitalist nation and each employed similar technologies. The best way to understand the transcontinentals' simultaneous failure as businesses and success as sources of individual fortunes for insiders is to regard them not as new businesses devoted to the efficient sale of transportation but rather as corporate containers for financial manipulation and political networking. They employed rational managers, but they were led by financiers. The financiers made money through subsidies, the sale of securities, 
insider companies for the construction of the railroads themselves, and land speculation. Each funneled corporate resources into private pockets. To do this, they needed considerable political aid and protection. In the paradox of transcontinental railroads as transformative failures lies their historical importance and interest. The transcontinentals were monuments to arrogance, ignorance, and greed, but this was not all they were. They shaped modern North America, and saying this involves five claims. My first claim goes to their relationship with central governments, the state. In the United States, the transcontinentals were children of the Civil War and the powerful federal government that Richard Benzel, the American political scientist, has called the Yankee Leviathan. In Mexico, they were the offspring of Porfirio Diaz, the Mexican dictator and centralizer. In Canada, the Canadian Pacific was a product of confederation. In the United States, the state did briefly weaken after Reconstruction, but it retained far more strength in the West than elsewhere. When we look closely at the U.S., Canadian, and Mexican government relationships with the Western railroads, we find an interlocking network of what I, using the language of nineteenth-century corporate officials and politicians, call friends. The railroads smudged the line between corporate competition and federal regulation. Corporations used the federal government to punish rival corporations while gaining advantages for themselves. They made politics a realm of private competition. My second claim goes to how railroads reshaped the sense of time, and more significantly, space. Railroads, so the cliché goes, annihilated space and time, and they obviously did cut the time and cost of travel. They made the far near but they did so unevenly and chaotically. Nineteenth-century shippers measured distance less by time of travel than by cost, but railroad costs, as we will learn, were an ever-changing realm of mystery. When shippers tried to calculate and compare costs, the map of the West became a crazy quilt whose pieces seemed utterly incommensurate and unstable. Calculating distance by cost meant that places slid across the map in a wild and arbitrary manner. In Washington State, Spokane was geographically closer to Chicago and Seattle geographically more distant, when measured by miles. But when measured by cost of shipping goods by rail, Spokane sometimes slid out into the Pacific, while Seattle moved seemingly effortlessly east across the Cascades. The railroads made their customers acutely aware of space, but they also rendered that space radically unstable and seemingly subject to the whims of distant corporations. Virtually all of the bitter political and economic conflicts that followed the construction of railroads in the vast region stretching from the Canadian Pacific south nearly to Mexico City, and from the Pacific to the eastern termini of the American transcontinentals, were in some sense quarrels over the organization and production of space. People quarreled over where tracks would run, where people would get access to the trains, and whether there would be competing tracks. People argued bitterly and endlessly over the rates charged to move people and goods along those tracks. They argued about who should own those tracks and trains, and who should control the terms of transportation. The third claim of this book goes to the nature of these corporations. They were not the harbingers of order, rationality, and effective large-scale organization. In both Robert Weber's The Search for Order and Alfred Chandler's The Visible Hand, perhaps the two most brilliant and persistently influential books in shaping our ideas of the late nineteenth century, Corporations became the architects of what the political scientist James Scott would later call high modernism. Scott identified high modernism as primarily a state project and made its hallmarks radical simplification and legibility. By legibility he meant the ability of distant bureaucrats and managers to view, measure, and ostensibly control distant places. The census, the cadastral survey, the standardization of weights and measures, freehold property, and much more were aspects of high modernism. 
Viba and Chandler similarly identified the corporation with managerial capitalism and managerial capitalism with rationalization, order, simplification, and legibility. The markers of corporate simplification and legibility were as diverse as the timetable, the tables of tariffs for freight, the organization chart, time zones, and new methods of cost accounting. In Viba's formulation, the corporations became a kind of vanguard of American progressivism, bureaucratizing, rationalizing, and seeking the services of experts ahead of the state itself. And in both Viba's and Chandler's view, the corporation emerged as the realm of salaried managers, experts who displaced financiers, entrepreneurs, families, and even stockholders in the control of business enterprises. They were, for better or worse, a force for order. The railroad corporations in this book are not those of Viba and Chandler. On the level of aspiration, what the managers of corporations, as distinct from their owners and financiers, aspired to create, I have little quarrel with Viba and Chandler. The achievement is something else again. Managers blamed their failures on accidents and contingent events, but they also used them to cover their mistakes and claim quite fortuitous results as the fruits of their planning. In his work on the railroads, Chandler relied on the records of boards of directors and the kinds of materials found in annual stockholders' reports. But mine is not a view from the boardroom, or at least not from the boardroom alone. I don't trust annual reports. I try to descend into the bowels of the organization, move to the president's offices, or better yet, to middle management and the workers on and around the trains, and the actual practices of corporations become far more ambiguous and complicated. The corporation was often at war with itself. Both Weber and Chandler were children of Max Weber. Modernity was synonymous with order imposed by impersonal large-scale organizations. The local yielded to the national, the pre-modern to the modern, Individualism gave way to bureaucracy, and temporary disorder gave way to a more lasting order. I do not discern a similar pattern. The organizations I describe here not only failed to institute the order they desired, they also just plain failed, and repeatedly needed rescuing by the state and the courts. Railroad bureaucracy was rife with individualism. We shall see that those who took to their sickbeds or European tours— those who obsessed about manhood, those who were overwhelmed by a sense of failure, were not outsiders, victims caught, so to speak, on the tracks and in the path of an onrushing modernity symbolized by the railroads. They were driving the trains. The local was no less modern than the national. Throughout the book I try to draw a large-scale history down to ground level through stories of individuals whose lives were transformed by the railroads. Through their eyes we see a world that was closer to Dilbert than to Chandler. The dysfunctions of railroad corporations and their expression in individuals were not a mark of the persistence of old practices within new forms, but rather a mark of their modernity. My fourth claim goes to rehabilitating movements, particularly anti-monopolism, that opposed corporations and are now consigned to the scrap heap of history. When late nineteenth-century North Americans tried to identify the centers of power that were transforming their worlds, they identified not the state but corporations, or monopolies, as they termed them. For all its failings, anti-monopoly opposition to the corporation was significant. Viba interpreted resistance to both corporations and corruption, the basis of anti-monopolism, as the rearguard and reactionary resistance of local societies at war with modernity. But the merchants, farmers, and workers battling corporations were as modern as the corporations themselves. As state-subsidized railroads emerged as fully private property, they revealed all too clearly in the West the inequality of the new social relations of property and opposition to this was at the core of anti-monopolism. My final contention is somewhat defensive, and an attempt to preempt what I anticipate will be the most common misinterpretation of this book. This is not a resurrection of the old robber-baron literature that Viba and Chandler helped to kill. 
All of these Western lines do lead back to a relatively small group of promoters and financiers. These men, J. Cook, J. Gould, Thomas Scott, Collis P. Huntington, Leland Stanford, James J. Hill, John Murray Forbes, Henry Villard, and others, are hardly historical strangers, and they have usually been portrayed as bigger than life. Such tycoons were, in David Bain's recent words, the heedless royalty of the developing republic, crushing enemies, exploiting the powerless, building empires. I wish, if only for simplicity, that I could say, for better or worse, that these tycoons dreamed modernity, built empires, and gave us the world we know. They were, however, not that smart. Many were clever enough at soliciting money and not repaying debts. The shrewdest of them were masters at controlling and manipulating information. We have their equivalents today. They were more likely to feel abused and threatened than imperious. The power they achieved traveled porous channels. It leaked away and had unexpected outcomes. These were men whose failures often mattered as much as their successes. Their inability to turn the transcontinentals into profitable businesses led them into halls of power they otherwise would never have frequented. With perhaps the exception of Gould, there is a sorcerer's apprentice quality to them. They laid hands on a technology they did not fully understand, initiated sweeping changes, and saw these changes often take on purposes they did not intend. The sorcerer's apprentice quality is why I find them so interesting, and so important. They at least gesture toward one of the mysteries of modernity. How, when powerful people can on close examination seem so ignorant and inept, how, when so much work is done stupidly, shoddily, haphazardly, and selfishly, how then does the modern world function at all? It is no wonder that religious people see the hand of God and economists invent the invisible hand. The transcontinental railroads are sometimes fetishized as the ultimate manifestation of modern rationality. But when seen from within, these astonishingly mismanaged railroads are the anteroom to mystery. Histories take a long time to be written. This one took about a dozen years. I spent those years searching in two places, the University of Washington in Seattle and Stanford University in Palo Alto. The Seattle area is the home of Microsoft. Stanford sits in the Silicon Valley. These centers of the new technology proved to be fortuitous places to be thinking about corporations dependent on what was once a new technology and is now the very symbol of old technology, steam. Writing where and when I did influenced this book a great deal. It is a historian's duty to be true to the past and try to recreate a world that those who lived in it would recognize. It is a mistake to make the past a place where people just like us think about things as we think about them now, and do things just as we do them now. Historians, however, are also historically situated. They write from their own time and place, and this influences what they write. They are prone to notice parallels and similarities. History is always a negotiation between past and present, and being in Seattle and Palo Alto in the late 1990s and early 21st century made me notice how much railroad talk in the late 19th century was similar to Internet talk a century later, how both shared the certainty that they had obliterated time and space, and with it all the old rules. There was, and is, a kind of wisdom and a kind of innocence in this talk, and sorting out the wisdom from the innocence is part of the task of this book. At Stanford, itself a monument to the railroad fortune, I noticed something else. I came to the Silicon Valley in the midst of the dot-com boom at a time when very many people were becoming very rich by creating companies or owning the securities of companies that lost vast amounts of money. Having naively believed that owners of corporations made money from the profits earned by their corporations, I thought that this situation was peculiar. Eventually I came to think of these new millionaires as descendants of men like Leland Stanford and his associates. They had garnered large fortunes from heavily indebted corporations in ways that would not bear much looking into. Like the dot-coms, most of my railroad corporations went bankrupt or into receivership. 
The corporations failed, but very often the people behind them succeeded. The celebrated creative destruction of capitalism is, it seems, gentle with the rich. I began to see the larger theme of this book. Failure and success are not always binaries. Certain kinds of failures impose more public than private costs. In failure, as much as in success, the modern world takes shape. Although historians have tried to diminish the corruption of the Gilded Age, it is hard to study the period without being aware of how corrupt the normal procedures of business and governance became in the late nineteenth century. The Gilded Age forced me to take corruption seriously, but it was writing about the Gilded Age and living in the early twenty-first century that made what I was studying seem more than just a phase, the unruly youth of corporate capitalism. There was Enron, the dot-com bust, followed by the credit crisis and the banking scandals of 2008 and 2009, and the government intervention to rescue corporations that in their own failure had brought the country to its knees. As in the nineteenth century, highly leveraged corporations, marketing dubious securities that were more inventive than comprehensible, even to their creators, precipitated massive losses, receivership, government rescues, and severe economic downturns. The present seems so nineteenth century. The parallels, of course, are not exact. They never are. But they are startling. By the time this book is published, the current downturn may be over, and there will be the perennial temptation to listen again to those who proved themselves so wrong before. Even now, as I write, some of them are saying that the combination of circumstances leading to the 2007-8 to collapse, the contingencies, as historians say, were so extraordinary that they could neither be anticipated nor prevented, nor presumably repeated. But if the late nineteenth century situation and the current one are even roughly parallel, then the present seems less extraordinary. And if railroad corporations failed not once but many times, with dire effects over the course of the late nineteenth century, then so can their twenty-first century equivalents. In the nineteenth century there was a movement not only to control abuses and injustices, but to rethink the relationship of the Republic and its citizens to its economy. The larger rethinking failed, but over the next half-century some reforms achieved significant success. Anti-monopolism was the root of this reform. It was a flawed movement. In the West it was racist to its core. But its proponents created a politics that forced politicians to confront larger economic and social issues. Although not all listeners will think so, this is a hopeful book. In paths forged and blocked, abandoned and resumed, history shows us that things need not be the way they are. Chapter 1 Genesis It is easier, more delightful, and more profitable to build with other people's money than our own. Newton Booth In 1860, the year he won the Republican nomination for the presidency, Abraham Lincoln traveled from his home in Springfield, Illinois, to New York, a journey of about 825 miles as the crow flies, to give his famous Cooper Union speech. Lincoln, however, traveled considerably farther than the crow. Departing on Wednesday, February 22nd, it took Lincoln six hours to go by rail from Springfield to State Line on the Indiana border, where he arrived at 4.30 p.m. and transferred to the Toledo, Wabash, and Western. The second leg of his trip took him from State Line to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where he arrived just in time to board another train, the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago. It was now 1.12 a.m. on Thursday, February 23rd. The third leg from Fort Wayne to Pittsburgh took a little over 24 hours. He arrived in Pittsburgh at 2.20 a.m. on Friday, February 24th. The fourth leg of the trip advanced him from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia and through yet another day. That train, fourteen hours late, reached Philadelphia early on Saturday morning, February 25th. The final leg of his trip carried him from Philadelphia to New York. He waited several hours for the Pennsylvania Railroad train to New York, 
about as long as that train took to go between Philadelphia and Jersey City, from which he had to take the Paulus Street Ferry for New York. Reduced to numbers, the trip of twelve hundred miles involved five trains, two ferries, four days, and three nights. The numbers do not capture the discomfort imposed by schedules that shuttled passengers between trains in the middle of the night. They do not record the adrenaline rushes involved in making some transfers and the drowsy tedium of waiting to make others. This was train travel before the Civil War, at once technologically impressive and nearly incoherent. It was exhausting, aggravating, uncomfortable, yet withal far better than any existing alternative. Americans were prepared to love trains, hate trains, and be unable to live without them. Like the Union itself, American railroads did not quite cohere. The railroads had grown as fast and were as disarticulated as the nation that contained them. The 31,286 miles of tracks united the country only on a map. Impressive in the aggregate, these lines could hardly be thought of as a system or even a collection of systems. A major reason was that there was no single standard gauge for tracks. It was as if hobbyists were trying to connect Lionel with H.O. tracks. They would not fit together. The standard gauge in North America today is four feet eight and one-half inches. It is an utterly arbitrary number that spread because the builders of a small English coal road had early success in building larger roads in England by using that gauge, and because others conformed to it. By 1860 it was the dominant gauge in much of the eastern United States. It accounted for roughly one-half the total mileage, but it was only one of the more than twenty gauges in use. Five feet was the standard gauge in the south, and five feet six inches became the standard gauge in Canada. An individual railroad stopped where its track stopped, but as long as the gauges were the same, a railroad's rolling stock could happily roll on along some other railroad's track, even if few roads at the time allowed such a thing. Different gauges were akin to dams in the thin streams of iron flowing through the continent. When gauges changed, traffic stopped. Passengers had to walk to a new train. Freight had to be offloaded at considerable expense, or cars had to be jacked up and their wheels adjusted before the train could continue its transit. The lines that flowed so cleanly on a map ruptured in reality because of a small difference in space between the rails. Sometimes the different lines coming into a city never actually met. Freight coming into Philadelphia had to be offloaded and carted across the city to get out of Philadelphia. In Ohio, the usual mishmash of gauges and opposition to bridging the Ohio River forced the ferrying of cars. Railroads often did not share terminals, and tracks did not connect their different terminals. A railroad system was articulated the way bones of a skeleton might connect, but the muscles and tendons were wagons, ferries, and human bodies. Take them away, and the railroad skeleton fell into unconnected pieces. The Civil War probably destroyed more railroads than it built, but it contributed a great deal to the organization of railroads and even more to the creation of financial and governmental institutions that would in the years following the war breed railroads like rabbits. The war gave free rein to men willing to take command, to imagine great things, to innovate, to experiment, and to lose all hold on reality. The abilities to organize, imagine, squander, and wreck unfortunately did not come in separate containers. They were part of a single package that, when opened in the 1860s, would create the first transcontinental railroads. 1. First Principles Among the men whose lives would be entangled with the transcontinental railroads and whose reputations would have been far greater if they had, like Lincoln, died with the Civil War, were Tom Scott and Jay Cook. Tom Scott may have been the quintessential railroad man of his generation. Scott is nearly forgotten now, but men whose names are well remembered once feared and admired him. Andrew Carnegie was his protege. Jay Gould was his rival. Edgar Thompson recruited him to the Pennsylvania Railroad, and by the outbreak of the Civil War, Scott had become its public face. He was a close friend of Simon Cameron, another railroad man, iron manufacturer, Republican senator from Pennsylvania, and for a brief and disastrous period, Secretary of War. 
Tom Scott had many friends. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Tom Scott was vice president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, a large industrial corporation. These may seem commonplaces today, but only a short time earlier there were neither vice presidents nor large industrial corporations. Both were products of the rise of railroads. Railroads dwarfed textile mills and iron foundries, the other large enterprises of the United States, both in the capital they required and in the complexity of their management. In North America the word corporation would, until relatively late in the century, remain virtually synonymous with transportation companies, particularly railroads. And in the number of people they employed, and in the elaborateness of their bureaucracies, these corporations had more in common with governments than with other business enterprises. Tom Scott's aptitude for organizing railroads made him an ideal candidate for government service, and he served his country well in the days following Fort Sumter, when Confederate troops and Baltimore mobs threatened to cut off Washington from the north by severing the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. In the dangerous and fearful early days of the war, Scott, acting first as an advisor to the government and later as an official in the War Department, reorganized and rerouted the railroads serving Washington, forging the competing northern lines that served the capital into a coherent system. He put them on a war footing, and he created a framework for a set of standard and uniform rates to extend across the north. Scott's ability and energy did not surprise those who knew him, nor did his corruption. Scott was not so much tainted by corruption as impregnated with it. He was the seventh of a family of eleven children, and the death of his father when he was still a child caused him to be passed hand to hand from his widowed mother to an older sister and then to a brother. Through his early jobs as a clerk, he became familiar with bookkeeping and money-making. Railroad fortunes would be a matter of bookkeeping, Scott was less adept at actually making things. His early ventures, a sawmill and an ice house, failed. But he remained a striver who was also dependent on family and friends. It was not until Herman Haupt, the superintendent of transportation for the Pennsylvania Railroad, hired him on the recommendation of friends that he began his rise. Early poverty and failure impressed on Scott the importance of having friends. His experience formed a kiln that so fired Scott's mortal clay that corruption became part of his very makeup. He had, just before the war, supervised the systematic bribery of the Pennsylvania legislature and manipulation of the press to remove the tax on freight passing over the Pennsylvania Railroad and substitute a flat annual payment. The taxes that remained unpaid for the Pennsylvania had ceased paying, would not go to the state but be retained by the Pennsylvania Railroad and tributary roads for the construction of new lines. His reputation would only grow. Rates, not taxes, brought him trouble in the early years of the war. The federal government did not nationalize the railroads. Instead, it made it worthwhile for the railroads to cooperate. A basic unsettled question was how much the railroads were going to charge the government for the enormous amount of war traffic it would deliver. In 1861, at the request of Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania, the railroads met to set standard rates for government traffic. Scott used these rates as the basis for a circular on government freight rates issued the same year. He created a standard rate that made no distinction between long hauls and short hauls. Controversies over rates would resonate throughout the history of Western railroads, as yet unborn, for years to come. And near the heart of them was the issue of local versus through rates. Railroads charged more per mile for short local shipments than for long hauls. Since much of the expense of hauling freight came in the labeling, directing, loading, and unloading of cargo, and since these rates were the same no matter how far a car traveled, in railroad economics, all miles were not equal. Cost per mile was largely a matter of a numerator remaining constant while the denominator grew. The first mile that a loaded train traveled was the most expensive, and each mile that followed was progressively less expensive. Whether a railroad car was traveling a thousand miles or ten miles, it cost nearly the same to load it and switch it, that is, move it around a yard and attach it to a train. Such costs were substantial if divided by ten, but minimal if divided by a thousand. 
Furthermore, when a car sat idle, either loading or unloading, as it did repeatedly after short hauls, it was not making money. This justified higher local rates. The longer the freight traveled, the less the charge per mile. By publishing a circular that gave the railroads the right to charge all government shipments as if they were local shipments, Scott gave the roads a huge bonus. Particularly in the Western Theater, railroads saw the opportunity to charge the government far more than they did private shippers. Charges of profiteering by railroads and kickbacks to quartermasters, particularly in the military department of the West commanded by John C. Fremont, put Scott on the defensive early in the war. He countered that he had intended his circular to set maximum, not minimum, rates. Since Scott was an expert at making himself clearly understood, this story was not particularly convincing. The charges against Scott were politically motivated and reeked of self-interest because the managers of the Baltimore and Ohio, which Cameron accused of overcharging, were clearly interested in retaliating against Scott and the Pennsylvania Railroad, which they said Secretary of War Cameron corruptly favored. But Scott was a political actor, so this should not be surprising, and that the charges were self-interested doesn't mean they were untrue as in many quarrels of the kind. Everyone was right. All the parties were corrupt. To have Simon Cameron complaining about corruption was like having Jefferson Davis complain about slavery. Without it, he would not have been where he was. A story, revealing but apocryphal since it was applied to so many people, later circulated that Thaddeus Stevens, the radical Republican congressman from Pennsylvania, had warned Lincoln against appointing Cameron Secretary of War intimating that he was dishonest. When Lincoln asked him directly whether he thought Cameron would steal, Stevens replied, I do not think he would steal a hot stove. When Cameron heard of the exchange, he confronted Stevens, who promised a retraction. Stevens called on Lincoln and told him, I have come up to take back what I said about Cameron. I am inclined to think that I am wrong in saying he would not steal a hot stove. The only trait Scott shared with Cameron was corruption. Scott was neither incompetent nor careless. Cameron's carelessness and incompetence spotlighted his corruption and forced Lincoln to exile him as ambassador to the Tsar of Russia. Scott, as Cameron's friend and a known corruptionist, survived, but only for the moment. The new Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, recognized that Scott's liabilities were canceling out his ability. With the Pennsylvania legislature trying to subpoena Scott in its investigations of bribery in the tonnage tax repeal, he was an embarrassment. Scott eventually and inevitably resigned from the War Department. The local rates and the corruption scandals were, however, the frosting rather than the cake in the government-railroad relationship, and if Tom Scott's great flaw was that he never could resist the frosting, he never mistook the frosting for the cake. Since railroads lived on high-volume cargoes, the cake was the tremendous traffic in men and material that the Union war effort demanded. When Secretary of War Stanton negotiated standard rates with the railroads in 1862, the railroads agreed to carry freight at a 10% discount from their usual rates. This was a savory deal for the railroads because it guaranteed them a high volume of traffic that would cover their fixed costs. The need to cover fixed costs obsessed Albert Fink, a German immigrant and engineer who became the general superintendent of the Louisville and Nashville, a railroad critical to the advance of Union armies in the Western theater. Railroads bought their stations, tracks, cars, and bridges on borrowed money. They paid interest on that money, and they had to pay more money to keep this infrastructure from rotting, rusting, and decaying as much from natural causes as from use. These costs were fixed. They had to be paid whether the railroad ran a hundred trains or no trains, and so it was essential for railroads to distribute these costs over the maximum amount of traffic. The more tons of freight that a railroad carried, the smaller the share of the fixed cost that each ton had to bear. High-volume railroads could charge lower rates, but to obtain the highest possible profitable traffic, a railroad had to discriminate. To fill a train, a railroad might accept traffic at the lower cost a shipper could afford to pay, while prior purchasers were charged the higher going rate. 
The Union didn't need more railroads. It needed to use those it had more efficiently. Josiah Quincy, a New Englander and one of the most trenchant critics of the railroads, argued that an average train represented a colossal waste of energy and money. A locomotive could usually pull far more cars than it did on a given run, and indeed often pulled empty cars, which, having brought freight to one location, had no freight to haul on their return. Given such wasted capacity, it made sense to fill up cars that would otherwise have to be hauled back to another station empty, and attach additional cars, even if substantial discounts were needed to attract the freight to fill them. Every loaded car added to a train, up to the capacity of its motive power, cost less to haul than the previous one. Even if such freight yielded no profit, it could meet part of the road's fixed cost. If a shipper such as the government could promise astonishing amounts of freight at fixed rates, then the railroads might as well be running to heaven. Giving the government preferential rates removed the frosting of higher local rates, but the cake remained. The trains ran to capacity. The railroads met their fixed costs, upgraded and rebuilt their lines, and raked in record profits, while avoiding the costly rate wars that plagued them under competitive conditions. For the roads most critical to the war effort, these were halcyon days. When Albert Fink later imagined a practical system of railroad governance and the legalization of pools that set rates and distributed traffic, he imagined something that roughly resembled the structure of northern railroads during the Civil War. The railroads constituting the system were in competition, but they had a common interest in the proper management of the transportation business of the country so as to secure the best possible results to the people with due regard to the rights of the proprietors of the roads. This could be secured only by the cooperation of the railroads under some sort of government with sufficient power to regulate and restrain the action of individual companies so far as necessary for the welfare of the whole. The federal government would not assume ownership or management, but merely prescribe regulations and the method in which the owners of the property shall control it in a legal manner, without interfering with the just right of others. The government should not impose tariffs, but rates should be made uniform by the joint action of the roads interested. The pressure the war created for coordinating railroads was not the primary impetus for standardizing gauges, but it quickened the pace of change. The need to transport men and supplies rapidly without unnecessary breaks gave urgency to the complaints of merchants, who had long resented the added costs of transshipments. Lincoln's decision in 1863 to make the Pacific Railway, the first transcontinental standard gauge, four feet eight and one-half inches, ratified a consensus that had already emerged, but the ratification was nonetheless important. It compelled the Pacific coast, where the early gauge was five feet, to change, and provided an incentive to all lines connecting with the Pacific Railway to adopt standard gauge. It was a major step toward continental uniformity. And although the South would continue to fight the standard gauge even after the Civil War, it lost that fight as thoroughly as it lost the war. It was always safest to bet against the South. When the American railroads in the 1880s extended subsidiaries into Mexico, the distance between the rails on most of them was four feet eight and one-half inches. When the Grand Trunk Railway, then the leading Canadian line, converted from broad gauge to standard gauge in 1874, the die was cast. Canadian railroads, including the Canadian Pacific, were largely on the same standard gauge as their American connections. 2. Patriotism and Profit Tom Scott worked directly with the railroads during the Civil War. He managed, coordinated, and centralized them into functioning systems. Jay Cook, on the surface, had little to do with railroads. He was a banker and financier, but he created a way of financing the war that he and others could easily transfer to financing transcontinental railroads after the war. Jay Cook was an Ohio farm boy who started as a clerk with the banking firm of Enoch W. Clark in Philadelphia and made good. On January 1st, 1861, as the Civil War loomed just over the horizon, he opened his bank on the ground floor of a brownstone building at 114 South 3rd Street in Philadelphia. His partner and brother-in-law, 
William Moorhead, a successful railroad promoter, provided most of the liquid capital of the bank, which totaled perhaps five thousand or ten thousand dollars. New York had long before eclipsed Philadelphia as the country's financial center, but even in Philadelphia the house of Cook was Lilliputian. Philadelphia's Gargantua, Girard Bank, with capital of one million two hundred fifty thousand dollars, was down the block. Cook's Brownstone at 114 South 3rd Street seemed an unlikely source of finance for the Union war effort. Jay Cook had real ability, and he had friends. His most important friends were politicians, and they came through his brother Harry, who had published the most prominent Republican paper in Ohio. It had lost money, but Jay Cook covered the losses because the paper's value was in the connections it had made for Harry, and through him, for Jay. It was the major organ for Salmon Chase, a Republican senator from Ohio, and by 1861, Secretary of the Treasury in the Lincoln administration. Harry had followed Chase to Washington. The secretary became Jay Cook's friend. Friendships between wealthy men and politicians whose salaries did not meet their expenses would become common during the war, and in the years that followed. Such friendship merged public business and private business in ways that enticed and alarmed both parties. The relations of Jay Cook and Salmon Chase were a kind of Victorian financial seduction, full of high-minded declarations of principles, real patriotism and sacrifice, mutual reassurances of rectitude, and dubious dealings. There is no doubt that Salmon Chase and Jay Cook rendered essential services to their country and helped save the Union. Chase came to trust Cook's advice and acumen as he struggled to meet the enormous demands of financing the war. New York bankers and large investors proved unwilling to purchase government bonds, except at large discounts from par. The government resorted to issuing paper currency, and with it came inflation. Each Union defeat early in the war further weakened the country's financial standing. The banks would not, and could not, finance the government's debt. The government, in turn, was unwilling to sell bonds below par or tax heavily enough to finance the war without borrowing. The only bright spot by 1862 was that inflation had made the sale of bonds at par easier. A purchaser could pay inflated greenbacks and get interest in gold, thus raising the real rate of return. Inflation, unfortunately, also reduced each bond's yield to the government in men it could pay and material it could buy. In October of 1862, Jay Cook became sole agent for an existing but so far unsuccessful bond issue of $500 million. The bonds were called 520s because they were twenty-year bonds paying six percent interest that could be called in by the government after five years. By law, they had to be sold at par. It was Cook's genius to imagine a different way of selling bonds. He would appeal not to bankers or to the market's sense of what the bonds were worth, but to the people's sense of what the union was worth. He would appeal not to the calculations of economic men, but to the emotions of patriotic men and women. Cook would sell the bonds retail, to small investors in denominations as low as fifty dollars, but the market would be national. Cook's sub-agents could be insurance men, real estate agents, or businessmen as well as bankers, anyone who had cultivated some degree of community trust and knew how to sell. Cook advertised widely, paid generously, and ensured good press coverage by kind and liberal treatment. Cook organized, supervised, and tracked his agents as if they were a small army. He wanted frequent reports of progress and used the telegraph to get them. And Cook's agents responded as if they were an army. As one wrote, It is glorious work and stirs our blood. Cook sold U.S. government bonds with such creativity and zeal that he came to see himself as God's agent in saving the Union. The paradoxical mark of Cook's triumph was a rise in the national debt, from $65 million in 1860 to $2.75 billion by 1866. Cook and his agents liked to portray their marketing of federal bonds as a species of patriotism, and it certainly was, but their patriotism paid. Cook and Chase would eventually quarrel over the terms. 
but the payments on the first ten million dollars of bonds would allow Cook one half of one percent commission, with another one eighth of one percent going to the sub agents. Cook would, in return, pay all the costs of publicizing the bonds. The costs of the publicity were substantial, but Cook was after more than commissions. His status as sole agent of the bond issue led to denunciations of monopoly and favoritism, but it also made his name widely known and brought him other business. And from the beginning of the war, he had sought to have his bank act as a government transfer agent, holding federal funds until the government drew on them. This gave him temporary but lucrative use of federal money. The bonds, similarly, gave him additional capital, as inefficiencies in engraving, printing, and selling the bonds, and delays in the transfer of the funds received for them, allowed him temporary use of the proceeds that piled up in his bank. The Civil War and federal business turned a minor banking house without access to significant liquid capital into a house to be reckoned with. Cook and his agents had not only reaped considerable financial profit, but also accrued dividends of patriotic regard and trust. In rendering essential services to the Republic, J. Cook and Salmon Chase also rendered essential services to each other. During the war, a ritual played out between them that would become familiar during the Gilded Age. Their efforts to save the Union gradually encompassed things of small moment, personal things, the stuff of daily life. In 1861, the secretary requested a favor, the purchase of a coupé or light carriage. In Philadelphia, Cook personally selected the carriage and sent it as a gift. The secretary thanked him and refused it. As a public official, he could not accept it, but, as it turned out, his daughter could. That would not violate his scruples. The issue became moot when the carriage proved unsuitable. In the midst of a war framed as a national moral crusade, Chase, an ardent abolitionist with ambitions for the presidency, had scruples, but he also had needs and desires. The scruples had to do not only with realities, but with appearances as well. He did not want scandals that opponents could use against him, but he needed money for himself and friends. The secretary sought financial favors for the widow of Dr. Gamaliel Bailey, an old political ally. Then the secretary himself needed a loan. J. Cook provided it. Now the secretary had money to invest. J. Cook invested it, guaranteeing no risk and promising amazing returns. He returned a $1,000 profit on a $13,000 investment within 60 days. Better yet, the secretary could deposit his money with the Cooks and draw on it as needed, even while J. Cook drew on the same amount for Chase's investments. All this would be above board, of course. J. Cook would charge him interest on any deficit in the account, but interest made little difference when investments bought on borrowed money were guaranteed to pay. Chase insisted that they keep their private and public relations separate in their correspondence, even as he mixed them in the letter that made the request. Both men sporadically continued to mix them later. They were, after all, hard to separate. They assured each other that they were honest men, and that, of course, Cook's private favors had nothing to do with the public benefits he garnered. There were inevitably complications. There always were, when American politics demanded both money and the appearance of rectitude. In 1862, the ghosts of the old republic, who feared that corruption would be the death of the American experiment in self-government, returned to haunt Salmon Chase. Someone brought to Chase's attention a 1798 law limiting the Treasury Secretary's private investments in public securities and other outside business activities. Chase told Cook that his private investments must conform to the law. Cook expressed his surprise at such a law, praised Chase's honesty, and directed Chase's investments into private securities that were largely unimagined in 1798. The profits continued to roll in as certain as the tide. The tensions between moral scruples and financial desires reached a dual culmination in early June of 1863. It was a lover's quarrel, both public and private. With subscriptions for the Union's bonds having yielded $12 million a week in May, and with Cook's monopoly under attack by the New York world, Chase, 
worried about his own political vulnerability, telegrammed Cook on June 1st that for the remaining bonds he was reducing Cook's compensation for the 520s from the 3 eighths percent that Cook demanded to 1 eighth percent plus expenses for advertising. Cook responded angrily. Chase soothed him and made some concessions, and the relationship continued. Chase needed Cook. Cook needed Chase. But on June 2nd, Chase sent a second letter regarding private rather than public affairs, or rather private affairs that he was afraid might become public. On June 1st, the very day that Chase had lowered Cook's public compensation, Cook sent him word of a private profit of $4,200 made in a matter of weeks on the rapid turnover of a stock investment in a railroad, the Philadelphia and Erie. Chase had provided no money, and Cook had not charged him any interest on the investment made in his behalf. Chase sent back the check. He was in an awkward position. He had not objected to the original investment, but he objected that the sale of the stock took advantage of market fluctuations that Chase, as Secretary of the Treasury, could have influenced. He told Cook of his determination to avoid every act which could give occasion to suspicion that he would use the power conferred on him to affect markets unnecessarily. Cook registered his astonishment, appreciated Chase's noble sentiments, and told him that he was laying aside the money, since it was Chase's and not his own. Chase's scruples did not stop him a week later from asking Cook to give another thousand dollars to Mrs. Bailey, whose house Cook had earlier purchased at Chase's request. J. Cook, and more particularly Salmon Chase, carried scruples that made their commingling of public and private affairs awkward, circuitous, and painful. They took the high road to the Gilded Age, and arrived burdened with guilt and prone to windy self-justification. Salmon Chase represented the networks J. Cook created in Washington. Fisk and Hatch represented equally critical New York networks. Cook opened a branch of his own bank in New York, but he also recruited sub-agents, among whom was the firm of Fisk and Hatch, a partnership made in March of 1862 by Harvey Fisk and Alfredrick Smith Hatch. Both were from Vermont, and both had long experience in banking before opening their bank at 38 Wall Street in New York. Their working capital was $15,000. Harvey Fisk was a man much like Jay Cook, Self-made, familial, religious, and slightly sanctimonious. Keep your own counsels, Fisk advised his sons. Tell no one of your affairs. Because they were dealing with small investors who had little experience in financial markets or securities, and a deep suspicion of exchanging their money for paper rather than things, Fisk and Hatch had to educate their customers. It was an education in the arcane world of Wall Street which had its own vocabulary as well as practices. They published a pamphlet entitled Memoranda Concerning Government Bonds for the Information of Investors. By 1881 it was in its eighth edition, and had grown to include a description of how the bond and stock markets worked. There were, the memoranda explained, two main classes of securities, bonds and stocks. A bond was the obligation of a corporation, city, county, state, or government to pay the purchaser or holder a certain sum of money at a certain time, usually twenty or thirty years from the date of issue, with a fixed rate of interest payable at certain periods, or, as in the case of income bonds, upon certain conditions. Bonds of business corporations were secured by the mortgage of all or specified persons of their property. Government bonds were secured by the faith of the government. One type of bond came with attached coupons, each dated according to the time when interest was due. An investor cut the coupons and exchanged them for the interest. A coupon or bearer bond was the property of the holder, and was much more liable to theft, but much easier to sell. A registered bond could be negotiated only by the person in whose name it was registered, and interest was paid by check to the owner or the owner's agent. There appeared, as time went on, a profusion of different kinds of bonds. Initially there were first mortgage bonds, which had first claim on assets, and second mortgage bonds, which had a second claim after the first mortgage was satisfied. Then came other bonds, debentures, consuls, convertible, land grant, sinking fund, adjustment, income, and more. 
each having a different claim on the property and different conditions of payment. The riskier bonds usually yielded higher interest. Stocks were the share capital of a company, representing an interest in its property over and above its liabilities, and in profits of its business after the expenses and interest on its bonds have been paid. This profit is known as a dividend. Interest on a bond represented consideration received for the use of money loaned, while that derived from an investment in stock is called dividend, because it is money divided to the stockholders from the profit of carrying on the business after the fixed charges have all been paid. Bonds were a safer investment and better for assured income. Stocks, while potentially profitable, demanded a close scrutiny of the company's standing and the success of its business. To own bonds was to lend money. To own stocks was to own part of a company. But this was only the beginning of it, for there were so many ways of buying and selling these securities that Fisk and Hatch included a glossary to explain the negotiations in paper that went on in Wall Street. These negotiations made ordinary investors deeply suspicious. Pieces of paper took on a life of their own, and their exchange and manipulation produced profit without yielding any material value. Arbitragers, bankers buying and selling stock and bonds in foreign markets in order to benefit by the difference in price between the home and foreign markets, made money simply by moving paper from one site to another. If paper stood for real things, then the connections between things and paper should be clear and their respective value honestly presented. Financial paper should be transparent and reveal the thing that gave it value. An investor should be able to examine a company the way a farmer examined a horse or cow. But small investors often relied only on published accounts, descriptions of the financial livestock, that were so ambiguous and deceptive as to render the securities opaque. Stocks and bonds were open to ballooning, or working up a stock far beyond its intrinsic worth by favorable stories, fictitious sales, or other means of deceptive inflation. It was hard to tell what paper stood for, and what real things stood behind it to give it worth. Even harder to grasp were the various manipulations of paper that could yield profit. An investor could pay for the mere opportunity to buy paper, a call on stocks or bonds at a specified price at a given time, or buy the privilege of delivering a stock at an agreed-upon price in a certain number of days, a put. If an investor thought a stock's price was going to rise, it made sense to purchase the privilege of buying it later at its current price. But it was harder for novices to see how people could profit off of a bear or falling market by selling short. Stocks were sold short when sellers sold stock that they did not own. To make the sale, the seller borrowed stock for a fee, promising to return the same number of shares on demand or at a fixed time. If the market fell, the borrower could replace the shares he had borrowed for a much lower price, called covering his shorts, returning to the lender the now lower-priced shares and pocketing the difference between his purchase and his sale as profit. To do this on a large scale, and to try to force a decline in values, was to bear the market, a favorite tactic of speculators. The great fear of bears was that bulls, or those betting on a rising market, would drive prices higher, or even corner the market by locking up available stock, and ruin them since they would be unable to cover their shorts. In the 1860s this deep, murky sea of finance was beyond the range of small investors who were only sailing offshore in what seemed the sturdier and safer ships of government bonds. They were investing in their country. Patriotism and profit, J. Cook promised, would work in tandem. For the five-twenties this proved spectacularly true. But there were more promises to come, and these would be about railroads. 3. THE ACTS OF THE FOUNDERS During the Civil War, Americans dreamed Western railroads, but they could not build them. The United States had more pressing concerns than building new railroads in the lightly populated West. American railroad mileage had grown by less than 4,000 miles to 35,085 miles by the end of the war. Of these... 214 miles spidered through California, 19 were in Oregon, 
162 in Kansas and Nebraska, and 465 in Texas. In western Canada and northern Mexico, no railroads ran at all. Congress could, however, legislate transcontinental dreams. A transcontinental railroad was, as reckoning went in as young a country as the United States, an old idea in 1862. In the 1850s the government had sent expeditions to select routes, and Congress had debated the routes, but further progress had fallen victim to the stalemate between the North and the South, and the unwillingness of private capital to build the road. There was no commercial reason for a transcontinental railroad, and no set of investors willing to fund, as F. A. Pike of Maine said in Congress, eighteen hundred miles of railroad through an uninhabited country. Pike was, of course, wrong. The country was inhabited, just not by white people whom congressmen thought of as suitable customers for a railroad. Timothy Phelps of California succinctly gave the answer to critics like Pike. The immediate necessity was not commercial, it was military necessity. And if there was no commercial demand for a railroad now, well, that made a railroad all the more necessary. It was absolutely essential to our internal development. The question was how to build it. And the answer, according to Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, was, The liberality of this government, either by money or land, to induce capitalists to invest. The result would be the hothouse capitalism in which the government created the conditions for private investment. The Pacific Railway Act of 1862 was justified on the grounds of military necessity. It was designed to preserve California and the West for the Union, but only a few dozen miles of rail would be laid before the war was over. Although the Act did create the structure of loan guarantees and land grants to companies that would build the road, the inducements in the original Act were insufficient bait for the capitalists Congress sought to attract. The lions and tigers and bears of capitalism stayed at a distance, but a collection of much smaller, if less timid, beasts came sniffing around the bait. Two corporations secured the right to build with government aid, and Congress initially required each to have fifty miles of track laid by November of 1864. The Central Pacific, a California corporation, had, in the words of Theodore Judah, drawn the elephant, the right to build from the West, but it remained to be seen if we can harness him up. Judah was then the chief engineer of the Central Pacific. He also became clerk of the House subcommittee responsible for reporting out the Pacific Railway Bill, and then secretary of the Senate Committee on the Pacific Railroad. Judah used these positions to distribute Central Pacific stock, with a par or face value of $66,000, where he thought it could do the most good. Backing Judah was a collection of Sacramento storekeepers who called themselves the Associates, and whose net worth was probably no more than $350,000. Collis P. Huntington had organized them late in 1860 to build a railroad east from Sacramento to the state boundary. They would also build a toll wagon road so that if the railroad failed, they would still have the Dutch flat road across the Sierras to the Comstock load. The core group eventually numbered five. Huntington, Leland Stanford, Mark Hopkins, and the Crocker brothers, Charles and Edwin. A stroke would later cripple Edwin, reducing the five to four and leaving the far less able brother, the only Crocker involved. Except for Edwin Crocker, a lawyer, they were all hardware dealers, grocers, or dry goods merchants. Collis P. Huntington was their driving force. Poorly educated, abstemious, and narrow as the upstate New York that produced him, he was also undeniably clever, self-assured, and authoritarian. He always had an eye for the main chance. He combined bulldog tenacity, which he demonstrated when necessary, with a shrewd sense that few fights were worth fighting to the finish. Few men wanted to finish a fight with Collis P. Huntington. Tom Scott fought him longer than anyone and Tom Scott would lose. His interest, Huntington grasped quickly, involved not putting much of his own money into the Central Pacific. The Associates' initial investment was small, 
fifteen hundred dollars apiece for all of them except Edwin Crocker, and an additional fifteen hundred dollars invested by James Bailey, a Sacramento merchant dealing in watches, clocks, and jewelry. This seventy-five hundred dollars represented ten percent down on seven hundred fifty shares of stock whose par value was one hundred dollars. A drive to sell stock in San Francisco failed utterly. Each of the associates later bought an additional three hundred forty-five shares with a total par value of one hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars, and other investors bought smaller amounts. Assuming they paid ten percent down, that would have added another thirteen thousand eight hundred dollars to their total investment. These two purchases by the associates gave them a combined investment of nineteen thousand eight hundred dollars. This was a considerable sum for storekeepers, but a pittance for a California railroad, the estimates of whose costs averaged one hundred thousand dollars a mile. Putting only a fraction of the stock price down left investors with the potential future demand for assessments to pay the remainder. In 1862, Huntington threatened assessments to force out Bailey and Judah, who had been given 150 shares. The Central Pacific existed prior to the Pacific Railway Act of 1862, but the Act itself established the Union Pacific. It was the first corporation chartered by the federal government since the Bank of the United States, and initially it was a mere shell. The Union Pacific would not take on a real existence until commissioners appointed by Congress opened its subscription books and sold two thousand shares. Only then could the purchasers organize the railroad. As numerous cities or would-be cities competed for the eastern terminus on the Missouri River, Congress chartered both a trunk line. The Union Pacific, that would build west from the one hundredth meridian in Pawnee Country, and five branches that would connect it to various points on the Missouri. Only in 1863 did Abraham Lincoln, under the powers granted him in the Pacific Railway Act, make Omaha the eastern terminus. Congress prohibited the trunk line from discriminating against the branches, but Congress did not consider how difficult it would be to enforce that provision. If the Union Pacific owned the Omaha branch, when the company opened its subscription books in September of 1862, it sold only twenty shares of stock, and the Union Pacific remained moribund until 1863, when Thomas Clark Durant took hold of it. Scheming, manipulative, at once calculating and volatile, Durant bridged antebellum America and the Gilded Age like some strange hybrid character from Herman Melville and Mark Twain. The only high roads Durant preferred were those on his railroad. He never took an ethical high road. He betrayed partners and he betrayed strangers. When there was no low road, he blazed one. While calculating and shrewd, Durant was also extravagant. His extravagance paled beside his collaborator in the enterprise, the aptly named George Francis Train, whom the Louisville Courier Journal compared to a locomotive that has run off the track, turned upside down with its cowcatcher buried in a stump and the wheels making a thousand revolutions a minute. Train had moments of brilliance, but he was also a buffoon. And his trademark became brilliant buffoonery. With no one else investing, Durant and Train could take control with little investment of their own. They purchased shares, paid for in part from speculations in contraband cotton, and lent the ten percent initial subscription price to others. This too was a speculation and a relatively small one. Durant's fifty shares had a par price of fifty thousand dollars. But his ten percent down represented an investment of only five thousand dollars, and since only five hundred dollars, or ten dollars per share, had to appear in the corporate treasury in cash, it is unclear how much actual money was ever involved. By 1863, Durant had gotten enough stock subscriptions to organize the Union Pacific. Storekeepers and speculators had secured the charters for the Pacific Railroad because it seemed such an unlikely enterprise to experienced railroad men. John Murray Forbes was a Boston capitalist who had started as a China trader and then funneled the profits of sailing ships, opium, silks, and tea into investments in Michigan and Illinois railroads. He even persuaded Hokua, a prominent Chinese merchant, to invest in Western railroads. 
At the outbreak of the Civil War, his Burlington system was just taking shape. It contained only a little over two hundred miles of track. Forbes had no interest in turning the Burlington into a transcontinental. He was a hard man, able and determined, but also opinionated, self-righteous, and narrow-minded. His circle of trust was limited largely to his own kind, but he knew railroads. The more men knew about running railroads for profit, the less likely they were to become involved in the Pacific Railroad. The transcontinentals were not like other railroads. In the early days of North American railroading, local investors built local railroads with considerable state aid to serve existing commerce. By the 1850s, some capitalists were beginning to combine local roads into systems such as the New York Central, which ran from New York City to Buffalo. But the transcontinentals were developmental roads that were supposed to create the traffic they would carry. Asking states or local investors at one end of the line to build a railroad that extended off into what seemed to them a vast emptiness was like bringing an elephant to a horse fair. It was a different beast, and they weren't buying. The transcontinentals were the mirror image of the civil war that was racking the nation. Building the transcontinentals and fighting the Civil War both involved great risk, immense expenditures of money, a sense of national purpose, and the organizational efforts of a newly powerful national state. Yet, as in a mirror, the resemblance was reversed. The Civil War demanded personal sacrifice for concrete collective goals. The railroads promised personal gain for projected public purposes. Having expended so much blood and treasure to restore the South to the nation, Congress hoped to connect the West without expending either. The desire of Congress to build a railroad without taxing the public, and the wish of promoters to build a railroad without investing their own money, were at loggerheads. The associates of the Central Pacific had by the winter of 1863-64 to built eleven miles of railroad, and they were out of money. That spring they secured further aid from the California legislature, but that aid got tied up in court. The Union Pacific had built virtually nothing. By 1864 it was apparent to both Huntington and Durant that Washington and New York loomed larger than the Rocky Mountains or the Sierra Nevada for the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. Unless more concessions could be wrung from Congress and skepticism overcome in the financial markets, the Pacific Railway was going nowhere. Huntington came east to lobby Congress and to try to sell bonds in the winter of 1863-64. to He settled his family in New York's Metropolitan Hotel and went to work. Durant was his rival and instructor. Huntington's first office at 54 William Street was on the same block as Durant's. Like Durant, Huntington shuttled between Washington and New York. They rode railroads to build railroads. In Washington they did much of their work at the Willard Hotel at 14th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. The Willard was, fittingly, the initial terminus of the Washington Street and Georgetown Street Railroad built by the Cooks and invested in by Salmon Chase. A collection of linked townhouses, it grew like the country by adding adjacent real estate. Nathaniel Hawthorne had spent a rainy day there in 1862, and thought its hall and parlors more justly called the center of Washington and the Union than either the Capitol, the White House, or the State Department. Everybody may be seen there. Among the politicians, wire-pullers, inventors, long-winded talkers, and more were railway directors. There in the cigar smoke haze and calls for mint julep, a whiskey skin, a gin cocktail, a brandy smash, or a glass of pure old rye, men sought advantage. Seeking to modify the Pacific Railway Act of 1862, Huntington and Durant offered congressmen and others private favors to secure a public bounty. Durant and his allies distributed $250,000 in bonds to those who could help them. This was almost certainly the occasion upon which the Central Pacific gave some of its convertible bonds, bonds that would be later exchangeable for federal bonds, to the men Mark Hopkins called our friends of influence. Such bonds would have value only if the act passed. For the country as a whole, the Pacific Railway Act of 1864 was the worst act money could buy. 
The act would spread loaves and fishes across a continent, and all would multiply. It was taxless finance at its most grandiose. Like its 1862 predecessor, the 1864 Act lent the companies fifty million dollars worth of government bonds for thirty years, but it increased the speed with which they would flow to the railroads. The government guaranteed both the interest and the principal on the bonds. In making this promise, the majority of congressmen did not anticipate that it would cost the government any actual money. They assumed that the railroads would earn enough from land sales, government traffic, and freight to pay the semi-annual interest on the bonds, and that, as traffic increased, the railroads would establish sinking funds to pay off the principal at their maturity in the 1890s. Congress was so confident, or so reckless, that it reduced its own claim on railroad property to a second mortgage and allowed the two railroads to issue between them fifty million dollars in first mortgage bonds, thus doubling the debt of the roads. In case of default, the government could recover its investment only after the first mortgage bondholders had been satisfied. Congress combined this recklessness with ineptitude. Congressmen thought they were just lending the railroads fifty million dollars worth of U.S. bonds. But the law was so sloppily drawn and the section on interest payments so ambiguous that the courts later decided that although the interest on the bonds was due semi-annually, the railroads did not have to pay the interest as it accrued. They had to pay the government only the total amount of simple interest owed when the bonds matured. So for thirty years the government, not the railroads, would pay the interest on the $50 million worth of bonds. The court's interpretation proved an incredible gift to the railroads. Looking at the benefits to the Union Pacific, whose share of the government bonds came to $27,236,512, we can see why. The United States was paying 6% interest on these bonds semi-annually. At the end of the 30-year period, the Union Pacific would reimburse the government for this simple, not compound, interest, and the face value of the bonds. This simple interest would amount to roughly $49 million, which with principal amounted to a total debt of $77 million. The difference between the $49 million that the railroads owed the United States but retained for 30 years, and the amount of money that $49 million could earn as an investment during that time, amounted to a tremendous windfall. The United States made semi-annual payments of $810,000 in interest on the bonds, and this represented money the Union Pacific did not have to pay but could invest elsewhere. Invested at simple interest of 6%, the first payment would have earned $1,433,700 in interest over 29 and one-half years. The last payment would have earned $24,300 for six months. In total, the commercial value of the court decision came to $43 million over 30 years. This was a donation to the railroads, in addition to the loan of $77 million. No other American railroad reaped such a bonanza of guaranteed bonds and interest payments, although the Canadian Pacific later obtained a similar guarantee from its government. The other piece of government largesse, the land grants, followed the same free lunch logic as the bonds. The Pacific Railway Act of 1864 doubled the land subsidy so that for every mile of road built, the companies would receive 12,800 acres and any coal or iron they contained. The land would not be of much immediate help in building the railroad, although it could serve as security for bonds. As the railroads sold the land to settlers, however, they would receive money to pay off their mortgage bonds and other debts while simultaneously creating new customers, and thus revenue. Donating this land to the railroads would supposedly cost the government nothing. In the United States and later Canada, the railroads received only the odd-numbered sections within a given township. Imagine a checkerboard that folds down the middle. The railroad right-of-way is the crease in the board. The red squares are railroad land. The black squares are public land. Because the railroads acted as a magnet pulling people into its checkerboard, 
the U.S. government could recoup its loss in giving away half the checkerboard by doubling the price of the remaining public land within it from $1.25, the base rate, to two fifty per acre and cutting the amount given as a homestead from 160 acres to 80 acres. The railroad created increased value. The government, in turn, through the land grant, gave a share of that increased value back to the railroads to reimburse the cost of construction. The doubling of land prices compensated the government for giving half the checkerboard to the railroads. The scheme seemed ingenious and foolproof. Even the greatest critic of railroad land grants, Henry George, regarded the grants as plausible and ably urged. This same logic led to even more lavish land grants to subsequent transcontinentals. Railroads received the land equivalent of small countries, or in North American terms, the equivalent of an American state or a Canadian province. The federal grant to Union Pacific roughly equaled the square mileage of New Hampshire and New Jersey combined. The main line of the Central Pacific got slightly more than the landmass of Maryland. The Kansas Pacific, one of the branches connecting with the Union Pacific trunk, had to settle for Vermont and Rhode Island. A later transcontinental, the Northern Pacific, which brought Cook and then Henry Villard down, received a total land grant that was the equivalent of converting all of New England into a strip twenty miles wide in the states and forty miles wide in the territories stretching from Lake Superior to Puget Sound. In all, the land-grant railroads east and west of the Mississippi received 131,230,358 acres from the United States. If all these federal land grants had been concentrated into a single state, call it Railroadiana, it would now rank third, behind Alaska and Texas, in size. The United States was hardly alone in this. The Canadian Pacific eventually received the equivalent of New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, plus change. This translated to slightly less than Kentucky or slightly more than Indiana. This largesse was the main course, but there were other grants that served as a kind of dessert. The Canadian Pacific received additional grants, 1,609,024 acres, for branches and the American railroads received state land grants totaling 44,224,175 acres, or an area roughly the size of Missouri, with 33 million acres alone coming from Texas, which contained no federal lands. Finally, cities and towns gave the railroads valuable lands for depots and yards, and simply as inducements to create connections. The government did not actually own much of this land. It belonged to Indians. But Indian ownership had never proved much of an obstacle to congressional schemes. Indeed, the very fact that it belonged to Indians initially seemed an asset in financing Western railroads. Instead of land grants from the public domain complicated by competing claims from settlers, land might pass directly from Indians to the railroads. In 1862, the year of the first Pacific Railway Act, Senator Samuel Pomeroy of Kansas had written a railroad purchase clause into the Kickapoo Treaty. It provided for the sale at $1.25 an acre of surplus Kickapoo lands, those left after allotments to tribal members, to the Atchison and Pikes Peak Railroad, which, as it happened, was controlled by Pomeroy. Senator Pomeroy then steered the treaty through the ratification process in the U.S. Senate. The Kickapoos protested that the tribal agent and interpreter had been bribed, that the treaty clauses had not been properly interpreted, and that tribal leaders who objected to the treaty had been removed by the agent. Only one recognized tribal leader had signed the document. There were embarrassing investigations, but no action. The treaty stood as a model of how treaties could deliver land directly to corporations, which could then sell the land at a markup to finance railroads. Mark Twain used Pomeroy as the model for his fictional Senator Dilworthy, the golden-tongued statesman, in The Gilded Age, the 1873 novel that gave the era its name. Pomeroy became a man who ever after was less famous than his own parody. On paper, land grants seemed to be foolproof, 
In operation, they seemed the work of fools. The federal government protected its revenue at the expense of states and localities. Taxless finance, subsidizing railroads without direct public taxes, had ironic and unintended consequences. States and localities found that because of delays in issuing patents that conveyed title, they could not easily tax railroad lands for the revenue needed to build roads, schools, and the basic infrastructure of local life. The effects would reverberate throughout the rest of the century. The crowning miscalculation of the 1864 Act was its haziness about where the two roads were to meet. By failing to specify a meeting place, the Act turned construction into a race for subsidies. The railroads were not racing for the land at the end of their routes. Utah and Nevada lands would be a burden to them. They wanted the bond subsidies. The more miles they built, particularly across the relatively flat desert, the more bonds they got. Whenever Congress couldn't decide on a policy in the American West, its default mode seems to have been to conduct a race. Pitting the Central Pacific against the Union Pacific ensured that what might have been done relatively methodically, efficiently, and cheaply would be done badly, expensively, but quickly. Much of it would have to be redone. 4. Building with Other People's Money Getting Congress to increase its subsidies helped Durant and Huntington accomplish the other part of their task, borrowing the rest of the money they needed to build the railroad. The promoters of the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific later claimed that they had risked their honor and fortune on these roads, yet in most cases they possessed relatively little of either. And what they risked, they risked on the construction companies, the Credit Mobilier, Charles Crocker and Company, and the Contract and Finance Company, that built the Pacific Railroad. To understand what they did, it is best to follow the money, which involves tracing the small amount they put into the railroads and the large amount they eventually took out. Compared with the Act of 1862, the Pacific Railway Act of 1864 reduced the obstacles between the promoters and the government bonds they needed, but obstacles still remained. Both roads now had to build 20 miles of railroad instead of 50 miles before the government would release its first allotment of bonds. And the new act lowered the price per share of the initial $2 million Union Pacific stock issue to $100 from $1,000, while removing restrictions on how much stock any one person could own. It also, however, tightened the requirements for actual investment by requiring that the board of directors make assessments of 5% of the par value of the stock every six months until the subscriber had paid its par price. Taken together, these requirements were meant to guarantee substantial private investment and the construction of two railroads of at least 20 miles before the government committed its resources. The law proved laughably easy to evade. Faced with the 20-mile requirement, the companies returned to a compliant Congress. In March of 1865, Congress amended the Pacific Railway Act to allow each road to issue 100 miles worth of bonds at $20,000 per mile, in advance of actual construction. Bonds issued on track yet to be built, however, did not attract investors, and so to strip these bonds of some of their risk and make them negotiable, the Central Pacific made some of them convertible. They could be exchanged for federal bonds when those were released. The Central Pacific and the Union Pacific could now borrow and build with other people's money. As for the requirement that stockholders actually pay the par value of their stock, the United States never enforced it. The Central Pacific was not federally chartered. It fell under the General Railroad Law of California, which, as amended in 1862, also took steps to ensure that the owners of railroads put their own money at risk. It required that a thousand dollars of stock be subscribed for every mile of railroad, and that ten percent of the subscription price be paid before the railroad could legally organize. And in what seemed a strong check on corporate malfeasance, the law made the stockholders personally liable for any debts that the company accrued while they were stockholders. The law sought to limit the amount of money the railroad could borrow to the amount of its capital stock, in practice, this clause achieved the reverse. 
The Central Pacific never sold much stock, and so as it borrowed more and more money, it issued more and more shares to stay in compliance with the law. No cash was paid for this stock, which went to the construction companies owned by the same men who controlled the Central Pacific. The best estimates are that at most $100,000 was paid for shares of the Central Pacific. The company's annual report to the Secretary of State of California that claimed $40 million in paid stock subscriptions in 1869 was fraudulent. By 1865, the promoters of the Pacific Railroad had successfully observed rule number one of building transcontinentals, put little or no money down, and were ready to move on to rule number two, negotiate among yourselves. The device for doing this was the insider construction company that made money by charging far more to build the railroad than the road actually cost. There was little new or original about the device, and this was very likely Durant's plan from the beginning. By receiving its pay partially in cash and partially in railroad securities, including stock, the construction company both profited from building the railroad and owned it. Both Congress and, in the case of the Central Pacific, the state of California, had seemingly created a formidable obstacle to insider construction companies by putting personal liability clauses for stockholders in corporate charters and state law. If the railroad failed to pay the debts that its construction created, the debtors could sue the stockholders. That was not good. There was, however, a way around this. In 1864, George Francis Train, acting for Durant, purchased an investment company named the Pennsylvania Fiscal Agency, originally designed to build a southern transcontinental. Its only real asset was its very broad and flexible charter. Train renamed the company the Credit Mobilier, after a similar French company. First and foremost, the Credit Mobilier was a limited liability venture, which meant that it could serve to launder any Union Pacific stock that it might acquire. By the terms of its charter, neither the Credit Mobilier nor its stockholders were responsible for the failure of any firms whose stocks it acquired. Second, the Credit Mobilier not only was a finance company, but it could also be a construction company that would build the railroads. The associates, as was their fashion, appear to have blundered into a similar arrangement as a result of circumstance, and then refined it by imitating the Credit Mobilier. Collis P. Huntington and Mark Hopkins were often more opportunistic than calculating. Their greatest gift was recognizing the opportunities that their failures and miscalculations created. The Central Pacific initially employed several independent contractors, but soon decided to let only a single large contract to Charles Crocker and Company, which, as everyone suspected, represented the other associates. Crocker and Company served as their primitive credit mobilier. As the recipient of stock in partial payment for construction, it became the means for transferring Central Pacific stock into the associates' pockets, but it did not remove the personal liability clause. Their initial preference was to sell stock, but in February of 1866, Mark Hopkins came to a fine realization. Having reached the present position with so little stock in outside hands, I think now it will pay us best to issue as little as possible and calculate to work it into the contractor and make it bring par or over within three years, when the annual earnings of the road will be very large. This became their plan. The final refinements came from Edwin Crocker. By March of 1867, the Crockers had decided that they would prefer a new construction contract directly to themselves and made by the present board. The board issued the contract to a new company, the Contract and Finance Company. The associates later claimed that they incorporated the Contract and Finance Company in an attempt to attract outside capital, but there is no evidence for this. Its nominal incorporators actually held stock for the five associates, who never paid anything for it. Instead, they gave their notes for the stock. The Central Pacific paid the contract and finance company inflated prices for constructing the line. The Pacific Railway Commission later estimated that the Central Pacific paid roughly twice the actual cost of construction per mile. 
In 1868, the contract and finance company received half of its $16,512,000 payment in gold and half in stock in the Central Pacific. This meant that the gold covered the cost of the line and the stock was a bonus. Other transfers in which the contract and finance company received bonds as well as stock were more lucrative still. It was, as Collis P. Huntington wrote years later, as rotten a corporation as ever lived. With the subsidies and financial mechanisms in place, there remained only the troublesome requirement of actually constructing railroads. The Central Pacific had already found its man to build railroads. James Harvey Strobridge was a taciturn misanthrope. He was both racist and brutal, but he could drive men and had fallen in with the right crowd when Charles Crocker hired him to head construction on the Central Pacific. Strobridge hated the Chinese, and Leland Stanford, the president of the Central Pacific, had tried to exclude Chinese, the dregs of Asia, from California while governor. Both, however, came to see the advantage of good workers who could be employed at wages below those of white labor. Chinese labor proved to be the Central Pacific's salvation. In the East, the end of the war freed up a pool of men experienced in building railroads quickly and under difficult conditions. General Jack Casement had learned railroad construction before the war and how to organize and lead men during it. He took charge of construction crews on the Union Pacific that would eventually build railroads and fight Indians who opposed their passage. The chief engineer for the project was the corrupt and largely incompetent Silas Seymour, but the man responsible for much of the building was the more complicated Grenville Dodge. Dodge was from New England. He had moved to Iowa, and when the Civil War broke out had fought in Missouri. Unlike many of the men who became active in the Transcontinentals, he was no abolitionist. He hated abolitionists, and he hated black people. He hated immigrants and Catholics with impartiality. He was an eclectic hater who hated people who often hated one another. He hated loudly and demonstratively. In a Boston restaurant, irritated by a black man who kept his eyes on the brass buttons of Dodge's coat, Dodge shoved a dish of stewed oysters in the man's face and then ordered another. He thought himself highly eulogized by the crowd for giving the nigger so just a punishment for his audacity. After moving west, Dodge got a job under Peter Dye on the Rock Island line. Dye was a skilled engineer who would later resign from the Union Pacific out of disgust with its insider construction contracts. Dodge was, like Dye, competent, and like so many men Dodge joined on the Union Pacific, corrupt. He was a man who would always exaggerate his talents, but he was not without talent. Often nasty, occasionally ridiculous, he was also sporadically and surprisingly able. He served in the Union Army, and early in his military service he accidentally shot himself with a revolver he forgot he had in his pocket. He would describe it as a war wound. In battle at Pea Ridge, he behaved credibly and bravely, and yet his best moments could still become Grenville Dodge moments. A Confederate shell hit a branch, and the branch fell, hitting Dodge and knocking him from his horse. In Dodge's telling, the fallen branch became a wound that left him lying on the battlefield for ten days, before he could be hauled two hundred fifty miles over rough roads to doctors who said he would not live. The original Confederate artillery shell was real, and Dodge did suffer a contusion from the falling branch that earned him a furlough. The rest was all fiction. Dodge's ability to build railroads was, however, not fictional. In 1864, using his troops and freedmen, he had in forty days restored 102 miles of railroad between Nashville and Decatur, destroyed by the retreating Confederates. With only hand tools, axes, picks, and spades, they had rebuilt 182 bridges, albeit with temporary spans, laid rails, and repaired cars. With competent engineers in their employ and federal bonds flowing into their treasuries, the year 1865 began auspiciously for both the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. By the summer, the Central Pacific had made it as far as Clipper Gap, 
42 miles from Sacramento. The normally cautious Mark Hopkins saw profit in California, but his optimism bred more caution. Why not just stop at the California line? From there they could tap the Comstock load traffic, monopolize California, and let someone else have Nevada and Utah, where there was little of promise. They would not stop because they could not stop. They needed the bonds that building in Nevada would provide. The Central Pacific did not reach the summit of the Sierras until July of 1867. Building so slowly turned the flow of federal bonds into a trickle and hurt their ability to sell their own first mortgage bonds. They had to borrow more and more heavily. By February of 1867 their load of debt, secured in large part by personal notes, made E.B. Crocker tremble for the future. A financial panic and the calling in of debts could destroy them. To get more federal bonds quickly, they jumped ahead of the stalled construction in the Sierras and began building into Nevada. Only in June of 1868 did Crocker finally wire Huntington that they had crossed the mountains and linked their Nevada and California construction. The Union Pacific faced a different set of difficulties. Durant had originally issued construction contracts to a dummy company headed by Herbert Hoxie. This was the contract that led the Union Pacific's chief engineer, Peter Dye, to resign in disgust before the railroad laid any track. Once Congress allowed the company to issue bonds in advance of building, Hoxie assigned his contract to the Credit Mobilier. These first Union Pacific securities lacked federal guarantees, and so they were hypothecated at killing interest. Hypothecate is a wonderful old verb that in the nineteenth century most often meant to offer stocks or bonds as security for a loan. In this case, the loans carried interest rates of nearly twenty percent. In need of cash, Durant turned to Boston capitalists to invest not in the Union Pacific but in the Credit Mobilier. Chief among them were Oliver and Oakes Ames, the kings of spades, who had made a fortune in New England manufacturing shovels. They had been active in Western Railroads before the Civil War, and Oakes Ames was also a member of the House Select Committee on Pacific Railroads. Along with them came Sidney Dillon, a Connecticut railroad contractor who would be intimately involved with the Union Pacific for much of the rest of the century. Like the associates of the Central Pacific, the Ameses and Dillons were part of an interlocking network of particular people centered on a particular place who invested in Western railroads. The associates were outliers, located as they were in Sacramento, and they would gradually be sucked into the orbit of New York, where they raised and borrowed their money. Other early railroad networks arose in Philadelphia, particularly around Jay Cook and then Tom Scott, but they gradually declined as the fortunes of these two men declined. Networks centered on Boston and New York were far more lasting. They outlived the rise and fall of particular individuals. They were the real centers of control of Western railroads. They dominated boards of directors with interlocking combinations of kin and men with long-time business relationships such as those growing out of the China trade. Over the years, as things went sour, the various parties in the Union Pacific told different stories about why they went in, but in all the stories there is a Yankee shrewdness that was in practice almost too shrewd by half. The shrewdness recognized that if the Union Pacific paid a construction company inflated prices to build a railroad, then the construction company could profit no matter what happened to the road. The Bostonians also knew, however, that if everything had been going smoothly, Durant would not have needed them. They had cash. Durant needed cash. The pump had to be primed, and the priming was the investment by the Ameses and the Bostonians. For the scheme to work, Durant and the Ames faction had to retain control of both the Credit Mobilier and the Union Pacific. And so an elaborate charade took place. When construction contracts were assigned to the Credit Mobilier, the Union Pacific wrote a check to the Credit Mobilier in partial payment for construction. The Credit Mobilier then returned the check in exchange for Union Pacific stock. The fiction allowed them to meet the requirement that the stock be sold at par, although no cash really changed hands. 
the Credit Mobilier became the Union Pacific's largest stockholder. It later distributed the stock among its own stockholders as a dividend. The rest of the construction contract involved a payment in other Union Pacific securities. The men receiving the stock and other securities were the men who controlled both the Union Pacific and the Credit Mobilier. Very few of them lived anywhere near where the line did business. Federal loans had created a railroad under the control of New York and Boston businessmen, most of whom had invested little or no money of their own in the Union Pacific. The Ames brothers did not trust Durant. No one in his right mind would trust Durant, and the railroad and the credit mobilier soon endured a war of faction. Durant's double-dealing and the widespread distrust he inspired had made him a burden to the whole enterprise, and the Ames faction forced its way onto both the Union Pacific and the Credit Mobilier boards. True to his particular genius, Durant tried to destroy the Bostonians by employing a tactic no one expected from him. Honesty. In 1867, Durant, on his own initiative, took the construction contract for the next section of the Union Pacific away from the Credit Mobilier and gave it to another party, the aptly named L.B. Boomer, who would act as Durant's agent. The new contract allowed only a modest profit above the real cost of construction. The Credit Mobilier was bleeding, and Durant was, in effect, denying the Bostonians the transfusion of bonds and cash that provided the Credit Mobilier's only chance to live. Durant would watch it die. He would survive it. The result was a coup that displaced Durant from the Credit Mobilier and a long and tangled struggle within the Union Pacific. In the end, the furious Bostonians cancelled the Boomer contract and secured an extravagant construction contract for Oaks Ames, who then assigned it to the Credit Mobilier. In the end, they outmaneuvered Durant. The Bostonians defeated Durant, yet, ironically, what saved the Union Pacific was the success of a Durant ally, Cornelius Bushnell, in imitating Jay Cook. Following the techniques that Jay Cook had pioneered, Bushnell advertised Union Pacific bonds aggressively and sent agents to leading cities. He created a market for Union Pacific securities, and the Credit Mobilier turned them into cash. The lucrative Ames contract multiplied the original investment of the Bostonians many times over. In the late 1860s, Union Pacific bonds rose above par, and the stock even reached 30 in 1868. The risk seemed to have paid off. The Central Pacific also ultimately found salvation through techniques pioneered by J. Cook. Following the war, Fisk and Hatch, part of Cook's Civil War Consortium, made the regard and trust that they had reaped from the war available to the railroads. They marketed railroad bonds on commission and also sold them to syndicates of bankers and large investors in Europe and the United States, who bought them at a discount and resold them. The Central Pacific and other transcontinental railroads, their bankers and the syndicates together lured investors, who had first ventured into the financial markets during the Civil War, along the financial gangplank one small step at a time. Investors proceeded from government bonds to government-secured railroad bonds, to convertible bonds, to mortgage bonds, vouched for by the same people who sold the government bonds, to a whole array of financial instruments, and from there, potentially, into the drink. Fisk and Hatch were working with Huntington by 1865, and eventually offered the Central Pacific bond issues in all their profusion and variety. There were first mortgage bonds and second mortgage bonds. There were mortgages on the trunk line and mortgages on the branches. There were land-grant bonds and income bonds. There were bonds on anything and everything that investors might accept as collateral. The bankers as well as the railroads they represented trumpeted the security of these investments, but they were in effect so many carnival barkers. There was no real monitoring of the figures railroads offered in their annual reports or bankers in their prospectuses. By 1868 the crisis had passed for the Credit Mobilier and the Contract and Finance Company, but how much profit flowed into the pockets of their organizers is difficult to establish. By the late 1860s, the Credit Mobilier was granting dividends to stockholders, including prominent politicians, of 50% and 100% a year. 
Charles Francis Adams made an early estimate of the total profit on investment at 750 percent. In dollar terms, reasonable 19th and early 20th century estimates have run from 11 million to 20 million dollars. Forty years ago, Robert Fogel put the profit of the Credit Mobilier at an upper limit of $16.5 million and estimated the promoter's profit for the period, between 1864 and 1869, at from 480% to 610%. By all calculations, the insiders accrued millions, and the Union Pacific compiled an immense debt. The financial returns of Crocker and Company and the Contract and Finance Company are even harder to determine, for the simple reason that when threatened with a congressional investigation, the books disappeared, never to resurface. By the calculations of the Pacific Railway Commission, established by Congress to investigate the transcontinentals in 1887, the bond issues, federal and corporate, paid to Crocker and Company and the Contract and Finance Company, roughly matched the cost of the road. Certainly when local and state bonds and revenue from the road up until 1870 are added, there appears to have been more than enough to build the road without any substantial investment from the associates. As Governor Newton Booth of California dryly observed in a San Francisco speech in 1874, It is easier, more delightful, and more profitable to build with other people's money than our own. The economic historian Haywood Fleissig estimated that the associates of the Central Pacific Railroad took an actual investment, not all of it theirs, of about $275,000, and leveraged it into a corporation capitalized at $135,346,964 in 1873 a figure higher than the $116,658,824 capitalization of what was widely regarded as the best railroad in the United States, Tom Scott's Pennsylvania Railroad. A good deal of that $135 million was water, bloated securities, with a face value much higher than what the associates of the Central Pacific, who owned them, had paid for them, or could sell them. Real money came from taxpayers through federal, state, and local subsidies, and it came through bonds. Investors paid cash for some part of the $52.5 million in bonds outstanding in 1873. An indeterminate part of that went into the railroads, as distinct from the pockets of their owners. By the later calculations of the Pacific Railway Commission, the associates derived a profit of more than $10 million from paying themselves to build the road. The ultimate profit, however, came largely from the sale of securities. To realize that profit, the associates had to create a market for their heavily watered stock. Mark Hopkins was too sanguine in 1865 when he thought the rise in stock would come within two or three years. And above all, Mark Hopkins did not count on Sam Brannan. In 1870, Leland Stanford made one of his many expensive mistakes when Sam Brannan tried to sell back his 200 shares of Central Pacific stock at par, $100 a share. Brannan, once a leader of the Mormon colony in California, was a buffoon, but a calculating and shrewd one. He had sparked the gold rush by walking through San Francisco waving his hat, holding a vial of gold, and shouting, Gold! Gold! gold from the American River. He left the church, became wealthy selling supplies to the miners, briefly ran a railroad, and used his wealth to become a legendary philanderer and drunk. Drunk or sober, he was no man to brush off, and when Stanford brushed him off, Brannan sued, demanding a full financial accounting of the Central Pacific. Anticipation of what the Brannan suit might reveal terrified the associates, who hurried to suppress the suit while buying up as much original stock as they could to prevent other suits. They were saved by Mrs. Brannan, who divorced Sam and received his stock as part of the divorce settlement. The associates bought it from her at $850 a share, effectively squashing the suit. Brannan's suit, and the books the associates wanted no one to see, halted the associates' immediate attempts to sell the stock. Silas Sanderson, the company's lawyer, cautioned against selling any Central Pacific stock acquired through the contract and finance company, 
because the purchasers would acquire the right to call the directors to account. Since the directors did not want to be called to account, they could not sell until they found a way to reorganize the railroad and have new stock issued. 5. Golden Spike None of the history that led up to the transcontinentals and none of the ambivalence of the men whose lives came to revolve around them is revealed in the famous photographs of the trains meeting at Promontory Summit. There are only the trains, the workers, the dignitaries, the bystanders, and the Utah desert. Promontory Summit quickly became less a place than a metaphor, and as a metaphor, Promontory Summit was almost too perfect. Leland Stanford, ex-grocer, ex-Civil War governor of California, and on May 10, 1869, the current president of the Central Pacific Railroad Company, tapped a silver hammer on an iron spike. Rigged to telegraph wire, the spike sent a signal across the nation, triggering bursts of cannon fire in New York and San Francisco, and of celebration and speech-making across the country. The Union Pacific now ran 1,032 miles from Omaha to Ogden. The Central Pacific ran 881 miles from Ogden to Sacramento. The connections forged by the railroad were like that burst of energy transmitted across North America. The golden spikes Stanford brought to Promontory Summit to commemorate the event were inscribed with conventional purposes of nationalism and commerce. One, contributed by David Hughes, a San Francisco contractor, memorialized the brighter vision that Americans imagined the Pacific Railroad would achieve. May God continue the unity of our country as this railroad unites the two great oceans of the world. Presented by David Hughes, San Francisco. The railroad was no longer necessary for the assertion of federal authority. The Civil War had settled that and connection of the seas would never come to pass in the way that Hughes and other Americans imagined. Asian trade would, by and large, soon flow through the Indian Ocean to the new Suez Canal, rather than across the Pacific and North America. Taken literally, the sentiments on the spike and the date inscribed on it, May 8th, not May 10th, were hopeful, plausible, and mistaken. In that, the engraved spike was true to the Pacific Railroad's origins. A country whose politics and whose waterways from the Atlantic to the Mississippi had, despite the Erie Canal, always oriented it largely north-south, now also ran east-west. The railroads, like that signal across the wires, caused millions to imagine events and possibilities they could neither see nor hear. The transcontinentals were, from their beginning, always running ahead of schedule, always approaching places that did not quite exist. The transcontinentals were the means to something beyond themselves, even if there was a certain lack of clarity about what those things might be. They were more than business propositions. They were, like the Civil War, exercises in nation-building. But whereas the Civil War settled the question of the national authority of the central state and sutured together the North and the South, the transcontinentals opened the question of a national market and the relation of the East and the West. A Railroad Life H. K. Thomas Fittingly enough for a stationmaster on the Union Pacific Railroad in Wyoming Territory in 1870, H. K. Thomas's diary is bound in rawhide with his name and his town's name, Laramie, branded on the cover. Equally fitting for the place, there was snow on the day the diary opens, September 23, 1870. There was no sign of the pay car, and the number four train was nine hours late out of Ogden because of an accident on the Central Pacific. When the pay car arrived a week later, the weather felt like midsummer, at least during the day. In Laramie, the only constant was the wind. Whole gale meant that not only sand but also gravel was moving. Rawhide was easy enough to come by in Laramie in 1870. The railroad replaced domesticated animals as the engine for long-distance travel, but it multiplied their numbers for most everything else. Mules, horses, and cattle going both east and west filled the trains. The cattlemen were already shifting from their earlier year-round reliance on valley lands to transhumance, 
driving the herds into the surrounding mountains in the summer and wintering them in the valley. The cattle moved into mountains whose forests still burned in the summer, covering the valley in a thick, smoky haze. Long drives moved stock north from Texas, but after that the animals traveled by train. On July 19, 1871, Thomas recorded his trouble in loading a large herd of wild Texas cattle, the worst lot to handle that he ever saw. Try as he and his men might, they could not load any more than four hundred per day, and that meant four days' work to take care of fifteen hundred head. Even at this pace there were losses among the recalcitrant cattle. The station crew had killed one and injured several others that clear, warm July day. The pay car, whose absence meant a scarcity of cash in Laramie, and the cattle were just two signs of how virtually all lives in Laramie in 1870 were becoming railroad lives. Nearby there were mines to produce the coal that fueled the railroads, and then there were the gold and silver mines. Thomas invested in syndicates that financed a miner or two to try their luck in new strikes in Utah and Wyoming. News of a strike sped the trains, carrying men as close to the mines as they could get before heading off into the mountains. The railroad brought the bread of Wyoming territory, and it brought the circuses. The railroad instantly created the new without eradicating, at least not immediately, the old. Buffalo herds grazed along the tracks in 1870, and Thomas rode the train to Como to hunt elk. Those that he killed too far from the tracks he left for the wolves. But game was declining as cattle were increasing, and the Laramie hunters, in anticipation of new game laws, killed all the antelope and elk they could find, as 1870 approached 1871. There were still Indians around Laramie in 1870, Lakotas, apparently, but Thomas did not always specify. He apparently did not know, and apparently did not much care. One day he recorded that forty Indians came into nearby Fort Sanders, entering under a flag of truce. The commander ignored the flag and detained them, or threatened to, until horses stolen in the neighborhood were returned. That he noted forty Indians was typical of Thomas. He was a man of numbers. He recorded the first execution at Cheyenne, the date and the time, Friday, April 21st, 1871, at 12.30 p.m., and the blood quantum of the victim, the half-breed known by the name of Boyer. Some feared that the Sioux would attempt to rescue him, but nothing of the kind took place. The execution passed off quietly. The only Indian Thomas actually met was John Richaud, the outlaw half-breed of Red Cloud's tribe. Richaud came to Laramie on business, railroad business. He had about one hundred mules for sale and expects to sell them to a Montana freighter who arrived from the west today. On a cold, blustery day, Thomas passed the time with Richaud and found him to be on the square. The freighter, Kirkendall, would ship seventy-one of Richaud's mules to Ogden. He drove the rest to Fort Fetterman. There were horse thieves. Sheriff Boswell promptly captured some inept ones in Hallville and brought them back to Laramie on the train, train number four, as Thomas noted. But Laramie was less wild west than industrial west. It was from the beginning a working man's town, and its violence largely working men's violence. Men got paid and men drank. When the soldiers have been paid off at the fort, they had a glorious time in town. Thomas, a temperance man, wrote sarcastically. Many of them have received broken heads, besides losing all their money. There were two scrapes, as Thomas called them, on December 8th. One involved guns, but no one was hurt. The other, at Sherman, was a quarrel between miners that was terminated by a blow of a shovel to the head of a man named Wood. Wood died. His assailant, Shipman, was later convicted of manslaughter by a jury of three or four Dutchmen, a couple of Irishmen, one nigger, and the balance women. Men were armed, and when they drank, they were careless with their weapons. On December 12, 1870, Thomas returned from the saloon opposite to our office, the general headquarters of all Negroes in town. Walls, the pastry cook of the Laramie Hotel, was stretched out there dead, having been shot by a waiter belonging to the same hotel named Lawrence. The bullet must have passed right through the poor old man's heart. He was a very quiet old fellow, 
have known him for a long time, and I never saw the least thing out of the way in him. Those who saw the affair seemed to say that it was accidental. Lawrence, too, would be convicted of manslaughter. Far more dangerous than drink or the quarrels of men was the work itself. Just before Christmas, an explosion in the coal mines at Carbon injured five men and set the mines on fire. They burned for weeks. In January, a brakeman got his hand badly smashed, coupling cars. A bridge watchman, run over by a train, died a few days later. The danger brought solidarity of a sort to working men against the men who employed them. But the solidarity was often shaky among transient workers, and it sometimes had to be enforced at the barrel of a gun. When five miners broke ranks and returned to work during the strike at the coal mines in Carbon, thirty miners armed themselves and waited for them to come out of the mines. When the government intervened, it was not on the side of the strikers. Orders had been issued for a company of U.S. troops to be sent to the scene of the trouble from Fort Steele. The troops arrived quickly by railroad, ending the confrontation. Management fired the leaders of the strike and began importing Scandinavians to work the mine. The station at Laramie and scores like it were points where the relentless moving and the passing to and fro essential to the new industrial order were concentrated, recorded, and taxed. It was all traffic to H.K. Thomas, and he records it as heavy and light in his diary, and much more specifically in the fortnightly reports that he dreaded writing and that took up considerable time. Thomas can judge the pace of business by how heavily laden were the freight and passenger cars that passed. When they grew too light, crews were laid off. In the fall of 1870, the passenger traffic was mostly through passengers. One hundred ninety on the number three, as Thomas noted, heading toward the west coast. But such traffic could, and did, fall off in a matter of days. By October the traffic was light, and number four from the coast was carrying only thirty-five passengers. In late January of 1871, number six was a heavy train of tea, silk, ore, and four cars of fat cattle from Catton and Company. In May of 1871, the traffic was heavy with coal, forty cars in one day. The mines spurred most of the local traffic. In April of 1871 there was a great rush of passengers to the newly discovered mines in Utah, very heavy trains going west. Two days after the miners passed, a large number of medical men are going west for the purpose of attending some convention in California. All of this was the commerce for which the railroads were built. Cattle, coal, medical men and miners, all reduced down to money. All these railroad lives could be calculated as revenue and expenses. The ticket business very dull, Thomas wrote on January 8, 1871. My quarter monthly report reached only $108.20, being lower by large odds than I have ever seen it here. The scheduled passage of trains intensified the odd ambience of the 19th century West. In the place where Americans imagined lives to be lived most intensely and immediately, most of the people were emotionally displaced. They had left part of themselves somewhere else, the place they called home. In the year his diary covers, H. K. Thomas never referred to Laramie as home. Massachusetts was home. The railroad connected him with home. Nearly every day I receive one and sometimes two papers from home, he recorded in March 1871. More than I can find time to read. Home was where letters came from, particularly letters from Nellie, each numbered consecutively and each answered and numbered in turn. Each time Thomas visited home, which he could do in less than a week over the railroad, the old sequence of numbering stopped and a new one began. It was 127 letters since he had visited Nellie on September 25th. He visited home and Nellie in November for three glorious weeks. The tension between the still great distance and the new ability to bridge it quickly showed up in small things. Thomas returned to Laramie so quickly, in five days, that he had no time to adjust and was very blue on his return. Massachusetts was in one sense so close that when he forgot his toothbrush, his family sent it to him as if he had merely gone over to the next town. 
It was so close that when in May R. Robinson, an old neighbor, passed through with his family on the way to California, he brought a picture of Nellie. Thomas was disappointed. He did not think it looks quite natural enough. But home was also so far away that these tokens brought by train only tantalized. The numbers on the letters toted up the distance. Letter 27 arrived from Nellie that evening. Home was someplace else, but even poor men were so close to that someplace else now that when the worst happened they could return. When Walls, the pastry cook, died of Lawrence's careless bullet, the colored men around town subscribed enough money to get a very fine casket and to send the body home to his family in Alton, Illinois. The black men, Walls and Lawrence, the white New Englander Thomas, the trains made the town seem diverse and promiscuous, but there were lines clearly drawn. Thomas sympathized with the freedmen in the town, but there were lines that neither blacks nor whites were supposed to cross. Sympathy with black men was one thing. Socializing together was another. When they did, people noticed. On a smoky Friday in August 1871, as fires burned in the mountains, Thomas recorded, A great sensation here last night, in the shape of a Fifteenth Amendment ball. Several of our boys attended, and they have been the subject of comment ever since, and probably will be for some time to come. The trains themselves, however, were not segregated. Thomas could not control the people who rode the trains, but he could judge them. Two days before the Fifteenth Amendment ball, a train of Mormon immigrants had passed through on their way to Utah. A low-looking set, taken as a whole, ugly and dirty. The railroad was Thomas's job, his link with home, and the courier in his romance with Nellie. Station master in love, he recorded the letters the way he recorded freight, by their size and their frequency. He worried when the letters were late and light. Even his dalliances on the side took place over the roads. In late February 1871, he was much surprised to receive a letter from Lizzie Holbrook today, Somerville, Mass. He replied, but only a short letter. A second set of correspondence ensued. H. K. Thomas was attentive to work, to Nellie, and to his possibilities. He lived at the Laramie Hotel, paying Mrs. Harper a dollar a day for board. He was, it appeared, an active mason and regularly attended lodge meetings. He turned down an opportunity to run as a Republican for the territorial legislature. He recorded rumors about who was rising in the ranks. Mr. Sickles, our chief engineer, is to succeed Mr. Hammond as general superintendent and the corporate politics of the road. The railroad magnates, Fisher Ames, Tom Scott, and Leland Stanford, all entered into his diary, even as they were utterly unaware of his existence. Thomas always remained alert to advantage. He introduced himself to passenger agents of other roads as they passed through so that he could get passes over their roads when he traveled east. It was a privilege of his job, like shortchanging customers and passing counterfeit bills. This casual dishonesty was apparently common. When railroad employees quit and left town, they stepped out on their unpaid board bills. Offered the Wasatch Station, Thomas refused it, holding out instead for Evanston due to open in the fall. Thomas had a presentiment of trouble, a station master's presentiment. Letters were late and light sporadically during the summer of 1871. The trouble came in August. Monday, August 7th, 1871. Weather quite pleasant. Received a letter from Nellie dated at Brewster, August 2nd. Probably the last but one that I shall ever receive from her. A sociable was held this evening at the hotel, the event being the departure of Reverend John Cowell to Santa Fe, New Mexico. The Laramie Band discoursed some choice music, so says the Laramie Sentinel. He wrote a reply on August 8th. Frailty, thy name is woman, he noted in the diary. After that his diary entries grew more sporadic. Nellie's last letter, announcing an engagement, perhaps, arrived on August 28, 1871. The hurt Nellie had inflicted moved all too easily into a more general misogyny that took the form of ridiculing Wyoming women in politics. Wyoming had enfranchised women, 
and in the fall of 1871 women were in full political activity. Thomas thought it amusing to see women in different conveyances electioneering. They're running around in every direction carting up voters. But he seemed more angry than amused. The women were, as a general thing, making complete asses of themselves. Amid shipments of tea and engines slowed because they were forced to burn wood, the diary drifted to a close in September of 1871, a year after it had started. A well-known lawyer was found dead in his bed, presumably from an overdose of morphine that he had picked up the habit of using. Fires still burned in the mountains, driving game into the valley. A bear was seen just outside town. Halfway down, the last page is ripped off, perhaps to remove an entry, perhaps only for a scrap of paper to write a note. Most of the rest of the diary is empty, except for two pages. Both contain poems. The longer reads, Love thee? Oh, yes, so well, so tenderly thou art loved, adored by me. Fame, fortune, wealth, and liberty were worthless without thee. Though brimmed with blessings, pure and rare, life's cup before me lay, unless thy love were mingled there, I'd spurn the draught away. Love thee? So well, so tenderly thou art loved, adored by me. Fame, fortune, wealth, and liberty are worthless without thee. The poem was the last remnant of a railroad romance. Love projected across a thousand miles. The railroads projected love, and they did so alongside imperial power. The forty Indians threatened by the military the lone Indian dead at the end of a rope, an alien justice and a terrible violence delivered by rail. The railroads reconstructed space into empire. Railroads were tools of dispossession and possession alike. In Nellie's and Thomas's love letters, they linked Wyoming and Massachusetts in an imaginative whole, as necessary to American empire as the guns the soldiers carried. Chapter 2 Annus Horribilis, 1873 I stay in my office not knowing just what to do. Collis P. Huntington, September 1873 Literally and figuratively, railroads were creatures of the seasons. The railroads had supposedly conquered nature. When lakes, rivers, and canals froze, halting water transportation, they could at least potentially run on. When wagons sank into the mud following spring thaws, the railroads rattled forward across seemingly insurmountable barriers, no matter what the weather. Or so it seemed. But not only could weather halt the railroads, it turned out that the very capital that sustained them was seasonal ebbing and flowing with agricultural cycles of planting and harvest. Only in politics could the railroads manufacture their own weather, but that weather grew stormier and stormier until their blithe forecasts of perpetual spring vanished into a long winter of political and financial discontent. Other aspiring transcontinentals found hope and inspiration with the completion of the Pacific Railroad. They found even more hope in the winter of 1869, when the Pacific Railroad faced its first great challenge and failed, miserably and nearly completely. Failures were the lifeblood of the transcontinentals. The failure of the Union had secured the subsidizing of the Pacific Railroad and in quick succession a host of other routes to other destinations on the Pacific coast. The actual completion of the Pacific Railroad had proved that transcontinentals could be built, but it did not present any convincing argument for why more should be built. The country had its transcontinental railroad. Why build another one, let alone two or three or more? Why not wait until it was clear they were needed? That, after all, was how Americans usually built railroads. The answer that rival promoters offered was winter. The claim that technology had conquered nature, time, and space turned out to be premature in regard to snow and ice. The cuts dug at such labor and expense through rises in the land to keep the line level filled with snow that buried the tracks and halted trains on the Union Pacific for more than a month. 
There were lessons in this about the complicated relation of railroads and nature, but engineers treated the snow and ice as technical problems to be solved by snowsheds in the mountains, snow fences on the plains, and plows on engines to dig through packed snow in the cuts. There was a respite for the railroad in the winter of 1870-71, to 71, but when winter storms hit in 1871-72, to 72, traffic ceased to flow on both the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific for weeks at a time. By early December of 1871, the major passenger depots east of the Sierras resembled small cities under siege. Nothing entered, and nothing left. In mid-December, San Francisco's Christmas was stranded someplace out in the mountains and plains. San Francisco's merchants were short 150 cars of holiday goods, and threatening to ship by Panama hereafter. Then, on December 19th, a heavy storm hit California, taking out bridges, blowing down telegraph lines, and forcing the Central Pacific desperately to reroute traffic within California. By December 21st, the storm had been raging for sixty hours, and the barometer had fallen to the lowest point recorded up to that time in the state. The Central Pacific's workers kept the main line open, but the branch line from Sacramento to San Francisco Bay failed them. It, like other Central Pacific connecting lines, went down in a jumble of lost bridges, mudslides, flooded track, and collapsed embankments. The railroad reached San Francisco only by sending goods from Sacramento by river. The winter became a far worse nightmare for the Union Pacific. The storms that had begun in October created a snow blockade that shut the line entirely for nearly a month starting in mid-December. The blizzards defeated the initial deployment of snow fences and snow plows. The snow in the cuts was so dense and packed that the locomotives pushing the plows broke down. Passengers languished in stranded trains in places they could not even name. Goods did not move. The only benefit to come out of it was the Union Pacific's adoption of rotary plows, giant blades turning on the front of steam engines to clear the cuts. These helped, but they hardly solved the problem. Bad winters plagued the Pacific Railroad throughout the 1870s, but even when the tracks were clear, the steep grades proved a curse. In 1876 it took two engines to haul fifteen passenger cars, five of them empty, over the Sierras. The same engines could haul a slower freight train of nineteen cars, providing the tracks were good. This was the practical limit of a Central Pacific train leaving or entering California. With bad winters stopping transcontinental traffic and steep grades limiting it, there had to be a better route. Cyrus K. Holliday had launched the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad from under the cottonwood trees of Wakarusa Creek in Kansas in the spring of 1869. The railroad ran five miles, but Holliday foresaw the track touching Galveston, Mexico City, San Francisco, and Santa Fe. Its more southerly route would avoid the Pacific Railroad's disastrous encounters with winter. The Atlantic and Pacific confidently claimed a route along the 35th parallel to San Francisco, preferable for its shortness, for its temperate climate, for the abundance of wood, water, and game. The route, in fact, crossed Indian territory and plunged into the Great Plains before taking on hundreds of miles of deserts and mountains. No matter. L. U. Rivas, a promoter and railroad publicist, informed the readers of the Inland Monthly of the important fact that the railroad had for its axis the January isothermal line of 41 degrees. All the great men of Europe and Asia had supposedly appeared within a few degrees of this line, which was the path of empire. The Atlantic and Pacific was thus in harmony with nature herself in accomplishing the destiny or mission of our people on the North American continent. Rivas became something of an expert in discerning the congruence between railway lines, nature, and American destiny. He later performed the same service for the Mexican International. 
Let our second coming into the Mexican nation be like unto a divine mission to regulate and reinvigorate old customs, old ideas, and old institutions, and herald the progress and prosperity, the faith and mental illuminations of our race now dawning upon the Western Hemisphere, which is destined to wrap the world in the new liberty given to mankind by this nation. Roots had multiplied like rabbits during and immediately after the Civil War, and in the early 1870s promoters saw the opportunity to make them real. The U.S. Congress had chartered the Northern Pacific to go from Duluth to somewhere on Puget Sound. A road north of the troubled Pacific Railroad seemed an odd answer to the problems with western winters, but promoters of the road made such claims for the mildness of the climate on the northern plains that skeptics dubbed it the Banana Belt. The Kansas Pacific, designed to be a branch of the Union Pacific, threatened to become a transcontinental in its own right. Promoters pushed for a Canada Pacific Railroad to go, somehow, across the continent from the St. Lawrence to British Columbia. The railroad network expanded rapidly following the war more than doubling in the United States, from 35,085 miles in 1865 to 70,784 in 1873, with peak building between 1870 and 1872. In 1871 alone, the United States added 7,670 miles of railroad. The greatest amount of building centered on Chicago and took place in what is now the Midwest, but railroads west of the Missouri, including Texas, formed a substantial tail of nearly 7,515 miles. The actual railroad network of tracks, bridges, stations, and trains had a doppelganger, a network of promoters and investors who linked together separate lines. Some of these links were obvious. All the big transcontinentals relied on overlapping boards of directors to unite the various lines in their system. Less obvious were the networks that linked together seemingly separate lines. These networks revealed themselves in common members, largely from New York and Boston, of the boards of directors. Eventually membership on railroad boards overlapped with membership on the boards of banks and trust companies, which became a kind of headquarters for organizing these linked investments. So extensive and overlapping were these New York and Boston networks that it is hard to understand how Gilded Age Americans ever thought business was about individualism instead of the social links created by family through kinship and intermarriage or friendship through long-time associations. The railroads drew directors from all over the country, but, again with the exception of the associates, directors drawn from west of the Missouri and even from Chicago were loosely networked, usually serving on a single road. Key Boston directors, however, were tightly networked. They formed three major groups. The one around John Murray Forbes served largely to link together the various Burlington roads, but through Jefferson Coolidge and Charles Payne it linked to a much denser network centered on Thomas Nickerson. The Nickerson network joined together at various times the Atchison, the Mexican Central, the Atlantic, and Pacific. The final group was the Ames family, centered on the Union Pacific. Benjamin Cheney, Charles Payne, Jefferson Coolidge, and Frederick Ames at various moments linked together all three Boston groups and railroads, and roads not so directly connected with Boston capital such as the Chicago and Northwestern, the Missouri Pacific, and the Northern Pacific. The Boston network of the Ames family eventually became linked with a New York network centered on Jay Gould and his associates. In addition, there was a Vanderbilt network that reached west through the Chicago and Northwestern. While the makeup of a single railroad's board of directors changed from year to year, powerful families moved from board to board, sat on multiple boards at once, or had multiple family members sit on the same board at the same time. Certain families maintained influence on railroad boards of directors for decades. They used the boards less to direct the railroads than to manage their investments, culling inside information, and picking the ripest and lowest speculative fruits and insider contracts that the railroads had to offer. Key directors could link railroads and coordinate policy between them.
1. Springtime in Mexico In Canada and Mexico, many politicians reasonably feared that the expansion of the transcontinentals was paving the way for the expansion of the United States. Money, railroads, nation-building, and empire were not easily separated. As W. Milner Roberts, eventually chief engineer of the Northern Pacific, wrote in regard to that road, it will forever settle the question of white supremacy over an area of country covering at least 450,000 square miles. Not all of those 450,000 square miles were necessarily, at least for the moment, within the United States. Thomas Canfield, the engineer who headed the preliminary survey that the Northern Pacific conducted along the Pacific coast in 1870, sought information on a route from Butte Inlet to Vancouver Island, in the event of Vancouver's island ever belonging to the United States. Such an event did not seem unlikely. The only cure for Canadian and Mexican fears of American railroads appeared to be railroads of their own. Railroads could be both routes of invasion, literally and figuratively, and keys to national defense, no matter which railroads in the North American West needed to suck the teats of some state in their infancy, because only this would give them the strength to garner the private capital they also needed. Like that of the United States, the governments of Canada and Mexico offered subsidies for new roads, hoping to reassure investors that what might seem risky enterprises involved no risk at all. To get these subsidies, men gathered in Ottawa and Mexico City, just as they gathered in Washington, D.C. Very often they were the same men, which meant that they were the very Americans whom Canadians and Mexicans feared. What superficially seemed three national systems of railroads would become one. In Mexico, the 1860s charters and proposals for railroads were everywhere. Railroads would give Mexico as glorious a future as the United States, if only the Mexican government would subsidize them so that promoters could build them. The Mexicans were correct in fearing the intentions of many of the Americans behind these proposals. Edward Plum, who had served as the first secretary of the American legation in Mexico City, worked with leading figures in the Pacific Mail Steamship Service to secure a concession for the Mexican Pacific that was to run from Guaymas on the Gulf of California to El Paso, making it the shortest transcontinental of all. George Church, one of Plum's correspondents, mocked Mexican fears of building railroads that might aid American expansion. They do not understand the problem of the age. The United States does not want them nor their territory, but civilization more powerful than the United States will sooner or later force upon them its inexorable dictatorship. They will bend to it and perhaps break under it. Plum agreed, but he also thought that once railroads secured American control over Mexican trade and development, we need not hasten the greater event, by which he meant annexation. There were Mexicans who thought they could ride this tiger. The most prominent among them was Matias Romero, who had been the Juarez government's ambassador to the United States during the dark days of the French invasion of Mexico from 1861 to 1867. He served in President Juarez's cabinet in the late 1860s and early 1870s. William Rosecrans came to Mexico as an ambassador appointed by Andrew Johnson in 1868, but also as an agent for American railroad interests. Johnson's successor, Ulysses S. Grant, had hated his fellow General Rosecrans during the Civil War, and he hated him still. He dismissed him, but Rosecrans stayed in Mexico, lobbying for railroads as a private citizen. He first worked as agent for Tom Scott and J. Edgar Thompson of the Pennsylvania Railroad, seeking aid for a Mexican national railroad anchored on Mexico City that would link El Paso, Tuxpan on the Gulf of Mexico, and Acapulco on the Pacific. It would connect with Tom Scott's as-yet-uncompleted Texas and Pacific. Rosecrans, in the usual manner, invested heavily in Mexican land hoping for his private speculative return when the railroads were built. He sought Mexican wealth, but he was willing to leave its sovereignty intact. Romero became his ally within the Juarez government. 
With the Texas and Pacific floundering, Rosecrans secured a second potential connecting road in the United States, William Jackson Palmer's Denver and Rio Grande. Palmer had served under Rosecrans at Chickamauga and had been the private secretary to Edgar Thompson of the Pennsylvania Railroad before the war. At a time when virtually every railroad promoter in the United States thought east-west, Palmer dreamed north-south. He began building a narrow gauge south from Denver in 1870 and sought to go through El Paso and on to Mexico City. To do so, he sold bonds in Holland on a road with nothing earthly for a basis except the right-of-way, with a success that astonished other promoters. By 1870, however, there was competition from a second group of American investors, some of them formerly associated with the Rosecrans Group and centered on the National City Bank of New York. They proposed a line, the International Railroad, running from Laredo through Monterrey and on to Mexico City. Edward Plum became their man in Mexico City and thus Rosecrans's rival. Mexicans remained torn between the hopes that railroads were the cure to their own weakness and the fear that railroad expansion was only American expansion in a different form and under another name. Juarez died in 1872 and was succeeded by Lerdo, who was as deeply conflicted as Juarez had been. Speaking of the United States and Mexico, Lerdo supposedly said, Between strength and weakness, let us preserve the desert but as president he expressed himself very strongly regarding the value of the railroad in securing control of his borders. Plum wrote that revolts thrived in remote parts of the country, such as the Rio Grande frontier, to which for want of means of communication the power of the government reaches with great difficulty. In 1872, as the concessions hung fire, Palmer and Rosecrans rode the Pacific Railroad west to San Francisco, and then sailed south to the Mexican port of Manzanillo, in the state of Colima. From there they explored a route to Mexico City that would connect with Rosecrans's projected route to Tuxpan. A second party explored and surveyed the route from El Paso to Mexico City. The two routes formed an inverted T, and would connect Mexico City to both oceans and the American border. Traveling with Rosecrans and Palmer was Rose Kingsley. She was one of those scribbling British travelers whose books multiplied across the West like ties across the rails. Yet Palmer's search for a railroad route was more the occasion than the subject of Kingsley's book. Palmer, General R. Rosecrans, and Kingsley's brother, who was Palmer's associate, faded into the background. In Mexico they could not compete with the mountains and countryside and what to Kingsley seemed the exotic qualities of the Mexican people. These Anglo-men and the Mexican gentlemen who aided them never quite vanished behind the fruit, flowers, birds, Indians, haciendas, churches, and bandits, but neither could they force themselves into the foreground. They were never sure what they were seeing or whom they could trust. They were even accompanied part way, as they later claimed, by Porfirio Diaz, whose rebellion against President Juarez had recently been suppressed and who was traveling incognito. The railroad men armed themselves, but then meekly surrendered their rifles to revolutionaries, the pronunciados, in the person of a major and his drunken soldiers. The major breakfasted with them, seeming so embarrassed that Rose Kingsley felt sorry for him, even as she desired to do something unspeakable to him for taking the weapons. Rose Kingsley refused, or even more tellingly just neglected, to give the men in her book the mastery that railroad men gave themselves. Despite their failures and disappointments, railroad men always identified themselves with progress and civilization in their own published accounts. But only at the end of her journey, when she reached Mexico City and encountered an ugly American engine with its wide smokestack, did Kingsley dutifully identify it as a harbinger of law, order, and civilization, and a joyful sight. It was left to her father, Charles Kingsley, the canon of Westminster, to supply the necessary platitudes and flesh out the moral of the journey in his preface to her book. In a couple of long paragraphs he offered the railroad as the key to making Mexico 
the entrepot of a vast traffic, not only between California and New York, but even, so some think, between China and Europe. The combination of foreign capital and that most potent of civilizers, the railroad, would in Mexico and the United States bring a perpetual reinforcement of the good to drive the bad further and further into the yet more desolate wilderness. Everything that appalled, charmed, and interested his daughter would disappear. 2. Springtime in Canada American promoters in Canada inspired similar fears and hopes. The British North America Act of 1867 had created the Canadian Confederation and Clause 141 of the Act obligated Canada to build a road to British Columbia as part of the terms by which that province joined the Confederation. A railroad running parallel to the Northern Pacific understandably aroused the interest of the directors of that road. It also interested J. Cook. If there was a ringmaster in the early Gilded Age circus of hope and greed that the railroads organized in the wake of the Civil War, it would have to be J. Cook. Self-made, patriotic, well-connected, and deeply religious, he was a man whose word was trusted because of his success in marketing the U.S. government bonds that financed the Civil War. Cook recognized that his business in government securities was diminishing, and that he had a national network of agents with time on their hands. American investors, the source of most of his business, were already moving into railroad bonds, lured by men who imitated his techniques. With the government about to retire and refund its debt at lower interest rates, even more investors would be looking for new opportunities. He needed a railroad, and the Northern Pacific needed him. Its only substantial asset was its immense land grant stretching from Minnesota to Washington Territory, across an expanse still largely under Indian control. J. Cook's task was to secure the money to build the road. He became the Northern Pacific's banker and purchasing agent. He agreed to try to sell one hundred million dollars worth of railroad bonds paying seven point three percent interest, but he guaranteed the sale of only five million dollars. He promised to advance the road this five million dollars to begin construction from Duluth within thirty days of signing the contract. Cook was to receive twelve cents on the dollar for every bond sold at par. The railroad was to bear the cost of advertising. He promised further advances of up to five hundred thousand dollars. Cook gained access to a total of sixty percent of the company's stock, but his contract specified that J. Cook and Company could name only two of the thirteen Northern Pacific directors and only a quarter of the members of the executive committee. He did not control the actual operation of the railroad, and this would turn out to be his Achilles' heel. On signing his contract with the Northern Pacific in 1870, Cook had immediately turned around and tried to divide the risk by forming a pool of his twelve ownership shares with each share costing $466,667. A share represented an obligation to buy one-twelfth of the five million dollars in bonds at par. With each share, the purchaser received one-twelfth of the stock issued to Cook and Company. The investors were buying bonds. The stock, which had no market value, was an inducement. Cook sought to attract big investors, but it was a hard sell as his partner, Harris Fonestock, warned it would be. Why take Northern Pacific bonds at par when roads with revenue were selling at below par? Why, in other words, pay 100 for a Northern Pacific when a Central Pacific went for 94, a Union Pacific for 84, and a Missouri Pacific for between 88 and 90? Some of these roads had federal guarantees, and all had tracks and trains, which were among the many things the Northern Pacific largely lacked. Cook did not consider the Canadian's desire for a railroad paralleling his own an obstacle to his plans. Canada's hold on its west was weak. The Confederation's annexation of the old Hudson's Bay Company territory of Rupert's Land sparked the first Red River Rebellion of 1869-70. to Led by Louis Riel, 
the Métis, the descendants of Indians, largely Cree, and Europeans, largely French, negotiated the creation of a new province of Manitoba. In its wake, Americans conspired with the Fenians, Irish nationalists, who were willing to carry the war against Britain to its colonial possessions, in order to weaken the Canadian hold on its west. Cook fished in these troubled waters. He wrote that, the annexation of British North America, northwest of Duluth to our country, could be done without any violation of treaties and brought about as the result of quiet emigration over the border of trustworthy men with families and with a tacit, not legal understanding with Riley and others there. It should be done without violence or bloodshed. The mysterious Mr. Riley was Louis Riel. Cook, apparently confusing him with the Fenians, bestowed upon him an appropriately Irish name. When the Fenians did launch a raid, Cook was unwilling to support it. Neither were the Métis, whose goal was not annexation to the United States. Cook's imperial daydreams, forgotten in the United States, have become part of the Canadian nationalist mythology that has made the Canadian Pacific Railroad the successor to the Canada Pacific the railroad that saved Canada. The iron backbone of a nation, it was a technological triumph that defeated both nature and a powerful and arrogant southern neighbor. The railroad stiffened Canada and held up its western mass, which would otherwise have sagged south into the waiting arms of the United States. The Canadian story makes Canada's Prime Minister, John MacDonald, sometimes drunk, sometimes sober, but always eloquent and resolute, the hero, and J. Cook, the villain. But in the early 1870s, Cook and MacDonald worked together. J. Cook, it turned out, wanted Canadian business and British capital for his Northern Pacific Railroad far more than he wanted an expanded United States. Cook realized that supporting filibusters and scheming to annex Canadian territory was not the most promising route to British capital. He did not want to prejudice English capital in any way. And he thought that, There will be no road built in Canada that will not end at the Sault Ste. Marie in connection with the Northern Pacific Road, which would then convey traffic west to Pembina on the Minnesota-Manitoba border. As for the Canadian railroad that would proceed west from Pembina toward the Pacific, Cook referred to it as the Canadian Pacific Tributary in letters to his agents. It would give traffic to the Northern Pacific, not take it. Cook was counting on the realities of Canadian geography and the dismal track record of British investments in Canadian railroads. Canadian geography was friendly to American railroads, an all-Canadian route would have to run roughly 700 miles through the Canadian Shield along the northern shore of the Great Lakes from Georgian Bay to Thunder Bay. The Canadian Shield was as desolate as it was beautiful. The granite bedrock stunted the forests and beaded water into countless small lakes, and the lakes aged into innumerable muskeg bogs. The population was small and scattered and promised to stay small and scattered, railroad or no railroad. Traversing it would be expensive, and the expense would pay no dividends in increased traffic. How could such a road compete with American railroads, running along the southern shore of the Great Lakes through fat lands, arable and productive, and already dotted with great cities and full of traffic? A route across the Canadian shield seemed, in the words of Alexander Mackenzie, the liberal politician who opposed it, one of the most foolish things that can be imagined. A businessman's railroad would, as J. Cook thought, drop south of the Great Lakes to Chicago and then move back north, west of Lake Michigan, to reach the border and the Red River Valley and the vast prairies and plains stretching west toward the mountains. John MacDonald was a practical man, and he was ready to accept a partial American route, one that avoided the Canadian Shield. The Grand Trunk Railroad was nearly as great an obstacle as the Canadian Shield. Financed by British capital, it already linked Ontario and Quebec with the eastern United States. Deeply in debt, often failing to meet the interest on its bonds, in chronic danger of bankruptcy, constantly in need of subsidy, plagued by inefficiency and dubious accounting, 
It seemingly provided a compelling argument for no further British investment in Canadian railroads. It proved all too successful, however, in attracting British capital. British investors continued to pour money into the Grand Trunk, even as the Grand Trunk issued new bonds to pay the interest on old bonds. By 1872, its ratio of debts to equity was an almost unbelievable twenty-five to one. The ideal ratio was one to one, with each dollar of debt paired with a dollar of equity securing the debt. The British continued to invest because they thought the Canadian government would bail them out. A new subsidized Canada Pacific paralleling the actual and anticipated route of the Grand Trunk threatened the older road's investors and made it difficult to raise British capital. It was probably only a matter of time before Jay Cook and Hugh Allen found each other. Allen was a Montreal shipping magnate who felt overcharged and underserved by the Grand Trunk. He feared that his ships would be shut out by a new steamship line being developed by the Grand Trunk. Francis Hinks, MacDonald's Minister of Finance and a longtime advocate of Canadian-American free trade, brought Allen and Cook together. MacDonald gave the Union his tacit approval. In 1871, Allen reached an agreement with the leading figures of the Northern Pacific. The Canada Pacific, all of whose incorporators were Canadian, gave the Americans a contract to build the Canada Pacific and to form the Canada Land and Improvement Company to develop the expected land grant. They kept this agreement secret. 3. The Indians' Perpetual Winter The Northern Pacific's huge land grant involved J. Cook with the Indians. The Indians of most immediate concern to Cook were the wapaton sisseton Dakotas. In 1871, the Wapaton and Sisseton discovered Northern Pacific surveyors marking a route through unceded land. This upset them, and they stopped the survey. There was nothing Cook could do about this directly, since only the federal government had constitutional authority to acquire land from Indians. By 1871, however, the transcontinentals and the federal government were intertwined on such a variety of levels that it was sometimes hard to distinguish whether particular people were acting in their capacity of government officials or because of their connections to the railroads. William Wyndham of Minnesota was both a U.S. Senator and a member of the Northern Pacific Board of Directors. Gilded Age congressmen routinely suffered crises of conscience in going on railroad payrolls. It would be easier to take these crises seriously if their outcome were not so predictable. It was a ritual of sorts. Moral concerns were raised, the relationship was clarified, the moral rectitude of the official was validated by the very people who had tempted him, and the official became a friend of the railroad. Wyndham worried about the appearance of conflicts of interest in his dual role, but Cook, who was not a man predisposed to irony, assured him there was no impropriety in Wyndham's serving as a director of the road, investing in it, and borrowing the money for that investment from Cook. "'We take it for granted,' Cook wrote Wyndham, that you are an honest man, and will do nothing that is not right strictly, especially when the subject of the Northern Pacific comes before Congress, which is the only possible complication. One of the things that came before Congress in 1871 was the matter of the Wapaton Sisseton. The device invented by Senator Pomeroy of using treaties to give Indian lands directly to railroads at bargain prices had flourished in the wake of the Civil War. The railroad man most adept at elbowing his way to the table was James Joy, then president of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, who managed to obtain the neutral tract of the Cherokee Nation in Kansas for one dollar an acre. The Supreme Court would validate the sale in 1872, and settlers would pay average prices that ranged from $9.15 an acre for the best land in the mid-1870s to $5.45 for the remainder at the end. King Joy, meanwhile, had an even bigger transaction with the Osage, who, unlike the Cherokee, were native to the region. A sale of over eight million acres for twenty cents an acre, nothing down. 
It was this treaty that came before Congress amid huge public uproar in 1871. The uproar was on behalf not of the Indians, but rather of white settlers who wanted those lands without having to pay the railroads a premium for them. The settlers had a case. They had played a crucial role in obtaining such sessions. By treaty and American law, the Indians should have been safe in their occupancy. The squatters had settled the lands illegally, but the United States had refused to evict them and used the invasion as a lever for further sessions. The squatters assumed that the lands would pass in the usual manner from the Indians to the government to the public domain to the squatters, who were now legal preemptors. They had not counted on the railroads. Settlers failed to defeat the Cherokee Treaty, but they not only defeated the Osage Treaty, they brought down the whole treaty system with it by uniting popular grievance with congressional rivalries. The Constitution reserved to the Senate the power to advise and consent on treaties, and the House had long resented being shut out of the treaty system. Since the House had to appropriate money for Indian affairs and land purchases, it used its power of the purse to tack an amendment onto an appropriations bill in 1871, declaring that there would be no new treaties although tribes would retain their status as semi-sovereign nations and existing treaties would be honored. Unable to use the treaty system in 1871 to get wapaton sisseton land in North Dakota for the Northern Pacific, Cook and Wyndham argued that if the treaty system was dead, then Congress should abrogate Indian title unilaterally. Cook had a bill introduced to strip the wapaton sisseton of their land, with Congress determining the price. The bill failed. The treaty system was less dead than in hiding. The House didn't end negotiations. It merely demanded a say in them. The agreements enacted after 1871 looked like treaties, walked like treaties, and even quacked like treaties. But they weren't treaties. They were agreements approved by Indians, the Senate, and the House. The wapaton sisseton negotiations showed how they worked. To get negotiations moving, Cook authorized payments to Assistant Secretary of the Interior, B. R. Cowan. Congress authorized a three-man commission to negotiate with the wapaton sisseton. One of the commissioners was James Smith, Jr., an official of a subsidiary of the Northern Pacific. He, in turn, recommended to Cook that the ex-Indian agent Benjamin Thompson be put on retainer by the railroad to secure Indian approval. Thompson would get $5,000 when the Indians signed, and $5,000 more when the agreement was ratified. Cook, Smith, and Thompson were acting, or so Cook persuaded himself, not just for the good of the railroad and the good of the nation, but also for the good of the Indians. The Northern Pacific was never a road lucky in its employees. Thompson didn't do the railroad much good, but once hired he was retained for fear he could do it harm if angered. Still the Indians, under enormous pressure, agreed to a session. The agreement was submitted to Congress, which substantially altered it. It went back to the Indians for approval, but in 1873 it was caught up in two quarrels. The first was among two Republican factions, the Mugwumps and the Stalwarts, and involved hard feelings left by the 1872 presidential election. Cook mediated it. The second quarrel arose when the Indian agent Moses Adams, also one of the commissioners, refused to give Gabriel Renville and other polygamous tribal leaders annual payments due them under treaties until they banished their extra wives. They, in turn, refused to sign the revised agreement. In nineteenth-century American politics, monogamy beat polygamy hands down, but it did not necessarily beat the railroads. Cook wrote his brother Harry that the Secretary of the Interior should order this gentleman, whoever he may be, to treat all the Indians alike, no matter how many wives they have. Harry talked to Wyndham. Wyndham talked to Secretary Delano, and Secretary Delano wrote Agent Adams. Adams rearranged his priorities. With the ratification of the altered agreement, the Northern Pacific obtained, Cook claimed, at once over five million acres between the Red River and the Missouri intact, not an acre of it lost. 
This of itself is worth a good deal more than the cost of the road on both coasts, all the expenditures up to this date, to say nothing of our other larger grant on the Pacific, and in Minnesota, and the completed railroad. It may have been the only good thing that happened to the Northern Pacific in 1873. It was only one thing on a long list of bad things that happened to Indians. 4. Political Storms Brewing Henry Dawes was a Massachusetts congressman who eventually produced legislation and reports that deprived the Indians of land on a scale even greater than losses to the railroads. In the 1870s, Dawes was not yet an Indian reformer, but he was entangled in a web of friendships that linked Massachusetts business and politics. His relations with textile manufacturers eased his entry into similar relations with railroad men. In 1866, Dawes consulted, took payments, facilitated legislation, and then succumbed to the usual moral alarm. He had to insist that his kind friends recognize that their generous payments to him were in no way inconsistent with official integrity, and would be received without the slightest reference to official conduct. Friendship was lucrative, and his friends had no desire to upset his sensibilities. Dawes had given Oaks Ames $1,035 for ten shares of stock in the Credit Mobilier. Dawes received, over the next six months, eight hundred dollars in Union Pacific bonds, one thousand dollars in Union Pacific stock, and six hundred dollars in cash as dividends on his Credit Mobilier stock. He also received other payments, which may or may not have been related to the Credit Mobilier, since Ames also invested in Iowa railroads for Dawes. In the midst of the presidential campaign of 1872, Charles Dana's New York son proclaimed the Credit Mobilier the King of Frauds. The princes and princesses of frauds during the Grant administration were no slackers, and there were dukes and counts galore. The reason the Credit Mobilier was the king lay a little farther down in the son's layered headline. Congressmen who have robbed the people and now support the national robber. Among those supporting the national robber, the Credit Mobilier, was Henry Dawes. The Springfield Republican picked up the attack, and Dawes lost his bid to become senator from Massachusetts, returning instead to Congress. Ames consoled him, joking that Dawes's new status as the best abused man in the country except Grant, Cameron, Gray, and a few others hurt Ames's pride of place, but he wrote as if Dawes still held stock. What an awful thing it is to own stock in the UPRR company or Credit Mobilier. To the dismay of the accused, the scandal would not die. Senator J. W. Patterson, in rising to his own defense and the defense of the Credit Mobilier, complained that Congress had been occupied during the entire session with the investigation, agitation, and discussion on the subject of these trivial investments. The press never did get the financial details straight, but it did not have to. Congressional attempts to quiet the scandal perversely kept it alive. Congress appointed two committees named after their chairs to investigate the Credit Mobilier, the Poland Committee in the Senate, which tried to keep the hearings secret, and the Wilson Committee in the House. The Wilson Committee investigation of 1873 is as good a marker as any for the beginning of the Annus Horribilis of the North American Transcontinental Railroads. The Credit Mobilier scandal implicated not only the leadership of the Union Pacific Railroad, but also Schuyler Colfax, the Vice President of the United States, James A. Garfield, a congressman who would be a future President of the United States, James G. Blaine, a Speaker of the House who desperately wanted to be President, and a covey of leading senators and representatives who scattered like so many quail for shelter. It was fitting that the members of the Wilson Committee never really understood the details of the railroad financing that they were investigating, and that they allowed most of those implicated to go scot-free. Ignorance was the common currency of the transcontinentals. The promoters of railroads knew little about building them, investors in the railroads had only the shakiest grasp on what they were investing in, 
and the politicians who subsidized them and were supposed to oversee them were often a little unclear on specifics. The essence of the Credit Mobilier, however, was clear. In order to curry congressional favor, the men running the Union Pacific had sold stock in the Credit Mobilier to leading representatives, senators, and the vice president of the United States below market prices. Oakes Ames, curt, belligerent, and often obtuse, was abandoned by his friends. Most implicated congressmen ducked and ran, but they ducked too low, ran too fast, and denied too much. The accused lied so voluminously and so ineptly that simply cataloging and refuting the lies became a full-time occupation for the press. Ames fought back. He opened his memoranda book. It contained names and numbers. Ames had two lines of defense. First, he did not consider his sale of stock to a fellow congressman a bribe. He declared, There is no law and no reason, legal or moral, why a member of Congress should not own stock in a road, any more than why he should not own a sheep when the price of wool is to be affected by tariff. In nineteenth-century politics, as much as now, the side with the best metaphors often wins. Ames had a bad metaphor. There were pretty transparent legal and moral reasons why a member of Congress should not accept an offer to buy a flock of sheep at discount before voting to impose a tariff on wool. Congressmen were acquiring stock through the Credit Mobilier in a corporation they had chartered, one they had to supervise, and which repeatedly came before them for legislation. The elaborate ritual dances of moral probity, engaged in by men like Dawes and Wyndham, were eloquent signs of their own ethical uncertainty. Ames had a stronger second position. He claimed that the stock was not a bribe, because a bribe was a quid pro quo. The distribution of the stock in the Credit Mobilier was about friendship and reciprocity. Ames wanted congressional friends for his enterprises— he was drawing a distinction essential to railroad politics. The railroads distinguished between their friends and those they had to bribe, but the argument advanced by some congressmen that the stock could not have been a bribe because it did not meet the going price for a congressional vote was not helpful in restoring public faith in their representatives. Except for the censure of Ames, a Republican, and James Brooks, the Democratic floor leader, no one was punished, and no money was recovered. This made the scandal all the more lethal and long-lasting. How, Ames wondered, and critics continued to wonder afterwards, could Ames be punished for giving bribes when no one but Brooks was punished for taking them? Jay Cook watched the Credit Mobilier unfold with genuine consternation. Aid to transcontinental railroads had become politically toxic. The scandal removed any immediate possibility that Congress would guarantee Northern Pacific bonds, and it badly hurt Northern Pacific bond sales. The spectacle of a transcontinental looted by insiders did not inspire outsiders to invest in other transcontinentals. And when the Justice Department threatened to recover Union Pacific bonds that had fraudulently passed to the Credit Mobilier, Cook feared that the remedy might be worse than the disease. Such an action, Cook contended, would destroy confidence in railroad bonds, since future buyers could never be sure whether the original sale of bonds had been legitimate. The courts ended that threat by ruling that the United States had no standing for a suit, since the damage had been done to the firm's stockholders and not to the United States. The only remedy available to Congress was revoking the Union Pacific Charter. Congress found other ways to punish the Union Pacific. An 1874 amendment to the General Appropriation Bill forbade the Union Pacific from issuing new stock, or mortgages or pledges made on the property, without leave of Congress. The act left the company at a competitive disadvantage. But it was not just the threat to his immediate interests that bothered Cook. It was the public behavior of railroad men and their friends. Like Dawes and Wyndham, Cook wanted the appearance of moral probity. Privately, this was ensured by the mutual agreement of all involved that what they were doing was honest and upright. But the Credit Mobilier had pushed railroad men and congressmen on a public stage and cracked their consensus. 
Schuyler Colfax, who insisted that he had received no dividends, and Oaks Ames, who claimed that he had paid such dividends to Colfax, could not both be right. The public believed that Colfax had told a whopper. The issue for Cook was not whether Colfax had received dividends from the Credit Mobilier. Colfax had, after all, also invested in the Northern Pacific, which was, Cook assured him, as fine and innocent an investment as ever was made by a mortal man. Cook reasoned that, if a member of Congress is anybody at all, he would be materially interested in some enterprise that came before Congress. The issue was that Colfax and Ames were accusing each other of wrongdoing. It did not matter who was right and who was wrong. Such a public failure to acknowledge their mutual virtue and the compatibility of private profit with public duty would fracture the structure of mutual reassurance and friendship, perhaps beyond repair. 5. Information and Trust Cook knew that his fate rode on the public's perception of his probity and on its trust in his competence and honesty. He wrote the President of the Northern Pacific, You must remember that my responsibility is greater than that of all the rest put together, as the money thus to be expended comes in ninety cases out of a hundred from those who purchase simply on my word, not on the word of J. Cook and Company in this case, so much as my personal reputation. Cook had entered into a contract with his investors. They promised not only to buy Northern Pacific securities, but also not to resell them. They would hold them as a permanent investment. Cook depended on small investors. None of the transcontinentals attracted large outside investors in their formative stages. And by and large, Cook could not attract European investors. The Northern Pacific initially considered Europe the great market for their bonds, but Europe was flooded with bonds offered by every little Dutch house. The Northern Pacific needed a status and credibility these small Dutch and German banking houses could not give them. It required a great house whose recommendation would give them preference. The Northern Pacific never secured the great house it needed. First, the Franco-Prussian War disrupted what looked like successful European negotiations. Then, when negotiations over reparations due the United States for British complicity in the activities of the Confederate raider Alabama threatened war with Great Britain, a second negotiation fell apart. And so Cook turned to his old sales force to sell to the same small investors who had bought Civil War bonds, prosperous merchants and farmers the clergy, Union war veterans, and successful artisans. Herman Melville had imagined the quintessential Gilded Age investment transaction as he had imagined so much of the nineteenth century before it became the norm. All I have to do with you is to receive your confidence, and all you have to do with me is, in due time, to receive it back. Thrice paid in trebling profits. Melville's confidence man had told the old miser, and in a sentence Melville captured the capitalist dilemma of trust, the exchange of cash for a promise. Imagine the old miser as a banker who knows all too much about the confidence man, and there is one outcome. Imagine an investor who knows little and is beguiled, and there is another outcome. The ultimate buyers of most railroad bonds lived at a distance from the railroad that they invested in, and they had no independent knowledge of the seller or the veracity of his claims. An investor encountered a virtual world of financial statements, prospectuses, newspaper accounts, and market values that at once stood in for and was inseparable from the actual railroads of a developing nation. The investor had to trust someone— the problem of trusting strangers was as old as long-distance trade. When a German banker, whose client was heir to a note signed by Huntington, Crocker, Stanford, and Hopkins, tried to ascertain the responsibility and financial ability of said parties through American intermediaries, he was a part of this older world. The new virtual world was, then as now, temptingly easy to manipulate. Numbers and words that were supposed to stand in for things could be changed and still maintain their influence. News could be altered or withheld. 
reports could claim assets that didn't exist and deny trouble that did exist. Altering the numbers and changing the words of this virtual world could prompt actions in the parallel universe where people paid money for bonds. Buying a bond was different from negotiating a promissory note for several reasons. The first was the distance separating buyer and seller. A bond is essentially a corporate promissory note, a claim on the revenue and property of the firm. Unlike a note, however, it is replicated thousands of times over and issued to thousands of people. This replication was one difference between a bond and an IOU and its nineteenth-century banking equivalent, an accommodation loan. Another was that bonds ran for fixed periods of time, whereas a short-term note was subject to call at any time. Finally, an accommodation loan not only was endorsed by a borrower but was guaranteed by other endorsers. The guarantee of a railroad bond was usually only the revenue and property put in trust to secure the bond, but at times a parent company would guarantee the bonds of its subsidiaries. In terms of personal relations, a bond was to an accommodation loan what a commercial greeting card was to a personal letter. A person drawing up an IOU, like someone sending a personal letter, usually has an existing relationship with a specific recipient. But those who issue bonds or produce greeting cards do not know the purchasers, and usually have no specific recipient in mind. In the 1860s and 1870s, the bond market overwhelmed this world of individual promissory notes with millions of pieces of printed paper. The bonded debt of American railroads rose from $416 million in 1867 to $2,230 million in 1874, and then, pausing after the Panic of 1873, to $5,055 million in 1890. The majority of these funds came from within the United States, but there was significant investment from Great Britain, the Netherlands, and Germany. The railroads needed banking houses to sell their bonds because, on the whole, there was little reason for investors to trust railroad promoters. Investors knew, although they might not have been able to articulate it, that information was asymmetric and that the men who ran the transcontinentals knew more about their condition and prospects than they were willing to tell. Banking houses had more ability to get information. That is why they became the intermediaries. The most trusted bankers, however, were not willing to get involved with the transcontinentals. Germany became the major European source of capital for the transcontinentals, but the German houses were not willing to take the American claims on faith. In 1872, Philipp Speyer and company forced the Central Pacific, by then nearly a decade old, to issue its first stockholders' report. Such, Speyer's agent Henry Schuster wrote, as was made by every other railroad in the world over fifty miles long. Schuster threatened, Huntington reported, not to buy or recommend his friends to buy any of our securities. The Central Pacific joined other American roads in the production of one of the nineteenth century's great fictional genres, the annual Stockholders' Report. Corporate reports were designed to sell stock and bonds. They gave information for a purpose which some of the dimmer lights in the railroad hierarchies did not always understand. Either from unusual honesty or from normal carelessness, Leland Stanford listed all the company's debts, the principal and interest owed the federal government, in his draft of the 1872 Central Pacific Annual Report. In a sentence in which the reader can almost hear Huntington's long-suffering sigh, he wrote, I shall strike the interest out, unless I get the reasons why they were put in, as this report is to help the sale of stock, and this item of, say, eighty million dollars is not in that direction. The railroads would have liked to have a monopoly of information, but they did not. The greatest threat to them was the Associated Press. To a modern reader, a small antebellum newspaper might seem nothing but an archaic version of Google News, a compendium of articles clipped from other newspapers. The process took time and was the result of innumerable choices by separate editors, so there was no telling how far or where a particular piece of news would spread. As a means of relaying information, it was slower than private correspondence. 
The New York Associated Press originated from a consortium of seven New York newspapers that banded together in 1846 to centralize the gathering and dissemination of foreign news. The Associated Press had its own reporters, but its major role was to collect and cull news published elsewhere. It was a combination of low-tech, passenger pigeons released from incoming ships, and high-tech, telegraph lines that sped information to New York and then out of New York to newspapers that subscribed to the service. By the 1850s, the NYAP had gone national, with regional associations funneling news into New York, which then redistributed a digest to subscribing papers. The service's great power came from the special low rates it received from Western Union and its control over which papers received the digest. After the war it survived conflicts between its regional affiliates and reached an accommodation with an emerging rival, the United Press, to maintain a monopoly on telegraphic news transmission. Commercial and political news formed the bread and butter of the Associated Press. The power of its agents, and for that matter of the Western Union operators who transmitted the news over the lines at night, was limited but real. Major news items almost always went through, although scandals embarrassing to Republican politicians might be suppressed. Minor news items, such as lawsuits against railroads or political attacks that might affect securities, were left to the discretion of Associated Press agents. Investors became extraordinarily attentive readers because the Associated Press was creating a national market by making information about prices and conditions almost instantly available. James Simonton was manager of the Associated Press, and he haunted Collis P. Huntington, J. Cook, and other railroad men because he had power beyond that of any single newspaper editor or publisher. The associates of the Central Pacific believed that Simonton, who was also partial owner of the San Francisco Bulletin, hated them. Most of California hated them. What distinguished Simonton was that his hatred could cost them money. Simonton could have articles unfavorable to the Central Pacific published in the Bulletin, and then he could have them selected for the AP Digest that went out over Western Union to all members of the Associated Press. Such articles hurt Huntington's ability to borrow. We have large amounts to pay, and it is very difficult to get money here, and then such articles as was published in the SF Bulletin of January 19th are republished in the New York Sun, and then that paper sent everywhere by Simonton hurts our borrowing money here, New York, no doubt more than there, San Francisco. By 1871, Huntington was convinced that the Western Union operators had orders not to send any information favorable to the Central Pacific. At least in the short term, a newspaper was able to make or ruin, deflate or inflate, the value of securities. The men who ran the transcontinentals cared nearly as much about newspapers as about their securities, because newspapers and financial papers were connected. I seriously wish that some legislative measure could be passed which would make the shooting of reporters wholly justifiable on sight, punishable by a fine not exceeding ten dollars. Charles Francis Adams, president of the Union Pacific, wrote to Charles Perkins of the Burlington. William Mao, who in the 1880s became Collis P. Huntington's right-hand man, claimed Huntington avoided the typewriter and had all of his correspondence written out in longhand because printed pages reminded him of newspapers, and newspapers always failed to make an impression. What Huntington said, however, was never an infallible guide to what Huntington did. He read newspapers very carefully. The lies retold and told in the press made investors nervous and hurt railroad securities. The rise and fall of securities measured the impact of information, but at the same time their rise and fall was itself information that could be manipulated. When falling bond prices indicated that an investment was risky, Huntington intervened to buttress bond prices so that they seemed to shout security. The news from Cal, as published in this morning papers, is not very satisfactory. Huntington wrote Hopkins in September of 1873. 
and it will all be telegraphed by Simonton to Europe in hopes of hurting our securities in that market. Huntington countered by buying Central Pacific securities. Today something over 100,000 of CP bonds, and the market closed 108th bid and none offered. This will go by Reuters news agency over the cable tonight, and an advance of seven-eighths since yesterday on the CP in this market will more than counterbalance any political news from Cal that they can send. Cook had not gone into the northern Pacific planning to deceive investors. He promised that this would be a safe, pay-as-you-go proposition. He had assured his partner and brother-in-law, William Moorhead, who opposed taking on the northern Pacific, that he had no intention of carrying a great transcontinental railway upon our backs. As Harris Fonestock understood the proposal, We do not propose to advance money at all in this construction, but to work upon a strictly cash basis, and gauge the building of the road by the funds on hand, the condition of the country, and to keep in view the idea of making it self-sustaining. Anthony Trollope traveled through the United States during the early 1870s when railroad promotions like the Northern Pacific were everywhere in the press and in private conversation. Trollope took in the talk, the promises, the fantasies, and the utter carelessness of such promotions, and distilled them in 1875 into his great novel, The Way We Live Now. Trollope put his fictional South Central Pacific and Mexican Railway under the direction of a group of arbitrary, powerful, greedy, heedless, and not particularly bright men, who, but for their noble birth, could have been pulled from many actual Western Railroad boards of directors. Trollope grasped the greed, the corruption, and the misplaced hopes that started the railroads off in life with debts that their traffic could not sustain. J. Cook was no Augustus Melmott Esquire, the financier of Trollope's novel, not least because Melmott was a shadowy figure and J. Cook was well known. Yet read more than a century later, Cook's correspondence exudes a salesman's confidence reminiscent of Melmott. When talking to investors he said one thing, when talking to his partners he said another. He probably believed both. Cook told himself and others that the Northern Pacific was a perfectly safe investment. The more I look at them, he wrote Moorhead in 1871, the better I am satisfied that they are the best bonds in the world. But more astonishing than regarding the bonds as a safe thing, Cook regarded the Northern Pacific as a relatively small thing. Like so many men coming out of the Civil War, everything they did later was dwarfed by that gigantic struggle. J. Cook had dealt, and continued to deal, in thousands of millions of dollars through his marketing of government bonds. The Northern Pacific seemed to him, in the words of William Moorhead, a mere bagatelle. A man who had handled those thousands of millions would look upon fifty millions of dollars as a comparatively small amount. Cook put ten percent of all his firm's profits into an account for Old Patriarch Jacob, which he distributed to charity. Cook listened to his god, but he should have listened to his partner, Harris Fonestock. Fonestock was a relatively young man in the 1870s. Later pictures of him, small, dapper, with a Van Dyke beard, give him the quality of a human exclamation point. He was a man who insisted on being heard. He never considered the Northern Pacific a small thing. He understood the dangers it presented all too well. Fonestock understood that Cook was lying to his partners, lying to his investors, and perhaps most dangerously of all, lying to himself. Fonestock was in reality what bankers presented themselves to be, an honest and prudent man. He recognized that the house of Cook was on the edge of a whirlpool, and he wanted to pull back. Fonestock's letters to Cook grew blunter and more hectoring as the Northern Pacific's drafts on the House of Cook grew greater and greater. The original contract limited such drafts to five hundred thousand dollars, but the management of the Northern Pacific was as careless as it was incompetent. Cook eventually replaced the road's hopeless president, J. Gregory Smith, like Leland Stanford of the Central Pacific, an ex-governor, with George W. Cass, but despite his promises to his partners, he advanced funds far beyond the promised limit.
Fanastock wanted to force the Northern Pacific to resort to the market to finance its short-term debt, but the railroad continued to come to Cook. By the summer of 1872, as workers built between the Red and Missouri Rivers, the Northern Pacific's debt to J. Cook & Company had reached $1,583,000, more than three times the agreed-on limit of $500,000. By the summer of 1873, when the road reached the Missouri, with an additional sixty-six miles built between Puget Sound and the Columbia River, the debt had reached nearly seven million dollars. The security for the loans was the bonds Cook was finding it more and more difficult to sell. Fonestock could not have been clearer about what Cook was doing and where it would take him and the firm. In June of 1872, Fonestock had told his senior partner that Cook was morally liable to every man and woman holding the bonds for the proper economical application of all the money received and for verification of all the statements contained in our publications. Fonestock enumerated the deceptions that Cook had perpetrated on a class of investors who have been influenced by Cook's personal recommendation. Cook had assured investors of the intelligence, vigor, and economy of the management. We know that it has been inefficient, distracted, and extravagant to the last degree. He had described the land grants as rich and valuable, but a large proportion were practically valueless, either for cultivation or for lumbering, and the rest were less valuable than the public have been led to believe. Publications promoting the bonds had promised rapid marketing of the lands for the security of investors. The railroad had, as of June 1872, received exactly $338.76 in cash for the lands. The Northern Pacific had claimed a comprehensive system to promote immigration. Such claims were lies. Such extravagant claims, he wrote, had actually deterred capitalists from investing and Cook was selling not to moneyed men, but almost exclusively to persons who rely upon our recommendation rather than upon their own judgment. Fonestock saw discredit, if not ruin, ahead. The ruin Fonestock feared would, like railroad promotion, be transnational. Canada, too, had an election in 1872, and the Canada Pacific became a threat to John Macdonald's Conservative Party. The Canada Pacific was centered on Quebec, its terminus, and offered nothing to powerful Ontario interests. Those interests responded by chartering a second railroad, the Inter-Oceanic Railway, and promoting it as a road free from American influence. The choice between the Canada Pacific and the Inter-Oceanic thus became a choice between Quebec and Ontario, framed as a choice between American intervention and Canadian independence which was in turn framed as a choice between the Conservatives and the Liberal Party. Framed this way, the Conservatives would lose Ontario. The Conservatives reformulated their position. They chartered both the Canada Pacific and the Interoceanic Railway, allowing both roads to dip into the United States, but funding neither. MacDonald's cabinet publicly denounced American participation in the Canada Pacific. Privately, however, the Conservatives continued to accommodate Hugh Allen. MacDonald's Conservative Party, like Grant's Republican Party, which was dunning Cook, needed money for the 1872 election. MacDonald's ally George Cartier approached Allen for campaign funds. If Allen gave the funds, he would get the presidency of the new consolidated company and the contract to build the road. The contract would bring fifty million acres of land and a thirty million dollar subsidy. Allen informed his American associates in the summer of 1872 that their stock would have to stand in his name for some time. The Americans were not worried. Their plan was to retreat into the shadows, let Parliament debate, and then emerge stronger than ever. It seemed a good plan. Allen contributed $350,000, and this money, spent liberally for votes, allowed MacDonald and the Conservatives to squeak through the 1872 election. When the proposed merger failed, in large part because the Inter-Oceanic continued to contend that Allen was a wedge for Northern Pacific participation, MacDonald arranged a whole new company, 
the Canadian Pacific, with Hugh Allen as president and with representatives on the board from all the provinces, to build the railroad. Only in January of 1873 did Cook mention a hitch in Canada. Rumors were circulating that Allen would dump the Americans. Cook remained sanguine. Intermediaries assured him that the exclusion of the Americans was more form than substance. He recognized that they needed to manage Allen, but he also knew that because Canada and England are both jealous of the connection with the Northern Pacific, Allen had to act cautiously. Allen's attempt to raise English capital from Morton, Rose, and Company would, as Cook correctly judged, fail. In the end, the Canadian Pacific would have no choice but to cooperate with the Northern Pacific. Cook continued to believe that Sir Hugh was highly friendly, and if he could act independently, would act at once in cooperation with the Northern Pacific. On April 2, 1873, as the Credit Mobilier investigation continued in the United States, the Honorable Lucius Seth Huntington, member for Shefford in Quebec, rose in the Canadian Parliament and accused Hugh Allen of having advanced large sums of money to the Conservative Party in exchange for a railroad charter. Government ministers had accepted the money, knowing that Allen was merely a front man for a company owned and controlled by Americans. Virtue came late to Mr. Huntington in such matters. The preceding fall he had been corresponding with Jay Cook about investing in the very railroads he now saw as a threat to Canadian sovereignty. MacDonald himself moved to establish a committee to investigate. In the words of the Governor-General of Canada, the Pacific Scandal of 1873 involved charges of no less a crime than that of having sold Canada's most precious interests to certain American speculators, with a view to debauching the Canadian constituencies with the gold obtained as the price of their treachery. MacDonald was initially confident that he could delay and control the investigation, but he had to take care of potentially damning evidence. Hugh Allen, a man whose imprudence, in MacDonald's words, almost mounted to insanity, had put quite a bit in writing, including how he came to be promised the charter. The recipient of much of this correspondence was George W. McMullen, a Canadian businessman who had acted as an intermediary with the Americans. Allen bought back the correspondence for $37,500 in American dollars. McMullen got $20,000 immediately. The second payment was to be made when Parliament adjourned without ever seeing the letters. It would never come. On July 4, 1873, the Toronto Globe and the Montreal Herald published the letters that Hugh Allen thought he had bought from George McMullen. This was followed on July 17th with an account from McMullen that linked MacDonald and his government directly to Allen's payments to the Conservative Party in exchange for the Charter. John MacDonald had been drunk a good deal of the fall of 1872, and did not remember, or claimed not to remember, all he had done or agreed to do, but he also unfortunately put some of his agreements in writing. He had clearly promised Allen the railroad charter, and Allen received it, but only after promising MacDonald a purge of the Americans. MacDonald might have evaded direct blame if the secretary of John C. Abbott, the man who had arranged the purchase of the McMullen letters, had not rifled Abbott's safe and sold letters he found to the Liberal Party. They were published as evidence of the truth of McMullen's story. Things spun out of control in a wonderfully bizarre Canadian way. MacDonald got drunk and disappeared. He returned, as he always did, the master of parliamentary politics. He managed to keep Parliament from any more than a token meeting in August, and secured the investigation by a royal commission dominated by his political allies. But his hold grew shakier as both public support and the support within his own party weakened. He put his faith in the age and ineptitude of the royal commission, whose elderly judges lacked, as the governor-general put it, the disemboweling powers which are rife in young cross-examining counsel. The witnesses' bowels stayed safely intact. Their testimony droned and meandered like a fly circling a warm room. The Commission did its best to sedate Canada. It took evidence, 
contradictory, equivocating, and in many cases simply perjured, and then published it. It offered no summary and no conclusion. When the Governor-General sent the account off to the Colonial Secretary in London, he reported, A greater amount of lying and baseness could not well be crammed into a smaller compass. In early November, MacDonald resigned. His government fell, and he passed over into the parliamentary opposition. By the end of the summer of 1873, the Western Railroads had, within the span of two years, ended the Indian treaty system in the United States, brought down a Canadian government, and nearly paralyzed the U.S. Congress. The greatest blow remained to be delivered. The railroads were about to bring down the North American economy. 6. THE LONG WINTER at the beginning of 1873, if maps were to be believed, railroads crisscrossed the continent. Harbors on the Pacific coast opened their mouths to receive the trade of Asia. Quiet places like San Blas, Acapulco, and Guaymas in Mexico, and San Diego in California prepared to become bustling cities. Places that barely existed as organized non-Indian communities— Tacoma in Washington Territory, and Granville, Port Simpson, and Waddington Depot in British Columbia, became potential railroad termini and imagined the world at their door. San Francisco, the only city worthy of the name on North America's Pacific coast, trembled before the attempt of the Central Pacific Railroad, which regretted its earlier decision to terminate at Sacramento, to get a government grant of Goat Island in San Francisco Bay. If the associates succeeded, they would create their own port and leave San Francisco isolated and commercially irrelevant. There were maps to detail these routes, congressional or parliamentary bills in the United States, Mexico, and Canada authorizing massive transfers of land, money, and credit to support them, stock certificates signifying ownership of the roads, and bonds representing money lent to these roads. All that was lacking on most of these roads was tracks and trains. All Western railroads, actual and imagined, were highly leveraged operations. They had accrued more debt than they could pay through operating profits and depended on continued borrowing to meet their obligations. Any diminishment in their ability to borrow meant disaster. Shut off the flow of capital to operating railroads and they would rust, rot, and shrivel. Today, when what remains of the old transcontinentals is so resolutely material— the lines of their tracks, the old engines and cars often lovingly restored in parks across the West, the stations that have become restaurants or museums. It is easy to forget that they were as much matters of information and trust as they were constructions of wood, steel, and stone. When railroads failed, what first broke down was not the machines and tracks, but the networks of trust that provided the funds that built the railroads, and fueled the economy that set people and goods in motion. By late 1872, the ability to draw in new funds to keep this cycle of borrowing going was coming to an end. European investors were losing their enthusiasm for unfinished American railroads. The federal government's policy of refunding its debt by retiring wartime bonds and gradually removing greenbacks from circulation was tightening the money supply. The large negative trade balance that the United States had with Great Britain was causing gold to flow east across the Atlantic, thus cutting down available American capital. Much of Europe's move to the gold standard and the resulting rise in the price of gold further increased the movement of gold out of the United States. James Lees summarized the situation in a letter to William Ralston of the Bank of California. The enormous amount of European capital sent to this country, i.e. the United States, of late years, a great deal of which has been wasted in extravagance and ill-spent in wildcat enterprises such as railroads through deserts, beginning nowhere and ending nowhere, bearing interest which has heretofore been reinvested here but now will probably be remitted together with heavy trade balances against this country, will all tell on our gold supply. To meet this demand, we probably have less than at any time within the last twenty-five years, so that the whole thing looks very serious to me indeed. William Ralston knew more about the Central Pacific than anyone but the Associates. 
When the associates wrote overdrafts on his and other banks, Ralston knew it. When the Central Pacific bought locally on credit, he knew it. Merchants exchanged the railroad's notes at the banks for ready cash, with the banks discounting the notes. The difference between the face value and what the merchant received was an interest charge. If the Central Pacific failed to pay a note, the merchant or contractor who cashed it at the bank was responsible to the bank. The ring of men surrounding the bank, as Mark Hopkins of the Central Pacific complained, know all about our business here. They knew what the associates owed, whom they owed it to, and what rates they were paying. There was nothing but the perplexities of it that they didn't know. Above all, Ralston knew that the associates were trying to sell the road. Huntington offered the Central Pacific, a road capitalized at $135 million, which claimed to have $59,644,000 in paid-up stock, which, of course, it did not, and nearly $7 million in annual net earnings, to A. A. Cohen, Michael Reese, and the ring of financiers centered on the Bank of California for $20 million, with only $2 million to $4 million down. Cohen's partners offered $11 million, and Huntington broke off negotiations. Huntington contemplated merging the Central Pacific with the Union Pacific, but that too failed. Ralston and Cohen knew that the Central Pacific was a road that had greater debts and obligations than assets and revenue. In times of easy credit, the associates could borrow new money to meet old obligations. When credit tightened, they were in trouble. In December of 1872, the associates of the Central Pacific faced payments of slightly more than two million dollars in interest due on January 1, 1873, alone. In addition, they had considerable floating debt. This was not public knowledge. Their annual report listed only $2,722,244 in interest payments due for the entire year, and does not seem to have listed the floating debt at all. They owed the three San Francisco banks with which they did business $1,850,000, all of it subject to call, and all the bankers were professing to be in need of coin. The failure to pay any part of it would bring an immediate demand that they pay all of it. And finally, there were taxes. It seems to me, Hopkins wrote, financial dishonor is unavoidable, and that can scarcely fail to bring a general collapse. Knowing the road's condition, Ralston demanded more collateral. In December of 1872, he got Stanford to promise that Huntington would place either one million dollars or two hundred thousand pounds sterling with Lees and Waller in New York for credit on their San Francisco account. Stanford's preference in any crisis was to do nothing. Actually, at any time his preference was to do nothing. If damned, Mark Hopkins wrote, Stanford will be condemned for leaving undone those things that he might have done. Although Stanford saw Huntington in New York soon after making his promise to Ralston, Huntington claimed that Stanford neglected to tell him of the agreement. Stanford intercepted telegrams to Huntington about the crisis, and Huntington discovered them only by accident. Stanford had found them so disagreeable that he was not going to show them to Huntington. It was not, Huntington noted wearily safe to do business with him, or, in other words, trust him to do anything. Huntington was unable to borrow in New York, and only when A. A. Cohen persuaded Michael Reese to borrow fifty thousand pounds sterling at one and one-quarter percent interest per month, which Reese then lent to the associates at slightly higher interest, was the railroad granted a reprieve. J. Cook, too, felt the pressure, but he maintained his characteristic optimism about eventual success and denounced Fonestock for his constant croaking. In the early 1870s, the United States was still a largely agricultural country, and the natural rhythms of planting and harvest acted like the moon on financial tides. Farmers withdrew money or took out loans to finance planting and harvest in the spring and fall, and to meet these demands, country banks withdrew their deposits from their correspondent banks in New York. In winter and summer, unused funds flowed back to New York because of the interest its banks offered. The city banks, in turn, lent this money out to businessmen, investors, and brokers, but it was liable to call at any moment. 
When Collis P. Huntington told his associate Mark Hopkins, Call for as little money in April as you well can, because April is usually the most unsettled and hardest month in the year in which to get money, unless it is October. He was referring to this seasonal ebb and flow of money, that made commercial capital more abundant in winter and summer, and much scarcer in fall and spring. Spring and fall were the seasons of financial crisis. Borrowers were liable to have their loans called in, and bankers needed to make sure that the securities they held were liquid and easily converted into the money that their own depositors required. This was the principle that Jay Cook insisted informed his own banking methods. He was sanctimonious about it, and his letters to his partners concerning it sounded like sermons. I have passed through so much trial and tribulations during the last thirty-three years in banking that I cannot but feel that our duty to God, who has so graciously blessed us in all things, and our duty also to our customers and our government, is that we should keep our hands entirely free from all loans, investments, or enterprises that are not cash at an instant's notice, even in the midst of a fearful panic. What J. Cook preached, however, he no longer practiced. The loans to the Northern Pacific could not be turned into cash when, in the fall of 1872, New York speculators attempted to capitalize on the shortage of currency and corner greenbacks. Extorting extravagant charges from those in need of cash, they were on the verge of causing a banking panic in New York. As drafts from the Northern Pacific and Associated Railroads continued to flow in, and its deposits continued to flow out, the New York branch of J. Cook & Company faced disaster. It had to borrow, but borrowing was virtually impossible because no one had cash to lend. Cook's political connections saved him. The assistant secretary of the treasury, William Richardson, happened to be visiting Cook's estate at Ogance outside Philadelphia when the crisis broke. Cook persuaded him to buy back government bonds in New York, releasing greenbacks into the system. Through his brother Harry in Washington, Cook made sure that the Treasury monitored the situation, relieving the shortage, making borrowing possible, and saving Cook and company. The episode shook Cook. You could hear the thunder and feel the wind by early 1873. Collis P. Huntington was a hard man, tough, remorseless, seemingly as impervious to the world around him as a rhinoceros, but in early 1873 he wrote Hopkins, Things look bad. I am doing all I can to get matters straight, and think I shall succeed. But I am not well, and I do not think that I have had twelve hours sleep in the last three weeks. A kind of nervous unrest came over Huntington. He feared he would soon be unfit for business. He was ready to get out of all active business. It was time, he advised Leland Stanford, to retire and enjoy their gains, even if they sold the Central Pacific for only half its real worth. The Crockers had already departed. After Edwin's stroke, the Crocker brothers left the company entirely, although Charlie would return in 1873, when the other associates could not meet the final payment owed him for his share. It didn't matter where one turned in 1873. In the United States, Canada, or Mexico, the same grandiose plans, continental ambitions, secret negotiations, and financial maneuvers that tied together political leaders and corporate promoters of the transcontinentals were unraveling. The heady mixtures of nationalism, greed, necessity, and ambition were inexorably slipping out of control. The political connections that saved J. Cook in 1872 an election year, did him less good the following fall. Cook's voluminous correspondence breaks off in 1873, and although he later denied it, he must have known that the storm would break. He cut his asking price for bonds. His attempt to organize a new syndicate to buy the remaining 730s, as the 7.3% bonds were called, at 83 instead of par, failed. The clearest sign of his trouble was his absence from Gibraltar, his estate on an island in Lake Erie. He routinely came to the island for several weeks in the spring and fall when the fish were running. Fishing and praying were the hallmarks of Gibraltar, and when Cook was not in residence he made the estate available to Protestant clergy. The ministers were there on September 18, 1873, when news reached Gibraltar that their loved and generous host had failed. 
On September 15th, Cook was entertaining President Grant at his Ogon's estate. On September 19th, he was issuing orders to close his mansion at Gibraltar. His fall was that rapid. William Richardson certainly knew that a crisis was coming, but only in the dim way of a man who might dismiss a tidal wave as a high tide. Anticipating the usual autumn stringency, the Treasury Department had sold gold and accumulated currency to ease the squeeze in the fall by purchasing bonds and thus supplying cash to the markets. This was more necessary than ever because, in the words of the economist William Timberlake, declining reserves in New York banks meant that nearly constant volume of circulation and deposits was perched on a smaller and smaller pivot of reserves. Richardson did purchase bonds as the panic set in, but he did not think it well to undertake to furnish from the Treasury all the money the frenzied people may call for. Confidence, he said, was to be entirely restored only by the slow, cautious process of gaining better knowledge of true values, and by conducting business on a firmer basis, with less inflation and more regard to real soundness and intrinsic values. His abandonment of Treasury Secretary Boutwell's policy of letting the economy grow up to the Civil War money stock represented an abandonment of Cook, who until his death denounced hard money and the gold standard as a source of suffering and ruin. With the refusal of the Treasury to intervene, the full impact of the Anus Horribilis fell upon the railroads. The advances to the Northern Pacific Railroad made the House of Cook incapable of meeting the call of country bankers who tried to withdraw their funds to finance the harvest. The tightening money market left Cook and his partners incapable of borrowing the money they needed. When on September 18, 1873, the New York branch of the House of Cook shut its doors, the other branches followed. Their failure triggered the Panic of 1873, which led to the Depression that paralyzed the economy. Credit tightened and prices fell. The coal and iron industries suffered along with the railroads. Half the American iron foundries had closed by the end of 1874. Bankruptcies doubled, from 5,183 in 1873 to 10,478 in 1878. Above all, it was a railroad depression. In 1874, new railroad construction in the United States fell to 1,911 miles, and both passenger and freight revenue began to decline. Between September 20, 1873, when the House of Cook collapsed, and the end of the year, 25 railroads with $150,233,250 in outstanding bonds defaulted. In 1874, 71 followed, with a bonded debt of $262,366,701, and another 25 having $140,448,214 in outstanding bonds, defaulted in 1875. Railroad stock prices fell by 60% between 1873 and 1878. The fledgling transcontinentals halted where they were, usually in the middle of nowhere. Governments fell with the railroads. The Depression cost the Republicans their control of Congress in the elections of 1874. In Canada, Allen surrendered the charter of the Canadian Pacific in late October 1873. For Jay Cook, the Canadian Pacific had never been anything more than the tail of his northern Pacific dog. By September, that dog was, for all practical purposes, dead, and by then railroads were falling all across the continent. In Mexico the railroads died with a whimper rather than a bang. Edward Plum, the agent of New York Capital in Mexico, having successfully negotiated a contract with President Lerdo, believed that the next session of the Mexican Congress would bring the approval he coveted. He still believed that on October 11, 1873 when he received in Mexico City a shipment of New York newspapers current to September 27th. They had the details of the financial storm, which so suddenly and violently has swept over the U.S. Plum hoped, the worst is now over and the atmosphere may become all the more clear after the storm. But the financial skies would not clear for years, and Plum's failure to get his contract approved by the Mexican Congress actually came as a relief.
An opposing Mexican company argued that the financial crisis in the United States made it impossible for Americans to raise the necessary money, and that Mexico would do better to seek English capital. Plum was certain his rivals could not raise the necessary funds, but Congress's decision to give them the contract left him relieved that he had not to take up such a load at present. 7. Stories of the Fall It would be edifying to see the Panic of 1873, as Secretary Richardson did, as a reinstitution of financial discipline, business rectitude, and true values. Sinners and the righteous, however, tumbled down into this particular economic hell together, and those who survived were less virtuous than lucky. Overcapitalized, mismanaged, and often ill-conceived, all the transcontinentals were fit for perdition. But the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific survived. The Union Pacific survived thanks to Jay Gould. During the panic he purchased stock in the Union Pacific, which was tottering on the brink of bankruptcy. In cooperation with Sidney Dillon, its president, he immediately executed a scheme to save the road from defaulting on its bonds. He did so, characteristically, by threatening to default. He had Dillon announce to the income bondholders that they would not be paid. Dillon offered to take their bonds in exchange for new sinking fund bonds at lower interest. This could have been a quite legitimate piece of finance, but Dillon and Gould secretly formed a pool to buy the income bonds that many holders were now eager to sell. They also secretly intervened in the market to boost the price of the sinking fund bonds. They took no risk. Union Pacific guaranteed that any losses the pool suffered would be made up by the company. It was a wonderful piece of insider dealing. Gould profited, investors lost, and the savings were used to lower the floating debt. Collis P. Huntington saved the Central Pacific only through ruthlessness and blind luck. More than once, Huntington teetered on the edge of defaulting on notes that would have brought the whole pyramid of debt tumbling down upon him. At the end of September, overwhelmed by work and worry, even he seemed ready to succumb. I stay in my office, not knowing just what to do. He let his eastern road, the Chesapeake and Ohio, fail, which brought down the Central Pacific's bankers, Fisk and Hatch. This should have been the end of the Central Pacific, for Fisk and Hatch had lent the railroad three million dollars that it could not repay. Fisk and Hatch had hypothecated these bonds to larger banks, and when these bankers found out how much the Central Pacific owed, they realized that the bonds they had taken as diamonds were really so much glass. They were persuaded it would be best to stay quiet and grant Fisk and Hatch a reprieve, three years to repay their loans. They would not force Fisk and Hatch to call in the Central Pacific loan, which would have driven that road into receivership. While this saved the Central Pacific, Huntington summed up the downside. It has hurt us as it has destroyed their, Fisk and Hatch's power, to borrow for us, and then our owing them so large an amount hurt us, as it was known to their largest creditors who were prominent bankers. Everyone agreed to lie. The utilitarian fictions of capitalism are apparent when the annual report for the Central Pacific Railroad for 1873, and the report of the railroad's bankers, Fisk and Hatch, two Central Pacific bondholders in January of 1874, are compared with the less imaginative letters exchanged among the associates. On January 1, 1874, Fisk and Hatch published numbers that assured investors that the Central Pacific had a large surplus from earnings, more than enough to cover its bonded debt. It didn't mention other debts. The Central Pacific, the bankers reported, maintained undiminished, its unaccustomed prosperity in management, resources, and revenues. The Central Pacific's annual report for 1873 remained as reassuring as ever. The financial and business prospects of your company were never brighter. In November of 1873, however, Hopkins wrote Huntington that it was impossible to save out of it revenues enough to pay the CP January interest. In December he had resigned himself to trying to pay the interest by not paying workers or taxes, by robbing Peter to pay Paul. Two different stories were told about the result of the debacle of 1873. The railroad journals, as business journals must, found the bright side. Railroads might fail, 
promoters might fall, and investors might lose, but the tracks themselves survived. In 1877, the railway age gave such an account. Investors have lost, but the American public has won because the United States has the railroads. They are built and in operation, and the owners cannot take them away, even if they want to. Had personal losses secured a larger good, a national railroad network? Had, in effect, misinformation and financial corruption worked for the benefit of the nation? In answer, John Murray Forbes, whose Burlington roads were edging west, told another story. He complained that the loans had gone out to collections of rails, ties, bridges, and rolling stock called railroads. Many of them laid down in places where much of it was practically useless. Charles Hassler, whose weekly financial report was closely followed by investors, wrote that one of the great causes, if not the main cause, of the disaster in railway affairs was the concealment of truth. Only through fraud had some of the lines been built, and it was quite likely that the country would be better off without them. The country had acquired a set of poorly built railroads without the traffic to sustain them. They would continue to deteriorate unless good money followed bad to maintain and improve them. Modernity is as much a product of disaster as of success. Both can bring the new into being. A Railroad Life William Hyde Like so many others who used the railroads to reimagine and to remake the American West, William Hyde was an engineer, and engineering, as he once wrote Mark Hopkins, was but the servant of investment. Hyde was an especially eager servant, ambitious, busy, and self-promoting. He desired to rearrange the Western landscape for personal profit and national progress. In him the two were always almost innocently connected. Personal profit and national progress was one of those pairings that seemed natural in the nineteenth century and suspect a century or more later. The pairing of the organic and the mechanical was another. Like so many engineers, Hyde never clearly separated his organic metaphors from his work of designing and building machines. Railroads, steam plows, and yet unnamed contrivances that could mobilize steam to run cars on rubber tires. The central metaphor of the transcontinentals was biological. They were trunk lines, and trunk lines needed branches with freight rates so low as to ripen into life millions of dollars worth of development. Development was but the fruit of the transcontinentals, and the trains would carry to market the fruit they had called into being across rivers, mountains, and even arms of the ocean like San Francisco Bay. Nature and the machine were not yet enemies. Hyde was ultimately a failure as an engineer. He survives not through his machines, but through his letters. Those letters trace lines of power like those in a diagram of a steam engine, but hardly as orderly. The lines of power in the letters originate from the sites of Hyde's writing, places where transformations were plotted and undertaken, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles. The first letters in Hyde's letter books were from San Francisco, where, in 1871, he was the chief engineer for the Terminal Central Pacific Railroad. The Terminal Central Pacific was designed to take advantage of what Hyde calls the great blunder of the Central Pacific, of officially making Sacramento their initial point and selling the right to go to San Francisco to the Western Pacific Railroad Company, which company made as great a blunder by making San Jose their initial point, leaving open for competition the airline route, of which ours is the completing link to the California Pacific Company, between Vallejo and Sac. The plan for the railroad shifted at various times, but in all its variations it amounted to dredging, scraping, filling, and building, until trains would eventually run across the bay from Vallejo on a stone embankment to wharves and warehouses built on the shoal, and tideland around Yerba Buena Island, or as it was most often referred to, Goat Island, where the spans of the Bay Bridge now connect. San Francisco never embraced the development of Yerba Buena, regarding it as a threat to its own growth. In any case, San Francisco did not have the power to deliver Yerba Buena to the railroad, although it might have had the power to deny it. The terminal Central Pacific needed greater leverage to transform Goat Island than it could get in San Francisco. 
The railroad had a corporate charter from California, but Yerba Buena was federal property, and in the 19th century the key sites for any American transcontinental were places where the roads never ran, Washington, D.C., Boston, and New York City. Hyde went to Washington as chief lobbyist to get the government to give his employers some or all of Goat Island. If a railroad controlled the island, it could make it, rather than San Francisco proper, the great embarkation point for Pacific commerce. San Francisco would be at its mercy. To secure control, Hyde went to Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress. It is hard to say whether any of his correspondents ever believed the letters that Hyde wrote them from Washington. A century and a half later, knowing the railroad would never be built and reading the letters in the Stanford University archives, one finds it hard to imagine that they did. Even the far more powerful efforts of the Central Pacific to make up for its blunder. I went to see the President yesterday, Collis P. Huntington wrote to Mark Hopkins concerning their attempt to get Goat Island, and had a very full talk with him, failed to wrest it from the federal government. Hyde's letter-books are full of his verbose, repetitive correspondence. Each page yields equal quantities of self-deception and self-promotion. Senators, whose help he believed he had obtained in one letter, always disappointed him in the next. He wheedled, whined, and then denounced a company so tight-fisted with its own worthless stock that it wouldn't even give him sufficient cash and paper to bribe the necessary lawmakers and pay off government clerks. I am dealing he told his wife, with all the elements that win battles in Congress, greed, ambition, lust for money and power. And yet he was always sure that they were on the verge of success. Then, quite suddenly, in May of 1869, he went over to the enemy, the Southern Pacific, at first an offspring of Central Pacific interests, and eventually the child that mastered its parent. He had just two months earlier denounced his new employers as a monopoly, but now he was fully and eagerly at their service, although after a year and a half he still had no defined sphere or duties or acknowledged position. Eventually Hyde found a niche in Los Angeles, not yet a site of much power, but instead a site to be transformed. At first he was merely a political manager in a fight to secure a subsidy from the city for the Southern Pacific, but by 1872 he was at last doing what made him happiest. He was building a railroad. Not much of a railroad, really a branch line posing as a section of the trunk, but it was iron rail and wooden ties and workmen to regulate and ships to unload. He was in his glory, and he was in love. His letters reflect his contentment as a tool of capital. Southern California, no matter how much it may disappoint later, no matter how its inhabitants always seem unworthy of its charms, exerts an initial attraction on some so strong that even Hyde called it love. William Hyde, already passionately in love with his wife, wrote her letters that incorporated the land around him so thoroughly that they read as if he and she and Los Angeles had formed a ménage à trois in which she only knew the third party through her husband's descriptions. My precious lover, Los Angeles is a delightful place, and under certain circumstances you and I would find life joyous there. I think of you constantly and kiss you over and over again in my goodbye embrace. Darling, goodbye. My darling wife, I have just been looking at your picture, and such a thrill of love went through me that I kissed it over and over again. I do love you so much. How I wish you were here to see this wonderful country, and to be by me. It was a perfect nineteenth-century relationship. What he adored was what he sought to transform. He had rivals for the land, but he dismissed them. They were unworthy. Fresh from bribing congressmen and saving his own railroad expenditures for the day of the election, he recognized their corruption at once casually and self-righteously. There is a Spanish element here which, if made to vote, must be paid for it, and the most money carries their votes. They have no interest nor care for a cause, but if their votes are wanted, pay will get them. Isn't it disgraceful? At the election, granting county aid to this little San Pedro railroad, there were gangs of these men driven into corrals, and then let in to vote in small parcels, and when their votes were cast, were paid their money. The idea of their holding the franchise is disgraceful. 
and later that month, in another letter to his wife, he reported, I rode off for the upper part of the Los Angeles River and the immense plains of the San Fernando, past the old mission of the same name, an immense straggling adobe building tiled over, groves of olive trees in the enclosure, and a crowd of old Indians hanging around. The whole country is as yet unsettled. The railroads would change all this. He was a man in deeply over his head, not because he did not know about building railroads, but because he did not, despite his Washington experience, fully appreciate the men he worked for. He wrote Leland Stanford that John Downey, like Stanford, an ex-governor of California, and the kind of minor promoter who would eventually be as thick as the chaparral in Los Angeles, has already shown the cloven hoof, and has become more and more selfish. He wrote Collis P. Huntington that he had never in his life seen a rural community like Los Angeles. All high and low seemed to be on a coin basis. Cloven hoof? Selfish? Coin basis? He was working for Collis P. Huntington and Leland Stanford. John Downey was an altar boy in comparison. Los Angeles was a community of saints. At the very moment, Hyde wrote, Huntington was floating a complicated scheme to Stanford and Mark Hopkins that involved bribing enough people to control the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, having San Francisco vote a bond issue to buy a rival to the Southern Pacific that would secretly be controlled by Huntington, Hopkins, and Stanford, and then using the bonds to buy the Southern Pacific at a tidy profit to the partners even after the million-dollar bribe was paid. The bribes, Huntington believed, would pay dividends. He was not sure about the money Hyde spent. Hyde did not understand the economy of corruption. The associates wanted to know how he spent their money and what he got for it. Hyde had not provided the details. Huntington did not understand the need to spend so much money to win an election when none was being spent against him. Hyde, in turn, could not understand why the Southern Pacific did not push the Los Angeles branch line but the associates were near drowning in deep financial waters, and every penny of their own money now mattered to them. The papers were full of rumors, accurate for once, that Huntington, Stanford, and Crocker wanted to sell the Southern Pacific to the very man, Tom Scott, who backed the men who opposed Hyde in Los Angeles. The deal fell through, but the Southern Pacific and the Central Pacific were both on the market, and their owners feared collapse. Hyde's perennial doggedness and optimism seemed very much like a species of blindness. By the time the crisis came, Hyde was out of work. Chapter 3 Friends We must take care of our friends. Collis P. Huntington For a railroad to survive, it had to have friends. Friendship became the preferred mode for a whole set of homosocial relationships in business and public life. The correspondence of the associates of the Central Pacific Railroad reads like a Quaker meeting. Friend Huntington, Friend Stanford, Friend Crocker, and Friend Hopkins. The men who ran the railroads had journalists who were friends and executives in other corporations who were friends. They had bankers who were friends, but above all, they had politicians who were friends. Friend was perhaps the key word in Gilded Age governance and business. On being asked the secret of political success, John Morrissey, prize fighter, professional gambler, and member of Congress, replied, Stick to your friends and be free with your money. As a lawmaker told the reporter George Alfred Townsend, measures lived or died on friendship. It was not only good to have friends, it was essential. Both Tom Scott and Collis P. Huntington knew the necessity of friendship. Scott and Huntington emerged from the panic of 1873 like survivors of a train wreck. Scott, true to form, did not so much stagger as strut. He had taken over the Texas Pacific, which had been rechartered in 1872 as the Texas and Pacific, to build from Shreveport, Louisiana, to Marshall, Texas. From there it was to take the most direct route along the 32nd parallel through El Paso, and by the most direct and eligible route to San Diego, with a potential branch from Fort Yuma on the Colorado to San Francisco. It was the last road to receive a substantial federal land grant. 
roughly eighteen million acres. It had also seized the corpses of its failed predecessors, the Memphis, El Paso, and Pacific, and the Texas Western, which became confusingly, given later events, the Southern Pacific of Texas, as distinct from the Southern Pacific of California, and consumed their federal and state land grants. It then very nearly became a corpse itself. The grants came with deadlines that the road failed to meet, but Scott had friends. Congress and the Texas legislature granted extensions. Scott had endorsed notes for the California and Texas Construction Company, the Texas and Pacific's equivalent of the Union Pacific's Credit Mobilier. When it failed, Scott could not cover the notes, but he remained, as he always did, publicly sanguine and confident. In November of 1873, the American Railroad Journal reported that Scott had assured the holders of the notes that if they would give him from two to twenty-four months, they all would be paid. He believed that Congress will extend aid to his enterprise not by endorsing the company's bonds, but by lending to the company government bonds under such guarantees of payment by the company as he can show is sufficient. It was astonishing that in the very year of the Credit Mobilier, Scott, dragging the corpse of a similar construction company, persuaded creditors that he could induce Congress to offer him essentially the same arrangement that had plunged the Union Pacific and Congress into scandal. It was vintage Scott. It was also belief in the power of friendship. In 1873, Huntington was neither as flamboyant nor as well known as Tom Scott, but he was equally determined and growing more confident. Before the panic, a fearful and demoralized Huntington had tried to sell out to Scott, but Huntington was perversely reinvigorated by the economic disaster that destroyed railroads all across the country, and yet seemingly miraculously had left him and the other associates standing. Scott, despite his bravado, was a mere mortal after all and if Scott intended to regroup and drive the Texas and Pacific toward California, then Huntington was ready to fight him. Huntington, too, had friends. The associates had bought the Southern Pacific, then a paper road chartered to run down the coast, just as they bought virtually everything that ran on two rails in California. They moved its route to the Central Valley and made it the equivalent of an expensive night watchman guarding the approaches to the Central Pacific's West Coast monopoly. If they couldn't sell their railroads, they would protect them, and their initial goal was to stop the Texas and Pacific from entering California. Their ultimate goal of making the Southern Pacific a transcontinental with branches extending into Mexico was a result of confronting Tom Scott, and not the cause. Their confrontation revealed not only the power of friendship, but also its moral ambiguity in Gilded Age politics. Political friendship was itself virtually always corrupt. Friendship facilitated the movement of public goods to secure private favors. But leagues of friends also mobilized to prevent such transfers, sometimes for the public good, and sometimes because they wished to have the spoils themselves. In the 1870s, Scott and Huntington both relied on friendship, but they seemed to have been cast from different molds. Huntington had none of Scott's charm and none of his grace. Scott could seem unctuous, but Huntington showed little desire to please. In private, Huntington was often wry and funny, but in public he came across as a self-satisfied and willfully obtuse bully. Scott, the public man, left few private papers. Like Jay Gould, Scott preferred conversation to correspondence. He did not like to leave tracks. Huntington, however— living in New York and dealing with his associates in California, had a voluminous, frank, and very often incriminating correspondence. Even during his lifetime, large numbers of his letters leaked into the public domain and were published by his enemies. He had no choice but to be shameless when his own writings revealed so much to be ashamed of. The differences between the two men were the products of self-fashioning, not of background. They sprang from the same pinched and narrow corners of rural America. Huntington grew up in Poverty Hollow in Harwinton Township, Connecticut. The death of Scott's father explained his early exile from home. The young Huntington was taken from his impoverished family by the town overseers and bound out to local farmers. Both the young Scott and the young Huntington became clerks. 
While Scott rose in the Pennsylvania Railroad, Huntington went west with the gold rush and became a Sacramento storekeeper. Both became spectacularly dishonest and assumed that others were the same. They regarded those who opposed them as evil men. At the height of their conflict they assumed this about each other, even as each appreciated the other's skill. What most differentiated Scott and Huntington in the early 1870s was that Scott knew a lot about railroads, and Huntington initially knew very little. Unfortunately for Scott, and fortunately for Huntington, knowing the railroad business was not that great an asset for building transcontinentals. The transcontinentals were not so much about earning revenues from moving people and freight as about finance and politics. Finance and politics were in the late nineteenth century about networks, and networks in turn were functions of family, friendship, and information. Huntington's second wife, Arabella, captured this later in 1889, when she teased her much older husband for sitting on his chair and making money all the time, like an old spider. It was a nice image of Huntington, weaving his financial web. It was the web that mattered. Without the web, the spider was just a hungry arachnid, and Huntington merely a storekeeper. Huntington and Scott knew what modern scholars sometimes forget. The federal government did not leave the railroad business to the market and the states to regulate, and their most decisive competition often took place in Congress. Their political lobbies connected politics and business, but these were only part of a second, much larger web of politicians, newspapermen, bankers and businessmen. The webs ensnared what the railroads needed to survive. Subsidies, friendly legislation, newspaper stories that made it easier to market the railroads' securities, and favors of all kinds. The strands of this web were as strong and gossamer as anything a spider wove. The strands had to be nearly invisible, and they could not reveal the spider. By and large, the strands were made from information that helped friends and hurt enemies. To manipulate information, railroads bought newspapers, but this was only a phase of the business. As they grew more sophisticated, they preferred to cultivate rather than employ individual newspapermen and publishers. The railroads' everyday means of cultivating newspapers were free passes, printing contracts, and advertising, often above going rates, but they also recruited newspapermen as agents and lobbyists and lent them money. All were prophylactics against bad news. Huntington, Scott, and Gould often wrote articles or had them commissioned, but their value depended on disguising the source. The value of a lie depended on the apparent rectitude and disinterestedness of the liar. In practice there was little rectitude and less disinterestedness in the newspaper business. In 1886 Isaac Bromley, a newspaper man and a lobbyist, prepared a memorandum on New York newspapers and their attitude toward the Union Pacific for the road's president, Charles Francis Adams. The Times was hostile largely because Wall Street bears were using it to drive down Union Pacific stock. The indicator and the graphic were friendly, but only because Wall Street speculators were using them to bull Union Pacific stock. The stockholder, a Gould organ, was quiet until Gould decided where his interests lay. The Financial Chronicle would do whatever it was asked as long as it had a reasonable share of advertising. The financier had little influence, but such as it had was for sale— its purpose being blackmail. The sun was in Bromley's pocket, publishing what he sent. The star did as Huntington directs. The Tribune was friendly but useless. No one except Republicans read it, and the Republicans already backed the funding bill the Union Pacific desired. The world was hostile only because the star was friendly, and William Dorsheimer, the star's editor, had opened a personal warfare on Pulitzer and so it went for page after page. Newspapers were the basins that caught the news, but there were ways to prevent, or at least slow, the arrival of information the railroads wanted held back. When the associates filed suit against A. A. Cohen, the San Francisco businessman often so central to their affairs, it turned into an embarrassment because Cohen used the trial as a trumpet to blast his charges against the Central Pacific across the country. Huntington acted to confine the publicity. I have no doubt, Huntington wrote Hopkins, 
that if the AP agent was seen, much of this stuff could be kept back. Huntington's lobbyist, Richard Franchot, once succeeded in getting the Associated Press reporter in Washington on the Central Pacific payroll, until the Associated Press editor, Simonton, suspected as much from the changing tenor of his stories. At their most ambitious, the Associates unsuccessfully sought in 1875 to get exclusive Associated Press membership for the Chronicle, a paper they then controlled by offering double the going rates and thus cutting off the hated bulletin and call. Such interventions were necessary because, as Huntington wrote to his then associate, David Colton, capital is always timid, and the timidity of capital created the need for constant reassurance and continual good news, both political and financial. Such interventions were also difficult. By 1883, the associates were subsidizing the bulletin and the call, as well as country newspapers, only to have the Chronicle and the Examiner turn against them. Nineteenth-century Americans were not shocked by the corruption of the press. Neither were they surprised that businessmen cheated, lied, and stole. What worried them was the corruption of the Republic. In the Gilded Age, Americans feared that the Republic had become corrupted, diseased, decaying, and dying. They identified the source of this corruption as monopoly, and they made monopoly synonymous with the corporation. The corporate monster, monopoly, had appeared before the Civil War as the Bank of the United States and had been slain by Andrew Jackson, but it reincarnated as the transcontinental railroads. The monster moved into the halls of Congress, but instead of devouring a rotten republic as the Jacksonians had feared, it announced that it just wanted to be friends. What was supposed to be a tragedy, the decline of republican virtue and then the death of the republic, became instead a farce. That is how Mark Twain cast it in The Gilded Age. The republic didn't die. It became a collection of Senator Dilworthy's. Congress met and Congress debated and Congress passed laws, but its public business had become seemingly inextricably involved with private gain. And yet this formulation was both too simple and too cynical, because this age of corruption was also an age of reform. The Gilded Age spawned powerful movements for social reform and fierce anti-corporate politics without, however, yielding the kind of simple battle lines between the masses and the classes that the most ardent reformers hoped would emerge. In part this was because there was rarely a single railroad interest. There were multiple competing railroads, and they made Congress and state legislatures places in which to compete. And in part it was because reformers, too, became part of the networks that corporations created. Networks connected friends, and while a reformer might be one railroad's enemy, he could as a result become another railroad's friend. Often missing from Gilded Age friendship was what seems to us its defining and necessary element, affection. It is not that these men never liked each other. When Mark Hopkins died in 1878, Huntington wrote, I liked him so much, and his death has hurt me more than I can tell. If I had not so much to do for the living, I would stop for a time and think only of the dead. But friend Huntington despised friend Stanford. I am disposed to think, Huntington had written Charles Crocker in 1871, Stanford will go to work for the railroad company as soon as the horse races are over. Of course I do not expect anything until then. And he once wrote Stanford himself, I wish you would tell me whom to correspond with in Cal when I want anything done, for I have become thoroughly convinced that there is no use in writing to you. The other associates shared his disdain. Their writing on Stanford is a chronicle of amazement, dismay, and irritation at his greed, laziness, ignorance, and ineptitude. Mark Hopkins thought Stanford's key quality was his intellectual torpor. He could do it, Hopkins told Huntington of some necessary task, but not without more mental effort than is agreeable to him. Men who had once been Stanford's friends were even less generous. Ex-Senator Connes of California railed against Stanford as this immensely stupid man, who had forgotten that he had helped make his fortune. 
David Colton was certain that Stanford and Hopkins disliked him and would blackball him as an associate when the special five-year agreement that made him one of them was up. It was this certainty, as well as his financial desperation, that led him to embezzle. But even as Colton embezzled, he employed the language of friendship. When Friends of the Central Pacific failed to pass critical legislation in 1878, Colton was alternately lachrymose and indignant. We have got no true friends outside of us five. The elimination of affection from corporate and political friendship in the Gilded Age was its genius. The key figures of the Gilded Age networks of finance, government, journalism, and business had stumbled like so many vampires on a cultural form, friendship, drained it of its lifeblood, affection, and left it so that it still walked, talked, and served their purposes in the world. Friendship was a code, a network of social bonds that could organize political activity. Affection was not necessary. Friends did favors for one another and worked toward common goals. On a rare occasion when Leland Stanford addressed railroad workers as friends, he explained that they were engaged in a common enterprise and ought to be bound together with a common bond of sympathy. The key attributes of friendship were such bonds of sympathy, reciprocity, loyalty, and a presumption of mutual independence. Friends were loyal and loyalty, as friends themselves observed, could not be purchased even if it could be rewarded. Friends of the railroads were not agents bought and paid for. Friends sometimes differed, but it was the long-term relationship that counted. Nor, given the finesse and secrecy involved in congressional committee work and negotiations, could friends be easily monitored. They could only be trusted. Friends had to be prepared for betrayals. Destroy when read. The phrase, sometimes boldly scrawled, sometimes a simple notation, is a staple of the archived correspondence between railway officials and politicians. The letters resting so undestroyed in the archives testify to both a misplaced confidence in railroad friendship and evidence that friendships were always provisional. When friendship faltered, the ensuing denunciations often focused on honor and loyalty. Among the Civil War generation of the North, treason was the ultimate sin. Loyalty was the great virtue. The language of war became the language of business. Senator John H. Mitchell of Oregon was a friend of Henry Villard, the receiver for the Kansas Pacific and later president of the Northern Pacific. In between his terms in the Senate, Mitchell was a lawyer and lobbyist for the Northern Pacific, and he saw his subservience to corporate interests in moral terms. I do despise a traitor, he wrote Villard, and you will receive my suggestions in the spirit in which they are made that is of entire devotion to you and your interests while in your employ. Friendship was where the kind of men found in an Edith Wharton novel obtained their footing. In a Wharton novel, the businessman husbands or fathers so necessarily present and as necessarily alien to the love affairs and friendships, to the flirtations and conversations around which the novels revolved, only blundered and did damage. The female characters created inchoate networks too insubstantial to support the ponderous men whom they accidentally ensnared. But in the hotel rooms, clubs, and offices, men spun out their webs of friendship. The material networks, the bands of steel that girded the continent, also depended on inchoate networks that mirrored the secrets, courtships, and flirtations of drawing-room and dining-room. The cultural connections of business and politics central to the railroads were the domain of friends. These inchoate connections, however, demanded material support. The railroads could and did grant political friends direct payments in the form of loans or cash, but such payments were unimaginative and often unnecessary. They caused problems in case of investigations, such as that of the Pacific Railway Commission in 1887, which discovered vouchers for large sums of money without receipts to show where the money had gone. Huntington discovered a better way to fund such payments. He demanded rebates of two and a half or five percent on the prices charged by those doing business with the associates. 
Expecting the rebates, suppliers raised the prices on the goods that they sold the Central Pacific and the Southern Pacific. But that did not disturb Huntington. The rebates were paid in cash and became a slush fund that was used for, as Huntington's assistant William Mal put it, payments for which it was thought just as well not to take any receipts. The railroads had numerous other ways of disguising favors. When Senator William Stewart of Nevada chaired the Pacific Railroad Committee in the 43rd Congress, the Central Pacific gave him 50,000 acres of land in the San Joaquin Valley, the whole transaction disguised with a dummy trustee. William Barnum, a senator from Connecticut, was a manufacturer and a member of the Pacific Railroad Committee in 1877. I bought the thousand wheels of Barnum, Huntington wrote Hopkins. He is in the U.S. Senate and does about what I want to have him have done. Reason why I bought the wheels. The railroads could also offer senators and representatives employment as lawyers during their terms and as lobbyists after they left Congress. But the cleanest and cheapest ways of helping friends was by giving them what the railroads often got in return, information. Your letter touching the disposition to be made of outstanding land grants, but anticipates a wish to know your opinion and have your views, Senator Roscoe Conkling wrote Huntington in 1880. A week later, Conkling, in a letter marked private, asked Huntington for advice on Central Pacific stock. I shall buy as much as I well can if I can know that you would think well of the purchase. By the end of the year, the sixty thousand dollars that Conkling had invested with Huntington had grown to eighty-four thousand dollars. These were all, in effect, retail transactions. Sometimes the railroads tried to get their friends wholesale. William Carr, a.k.a. Uncle Billy, a.k.a. Boss Billy, had metamorphosed from something of a thug into an original incorporator of the Southern Pacific. He was a political fixer and an intimate of Stanford. Carr controlled federal patronage in San Francisco under Republican administrations, and he had considerable influence over some California congressmen. By 1875 he had received $60,000 in Southern Pacific bonds for his services to the Associates. Huntington and Colton debated how much he was worth in the future, for it was very important that his friends in Washington should be with us and if that could be brought about by paying Carr, say, ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars per year, I think we could afford to do it, but of course not until he had controlled his friends. Payments also went directly to the political parties. There were rumors in 1876 that Scott had offered the Democratic and the Republican National Committees each three hundred thousand dollars for resolutions in support of the Texas and Pacific, and large sums to individual congressmen. The techniques of friendship that began in Congress and legislatures were quite flexible. They could be extended outward to the press, to judges, or to anyone in a position to help or hurt the railroads. 1. The Lobby At the political heart of the networks that Thomas Scott and Collis P. Huntington created were lobbies. They extended their lobbies until they were larger and more far-reaching than anything previously seen in American politics. The lobby as a means of supplicating favors from the government had long antedated the transcontinentals. What made the Western Railroad lobbies different was their evolution into a means for one corporation to fight another corporation. The lobby made politics a realm of economic competition between corporations. Before the Panic of 1873, railroad lobbies were small and often operated through independent lobbyists, or strikers as they were called. The strikers knew key things and key people. Lobbyists formed the so-called Third House of Congress. Given the increased scale of public business that came with the Civil War, lobbyists, often reporters or ex-politicians, helped to move legislation and thus avoid gridlock, but at a price. The Civil War and Reconstruction created a golden age for strikers. Uriah Painter so adeptly combined reporting for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the New York Sun with lobbying and speculation that the legions who did not love him called him Uriah Heep, this singed rat, or that persistent falsifier. Harry Cook had been his tutor. 
in a country where gold stocks and bonds rose and fell on war news, a reporter's knowledge of troop movements was information that could become money. Painter used information and became the tool of others in using it. Painter's work for the cooks blended finance, information, and politics in ways that would grow standard for the transcontinentals. Strikers, however, were dangerous servants to corporations, and after 1873 railroad corporations moved to marginalize them and replace them with larger and more elaborate lobbies. The damned strikers are so numerous, Collis Huntington had written Charles Crocker in 1870, referring to bills he sought to get title to Goat Island, that if we should endeavor to put the matter before Congress this session, I have no doubt it would cost us more than it would be worth, but I will feel of them and see what can be done. Displacing the strikers was a gradual process. Tom Scott came to Congress with a formidable political reputation. His enemies described him as standing in the smoke of a political battle like a Davy Crockett of corruption. A one-man power who sets up and pulls down and rules with omnipotent sway. Able, unscrupulous, shrewd, knowing how to make the interests of thousands of imitators of a smaller pattern run in the same groove with his own, he has probably done more to corrupt legislation, debauch politics, make bribery a science, elevate it to the rank of profession and enshrine it among the fine arts, than any man in this country. Scott remained quite involved in the Texas and Pacific lobby, running it at key junctures, but he did not simply replace strikers with his own personal power. He built an organization. Tom Scott's evolving relationship with Uriah Painter, who served Scott first in the Pennsylvania Railroad, then in the Union Pacific, and finally in the Texas and Pacific, reflected the changes taking place in lobbying. Scott was initially deferential, writing Painter as late as 1873, I feel assured your interests can be better conserved by standing by us, rather than by using your influence in favor of adverse measures. I would be pleased to hear from you from time to time as to any proposed measures to be introduced likely to affect our interests. Painter, in turn, was heady with the power Scott's corporations commanded in Washington. When Secretary of the Treasury Boutwell threatened Scott's interests, Painter denounced Boutwell as cross and malignant and then turned on Grant. "'You can secure fair play or ruin him,' he wrote Scott of the President of the United States. "'And I would not be kicked around like an old hat while I had the power to command respect.' By 1874, however, Painter, the feared striker, was casting himself as a victim of rich corporations that refused to grant him his due. And by the end of the decade he was denouncing men he had once served. When loyalty went unrewarded and trust failed, the outrage was real. In Painter's papers there is a bundle of correspondence, his letters and the replies, that he took care to preserve and keep together. The issue they addressed was not the railroads per se, but the closely related affairs of the Pacific Mail, the steamship service that provided the only real alternative to the Pacific Railroad in travel from the west coast to the east, and whose rates often determined transcontinental rates. It was a company the railroads tried to control. Jay Gould had proffered an arrangement through Grenville Dodge to Uriah Painter, and through Painter to friends in Congress. Congressmen were to derail legislation in such a way that certain securities were to rise in value. Part of the profit would go to the friends of Painter, Dodge, and Gould. They killed the measure Gould wanted killed, but apparently not in the manner Gould wished and so the securities were not delivered. Painter was outraged. It was a question of honor. This was not honest dealing. There would be a price to pay. A man's broken word here is a barrier to further credit. Dodge said he could do nothing, and it was useless to threaten Gould. Gould refused to act. Strikers no longer inspired fear. They were growing domesticated and sought scraps from corporate tables. When Grenville Dodge enlisted Uriah Painter in Gould's scheme in the late 1870s, Dodge had become, among many other things, a corporate lobbyist in the service of Gould and Tom Scott. He had gone from being a Civil War general and chief engineer for the Union Pacific to being an Iowa congressman. 
He had become a lobbyist for the Union Pacific and then moved on to the Texas and Pacific in 1874, when Scott hired him as chief engineer. He also served as the chief lobbyist for the Texas and Pacific, even though he never fully severed his ties with the Union Pacific. Dodge could still be odd and erratic. When caught up in the Credit Mobilier, he panicked and temporarily abandoned his work on the Texas and Pacific to hide in St. Louis. Such lapses, however, did not prove fatal. Dodge, who was adept at promotion, particularly self-promotion, overcame them. During the Civil War, he had considerable success in organizing spies and informants, a talent that proved useful as a lobbyist. He remained an ambitious, audacious, and apparently convincing liar. It was always safest not to trust what Dodge said. The problem was that often some unknown part of it was true. Collis Huntington built his Central Pacific Southern Pacific lobby around Richard Franchot. Franchot, who had been a railroad president, a congressman, and a general, was as cynical as he was able. A master of detail, he did not overwhelm Collis P. Huntington, his friend and employer, with details. Franchot's letters rarely took up more than a page or two. In 1880, Vice President William Wheeler, in the process of wheedling a pass as a personal favor for his nephew from one of Franchot's successors, claimed that if Franchot, who died in 1875, had lived, he would have been the next senator from New York. There is no reason, however, to believe that Franchot would have wanted to be a senator. He already held high and lucrative political office in the Central Pacific. The transcontinental railroads needed men like Dodge and Franchot because the bonanza of grants and laws garnered in the 1860s had left them interested in virtually every branch of government. Dodge listed his own efforts for the Union Pacific in 1870 in Homeric detail. In Congress there had been the Junction Bill, a bill amending the Wyoming laws, the Bridge Bill, and the perennial question of the Union Pacific's payment of interest on government bonds. In the courts, he had had to look after the Davis suit to prevent the courts from appointing a receiver for the road, the Cheyenne case, and the Evanston townsite case. He had to work to get a reversal in a land case, Freeman v. UPRR. In the Department of Interior, he had to secure the order from Secretary Cox as to our right inside of reservations, and he had to watch over decisions as to the right of parties to unsurveyed lands within reserved areas. In Treasury he had to shape the modification of the construction of the interest law. In the War Department there was the matter of the reduction of the military reservations. And then there was the reversal of Commissioner Drummond's decisions against us, the railroad's right to coal mines, the exchange of government bonds for company bonds, and securing patents for railroad lands. These issues involved hundreds of thousands of dollars and thousands of acres of our best lands. It was no different for the Central Pacific. There were, Collis P. Huntington estimated in 1876, currently 35 bills in the Senate and the House that we are interested in. Getting the original privileges had not demanded a lobby. Regulating them, maintaining them, and denying them to others increasingly did. In the 1870s, no lobbies were as large as those of the Central Pacific, Southern Pacific, and the Texas and Pacific. Beginning in 1874, Tom Scott's Texas and Pacific lobby grew in order to obtain subsidies from Congress, and Huntington's Central Pacific Southern Pacific lobby grew in order to deny the Texas and Pacific those subsidies. In evaluating the struggle between the two corporations, it is best to keep the vulnerability of each in mind. Both the Southern Pacific and the Texas and Pacific were so dependent on credit that they resembled two large and angry men trying to fight while on life support. Both corporations carried immense debt, and both depended on steady infusions from existing subsidies, bond sales, and loans. Each flailed at the other, each trying to maintain its own lifelines while cutting off those of its opponent. Scott was clever, persistent, and increasingly desperate. Like a man whittling a stick, he pared and sharpened his requests as the 1870s wore on. He first asked that the United States accept Texas and Pacific bonds as security for an equal amount of U.S. Treasury bonds, 
thus allowing him to build the railroad on the credit of the United States. He reduced that request to a guarantee of interest on the railroad's own bonds. And in 1878 there emerged a hodgepodge of bills with a medley of subsidies, from a guarantee of interest to the government's payment of $20,000 in greenbacks per mile in exchange for an equivalent in Texas and Pacific bonds. Scott originally wanted the funding based on the trunk and all its branches. He later reduced it to the trunk line itself. In all their forms, his bills remained, as an opposing congressman said, substantially a proposition to build this road on government credit without making them the property of the government when built. If there be profit, the corporations may take it. If there be loss, the government must bear it. As the Texas and Pacific and the Southern Pacific built up their staffs in Washington, D.C., Huntington complained in 1877 that the fight grew more and more expensive each year. In the 1870s and on into the 1880s, congressional committees, if not blind, were nearsighted. They had no staffs. To influence the committees and provide information, the Texas and Pacific and the Central Pacific employed ex-congressmen, some of whom had made reputations as reformers, to know more than the committee members knew. The Central Pacific hired S. C. Pomeroy of Kansas, J. R. West of Louisiana, George Julian of Indiana, Lyman Trumbull of Illinois, and Franchot himself. For more specialized tasks they employed attorneys, such as John Flagg, who took care of land matters for the Central Pacific in the late 1870s. They also cultivated men whose jobs gave them the opportunity to snoop, overhear, and intercept telegrams and letters. When Uriah Painter went to work for Tom Scott, he made it a point to take care of doorkeepers and telegraph operators. Huntington recruited John Boyd, who eventually became the chief Central Pacific lobbyist, while Boyd was an assistant doorkeeper of the house in 1868. Huntington and Richard Franchot helped secure George Gorham the position of Secretary of the Senate. Gorham also became a close friend of Senator Conkling. Dodge recognized that lobbyists were not enough to secure desired legislation. He knew that friends of the railroad in Congress remained partisan politicians, answerable to constituents and local party machines. To have any hope of getting his subsidies, Scott had to expand the scope of the lobby well beyond Washington, D.C. Dodge, quite characteristically, took credit for professionalizing the lobby and widening its scope. Dodge viewed Washington as a volcano. Laws, regulations, and subsidies spouted from the Capitol Dome like lava, but the force that propelled them was generated deep within the country. Influencing Congress demanded being on the ground in D.C., in the lobby, but it also meant creating pressure on congressmen in ways that seemed to come from their constituents. Such pressures took the form of newspapers that crossed congressmen's desks, and the letters, petitions, and resolutions of their constituents and party members that piled up on them. To create such pressure, the railroad lobbies could not just gather information, they had to manufacture it. In March of 1875, Dodge explained his strategy as if it were the antithesis of lobbying. There was no success here until I changed my whole policy by reaching men from their homes not in Washington, and let me say to you that all the members of Congress who have been brought to us have been brought in that way and not by men who have been here in Washington, in our interest and under our pay. What strength the T and P have had here has been secured from the fact that it has been relieved almost entirely from what is known as a lobby. Dodge was not eliminating the lobby. He was expanding and perfecting it in ways that played to the dual identity of congressmen as both friends of the railroad and partisan politicians. Dodge found that his old Republican colleagues claimed to be sympathetic to the Texas and Pacific, but were unwilling to go against the anti-subsidy resolutions of their constituents in party conventions and state legislatures. To compensate, Dodge sought to develop countervailing strength in the Democratic South by selling the Texas and Pacific as a southern transcontinental. Dodge turned Scott's debts and failures into strengths. Scott's numerous creditors saw in a subsidy their source of payments and became his champions. 
The Texas and Pacific was only a small road of 320 miles when the Panic of 1873 halted it, but it projected branches that, either directly or through connecting lines, would link it with St. Louis, Galveston, Houston, San Antonio, Vicksburg, Memphis, and New Orleans. From each branch, actual and projected, hung fruit. Work for subcontractors, business, and rising property values in the towns it connected, and opportunities for new feeder lines. Those who hoped to harvest this fruit became friends of Tom Scott. All of them could serve as dummies for railroad ventriloquists, conveying the Texas and Pacific message to Congress. 2. Anti-Monopoly and Party Politics After 1873, the Associates would look back fondly on the Civil War and its immediate aftermath as the years when national politics were synonymous with Republican politics. Then the railroads could safely hitch their fate to the Republican Party. In 1873, Mark Hopkins wrote Huntington, When we commenced eleven years ago, Congress and legislatures were gentle steeds. Bless me how they rear and tear now. The rearing and tearing was owing partially to the resurgence of the Democrats. Huntington had begun to recognize the need for new tactics as early as 1871 when he proposed... Some of us ought to act with the Democratic Party. I think there is little difference between them now. It is only the seven reasons, the five loaves and two fishes. He thought the Associates' reputation as Republicans had hurt them in their losing fight to secure Goat Island in San Francisco Bay as their terminus. Hopkins recognized that the Democrats' demand for a cut of railroad favors and railroad money was not the only change in railroad politics. Something else was happening, and it alarmed Richard Franchot, even though he initially thought it was a temporary disturbance. In 1870, Franchot had written Huntington, Congress is very much demoralized on R.R., and as scary as the very devil, and I should not be surprised any day they bolt like a drove of sheep. With the country press howling, members are very weak-kneed in regard to legislation in favor of great monopolies but Franchot dismissed this as a spasm of virtue. When it is over, he assured Huntington, all will be well again for reasonable propositions in aid of railroads, and I think in course of session we will get what you require for SPRR. Until then they still had good friends whom they could rely on. After the Credit Mobilier scandal broke, Franchot was no longer so dismissive of reform. In one of his more effusive letters to Huntington, he stressed the vulnerability of their railroad friends to assault by the press. "'Now I repeat what I heard from good men every day,' he wrote, in a prose nearly as vivid, garbled, and ungrammatical as Huntington's. "'And there is some truth in it, for the press is omnipotent for good and evil in politics. "'All our R.R. friends,' he told Huntington, are near despair. The newspapers come down on them, and they have not a newspaper in the land to defend them. They feel that the vast capital at stake in railroads in this country is allowed to be jeopardized for the want of an organ, and they ask friends to stand up for them to be pelted down by the press of the country without raising a hand or a dollar to defend them. It was the Grangers, quickly the premier organization of American farmers, who panicked Franchot. They took their name from the patrons of husbandry or the Grange, and became, in the words of one of their supporters, a power which no party can afford to ignore. Their rise marked the beginning of post-war anti-monopoly politics, but their ideological roots tapped older Jacksonian fears of special privilege, corruption, land monopoly, and tenancy. Their chief target in the 1870s was the railroads. Historians have long recognized that Granger demands for railroad regulation in the early 1870s arose most powerfully from businessmen, merchants, and wholesalers in towns and cities of Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, who felt that railroad rates favored their competitors in other places. Railroads had the ability to disrupt existing market networks and determine whether existing towns and businesses prospered or died. A railroad, Henry George wrote, approaches a small town as a robber approaches his victim. The threat, if you do not accede to our terms, we will leave your town two or three miles to one side, 
is as efficacious as the stand and deliver when backed by a cocked pistol. But George grasped only the first episode of railroad clout. The physical presence of a railroad merely created a greater strength, the power to set rates. The moral and political core of the Granger and anti-monopolist critique of railroad corporations was that they had become an embodiment of special privilege and discrimination. Anti-monopolists argued that all of the bulwarks of freedom in the United States were under assault from corporations that were, by their very nature, monopolies. Monopoly was the key word in the reform vocabulary, and it is essential to understand what late nineteenth-century Americans meant when they used the term. A monopoly was, first of all, a private entity granted special privileges by the state. It was thus almost by definition corrupt, since anti-monopolists believed that special privilege, in the last analysis, rested upon legislative, executive, and judicial favoritism. Such privilege could take the form of tariffs, land grants, loans, or other subsidies that favored a few and hurt many, or corporate charters that gave the railroads public aid without concomitant public control. By the 1870s, special privilege and monopoly had become synonymous with corporations. The second mark of a monopoly was the ability to destroy, limit, or distort competition. The competition in question was not simply that between the railroads themselves or railroads and other forms of transportation. It was competition between all those businesses that used the railroads. By manipulating rates, the railroads could decide who succeeded in business and who failed. They could discriminate among individuals, offering favored shippers lower rates or rebates. They could discriminate among places, giving towns equidistant from the same destination different rates. They could discriminate among things, putting similar kinds of cargo in different categories and charge them different rates. The railroad's ability to discriminate, to use another key word in the anti-monopolist vocabulary, against Republican citizens violated both equity and basic rules of the market. Monopolies in other businesses hurt their competitors and their consumers, but railroad monopolies hurt everyone, because through their ability to set rates, they could dictate the very terms of all competition. In the late nineteenth century, laissez-faire was still making its strange transition from a doctrine of radicals and democrats to a doctrine of conservatives fearful of popular politics. The classical liberalism of Thomas Jefferson or Adam Smith feared government intervention in the economy as always and necessarily favoring the rich. This liberalism valued property because its possession bestowed more than access to things. It gave independence, a stake in productive wealth, a chance to exercise initiative, do valuable work, and earn standing in a community. These values seemed precisely what corporations and corporate property threatened. They made people dependent. The embrace by Gilded Age conservatives of laissez-faire, however, made property not the means to freedom, but the reward of freedom. Conservatives embraced the rich. They did not fear them. Monopoly's distortion of competition led to a third criticism of Monopoly. An enterprise became a monopoly when it encompassed an activity that citizens could not normally avoid, and so gained an ability to extort what anti-monopolists sometimes termed rents, but more often a tax. A tax was any taking of a portion of the value of a product that was not the result of an addition of value to that product. In a republic, the ability to tax belonged to the legislature, made up of representatives of the people. It was a public right. Anti-monopoly was originally a producer ideology. Producers, such as farmers, were entitled to the value of what they produced, but landlords, middlemen of all kinds, bankers and railroads, claimed the lion's share of the profit from products to which they had contributed little or nothing. They, in effect, levied private taxes. The vanguard of anti-monopolists followed this through to the logical conclusion. Any business whose profits came from the power to tax, that is, to claim a share of a product's value without altering it, was illegitimately claiming a public or state function. Public functions belonged to the people and their representatives, and such businesses should be nationalized. Anti-monopolism was a political movement that sought to reshape American politics. But the transcontinental railroads had narrower political ambitions. 
They wanted to control only those aspects of the political system that were critical to their interests. They regarded politics as simply another phase of business. They corrupted government, the public press, and financial markets, but their politics never went much beyond seeking profit. Although most railroad men denounced and feared anti-monopolists in general, in practice the reformers became just another political grouping that could, in certain circumstances, prove useful. Few anti-monopolists initially imagined that men like Tom Scott could, under certain circumstances, enlist on the side of competition, or that Collis P. Huntington could march under the banner of anti-subsidy. Railroad men learned that normally the worst place to challenge anti-monopolists and reformers was in elections. Charles Crocker complained in 1883 that the railroad's intervention in conventions and primaries made the men they opposed their enemies, while the men they succeeded in nominating are so anxious to prove that we did not help them that they are the worst men we have to deal with, for they are very anxious for an opportunity to show that they have no love for us. The Associates' electoral record in California, from the completion of the Central Pacific into the mid-1880s, was abysmal. The victory of Governor Henry Haight, an anti-subsidy Democrat in 1867, was followed by the 1871 election of Newton Booth, an anti-monopolist Republican. When Stanford tried to defeat Booth's run for the U.S. Senate, he turned to the Democrats. Booth not only won, but Stanford undercut the pro-railroad Republican machine and alienated the railroad's important friends, Senator Sargent and George Gorham. In 1879, voters over intense railroad opposition approved a new California constitution providing for railroad regulation, and in 1882 elected George Stoneman, an anti-monopolist Democrat, as governor. In 1886, Charles Sherrill wrote Huntington in frustration, in regard to California, for the last fifteen years we have met with more opposition from the representatives of that state than from those of any other state in the Union. Powerful railroads often could not command their home state's delegations. Tom Scott and the Pennsylvania Railroad had enormous influence within the Pennsylvania Republican Party, and Simon Cameron's son was an incorporator of the Texas and Pacific, but Speaker of the House Randall from Philadelphia was, at least publicly, an anti-subsidy Democrat. Elections, however, were the beginning, not the end of politics, and railroads learned, as Charles Crocker put it, to manage men after the election. John King Luttrell, a Democratic representative from California, was a member of the critical Pacific Railroad Committee in the mid-1870s. Huntington wanted David Colton to make him a friend. I hope you will get someone to convince him that we are good fellows, and that should not be a hard thing to do, for I have no doubt of it myself. It was an interesting, perhaps intentional, double entendre. Good fellows, in the underworld slang of New York City, was then, as now, a term for a criminal who thought there was honor and loyalty among thieves. When Luttrell refused the carrot, Huntington picked up the stick. In 1875 he dismissed Luttrell as a wild hog. Colton was to beat him. But how? Beating him with a Republican would create animosity against the railroad among congressional Democrats who were becoming a majority in the House. In Nebraska the Union Pacific learned to influence Democrats in a Democratic district and Republicans in a Republican. Direct electoral intervention to defeat an enemy with a member of the opposing party was usually a last resort, and often a failed one. If Colton could not prevent his nomination, then Colton was to put a railroad Democrat up against him in the general election to split the Democratic vote and thus more obliquely elect a Republican. The associates were always persistent. Luttrell metamorphosed into an honest man. He introduced a bill to authorize the Central Pacific to build east, gobbling up the Texas and Pacific land grant as it went. It is a fight that will cost us much money, Huntington wrote, but I think it is worth it. Huntington asked Colton to thank Luttrell for the good work that he has done in Washington. Huntington welcomed Luttrell's re-election. On leaving Congress, Luttrell occasionally lobbied for the railroad. Recruiting men like Luttrell involved a kind of seduction. 
It often took place in hotels, such as the Willard, or over private dinners. Collis P. Huntington seduced E.J. Ellis, who had earlier been seduced by Tom Scott. Ellis could have been a character in a Wharton novel, but he could also have been an invention of Mark Twain. Both fished different parts of the same social pool. In 1879, Ellis was thirty-nine years old, and he was as importunate as he was impecunious. A veteran of the Confederate Army, an ex-prisoner of war, a graduate of the law school at Louisiana State University, he was also a Democratic representative from Louisiana between 1875 and 1885. He was a redeemer, freeing the South from Reconstruction and complicit in a politics that spilled African-American blood and broke the back of African-American suffrage in Louisiana. He was also a member of the Pacific Railroad Committee and a friend of Collis P. Huntington, who was a Republican and a former abolitionist. By December of 1879, Ellis was a particularly desperate and indiscreet friend. In February of this year, I met you for the first time, Ellis wrote Huntington. I had a long conversation with you about the railroad interests of the South looking to the Pacific Ocean. Until January of 1879, Ellis had been a strong advocate of Tom Scott, but realizing that the standoff in Congress threatened any transcontinental railroad for the South, Ellis tried to get the Texas and Pacific to compromise with the Southern Pacific. It refused. This, Ellis said, opened my eyes to the real but occult designs of the T&P scheme. It was merely an extension of the Penn Central through to St. Louis. Only then did Ellis turn to Huntington and the Southern Pacific as the real hope of New Orleans for a connection to the Pacific. Ellis's conversion to the Southern Pacific, however, did not spring solely from his devotion to the South. At that interview, a transaction occurred which bound me to you personally, and identified me with your personal fortunes, such ties as cannot be broken or disregarded. Huntington had proposed to advance him a certain sum per annum, and Ellis agreed, voluntarily, Ellis underlined the word, to serve Huntington's interests in any way, shape, manner, and form. Huntington had made eighty per cent of the annual payment. Ellis desperately needed the remainder now. His position as a member of Congress had destroyed his law practice. He had pledged more and more of his salary to meet his debts. By December of 1879 it was pledged into May of 1880. He would not embarrass or inconvenience a friend for selfish purposes, and if the request caused Huntington any inconvenience he should dismiss it from his mind and thoughts. But since Huntington had fixed no date for the payment, he thought he should ask. But enough of this, he wrote. When he could locate his family in D.C., he would come to New York, to know fully your views and wishes with regard to measures pending here. I desire to know your exact will with regard also to the Northern Pacific and its proposed extension. He saw no reason to give them an immense land grant gratis. Huntington, of course, also saw no reason why a rival road should be given a grant. I am sincerely and always your friend, Ellis wrote in closing. Huntington insisted that the associates never offered bribes for official favors, and this was a lie. What he meant was that they did not bribe friends like Ellis. Friends reciprocated favors. Huntington also said that when the corrupt are in power, bribery may be the last and only means left to honest men. Railroads resorted to bribery, a quid pro quo, only when their network of friends was insufficient to a crisis at hand. When railroad men offered bribes, they believed the fault lay with the recipients. Huntington and his friends remained honest men. Railroads often bestowed favors with praise of the recipient's honesty. Senator William Stewart of Nevada is, Huntington wrote, peculiar but thoroughly honest, and will bear no dictation, but I know he must live, and we must fix it so that he can make one or two hundred thousand dollars. It is in our interests, and I think his right. Similarly, Roscoe Conkling was a quintessential friend, whom Huntington considered decidedly the greatest man in the United States Senate. 
Conkling was one of those powerful and ridiculous figures who dominated the Gilded Age Senate. He possessed some of the same moral grandeur that Twain gave to his Senator Dilworthy. He brought to Congress what his enemy, the equally powerful and equally ridiculous Senator James G. Blaine of Maine, described as his haughty disdain, his grandiloquent swell, his majestic, preeminent, overpowering turkey gobbler strut. Cartoonists seized on the turkey gobbler strut, and Conkling could never shake it. He hated Blaine. When Blaine, who was implicated in the Credit Mobilier and other railroad scandals, became the Republican candidate for the presidency in 1884, Conkling refused to campaign for him, announcing that although a lawyer and often a railroad lawyer, he did not engage in criminal practice. Blaine lost New York by a hair, and with it the election. Conkling was a great hater, but he was also a consistent friend. Oliver Ames of the Union Pacific wrote in 1874 that Conkling has always been in the interest of the Central Pacific and ready at all times to work for whatever they wanted. Conkling's high-mindedness centered on his opposition to land grants to roads that might compete with the Central Pacific. Huntington rewarded and protected such virtue. He once asked Stanford to arrange something out of which he, Conkling, could make some money, something handsome. You will have to be very careful how you do it, as he is very sensitive, but of course, like the rest of us, has to eat and drink. The Central Pacific fed him well, even as it reassured him of his virtue. Huntington even contributed to Conkling's lasting monument, a statue by John Quincy Adams Ward still standing in Madison Square in New York City. At least one of the other statues in the square, Chester A. Arthur, is fitting company. Railroad men and their friends knew that the uninitiated easily mistook reciprocity for bribery, and that the system could not be opened to public scrutiny. Senator Cole of California was a recipient of Central Pacific loans, and when he broke with the road in 1875, Huntington considered suing him for the money he owes us, but feared it would admit of liability to open up some questions that would possibly hurt us because they would probably be misconstrued. When J. N. Dolph was elected to the Senate from Oregon, he asked for and got reassurances from Henry Villard of the Northern Pacific that his interests will be properly taken care of. Villard also assured him, I shall take good care that your identification with our interests shall not embarrass you in the least as senator. The railroads tried to place their friends and lobbyists at critical congressional choke points where bills could be delayed, stopped, or advanced. The key points were the Pacific Railroad Committees of the House and the Senate. These committees were not prime congressional assignments, and so railroads faced little competition from other interests in securing them. Ways and means in the House and Appropriations, or Judiciary in the Senate, were also critical committees for the railroads, but these were sought-after appointments and hard to secure. Winning control of the Pacific Railroad Committees did not ensure legislative success for the railroads, but without control of these committees a successful political offensive in Congress was impossible. Lobbyists did their most effective work in committees. They excelled at preventing quorums, amending legislation, delaying reports, side-tracking legislation to other committees, or antagonizing bills by introducing similar legislation to split the vote. As Woodrow Wilson wrote in the 1880s, a bill on leaving the clerk's desk to a committee room crosses a parliamentary bridge of size to dim dungeons of silence, whence it will never return. To get their friends on committees, the railroads had to try to influence far more important politicians. The Gilded Age Senate and House were very different places, varying in size, their rules, and the length of terms of their members. Each demanded different tactics. In the House, the rapid turnover of members in the 1870s and the power of the Speaker meant that railroads recruited friends more opportunistically. Ideally, the railroads could influence the Speaker, who determined the composition of critical committees, and was in many ways more politically powerful than the President. 
In the Senate, with its longer terms, weaker leadership, and greater ability of members to influence their committee assignments, it paid the railroad to cultivate long-term friends. No senator exercised the kind of control that the Speaker did in the House. But influential senators like Roscoe Conkling had significant power in the party caucuses that staffed the committees. Although turnover in committees from session to session remained high in the 1870s, about 50 percent, it was far less than in the House. By 1883, the Senate began making committee appointments for an entire two-year congressional session instead of a year at a time rendering railroad friends there all the more valuable. 3. The Southern Transcontinental Throughout the 1870s, Collis P. Huntington and Tom Scott fought to control the Pacific Railroad Committees. These were the epicenters of their long war over who would control the southernmost transcontinental. Although they had neither national interests nor any transcendent principles at stake, Scott and Huntington still sought to influence the selection of and the actions of the Speaker of the House, and Scott even tried to intervene in the selection of the President of the United States. Like a brawl spilling in from the next room, their battle played a role, either marginally or centrally, in some of the most important political conflicts of the 1870s. When in 1874 Tom Scott renewed his attempts to gain a subsidy to push the Texas and Pacific to California, he had a huge burden to bear in the popular reaction against the credit mobilier and railroad subsidies in general, but he also thought he had a formidable advantage. In the elections of 1874, the Democrats had captured the House of Representatives, and they would retain control for eight of the following ten years. Scott and Grenville Dodge thought reasonably enough that a Democratic House rooted in the South augured well for a subsidy for the Texas and Pacific, a southern road. Scott had his railroads running out of Washington in almost every direction, and virtually the first thing Grenville Dodge did was to urge Tom Scott to grant passes to any congressman who might be of use to them. Politicians loved passes. The files of every nineteenth-century railroad make it possible to gauge when a congressional session was about to begin and when it was about to adjourn by determining when the requests for passes began to arrive. They came from congressmen, cabinet officers, and bureaucrats. They came from judges, including Supreme Court justices, and military officers. They came from the vice president. They came from the president. In the state legislatures they were handed out like party favors. It was not a peculiarly American custom. In Canada they went to members of parliament and ministers and to members of provincial parliaments and important officials. All friends had them, and even the friends of friends requested them. In 1870, Huntington reported that having sent a senator two passes for friends the preceding week, the senator responded by asking for six more. In 1874, the Central Pacific had carried 6,186 deadheads, as non-paying passengers were called. Eventually, passes became so burdensome that roads tried to restrict them. But the policies they instituted made the assumptions that lay behind the issuing of passes even clearer. Passes ideally were to go only to proven friends or prominent candidates for friendship. Sidney Dillon of the Union Pacific phrased the policy discreetly as passes only for those who should deal with us fairly. As receiver of the Kansas Pacific, Henry Villard was more direct. They went to parties that have been or can be useful to us and W. P. Clough, counsel for the Northern Pacific, was frankest of all. I have always been guided by the principle of not advising the issuance of any transportation for which a full and complete equivalent in some form was not in immediate sight. But the distribution of passes to politicians, their friends, and those doing substantial business on the roads proved hard to control. Charles Francis Adams considered them congressional blackmail. No railroad could deny passes when their rivals passed them out, as T. F. Oaks of the Northern Pacific wrote, Ultimately we will be forced to do as our neighbors do or lose our business. The Interstate Commerce Commission forbade them in 1887, 
but that did not stop railroads from issuing them to powerful friends. Dodge and Scott set out to make the Texas and Pacific a sectional issue, a mark of justice to the South. Dodge's strategy was to mobilize the Southern press in order to pound the opposition. The idea was to use arguments that played on the sectional disparity between government aid to the North and West as compared with that to the South. Dodge recruited the journalists and supplied the figures. He sought to frame the issue so that instead of representing aid to a private corporation, the Texas and Pacific subsidy would stand for sectional justice in the wake of the Civil War. In part, the tactic was ideological, to break down the old Southern emphasis on a narrow reading of the powers of the federal government. The goal was to bait the Northern press into attacking the Southern proposals, thus unifying the South in their favor, and giving an opening for northern friends of the railroad to sponsor some sort of sectional compromise. Dodge worked hard to implement this strategy. He circulated petitions for the road in key congressional districts, solicited influential men in the South to work on congressmen, and to get resolutions in favor of the road from southern legislatures. As Dodge wrote Scott in 1875 regarding the circulation of petitions in one congressional district, their operative was not to rest until he had the name of nearly every voter there on a petition by some pretense or other. It was a clever tactic, and it put Huntington on the defensive. In the early years of his war with Scott, Huntington spent much of his time responding to Scott's initiatives. Scott often outwitted him, but Huntington was a quick study, and he had a great advantage. Scott was trying to advance legislation. Huntington only wanted to stop it. And as Huntington later wrote, It is very much easier to stop legislation than it is to procure it. With a certain sum of money, he claimed, I can stop almost any legislation when the same amount will not pass the bill. Huntington put his own men to work in the South, organizing opposition to Scott. Dodge realized that the Texas and Pacific's bills would never pass if anti-monopolists united against them and he quite adroitly moved to present bills promising subsidies to a corporation as bills that would end the Union Pacific Central Pacific monopoly on transcontinental traffic. Dodge's careful hard work secured a resolution from the National Grange, or the Communists as Huntington called them, for reasonable aid to the Texas and Pacific. Scott marched forward under the banner of anti-monopoly, he also organized conventions at St. Louis and Memphis to produce resolutions for public aid to the Texas and Pacific. In the mid-1870s, this strategy seemed on the verge of success. Scott's bills failed in the lame-duck session early in 1875, but Dodge hoped that with an incoming Democratic House a bill would go through. Scott, however, needed a sympathetic speaker. Despite Dodge's success in flying the flag of anti-monopoly in the South and West, Northern Democrats had mobilized voters by attacking government subsidies and corruption, which made Tom Scott, a famous corruptionist seeking subsidies, anathema to them. And Dodge, to his dismay, found Southern Democrats more interested in capturing the presidency in 1876 than in getting a speaker sympathetic to Southern railroad connections. No candidate for speaker could make an obvious deal with Tom Scott. Scott's response to the dilemma was so Byzantine, so full of what seemed like feints and betrayals, that it is hard to be sure what happened. The affair was encapsulated in Scott's relation to Congressman Samuel J. Randall, a near neighbor and personal friend in Philadelphia, and a man with his own taint of corruption. Randall was an opponent of subsidies, and one of the two leading candidates for the speakership. In the summer of 1875 he accepted the offer of Beverly Tucker, who was both his friend and a noted friend of the Texas and Pacific, to tour the South to drum up support for his candidacy. Tucker traveled that summer on the separate payrolls of both Randall and Tom Scott, pushing two seemingly antithetical products— the anti-subsidy Randall for Speaker, and a subsidy for the Texas and Pacific. Randall had promised Tucker a fair Pacific Railroad Committee, one that would allow the subsidy bill to get to the House floor for a vote. 
Tucker, however, not only failed to sell Randall in the South, but news of the combination of Randall and Scott drifted north and hurt Randall there. When the House Democrats voted in the fall of 1875, Randall lost to Michael Carr of Indiana, another anti-subsidy Democrat who had the support of Collis P. Huntington. Randall attributed his loss to the suspicion that he had made a deal with Scott. And so it would seem that the election was a triumph for Huntington and a defeat for Scott. But things were not so simple. Randall received fewer votes than expected from the southern states, supposedly most enthusiastic about the Texas and Pacific. And some of Randall's supporters suspected that Scott's machine had used the New York world to circulate rumors about a deal between Randall and Scott— in order to discredit Randall while actually soliciting support for Carr. In reality, Scott did more than that. He arranged with William Hurlbert to buy the New York world from Manton Marble. Marble was the power behind Carr's throne. According to the terms of the contract, Marble would receive an additional $100,000 within thirty days after the adoption by the Congress of the United States of any bill or bills securing the endorsement by the United States government of the Texas and Pacific Railroad, or any other practical guarantee in subsidy to said road. In 1876, Carr gave Scott his majority on the House Pacific Railroad Committee. It included James Throckmorton, a member of the Board of Directors of the Texas and Pacific. The committee, as Huntington reported, was set up for Scott, and in early February a subcommittee recommended a favorable report on the Texas and Pacific bill. Huntington, however, now played his own reform card, and responded with anti-subsidy resolutions from state legislatures that he hoped would control Thomas Platt of New York and Gilbert Walker of Virginia, and block the bill when it came before the full committee. Just to be sure, Huntington paid Platt, who was usually considered Jay Gould's man, five thousand dollars. By March, he thought his efforts and the strong anti-subsidy feeling in the country and Congress had stripped Scott of his committee majority. The critical blow against Scott may have been more subtle. As always, Railroad politics came down to committee rooms, arcane rules, the exchange of favors, and the fidelity of friends. Nearly invisible acts had great import. In 1875, a Central Pacific lawyer, Harvey S. Brown, disposed of $9,000 in Washington in two months, with the money going to a certain party in Washington. Where the money went is not clear, but Joseph McCorkle, an ex-congressman from California said that Brown had promised Dr. Hamilton, who was on the Central Pacific's payroll, five thousand dollars to give to L.Q.C. Lamar, a friend of the Texas and Pacific, chair of the House Pacific Railroad Committee, and later Secretary of the Interior. All Lamar had to do was delay the favorable report on the Texas and Pacific by his committee. Brown denied any arrangement with Hamilton. It was, however, during this session— when Scott seemed to have the votes to pass his Texas and Pacific bill through Congress, that the bill came out of committee too late for a floor vote in the House. Dodge and Scott then failed to get the necessary two-thirds vote for the suspension of rules to bring their bill to a vote. If Lamar betrayed Scott, he did so because friendship could not prevent duplicity. You know, it is so easy for a person to be a friend and not a friend in a measure before Congress. Grenville Dodge later wrote to Tom Scott, that no one can tell whom to count on in any emergency or on an amendment. At the time it seemed a temporary setback. In hindsight, it was a crucial defeat. Huntington had turned Scott back, but Scott's political abilities, his willingness to spend money, and his knack for creating alliances between men of antithetical principles dismayed and worried Huntington who complained in 1876 that the devil, the communist, and the Pennsylvania Railroad have united against us. This was high praise of Scott's political ability to link corporations, corruption, and reform. But Huntington, too, was becoming adept at this game. When Scott raised the flag of anti-monopoly, the Southern Pacific hoisted the flag of anti-subsidy. 
In December of 1875, Congress passed the Holman Resolution, introduced by the same Indiana congressman who, during the Civil War, had denounced the Pacific Railway Act of 1864. The resolution renounced corporate subsidies. Grenville Dodge thought the vote largely for show, but it was still a sign of the strength of reformers and the Southern Pacific Railroad. In the summer of 1876, as in Huntington's words, the liveliest fight he was ever in grew more and more expensive, and the Texas and Pacific was still unable to grasp the prize, Scott invited Huntington to meet him at Beach House Seagirt below Long Branch, New Jersey, a lovely house out of the way of the thousand and one people. Jay Gould, who wished neither side well, but who was alarmed at the ancillary damage being done the Union Pacific as it sought a compromise on debt repayment with the government, attempted to mediate. There was a truce, then renewed war, further negotiations, and in late December, what seemed briefly like peace, as the two sides worked out an agreement that would need congressional legislation to be effective. On the surface, the agreement, as first announced, seemed a capitulation by Scott. The Texas and Pacific and the Southern Pacific would meet a hundred miles east of El Paso, with the Southern Pacific receiving the Texas and Pacific land grant west of the junction. Scott had given up California, Arizona, and most of New Mexico, and each road would work for a federal guarantee for interest on its bonds and for the bonds of the road's branches. Huntington offered Gould a share in the construction company that would build the Southern Pacific, and Scott agreed to help pass a sinking fund bill to resolve the Union Pacific debt. Neither Scott nor Huntington observed the agreement for long. Scott had won over two members of the Senate's Pacific Railroad Committee, Senators Spencer of Alabama and Walker of Virginia, to secure control of that committee. How he won them over is indicated by Huntington's conviction that they could be switched back with the proper arguments. He put proper arguments in quotation marks to designate the phrase as a euphemism for quite improper arguments. When the Pacific Railroad Committee altered the compromise bill that Huntington, Gould, and Scott had agreed upon, Huntington blamed the alterations on Scott. He didn't like changes regarding how the Southern Pacific connected with San Diego but more dangerous were provisions about rates and regulations. Scott had cleverly used the treaty between the railroads to create both a subsidy bill and, in an odd way, a reform bill. The bill made the linked lines an open highway with the Texas and Pacific and the Southern Pacific, promising to charge freight received from each other and from all other connecting roads the same rates as freight originating on their own lines. The bill also gave Congress an unspecified control of those rates, and, as icing on the cake, it prohibited any combination, agreement, or contract between the Southern Pacific and the Central Pacific. Huntington had, in effect, promised to lobby for a bill that produced a new road regulated by the government and that prohibited the coordination of the two halves of the Associates' California monopoly, the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific. The government had the right to examine the books to make sure there were no such contracts. If Huntington opposed the bill openly, Scott would cite it as proof of the Central Pacific's desire to preserve its monopoly, adding an even greater aura of anti-monopoly reform to his own request for subsidies. When, on January 24, 1877, the bill was reported out of committee, Huntington remained on the surface its friend. In Washington, he told Hopkins, it is understood that I am for it, but he began setting backfires against it, and urged Hopkins to send messages to congressmen promising to build the Southern Pacific with no subsidies. His real aim was to strangle the bill. He also moved to make sure that such a bill would not emerge from committee again. He lingered at the Willard Hotel for two extra days in March 1877 to fix up Railroad Committee in the Senate. Tom Scott was there doing the same thing, but, wrote Huntington, I beat him for once certain. Scott responded to the failed compromise by raising the stakes. He would try to control not only the Speaker of the House, but also the President of the United States. 
Carr's death in August of 1876 and Randall's accession to the speakership forced Scott to begin all over again in 1877, when Randall ran for re-election as speaker. Once more, Randall's supporters faced the dilemma of reconciling Southerners who wanted a subsidy with anti-subsidy Democrats. Once more, Randall indicated that although he might personally oppose the bill, he would appoint a Pacific Railroad committee that would advance it to the floor of the House for a vote. He even suggested that he would vote for the Texas and Pacific if the South wanted it. Once more, threats materialized that made it critical for Randall to win over the Texas and Pacific. Rumors circulated that the Texas and Pacific would deliver enough Southern Democrats to elect a Republican speaker in exchange for Republican support for the subsidy. Voters were confused. As one wrote, The New York Sun says Mr. Randall is the uncompromising enemy of the Southern or Texas Pacific Railroad. The Richmond Dispatch says Mr. Randall desires to be speaker because he favors this project. Can you advise me without doubt? what his views are upon this question? The associates thought Scott opposed Randall. Randall won the election, and Scott once more got a majority on the House committee. Anti-subsidy congressmen complained that Randall played both sides, saying he was opposed to subsidy, and then made the committee in favor of subsidy. But during the winter of 1877, the contest over the speakership was cast into the shadows by a much larger battle. The deadlocked presidential election of 1876 brought the business of Congress to a standstill. As the Constitution mandated, the election would be decided by the House. Tom Scott's role in resolving the election of 1876 demonstrated at once the reach and the limits of the railroad lobby and corporate power in politics. Had the Texas and Pacific lobby been stronger there would have been no need for Scott to intervene in the contested election for president between the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and the Democrat Samuel Tilden. He would have already received his subsidy. Had the lobby been less powerful, he could not have attempted to intervene. In December of 1876, two newspaper men, Henry Boynton and Andrew Keller, had proposed an arrangement between Scott and Hayes. Scott would persuade enough Southern Democrats in Congress to support Hayes to give the Republican the election, and Hayes would, among other things, obtain the Republican votes necessary to subsidize the Texas and Pacific. It was an audacious proposal, and when Congress appointed an electoral commission to decide the election, Scott tried to influence the commission decision on the disputed votes in Louisiana. Dodge warned him that he had overstepped and should avoid entangling alliances. Dodge thought it possible that the commission might accomplish something, but if it does not, it is very liable to make enemies on both sides, and will they not strike back at us in every way they can? Our southern policy, Dodge thought, should be based solely upon material improvements. The moment we drift off into political matters, we are liable to cause the South to lose sight of the T&P. As great a historian as C. Van Woodward thought that Scott had won Hayes the presidency. The explanation has since been discredited, but not because Hayes was not approached, and not because Scott did not try. Hayes never made any promise beyond a tepid support for internal improvements, and Scott could not persuade Southerners to exchange the presidency for a railroad. Such grand failures always seemed to energize Scott, and in the wake of Hayes's election he reinforced his lobby and sought new friends. In 1876 Scott supposedly had two hundred lobbyists, many of them ex-members of the House and Senate, at work in Congress. Two years later he had every old political bum of the South in his employ, at two hundred fifty dollars per month up. In December of 1877, Huntington found out that two friends of the Southern Pacific, Senators Howe and Ferry, were no longer on the Senate's Pacific Railroad Committee. Huntington was not happy. Ferry was a particularly expensive friend to lose, even after losing his committee post, he drew on Huntington for $10,000 in cash as a loan. Replacing Howe and Ferry were Senator Stanley Matthews of Ohio, President Hayes's brother-in-law and a friend of the Texas and Pacific, 
and Senator William Wyndham of Minnesota, a friend of the Northern Pacific since J. Cook's days. Because the Northern Pacific and the Texas and Pacific had a common interest in securing and protecting their subsidies and breaking the Union Pacific Central Pacific monopoly, his appointment gave Scott control of the Senate. Scott once again took the offensive, with his forces pouring out from their headquarters, which the Central Pacific's lobbyists called the Menagerie on 13th Street. Huntington, however, knew the critical congressional choke points for railroad legislation. After a visit by Huntington to Washington in early 1878, Charlie Sherrill, his chief lobbyist, requested $1,500. On February 10th, Sherrill wrote I.F. Gates, I got the check cashed and paid the $1,500 to Senator Wyndham and hold his receipt for same. Senator Wyndham of the Pacific Railroad Committee had become a friend of the Southern Pacific. Pervasive corruption did not keep the barrier separating friends of the railroads from reformers from becoming more and more porous. By 1878, an innocent observer might have thought this corporate warfare between the Texas and Pacific and the Southern Pacific was really a fight between two sets of reformers. That a man was ideologically opposed to great corporations did not mean he could not be of service to them. In 1878, C. H. Bardwell, a journalist and enemy of Tom Scott, solicited Huntington to back the anti-monopolist greenbacker Seth Yoakum in Pennsylvania to defeat ex-governor Andrew G. Curtin, a Scott ally and the Democratic nominee for the House. When Yoakum won, Bardwell again intervened, asking Huntington to protect Yoakum from Scott's efforts to deny him his seat. At the time, the Greenbackers were expected to hold the balance of power in organizing the House, and the organization of the House remained critical to the great battle Huntington was waging against Tom Scott's Texas and Pacific. Despite Scott's gargantuan efforts, the Texas and Pacific and the Southern Pacific deadlocked in Washington, D.C., and both opened new fronts to vanquish the other. Scott supported reform efforts in California to get a strong railroad commission to regulate the Central Pacific and the Southern Pacific. And in 1878, the California Railroad Commission handed Tom Scott a great gift by disclosing the enormous floating debt carried by the Associates Railroads. Huntington, unwilling to sell Southern Pacific bonds at prices well below par, had instead acquired heavy short-term liabilities on the Central Pacific. Using the New York World and pamphlets sent to bankers to spread the news, Scott thoroughly alarmed investors and badly hurt Huntington's ability to borrow. Hitting the Southern Pacific on financial markets was critical for Scott, because the associates, too, had adopted new tactics. They pushed forward efforts to get charters from the Arizona and New Mexico territorial legislatures to construct a railroad to Texas. To obtain these charters, they mobilized their own cadre of political hacks in need of employment and sought friends in the territories. Among them was John C. Fremont, rising like a zombie from the political dead. On becoming territorial governor of Arizona, he immediately requested $2,500 from the Southern Pacific. He assured Crocker that he thought the interests of the territory depended on the success of the Southern Pacific. In 1878, Scott fell sick, and the end game began. Scott continued to wage railroad war into 1879, but his friends started to desert him, and his once impressive organization fell into disarray. Samuel Barlow, a railroad promoter in his own right and a power in the Democratic Party, sent Richard Taylor to Washington to help the Texas and Pacific in 1879. But a dismayed tailor reported at the end of the session that although the measure had every element of success, equity, sectional feeling, local interests, hostility to Huntington and Gould, politics, all have been frittered away. A large part of the foundation on which I attempted to build has proved imaginary. The Texas and Pacific had lost too many friends. The defeat of the Texas and Pacific revealed the ultimate moral ambiguity of Gilded Age politics. The defeat of Tom Scott took down one of the most corrupt 
and also one of the most able men of his time. The defeat of the Texas and Pacific was therefore a victory for reform, except that some anti-monopolists, such as the Southern Grange, were allied with Scott, and the man who ultimately defeated him, Collis P. Huntington, was as corrupt as Scott. He needed his boys to defeat Scott, and the boys, Huntington reported, are very hungry, and it will cost considerable to be saved. In March of 1879, as Congress adjourned, after a last desperate struggle over the Texas and Pacific, John Boyd, who was in charge of the Southern Pacific's efforts in the House, reported that month's expenses to Huntington. The total was $12,585. The largest category was bills received, which ran to $12,345, and under that was the cryptic notation, $125 times 85, which yields a total of $10,625, the bulk of the monthly expense. There seems one likely explanation for a single notation repeated 85 times, the cost of a vote. How much Scott and Huntington spent in the 1870s is impossible to determine. In 1887, when a special railway commission investigated the affairs of the original transcontinentals, it found expenditures of $4,818,355.67 on the books of the Central Pacific Railroad, for which there were insufficient vouchers to show where the money had gone. This represented only money from the Central Pacific, not from the Southern Pacific or other corporations that the associates controlled. It did not represent employment, passes, investment opportunities, gifts of land, or the numerous other ways that railroads had of rewarding friends. There is no room for doubt, the Commission concluded, that a large portion of this money was used for the purpose of influencing legislation and of preventing the passage of measures deemed to be hostile to the interests of the company, and for the purpose of influencing elections. By way of comparison, the railroad paid $29,812.54 in federal taxes during the same period. Its legal expenses were $2,361,154. It paid state and local taxes of $5,857,380. Four, Reform in the Gilded Age Railroads could enlist reformers to serve their interests in battles against other corporations, but reformers could also ally with railroads to pass reform legislation. Because railroad politics involved competition between railroad corporations in legislatures, Congress, and various bureaucracies, there was rarely any single railroad interest. Legislation that hurt one corporation might very well be supported by rival corporations, and in such calculations of interest lay possibilities for reform. The details of such railroad politics were mundane and tedious. A major battle involved the question when and how the land office should issue, and the railroads accept, patents or title for the land in their grants. Until the government issued patents, towns and counties could not tax the land. Settling these issues took nearly two decades as the railroads stopped bills in committees and delayed action in friendly courts. Reformers found themselves entangled in seemingly endless procedural questions. In the most extreme cases, these issues stretched out over a generation. Almost 90% of the Central Pacific's land in Nevada and Utah was patented only after 1893. Railroads did not want patents when they thought the land of little value and feared taxation, but they very much wanted patents when they thought more valuable land might be forfeited. By building too slowly or not building at all, some railroads had failed to fulfill the conditions of their charters, and anti-monopolists in Congress pressed for the revocation of these land grants in the 1880s. Several secretaries of the interior stopped issuing patents in order to prevent railroads from selling lands to which they were not entitled. With the danger of forfeiture looming, railroads that had avoided getting patents in order to avoid taxation now reversed position.
They complained about the inefficiency of the land office in issuing patents. Most claimed that they had always wanted patents and had always been willing to pay taxes. Like battles to secure subsidies, battles over land grants and title produced alliances between anti-monopolists and corporations. The Central Pacific backed legislation to restore unearned land grants to the public domain. It was a way to strike at the Atlantic and Pacific, the Northern Pacific, and other rivals. Other railroads in return backed reforms that hurt the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific. The latter two desperately wanted to defeat the Thurman Act, which required them to pay into a sinking fund to retire the debt they owed the government. Both railroads mustered their lobbyists and friends against the bill. Senator Newton Booth, the reform senator from California and the associate's old adversary, knew their methods and charged that the Gordon Bill, which the Pacific Railroads hoped to substitute for the Thurman Bill, would make the Senate particeps criminis in the fraud that the men who hang around our doors would perpetrate. When passed, he proclaimed, the Gordon Bill should go not to the President of the United States, but to the Presidents of the Companies. It is the coin and mintage of their brains. It was approved in advance. The men who hang around our doors were a lobby grown too obvious and ubiquitous. The political networks the railroads had created were, it turned out, at their best when nearly invisible, appearing only when they were in action and motion. It was as if they were some strange railroad, whose trains, tracks, stations, and telegraph wires were all visible when a train passed, but then disappeared. To render them visible was to weaken them, or to change the metaphor, flies should never see the spider. When the Thurman Bill passed in 1878, Gould and Huntington blamed each other for being too much in evidence, but it was not just that their own lobbies had failed. Others had succeeded. Some of the most effective arguments for the Thurman Act came from competing railroads, which, unlike the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, had not received government bond guarantees. An unsigned memorandum in the files of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, a road that was no friend of the Union Pacific, aptly summarized the case against the Union Pacific. The Union Pacific was paying to a few wealthy men who own the thirty-six million dollars of its capital stock, which never contributed a dollar to the construction of the property, eight per cent annually on the par value of the stock, or twelve and a half per cent on its present market value. The Burlington lobbied in favor of the Thurman Act. Tom Scott also helped push the Thurman Bill forward. Scott, Huntington wrote Crocker, had worked up a feeling against the C.P. beyond what you have any idea. Scott supposedly controlled five crucial votes in the Senate. Senator William Wallace, a conservative bourbon senator who voted for the Thurman Act, has been cited as an example of how little ideology mattered in the Senate. But Wallace can more persuasively be seen as evidence of how much friendship with Tom Scott mattered. Wallace was probably one of Scott's senators whom Huntington had in mind when he blamed Scott for the defeat of the Gordon Bill and the subsequent passage of the Thurman Act. The Thurman Act marked a victory for reformers, if in the end an empty one, but it was also a victory for the Burlington system and Tom Scott. Other reform measures resulted from similar alliances. Reform, too, could be evidence of railroad politics and corruption. The linkage of corporations and politics through organized friendship put some of the culture's highest values at the service of some of its most mendacious ends. That the politics of friendship were corrupt made the language of honesty, probity, and fair dealing all the more necessary, not only, or even primarily, to mask the corruption, but rather to assure the participants that they still operated within a known moral universe. The inwardness, to use a nineteenth-century term to denote things whose meaning was not apparent on their surface, of legislation, newspaper stories, or administrative decisions, makes it necessary to look beyond final votes and even earlier roll calls in Congress to understand how corporations played politics. 
The announced intent of a bill was not always its real purpose. The public opposition of representatives often hid private support. They would publicly vote against a bill while privately making sure that it had the votes necessary to pass. Much of this duplicity was embedded in the loyalty of friends. There was sometimes honor among thieves. Collis P. Huntington may have been mocking the Railway Commission investigating the Pacific Road in 1887, or he may have been lying, or he may have been seeing the world from the peculiar perch of Collis P. Huntington. But when asked to explain why the railroad had spent so much money in Washington, he said it was to bring moral influence to bear. A Railroad Life Elias C. Boudinot Indians were a difficult people to classify. Some resisted railroads, some rode them, and some desired to build and own them. On the far extreme were men like Elias C. Boudinot, who became a willing tool of the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad. Boudinot was a striking man. People did not forget him. He looked like Wild Bill Hickok, who looked like Buffalo Bill, who looked like George Armstrong Custer. Boudinot had the same handsome features, the same shoulder-length hair, the drooping mustache, the same impassive stare. Not at the camera, but slightly away. Except that Boudinot's hair was not blonde. Elias C. Boudinot had a New England mother, but he was still a Cherokee Indian. If the competition were not so stiff, Boudinot might be ranked among the great scoundrels of the Gilded Age. It was fitting that a Cherokee scoundrel should bear a resemblance to a variety of white scoundrels and showmen who came to personify the West in popular culture. Boudinot was the son of Elias Boudinot, the editor of the Cherokee Phoenix, murdered in 1839 for his role in the Treaty of New Wichota, which had led inexorably to the Trail of Tears. He was the nephew of Stand Waity, the Cherokee who was the last Confederate general to surrender during the Civil War, and he was himself, despite his New England mother and New England education, a delegate to the Confederate Congress. He came out of the Civil War with a need to recoup his fortune, and he blended business and politics in a familiar Gilded Age manner. In arguing for the abolition of Indian territory, treaties, and the special legal status of tribes, Boudinot quite characteristically made himself Exhibit A. He had once trusted in treaties, he claimed. He had relied on the exemption from U.S. tax laws in Indian Territory provided by the Cherokee Treaty of 1866, but Congress had passed laws in violation of the treaty, and the courts had upheld them. Boudinot had lost his property for back taxes. This had taught him, so he maintained, that the treaties were a charade. Sovereignty could not stand against either the U.S. government or corporations, and the Indians' only hope was the end of Indian governance in Indian territory, the end of common land holdings, and the acquisition of citizenship. This was, his opponents countered, a recipe for disaster, and time would prove them right. But Boudinot always claimed that he was acting in the best interests of the Cherokee and other Indian peoples. Elias C. Boudinot was the founder of Vinita in Indian Territory, which, although the Atlantic and Pacific Railway never wished it to be so, became for a time the de facto western terminus of the railroad. The Atlantic and Pacific was from beginning to end a road of troubles. It was as unfortunate in its friends as in its enemies. It had both in Indian territory in the early 1870s. Nobody among the so-called five civilized tribes of Indian territory was more enthusiastic than Elias C. Boudinot. Charming, well-spoken, garrulous, courtly, mendacious, and violent, not surprisingly Boudinot became involved with the railroads. His Cherokee opponents, which included the vast majority of Cherokees, labeled him a traitor and an opportunist but this did not stop his lobbying in their name for territorial government, railroad grants, and the division of Indian lands. He claimed his life was in danger, and it probably was. The son of a murdered editor, he made sure he was on the right side of the pistol in tribal disputes. He was said to have murdered the editor of the Tahlequah Telephone as the victim sat at his desk. 
Boudinot had not liked an editorial. Boudinot denied that he was an agent of the railroads, but he had close ties to the corporations whose land grants depended on either Indian sessions or the dissolution of Indian territory. The Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railway, the Katy, claimed in its annual report that Congress had granted the road a 100-foot right-of-way and 4,121,600 acres of land. The asterisk in the report noted that this land was subject to temporary Indian occupancy under treaty stipulations. Translated, this meant that the land remained Indian land until the Indians ceded it, which no tribe in Indian territory proved willing to do. The railroad, in fact, had no land beyond its right-of-way except for what the Indian nations or their citizens would provide them through lease or other rights of occupancy, or until this land was restored to the public domain by laws like the ones Boudinot was urging. Dozens of territorial bills would come before Congress in the 1870s and the 1880s to accomplish this end. Some of them were written by the corporations themselves. Although the land grants lay in abeyance, the railroads still sold bonds based on them to European investors, and the railroads themselves moved into Indian territory. Boudinot drove the first spike in Indian territory when the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas pushed south of the Kansas border, on its way toward Texas in 1871. He saw opportunities. The Missouri, Kansas, and Texas had agreed to build a depot jointly with the Atlantic and Pacific, at the town site sure to arise where the Atlantic and Pacific, heading west, crossed its tracks. Relying on the Atlantic and Pacific Survey, it calculated the crossing at a place called Big Cabin, in the northeastern corner of what was then Indian Territory and is now Oklahoma. Since it built its line first, the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas erected a depot there, and awaited the coming of the Atlantic and Pacific. And in July of 1871 the Atlantic and Pacific appeared, but not at Big Cabin, Instead, it went a few miles north to Veneta, which consisted of a fence enclosing about 2,000 acres of prairie some 34 miles from the Missouri border. Elias Boudinot had put up the fence, claiming the use of the land as a Cherokee citizen. The loan for erecting the fence had reportedly been arranged by the Atlantic and Pacific. Boudinot was to have one-third of the profits from the town site. Veneta it was as if the Atlantic and Pacific had been haunted by John C. Fremont, who had been among its founders. Boudinot had named his fenced prairie after Vinnie Reams, a sculptress more beautiful than talented. She was the young lady artist who in 1871 petrified, as Mark Twain put it in the Gilded Age, Mr. Lincoln into a statue with an expression that indicated he was finding fault with the washing. This is the statue that now stands in the Capitol Rotunda. In Paris, during the summer of 1869, the young Vinnie Reims had a dalliance, and perhaps an affair, with the much older Fremont, who had remained in France while his family toured Europe. He occupied his time trying to seduce Vinnie, while fighting off charges that agents of another fledgling transcontinental of which he was a partner, the Memphis, El Paso, and Pacific, had defrauded French investors. That road was supposed to tap the great commercial route from Guaymas and the interior at Santa Fe, and then intercept the traffic of the great river of Colorado, which had as little traffic to speak of then as now. By the early 1870s, Fremont was a man so expert at transmuting opportunity into spectacular disaster that he was not only capable of squandering a gold mine, but actually did squander one. Fremont had gained fame as the pathfinder exploring the West and helping bring California into the Union. He had been the darling of the nation, but his California activities ended in his court-martial, and on his later expeditions, what had earlier seemed daring, now seemed only recklessness and ignorance. Men straggled out of the mountains bearing tales of cannibalism. In 1856, Fremont had been the Republican candidate for the presidency of the United States. He lost. He became a Civil War general and nearly lost Missouri before Lincoln sacked him. 
Ulysses S. Grant served under him. Grant found him a man of mystery. You left without the least idea of what he meant or what he wanted you to do. Fremont lost Vinnie Reams as he lost control of the various western railroads that he helped organize. The Leavenworth, Pawnee, and Western, renamed the Union Pacific Eastern Division, to confuse it quite purposefully with the Union Pacific, had come to nothing because of, as Fremont put it, estrangements between Fremont and his partner. The estrangements led to a chain of events that culminated in a murder in which Fremont was not involved. In 1871, the man who had aspired to be President of the United States was the President of the Memphis, El Paso, and Pacific, and a criminal. In Paris, the French courts, trying Fremont in absentia, convicted him of fraud. His agents had forged documents, given false information, and swindled roughly six million dollars from investors of limited means. Fremont had no intention of delivering himself up to French authorities. That Fremont's railroad crumbled at the touch surprised few who knew him. Fremont is entirely unreliable in money matters, J. Cook wrote his brother Harry in 1871, and it injures anyone to have any connection with him. The Memphis, El Paso, and Pacific ceased to be a railroad and became merely a scandal. The Atlantic and Pacific would fail. Not even Fremont's departure could save it. The Southwest Pacific reverted back to the state of Missouri when Fremont failed to make the first payment, and he sold his stake in the Union Pacific Eastern Division. In its own way, this unbroken record of failure was impressive. Even with Fremont gone, a kind of corporate dalliance on the prairie persevered, but all in all it was perhaps better not to have named a railroad junction after one of the participants in a failed, and maybe even an unconsummated, romance. Things did not go well in Venita. Agents of the various railroads were soon throwing opponents' rails into ditches. Mr. Bond, the acting general manager of the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas, disliked the Atlantic and Pacific's Mr. Kellett, whose manner and matter of conversation were more like that of an insane man or man mad with passion, rather than that of a gentleman representing a respectable railroad corporation. His actions were a glaring case of Celtic ignorance and impertinence. Things went downhill from there. The Missouri, Kansas, and Texas trains ceased stopping at Venita, which everyone agreed reduced its utility as a railroad junction. The Atlantic and Pacific armed its employees and resorted to lawyers. When it and the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas eventually did connect at Venita, the connection was actually between an Atlantic and Pacific passenger train and a Missouri, Kansas, and Texas cattle train, whose passenger accommodations were not exactly what travelers had been led to expect. The Atlantic and Pacific was supposed to build west from Venita, but in the winter of 1872-73 to the contractor's horses died, halting construction. And then it was 1873 the Annus Horribilis, and funds for the road dried up. Most significant of all, the Indians refused to cede the lands that would free up the road's land grant. Venita became an unintended terminus. Indians remained stubbornly athwart the line of empire, defying the isothermal and the Atlantic and Pacific, and all the Atlantic and Pacific could do was howl. In its pamphlets it created a literary parody of the Indian territory inhabited by the Cherokees and other southern tribes. The actual Indian territory was dotted with farms and ranches, towns and schools. It had newspapers and legislatures and courts all run by Indians. For C. J. Hillier of the Atlantic and Pacific, however, Indian territory was a wilderness— and a railroad and a wilderness are incompatible things and cannot long coexist. Either the wilderness will be subdued or the railroad will die of starvation. Indians were too few and too barbaric, he argued, to support a railroad or a modern society. We might as well, for all business purposes, build a road for three hundred miles through a tunnel or a desert as through the fertile Indian country in its present condition. 
Hillier played off of what John Benson, a Cherokee, called the chief mistake of legislators and the American public regarding Indian territory, that the Indians of this territory are but savages, and that their country can be monopolized by railroad speculators and governed by the appointees of the President of the United States, instead of those of their own selection. Benson favored connections with the larger economy, and he favored development. He just wanted development to take place under the governments of Indian nations and under Indian control. Boudinot hung on by proxy. He built a hotel in Veneta, a place where he felt acutely uncomfortable, as people do when they think the other residents want to kill them. He rented the hotel to a white man. The Cherokees ruled this illegal and finally tore the hotel down in 1879. Boudinot sued. He continued to lobby Congress to turn Indian territory into a standard American territory with territorial government. He traveled in Washington high society. He caned Cherokee representatives who denounced him. For years he was a familiar figure in Washington, D.C. But by the time of his death in 1890, he had returned to practice law in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and was living on his ranch in Indian territory. Chapter 4 Spatial Politics But a little practice and a little study of field geometry will enable anyone of ordinary intelligence without any engineering knowledge whatever to lay out a railway from anywhere to anywhere. Arthur Wellington, The Economic Theory of the Location of Railways The railroads made nineteenth-century Americans realize that space was political. It was a disconcerting recognition because space and politics seemed categorically different. Space was natural. It was what existed in the world separate from humans. Politics was cultural, one of many different arrangements humans created to deal with one another. Space always seems the most natural when it is the most static, when it is measured simply as the distance from here to there. Measures of difference differ from society to society, but distance, the stuff being measured, seems a creation of the natural world, changing only as continents drift and mountain ranges rise. Conventional representations of railroad lines rendered them static, and thus a mere overlay on a natural space. The gorgeous maps printed in the late 1880s by the Engineering News depicted the American railroad network and its recent expansion as a jungle of multicolored railroad lines, their trunks crossing and their branches sometimes intertwining. They captured the growing extent of railroad space, but they could not capture the way this expansion changed space itself, since, like all maps, these were static. The deeper meanings of railroad space remained invisible unless the trains were put in motion. Emphasizing motion was essential to creating a spatial politics. The railroads made space political by making the quotidian experience of space one of rapid movement. A railroad train in motion was a snorting, smoking, roaring thing. For all the beauty of its movement, it was an assault on the human senses, which registered that it was the train's movement that mattered. But it wasn't just the train that moved. The things the train connected seemed to move with it. The British novelist Antony Trollope, while visiting the United States in the 1860s, wrote, The town that is distant a hundred miles by the rail is so near that its inhabitants are neighbors, but a settlement twenty miles distant across the uncleared country unknown, unvisited, and probably unheard of by women and children. Under such circumstances the railway is everything. It is the first necessity of life, and gives the only hope of wealth. Trollope captured why the locomotive had been taken to the bosoms of them all as a domestic animal. What Trollope grasped was that space itself took on different forms, according to how movement was measured. The speed of the train determined the time of the journey and the experience of space. Substituting time for distance made space political— but only to the extent that politics determined which places got railroads and which did not. A further step was necessary for the full fruition of spatial politics. People had to measure space primarily by cost. 
Measuring space by cost rendered it radically unstable. It changed every time a freight rate changed. It became apparent that whoever controlled this measure of space gained considerable power and advantage. And once this became apparent, the struggle to control and regulate those measurements not only irrevocably entered the realm of politics, but moved to the center of nineteenth-century American politics. North Americans realized that the building of railroads had created the hardware of the railroad network, but just as critical to the operation of the railroads was the software, the time schedules and tariffs, rates, that managed movement of people and things through space, and the administrative apparatus that kept track of railroad cars, determined routes, and set prices. These formed the heart of a railroad politics, that was fundamentally a spatial politics. 1. Absolute Space In 1869, Butler Ives, a 39-year-old engineer in the employ of the Central Pacific, helped complete a first draft of Western Railroad space. He had been in the field surveying the route of the railroad for three years, in some cases working far to the east of where the Central Pacific would run. The country he traveled was often Indian country. Ives was a romantic who feigned a cynicism that often became an ill-concealed form of boasting, as when he described the work of laying out the route across the Great Basin. For 150 miles of the distance we had day camps, or for every camp in that distance we had to haul water with mule teams from 10 to 15 miles for cooking and drinking purposes, and some of that was brackish. I found it a good place to take the romance out of some enthusiastic young engineers I had in my party. But at other times his own romance was all too apparent, as when he led his party east of Ogden and into the mountains. The country for a hundred fifty miles east is but a succession of mountain ranges with very narrow valleys along the streams. There is but little timber, except on the highest slopes of the mountains, while most of the country is covered with good grass. The streams are filled with trout and the mountains with game, rendering it one of the best sections of country I have ever been in for camping purposes. I have carried my old shotgun on the pommel of my mule's saddle all summer, have killed one brown bear, one antelope, and geese, ducks, grouse, hare, etc., without number. We have had trout whenever we took the trouble to fish for them. Ives, who was from Michigan but had long lived in California, took pride in his ability to live in these western places. They keep me out on this infernal region of salt and desolation, he wrote his brother, because I am familiar with the country and don't fear the Indians, which is a bugbear to most people in this country. In fact, I am a sort of vagabond pioneer of the railroad company, singled out for difficult jobs, with a carte blanche to do pretty much as I please. His skills were transportable, but the local knowledge that he developed was not. That did not matter, however, because the whole point of creating railroad space was to make such local knowledge superfluous. A passenger train would cover those 150 miles in less than a day, without any need for the travelers to find or carry water or to camp. Vagabond Pioneer was a role Ives played. He was really a very modern figure, a professional engineer whom a corporation employed for a salary. He carried with him not only his shotgun, but his tools of abstraction, the old solar compass and two barometers. He knew he was using these tools to measure and transform space. His work helped make the East, once so far away, near, whether he measured his separation in time or in money. I don't know how things will shape with me when the road is finished, he wrote his brother. If I can get time, I will come and see you. It will not cost me much, for I am a deadhead on both roads. He was a company man with company benefits. Ives's correspondence largely stopped in 1869, and then, in the way that documents and history truncate fuller lives, there was in 1872 a final letter from Jonathan Valentine, a superintendent of the Wells Fargo Express Company, to the superintendents of the Union Pacific. We forward tomorrow express addressed to Detroit, Michigan, the remains of Mr. Butler Ives, who was one of the pioneer engineers in surveying and locating the route of the present Overland Railroad, the CP and UP lines.
As a tribute to Mr. Ives's attainment as a railroad engineer and character as a gentleman, and as a courtesy to railroad managers, we forward the remains free and will esteem it a favor if the U.P. and American companies will cooperate with us. Ives was dead. He was just cargo, but he remained a deadhead. His corporate privileges were intact. The railroad did carry him home. Ives passed away five years before the first edition of Arthur Wellington's The Economic Theory of the Location of Railways appeared. Wellington served as an engineer on the Mexican Central Railway and the Mexican National Railway, but his most impressive production was his book, which would go through five revised editions by 1891. Like Ives, Wellington was an engineer who reduced local knowledge to numbers, a universal language of elevations, grades, curves, and the power that a steam engine could muster. He did this to create railroad space. Wellington was an enumerating modernizer, and a very intelligent one, who wanted to lay out the physical infrastructure of railroad, its tracks, bridges, tunnels, stations, so that movement yielded the highest possible revenues. He thought methodically about the connections between infrastructure, movement, and revenue, and his skill lay in keeping all three elements in play at once. He was engaged in a perpetual act of translation. He translated geography into a kind of hybrid space, at once abstracted and physical. I will call this hybrid space absolute space. It was both geometric and natural. It came into being when workers altered an existing landscape by driving a railroad through it. The track created an axis. Looking down the track, engineers could measure a linear space and the length of journeys. Looking outward from the tracks, surveyors could find the series of square sections that made up the railroad's land grant. The Canadian Pacific, in the years immediately following its completion in 1885, formed a nearly pure example of absolute space as a paradigm of order and control. The Canadian Pacific laid out its stations every eight miles. Why eight? Apparently eight miles was the maximum distance at which a farmer could make a round trip with a wagon load of grain on level terrain in a single day. A farmer along the line halfway between stations would still be able to make his journey and be back by dark. At every second station there would be depots, section houses, and water tanks, as well as the various side tracks necessary to load, unload, and switch trains. And roughly every one hundred miles the train would reach a divisional point with railroad shops and yards, which inevitably meant jobs and larger towns. The Canadian Pacific was imposing a pattern here that would determine the movements, routines, and opportunities of people not yet in the country. Besides the railroads, only the state could structure space on this grand scale. Together, the Canadian and American land surveys and railroads marked out the shapes of what was to come. It was as if Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and all the places like them across half a continent were a child's coloring book, with the patterns pre-sketched. Farmers could add color and variety, but the lines of their fields, the locations of their roads... The places where they would take their crops and buy their supplies, all of these had first been determined by the survey grid and later elaborated by the railroads. W. C. Van Horn was the primary architect of railroad space on the Canadian Pacific. He was a striver. As an old man, he remembered how he had aspired to be a general superintendent of the railroad, any railroad. He imagined that a general superintendent must know everything about a railway, every detail in every department. And Van Horn, as much as any man, did. General Superintendent may have been his original destination, but General Superintendent was a local stop, and Van Horn became an express. He was a General Superintendent before he was thirty. He took no holidays, worked nights and Sundays, and not any of this could be called work, for it was a constant source of pleasure. An American lured north to run the Canadian Pacific, and eventually rising to be its president, Van Horn became an ardent Canadian nationalist, in part because Canadian nationalism was the fuel for the Canadian Pacific. 
Van Horn was a man conditioned to think about railroad space in terms not only of the thousands of miles that the Canadian Pacific spanned, but also of the inches and feet involved in the design of a car, or the square footage of a warehouse or grain elevator. Van Horn recognized the power of spatial arrangements. How, for example, the precise arrangement of sidings and the buildings along them in Manitoba could influence the price that wheat grown in the province brought a continent away. The Canadian Pacific leased rather than sold land adjoining sidings, and that allowed Van Horn to mandate the kinds of structures that could be built there. By replacing numerous small buyers and their small single-story warehouses, in which high and low quality wheat were promiscuously mixed, with two or three suitable elevators at every grain station on the line, which separated wheat by grade and loaded wheat mechanically rather than manually, the railroad could exert control over the quality of wheat. Van Horn reduced the harvests of tens of thousands of Western Canadian farms into a small number of graded classifications that enabled a buyer in Liverpool to know what he was getting when he purchased Manitoba wheat. That gave it an advantage over wheat shipped from Duluth, Minnesota, the northern Pacific's terminus, which was very variable sometimes. Number one Duluth hard wheat means one thing at one time and quite a different thing at another, and this has had the effect of injuring its reputation and reducing its value in the world's markets. Rigorously graded Manitoba wheat would bring a premium on world markets, and the railroads as much as the government had to take responsibility for ensuring uniform grading. 2. Relational Space Absolute space, in turn, yielded a second kind of railroad space, relational space. Relational space came into being only when the geometrical measures of absolute space, calculated in inches, feet, or miles, were related to other abstract measures, such as time or cost. Relational space was the railroad space of movement that arose when humans calculated their journeys not in miles and feet, but in hours and minutes, or dollars and cents. Railroad distance measured in miles between two points was stable. Distance measured in time or money was often radically unstable, and a matter of bitter dispute. It formed the heart of the entire railroad enterprise. Like Ives, Arthur Wellington was both cynical and touchingly naive. He was scornful of much engineering practice, but he still thought that, if engineering was rightly defined, railroad problems were ultimately still engineering problems. Western railroads in particular were primers on where not to locate railroads. The Kansas Pacific never left the prairies and the Great Plains, but it contained numerous and heavy grades distributed over the whole of it. The Mexican Central had rejected a route that would have put it through Silao, Guanajuato, and León. It decreased its tributary population per mile even as it added nearly 500 miles of extra haul between Mexico City and El Paso. The Western Pacific took the shortest route between San Francisco and Sacramento, but an alternate route taken by the California Pacific Railroad was shorter in the sense of economy and transportation which is to say it was a dead-level road, while the other had a maximum grade of fifty feet to the mile. Wellington measured the success of railroad technology by its ability to move freight at minimal cost. By these standards, the technological success of most Western railroads was open to question. As Wellington pointed out, a little practice and a little study of field geometry will enable anyone of ordinary intelligence without any engineering knowledge whatever to lay out a railway from anywhere to anywhere. There was no field of professional labor in which a limited amount of modest incompetency at $150 a month can set so many picks and shovels and locomotives at work to no purpose whatever. Many engineers built railroads badly, and it might take years to discover the hidden costs of steep grades, sharp curves, missed sources of traffic, and the failure to keep a line as level as possible. Once built, the railroad's absolute space became part of the local geography, ideally suited for mapping and conventional description in a railroad guidebook. The Pacific tourist, designed to entertain and inform, 
provided railroad travelers information about towns, sites, stage connections, and a rudimentary history. Its readers encountered a set of maps, anecdotes, descriptions, statistics, and illustrations all set firmly in absolute three-dimensional space. Archer, Wyoming is 508 miles from the starting place, Omaha, with an elevation of 6,000 feet above tidewater. This station is a sidetrack with Section House nearby. Cheyenne, the magic city of the plains, was 516 miles from Omaha, elevation 6,041 feet. The Railroad Gazetteer, for gratuitous distribution on railways, steamers, and stages, of the Central Pacific, meticulously located for its captive audience of travelers, tunnels, snowsheds, and exceptional sights by their distance from San Francisco and their elevation. What distinguished railroads from the natural geography through which they ran was their centrality to measures of value. They transformed everything around them. There is no such thing as a badly placed river or a mountain, although humans may wish they were located elsewhere. They are where they are, but engineers located railroads for human purposes. There were good locations and bad. To determine the line between the utterly bad and barely tolerable in railway location, Wellington relied on a second abstract measure, the dollar. Wellington thought engineering should not be considered the art of construction, but rather the art of doing that well with one dollar, which any bungler can do with two, after a fashion. How to build a railroad was widely studied, but the larger questions of where to build and when to build, and whether to build them at all, had been neglected. The first step in the engineer's job of giving maximum value to railroad movement was to reduce the natural complexity of a road to a mathematical simplicity that would indicate the optimum route over which a single engine could pull the maximum number of fully loaded freight cars a given distance at the lowest cost. Through the 1880s, with the coupling technology then in use, the maximum length of a freight train was 50 to 60 cars. On most lines, however, the real limit was lower, often much lower, and was set by the number of cars a locomotive could pull up the ruling grade. The ruling grade was not necessarily the maximum grade. If a train had to approach a grade at low speed or from a standing stop, then this virtual grade might be the ruling grade, while a steeper grade approached at high speed might be more easily surmounted. Numerous short steep grades forced railroads to run smaller, more frequent trains, and the cost of doing so was far greater than running large trains. The ability to limit the length of trains was, in Wellington's view, the whole objection to gradients. Ideally, a railroad should follow the most level terrain, using nature to reduce the grade as much as possible. Curves, as long as they were not excessive, were tolerable. Railway location was nearly a thousand pages long by the late 1880s, but its essence was clear. Railway location was primarily about gradient and traffic. If there was a fundamental law for location, it was, follow that route which affords the easiest possible grades for the longest possible distances, using to that end such amounts of distance curvature and rise and fall as may be necessary and then pass over the intervening distances on such grades as are then found necessary. Engineers should choose routes that concentrated grades into a limited number of places of steep ascent where helper engines could assist. Wellington's concern with the ruling grade was, of course, not the whole story, but it was most of it. His second concern was traffic, which also reduced down to a maxim. The layout of railroads should secure the largest possible tributary population and, whenever possible, link major centers of population. Wellington thought engineers paid far too much attention to what he called the minor details of railway location. Relatively small variations in distance, curvature, and the rise and fall of topography less than the ruling grade of the road. These minor details did influence the cost of moving people and goods and at the extreme could cripple a line, but improvements should be made only when they were justified by increases in business, gross receipts, or savings in operating expenses greater than the costs of improvements. 
Such calculations could be made conservatively, never estimating an increase in traffic more than two to five years in the future. Wellington's calculations of movement took him into the realm of relational space, which was the wonderland of modernity. It rendered what was close distant and the distant near. For Wellington its key measure was cost of transport, and that did not vary in direct ratio or in anything like direct ratio with distance. Other items, grades, cost of construction, terminal expenses, volume of traffic, whether cars return full or empty, had more to do with the actual cost of service. In any case, Wellington thought the price of transportation had nothing to do with the cost of producing it. It was, he believed, simply a function of what people were willing to pay. Calculations of cost disrupted the clichés about the annihilation of time and space that governed people's initial reaction to the railroads. Margaret Irvin Carrington had captured that first reaction in 1869, when she wrote that with the transcontinentals and the Atlantic Cable, the Christian world and all civilized people may rejoice that the islands of the sea and the barbarism of Asia have been brought so near to our homes that with only a single wire to underlie the Pacific, the whole earth will become as a whispering gallery, wherein all nations, by one electric pulsation, may throb in unison, and the continent shall tremble with the rumbling of wheels that swiftly and without interruption or delay transport its gospel and commerce. The Pacific coast was by 1869 only four days from Omaha, and an officer of the army recently returned in forty hours over a distance which required a march of sixty-four days in 1866. But Carrington did not speak of the shifting costs of such trips. Railroads reduced the cost of movement, but they also rendered it dramatically unstable. Ignore the instability, and the whole world did seem to be collapsing together. The Senate Select Committee on Interstate Commerce reproduced this orthodox vision when it reasoned that a mechanic in Massachusetts had only to work a single day to pay the cost of transporting the food he would eat for a year 1,000 miles from the western prairies. If the mechanic will give up one holiday a year, he is placed alongside of the prairie, and distance is eliminated from his condition. Such calculations, however, ignored fluctuations in costs, and differences in costs between one destination and another. When rates rose, or when they sank faster for one place than for another, seemingly fixed places grew not closer but more distant. This was relational space, and it became the heart of anti-monopoly politics. The measures of relational space were the timetable and the tariff. Both translated distance into other abstract measures, time and cost, but to get the full measure of relational space they had to be read together. The whole purpose of the timetable was to translate distance from miles into time. Going eastward from San Francisco in November of 1871, a passenger left San Francisco at seven o'clock in the morning and reached Sacramento at two o'clock in the afternoon. It was after midnight when she reached Reno, and roughly twenty-four hours after leaving San Francisco she was at Humboldt in Nevada. Nearly another day would pass before she reached Ogden. People moving through space had to orient themselves by time. When the train departed, when it arrived, how long it was in transit, and compare the savings in time with other means of transportation. The timetable's measures of space were always shifting. Schedules changed, stations were added or dropped, new technologies increased the speed of the train, and thus shortened the time between places, and weather delayed the train, and thus increased the time. Ultimately, this orientation in space by time changed time itself. The Central Pacific Railroad in November of 1871 had to specify that the schedule operated on Sacramento time, because each city operating on sun time had its own time. Eventually, in 1883, the railroads promoted and enforced standard time to coordinate their schedules. Lives took shape around this. Just as the timetable translated space into time, so the tariff list translated distance into money. This was a relatively simple translation in the case of passengers. 
It depended largely on the class of travel, but it was a much more complicated translation in the case of commodities. The cost of shipping varied from commodity to commodity and was always changing. Here is where relational space grew most important. When the price of movement between two places fell, then those places drew closer together. When it rose, they grew farther apart. Since the prices or tariffs that the railroads charged fell as a whole throughout the late nineteenth century, space had shrunk. The average rate per ton-mile on freight declined fairly steadily on both the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific between 1870 and 1885. With the rates in 1885 roughly one-third of what they had been fifteen years earlier. Things were, however, more complicated than they seemed. The overall decline in freight rates and comparisons between American and European freight rates became something of a stock answer to complaints about American railroad tariffs, but they were not answers that stood up well to scrutiny. In 1897, the president of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe informed the Kansas legislature that the average rate charged per ton mile by his system had fallen 55 percent between 1882 and 1896. The average rate per ton mile, however, was not a particularly revealing statistic. Because railroads charged more for short hauls than for long hauls, and because they discriminated between commodities, charging less for bulk goods like coal or wheat than for luxury goods like coffee or tea, a change in the length of the haul, or an increase in the amount of lower classifications of freight, would produce a decline in the average rate per ton mile without much alteration in rates. The expansion of the Santa Fe after 1882, and the rise in Kansas coal, corn, and wheat production would in and of themselves have gone far to reduce average rates. An American Statistical Association forum in 1897 concluded that the low average freight rates per ton mile in this country are due chiefly to the enormous amount of long-distance freight traffic. The average rate per ton mile told little about the fall in the cost of transportation in relation to the fall of commodity prices. It appears that falling rates for the transportation of corn and wheat, at best, mirrored the falling prices for those commodities. The railroads charged what the crops would bear. Real rates may have fallen in the 1870s, but the price of transportation maintained either roughly the same proportion to the value of the crop, or actually claimed a higher proportion from the 1880s into the 1890s. Real railroad rates spiked proportionately to corn and wheat prices during the Depression of 1893 to 1897. The Atchison's statistics did not answer what C. E. Preevy later called the ethical question regarding the fairness of rates. Preevy wondered whether the reduction in average rates per ton mile has been at the expense of the railroad companies and a direct gain to the public, or does it consist in merely doing less work for less money? Falling prices and average rates were not the issue. Comparative prices and discrimination between shippers were the issues. Because prices did not fall evenly, distance did not shrink evenly and this gave rise to the chronic discontent of those who used the railroads. It did not matter to wholesalers in Spokane, for example, if they seemed to grow closer to Chicago as their rates decreased over time, if the rates to ship from Chicago to Seattle fell even faster. In such a case they were at a disadvantage. They were in comparison to Seattle growing farther away from Chicago, even though Seattle was 229 miles west of Spokane. Similarly, the special rates granted to Winnipeg brought that city closer to eastern Canada than any other place on the Canadian prairies. 3. The Things They Carried If one thinks of the railroad tracks, bridges, and stations that made up the railroad's absolute space as hardware, and rate tables that governed their relational space as software, it is easier to understand how railroads could project order and create disorder in such a way that the very concepts blurred. The physical capacity of railroad lines steadily increased. The limits of the technology, the need of locomotives for coal and water, and the restraints on how far farmers could profitably haul goods by wagon, shaped a seemingly uniform railroad space. 
but technological restraints were to some extent plastic. Over time, everything on a railroad swelled. Freight cars increased in size from ten tons in 1870 to fifteen and twenty tons, reaching forty tons in the early twentieth century, even though these large cars rarely carried a full load. The increases in car size as well as in train size were the fruits of steel rails, which allowed heavier loads, rebuilt and ballasted lines, better brakes, better couplers, and more powerful locomotives. The Pennsylvania was the gold standard of railroad lines, and the one that kept the best records. Its average train carried a payload of 94.3 tons in 1863, 116.8 tons in 1873, and 196 tons in 1883. Western lines, not as well built or as well equipped, almost certainly averaged far less. As railroads built more tracks, and as trains increased in length and in number to carry more freight, they required more freight cars. Freight cars remained inexpensive individually, with their cost remaining steady at about five hundred dollars from the Civil War to 1900. But collectively, they were a major drain on the railroad. To take just three representative Western railroads over this period, the Central Pacific, the Northern Pacific, and the Chicago and Northwestern, the number of freight cars on each road increased, respectively, from 3,200 to 5,850, Central Pacific, 0 to 16,726, Northern Pacific, and 5,982 to 35,194, Chicago and Northwestern. And on each, the large majority of freight cars were the simplest, box cars and flat cars. As railroad tracks connected more and more places, movement often spawned disorder. The timetable disguised this disorder, not simply because trains were often delayed, but because it disguised the fact that many trains were not scheduled. Passenger trains, express trains, and scheduled freights usually did move along smoothly enough, but by the 1880s most western freights were unscheduled and put together as cargo required. For these trains, the railroad was less a single line through space than a contraption that looked like an old tinker toy. Imagine each stick of the tinker toy as a division of 100 to 125 miles, and at the end of each division, the round connecting piece of a tinker toy, was a railroad yard. This division point was the key marker in the absolute space of railroads. Now imagine a freight car bound from San Francisco to Cleveland or from Vancouver to Quebec. The car moved in divisional increments. A locomotive moved it from San Francisco to Sacramento, at which point the engineer put the engine in the roundhouse and the cars with their cargo in the yard, and a new train was made up. The car might sit there for a day or more, before going on to the next division at Reno, where the process was repeated. And so a freight car proceeded across the country. The bigger the division point, at Ogden, where the cars moved from the Central Pacific to the Union Pacific, or Omaha Council Bluffs, where it moved to one of the Chicago lines, the longer the possible delay. In Chicago it could take a week or more to move out of the yards, and none of this took into account bad weather, accidents, or the endless hours spent on sidings waiting for other trains to pass. It was impossible to simply divide the distance traveled by the speed of a freight train, 11 miles per hour to 18 miles per hour, and get the duration of the trip. In 1886, William Van Horn traced nine freight cars moving through mountainous British Columbia, westbound from Donald to Port Moody. The first six cars to depart took from six to nine days to make the entire journey. They spent most of their time sitting in yards and sidings. It took these cars five to seven days to travel the 121 miles between Kamloops and North Bend. The next week, the last three freight cars made the entire trip in half the time, in from three to four days. During the same period, cars going east over the same track took between two and five days between Port Moody and Donald. It is not necessary to run our freight trains very fast to make first-rate time. Van Horn admonished his divisional superintendent. 
It is only necessary to keep cars full watch to see that they are not scattered along the road or delayed at divisional points. The inefficiency of normal railroad movement played to the genius of nineteenth-century railroad owners, who were usually able to find occasions for profit in their own ineptitude. Insiders organized independent fast freight companies, each with its own colored cars reflected in its name, such as the Blue Line or the Red Line, to move freight continuously across the country. A fast freight attained no greater speeds than any other freight, but it kept moving instead of pausing every hundred miles. Insiders skimmed the cream of this traffic for years until management created internal fast freight divisions. Changes in technology produced additional opportunities to divert profits to insiders or well-connected customers. When by the end of the century refrigerated cars were beginning to be used for chilled beef and fruit, the railroads left their purchase to fast freight lines. In 1890, American railroads owned 8,500 refrigerator cars. The fast freight lines and the so-called shipper lines, such as the Armour Packing Company, held 15,000. They, too, became a way to drain off the most profitable traffic, often for the benefit of railroad insiders. Fast freight companies profited by keeping goods in motion, but value also accrued at those places where movements stopped so that shippers could load goods and customers could take them off. With all else equal, farmlands with ready access to railroad stations, warehouses, and elevators had greater value than farmlands too far from a railroad for an easy haul. Towns competed so desperately for railroad connections because railroads increased not only business but also property values. There was money in knowledge of where a railroad was going, or better yet, where a railroad would erect stations, elevators, and warehouses, and where it would establish its divisional points with yards and repair shops. Both those running the railroad and those in existing towns knew this. There were two kinds of urban places in the West market centers, which very often existed prior to the arrival of the railroads, and railroad towns, usually divisional points on the railroad that owed their prosperity and even existence to the railroad's location of roundhouses and shops within them. In both, the railroads created value. In both, the railroads, either the corporation itself or, more often, privileged insiders, sought to monopolize as much as possible the increased land values that they created. The degree of railroad control varied significantly. The Canadian Pacific was one of the few roads that succeeded in allocating this profit to the corporation. In choosing possible division points, the railroad selected the site that allowed it to secure a large enough interest in the adjacent real estate to recoup its expenditures on shops and sidings. In the words of the Toronto Globe in 1882, the managers of the Canadian Pacific had a say in the existence of almost every town or prospective town in the Northwest. Individuals rarely have an opportunity of starting a town without their consent and cooperation. When landowners at Grand Valley, Manitoba, tried to negotiate a better price for a future town site, the railroad found more amenable men at what would become Brandon. When the Canadian Pacific's superintendent, Alpheus Stickney, and chief engineer Thomas Rosser tried to use insider knowledge to engage in private land speculation, Stickney was replaced by Van Horn, who then fired Rosser. American railroads usually allocated speculative profits to corporate officials and board members. James J. Hill insisted that his roads did not engage in townsite development. They didn't. He reserved that for himself. When the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba, the mother road of the Great Northern, built to Devil's Lake, North Dakota, it destroyed many existing town sites simply by avoiding them. This left open the opportunity for Hill and other railroad officers to use the Northwest Land Company, in which Hill held half the stock, to develop towns on behalf of the railroad. In this, Hill did what Charles Perkins of the Burlington and Missouri had done, and what Frederick Billings of the Northern Pacific did. Either individually or through land companies, insiders took advantage of their access to information and profited from expected booms in land prices at towns where railroads located stations and divisional points. 
In the words of the geographer John Hudson, writing about the Dakotas, the successful towns were those platted by railroads or their designated agents. Or, as Charles Francis Adams complained, town site schemes are jobs from beginning to end. I have never struck them anywhere that I did not find some sacrifice of interests of the company at the bottom of the whole thing. Railroads could bully small towns by threatening to move their shops elsewhere, but transcontinentals rarely had the same kind of leverage over large market centers, such as Denver, Salt Lake City, or San Francisco. The associates failed in their efforts to overcome San Francisco and control the juncture of rail and shipping on the Pacific coast by creating at either Goat Island or Oakland a port terminal where they owned all the surrounding real estate. And later in the century, Los Angeles defied the Southern Pacific and defeated that road's attempt to make Santa Monica into the port for the city of Los Angeles. Denver did not wither because the Union Pacific passed to its north, and the city soon had the Kansas Pacific and the Denver and Rio Grande. The Northern Pacific controlled Tacoma, but Seattle emerged as the leading city on Puget Sound and it had secured its independence even before James J. Hill and the Great Northern made Seattle a terminus. The arrival of the Canadian Pacific in Vancouver, which had easy water connections to Puget Sound, forced the Northern Pacific to grant Seattle rates equivalent to Tacoma's. Kansas City was never under the domination of a single railroad. Despite all of the Union Pacific's efforts, Omaha remained Omaha, and the reasons behind the bitter struggle of the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific to dominate Ogden was often a mystery to people who saw Ogden. It never posed a threat to Salt Lake City. There were exceptions. The decision of the Mexican railroads to bypass Matamoros, once a major entrepot in northeastern Mexico, caused that city to wither. Its population had dropped from 40,000 in 1882 to less than 4,000 by the end of the 1890s. And Vancouver, British Columbia might seem the great exception to this, but here the Canadian Pacific did not displace an existing market city so much as create a regional market city where none had existed before. When the Canadian Pacific announced in 1884 that its terminus would be in the immediate vicinity of Coal Harbor and English Bay, it began a process that would transform what was first the site of Gastown and Gassy Jack Dayton's Hotel and Saloon into Vancouver, British Columbia. It did so, however, only after a lengthy and bitter struggle. The Canadian Pacific received a land grant of roughly 6,000 acres near its terminus. Private owners coughed up an additional 175 acres to the railroad. L. A. Hamilton, the CPR's surveyor and later land commissioner, determined the layout of much of the future city, and the goal was quite straightforward, to give the greatest possible value to our CPR own lands, and therefore the least to any other. And from all of this the Canadian Pacific prospered. It did not rush to sell off its holdings, and it imposed stringent terms on buyers. The assessed value of its holdings steadily rose as the city grew, from roughly 1,000 people in 1887 to about 20,000 in 1900. The railroads could not dictate to larger cities, but they still could profit from the value that railroad movement created there. In negotiations with San Francisco, the associates obtained 60 acres at Mission Bay for the Southern Pacific and the Central Pacific. Sixty acres of largely submerged land might seem a pittance relative to the immense land grants held by these two railroads, but that wasn't how the railroads did the math. For accounting purposes, the Central Pacific valued the twelve million acres in land grants it controlled at thirty point three seven million dollars. It valued its half share in the Mission Bay Tideland at $285,000, or $9,487 an acre. In other words, one acre in San Francisco equaled 3,795 acres of land outside San Francisco. This was one possible calculation, and a low one. In its annual report, the Central Pacific put a much higher valuation on its lands in Sacramento, Oakland, and Mission Bay. 
These 670 acres of urban land were worth $7,750,000, exclusive of improvements. Urban lands totaling a little over a section, 640 acres, were thus worth roughly 25% of the entire value of the rest of its land grant. Freight traffic rather than passenger traffic gave lands value in the 19th century West. Western railroads were freight roads, carrying the basic commodities of an agricultural and increasingly industrial nation. Where there was no access to ocean or other water transportation, the railroads were the primary carriers of grain, other agricultural produce, livestock, coal, lumber, and minerals. The remainder of their traffic was manufactures, merchandise, and a variety of miscellaneous goods. The proportion of these things varied across the West, but taking the systems that ran through Kansas as a fair sample of the Western railroads, the figures for 1890 were a total of 29.3 million tons of freight, of which 8.5 million tons, 28.9%, were agricultural products, 3.5 million tons, 11.9% were animal products, 8.2 million tons, 27.9% were minerals, and 3.0 million tons, 10.1%, were forest products. The western roads were even more heavily commodity roads than those in the east. Nearly 80% of their freight traffic came from field, farm, mine, and forest. Although more traffic in Kansas flowed west than east, the cargoes were not simply raw products flowing east and finished products flowing west. In 1888, raw materials such as coal and semi-finished goods such as lumber made up a significant portion of the freight going westward. Businessmen, farmers, and railroad officials all over the west recognized that the price of moving things, railroad rates, did not vary evenly with distance. If they did, there would be no distinction between the most important markers of relational and absolute space. The shorthand for making the cost of transportation proportional to distance was pro rata, and the railroads objected to it strenuously and effectively. Thomas Kimball of the Union Pacific summarized the critique in early March of 1877. The popular assumption is that the cost of transportation is strictly on the basis of uniformity as to miles, and that compensation should be on the same basis of uniformity as to miles, and that compensation should be on the same basis regardless of the length of haul. But, Kimball argued, local traffic was more expensive, because the costs of switching, handling, dropping, and picking up cars and returning cars were far greater per mile on short hauls than on long hauls. This explained the logic behind the distinctions railroads made in the rates for short hauls and those for long hauls, but it did not establish the justice of particular railroad rates. The struggle to define and implement fare rates became the center of spatial politics. A century and more later the details of these rates, the state and federal commissions created to investigate them, the political campaigns that took place around them, in short the very stuff of spatial politics, seem as dreary and arcane as they are distant. But examine these details, and the power of the corporations, and the fear it inspired, becomes apparent. It was visible whether shippers reacted with fury or resignation to the influence railroads had over them. When his Idaho Lumber Company lost its special rates and its markets to the Montana Improvement Company, reputedly owned by Northern Pacific insiders, O. A. Dodge asked the railroad for either a restoration of his old rates, or if the Northern Pacific had deemed it advisable to do all the lumbering business, a fair price for his property. His business was at the mercy of the railroad. If it decided to cut him out of the market, he was resigned. All he could do was ask for compensation. But more victims protested. When the Pacific Railway Commission investigated subsidized railroads in the West in 1887, the anger was palpable, even though it might be hard to imagine that the rates for Spreckles sugar or canned vegetables created deep emotion. In the late 1880s, Lincoln, Nebraska, was a wholesaling center and a rival of Omaha. When the Union Pacific compiled statistics on stations west of Omaha, 
it was the only one where imported goods far exceeded exports. Lincoln had connections with three major railroad systems, but of these only the Union Pacific had direct connections to the Pacific coast. A Lincoln wholesale grocer testified before the commission that by charging wholesalers in Lincoln a higher rate for California products, particularly spreckles, sugar, and canned fruit and vegetables, than they charged wholesalers in Omaha, the Union Pacific gave the Omaha wholesalers the advantage of us, and it is the destruction of our business. The comparative prices of sugar and canned goods became evidence of the extending influence of corporate power. It was, and it helped make the monopoly power of corporations the chief political question of the day. Charles Francis Adams admitted that he did not see how anyone could enter upon any manufacturing history on the line of a railroad corporation which makes a plaything of its tariffs, and he thought the Union Pacific had played with its rates far too much. Railroad rates affected the structure of entire industries. Most Western commodities needed processing of some kind before they reached their final markets. Wheat had to be milled into flour, timber had to be cut at sawmills, ore had to be smelted, cattle and sheep had to be slaughtered and turned into meat and by-products. Where businessmen located mills, stockyards, and smelters often depended on the intricacies of railroad rates. When railroads charged higher rates for hauling wheat than for hauling flour, they were encouraging the growth of mills near the site of production. When they charged higher rates for flour than for wheat, they encouraged millers located near the sites of consumption. When they raised prices on dressed beef, so that a refrigerated carload of forty slaughtered carcasses cost as much to ship as a carload of twenty live animals, even when the cost of the refrigerated car was only one-third more, they favored Chicago as against more westerly stockyards and slaughterhouses. Setting rates was difficult. Even the railroads had very little knowledge of their true costs and thus the profit on any particular item. When in 1877 Collis P. Huntington asked his general superintendent, A. N. Town, for the cost of hauling freight per train per mile, Town, who described himself as a high-tariff and low-speed advocate, replied that, this is a problem difficult of solution, and it cannot be arrived at with any degree of accuracy as a rule. A basis for one road would not be at all applicable to another. The profoundest railroad mathematician, Mr. Fink, had written that such a calculation demanded fifty-eight items of expense, all of which vary on different lines of road, and enter more or less into different combinations. In fact, railroads did not base their rates on the cost of service, which they were incapable of determining. When the imminent arrival of James J. Hill's Great Northern in Butte, Montana in 1889 threatened to drive prices charged by the Union Pacific and Northern Pacific lower, Charles Francis Adams was uncertain whether it was worth competing with Hill. Because he had only guesses, surmises, general impressions, or other vague estimates of the value to us of the Anaconda and Butte business. He certainly could not trust the estimates of his own managers. The Union Pacific and the Northern Pacific were jointly operating the Montana Union Railway in Butte, and after setting prices for the hauling of coal, they offered one supplier a rebate if he reduced the amount of coal he shipped under his contract with the Montana Union, since Adams thought the road was losing money on every ton hauled. This combination of ignorance and miscalculation was not unique to the Union Pacific. In April of 1889, William Mall, an accountant who became Collis Huntington's right-hand man, was in San Francisco examining the books of the Southern Pacific. He reported, As the matter now stands, it is impossible to bring anything to New York, or to arrive at any intelligent understanding about matters from the books here, and each month's business really requires a special investigation, because practices have been changed since the preceding month. There were four separate auditors in the building, and each time one of them picked up a new idea that he liked, he put it in place without any reference to any definite policy, and the result is a constant changing in methods, distribution, etc., which is horrorful in every way. 
when railroads buried state railroad commissioners under piles of incommensurate, confusing, and often arbitrarily constructed data, they were just doing to others what they did to themselves. Albert Fink knew more about railroad rates than any other nineteenth-century North American. He studied railroads the way Darwin studied evolution. But whereas Darwin found a simple rule, Fink watched his rules fly apart. He could find no uniform rule for rate-making. Fink opposed legislating rates since transportation tariffs cannot be established by simple arithmetical or mathematical rules. They require the application of quite a number of principles, all correct in themselves, and this to a great variety of ever-changing facts. For each kind of freight, one needed a separate calculation to determine what rate the traffic could bear. Hence the multiplicity of rates and categories of freight involved in moving things through space. This was a task that demanded experts. When forced to offer a governing principle for rates, Fink contended that railroads priced goods according to what a given commodity could bear. But this was an unfortunate phrase, for it implicated squeezing every possible cent from every commodity. What the railroads meant was that they would price a commodity as high as they could without reducing the volume shipped. In practice, this meant that for certain low-value bulk commodities—wheat, coal, lumber— there was a maximum amount that could be charged no matter how long the carriage. Similarly, to fill a train, and thus at least cover fixed costs, it might be necessary to charge some freight only the cost of carriage. In practice, pricing according to what the traffic would bear meant traffic managers and freight agents set rates experimentally and then modified prices as necessary. Prices were educated guesses constructed by trial and error and varied according to immediate circumstances. This did not mean that the agents could not set rates both cleverly and adroitly. 4. How Railroad Rates Construct Space California provides a good example of how rates constructed space, how space became political, and how for shippers railroad space seemed a kaleidoscope. Lathrop was one pivot around which the kaleidoscope turned in California during the 1870s and 1880s. Surrounded by wheat fields for many miles on all sides, Lathrop, the maiden name of Jane Stanford, was a small, nondescript town in the San Joaquin Valley. But, as Albert Wilbur, the railroad's telegraph operator and later freight agent there in the early 1880s explained, it was the most important junction on the CP system of railroads. That was a function of wheat. A single district to the south of Lathrop was alone supposedly capable of supplying one hundred cars of wheat every day for an entire year. It was where that wheat did not go that made Lathrop important. California railroads moved wheat west, not east. Sailing ships departing from San Francisco Bay delivered wheat to its final destination, which was usually Great Britain. Steamboats along the San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers provided by far the cheapest and most efficient way to move freight to San Francisco Bay in the 1870s and 1880s, and Lathrop was about ten miles from Stockton, which, except during winter and spring high water, was the practical terminus of navigation on the San Joaquin. The way to secure lowest costs and the least expenditure of energy would be to take wheat by rail to Stockton and put it on steamboats and barges. Nature, as Mark Hopkins had realized when he initially planned the terminus of the Central Pacific at Sacramento, seemed to defeat railroads. They could not compete with steamboats for low-cost bulk commodities. But just as the Central Pacific did not terminate at Sacramento, the Southern Pacific Line along the San Joaquin Valley did not terminate at Stockton. The railroad wanted to eliminate the river's ability to dictate rates for the whole San Joaquin Valley. On the Sacramento, the railroad operated its own steamboat lines, but on the San Joaquin it first bought out the steamboats, removing most of them, and then moved to keep wheat off the river. In 1876, the Central Pacific Southern Pacific charged only local rates for freight within California.
But in 1877, the Southern Pacific instituted through rates from San Francisco to Southern California destinations south of Gloucester in Kern County, 377 miles away. In the San Joaquin Valley, the Central Pacific Southern Pacific added to its usual first, second, third, and fourth class rates a local tariff for grain on the Southern Pacific and, more significantly, a port grain tariff for carloads of wheat destined for Sacramento, Stockton, Oakland, and San Francisco. The low special rate extended to the end of the San Joaquin Valley, and it created a relational space measured by cost that compressed the valley, pulling towns comparatively closer to shipping points. No major valley wheat-producing area paid more than six dollars a ton to move wheat to San Francisco Bay ports for shipment abroad. The managers of the Central Pacific Southern Pacific wanted to encourage grain production, but they also wanted to keep wheat off the San Joaquin River and away from Stockton. The goal was to make the combination of railroad fares to get to the river and steamboat and barge fares on the river higher than direct railroad fares to San Francisco and Oakland. Farmers could get a lower fare to Stockton than to Oakland or San Francisco, but transfer fees to get the wheat from the railroad car to the steamboat added $1.50 a carload, and this combined with the steamboat's own charges of $1.50 per ton, or $15 per carload, made the price higher than shipping directly to San Francisco. Even at later much lower steamboat rates of $0.70 cents to $1 a ton reported in the 1890s, the railroads undercut the steamboats. Lathrop was the key to their doing so. Below Lathrop, the railroad paralleled the navigable channel of the San Joaquin. In effect, the railroad's special rate charged farmers a great deal to get wheat to Lathrop and very little to leave, as long as their cargo was going to the bay. This was very clear to farmers who shipped from Lathrop. It cost them one dollar twenty per ton to get their wheat a few miles to Stockton by rail, and this fee, plus the transfer fee and the steamboat fare, raised their shipping costs above the two dollars twenty cents that the railroad charged to carry the wheat directly to Oakland and San Francisco. Only those who could haul their wheat directly to the docks on the navigable part of the San Joaquin could effectively use the river. For most farmers, the railroad had erased the San Joaquin as a source of transportation, not because of superior technology or efficiency, but because it used its rates to manipulate and control space. Farmers in the upper San Joaquin Valley encountered another price exacted by the railroad. What the railroads gave in freight going to San Francisco, they took back in freight leaving San Francisco, which was the port of entry for goods coming in by sea, and also, because of lower through rates, for transcontinental traffic. Costs ranged from five cents per one hundred pounds for those stations near San Francisco to one dollar twenty-five for one hundred pounds, or twenty-five dollars a ton, for the farthest valley stations. Again, the increase in rates was not uniform across distance. Stations below Lathrop that could use the San Joaquin River paid little more for first-class goods coming in than they did for wheat going out. Stations beyond Lathrop faced a steep escalation in price. Farmers in the San Joaquin Valley shipped wheat at a maximum of six dollars a ton, but they paid freight rates that topped out at twenty-five dollars a ton for goods they consumed. Rate reductions had meaning only within the particular spatial patterns of traffic. Thus, the California Railroad Commission could appear in 1883 to deliver a ringing victory to the state's farmers by reducing grain rates 35 percent, but their reduction applied only to grain going east, which was not the direction that grain traveled. For one ton of grain shipped from San Francisco to interior points, there are more than a thousand tons transported in the other. Upon the one ton, which is charged for at exorbitant rates, there is a reduction upon the one thousand, which is the produce of the labor and time of the producer. There is no reduction whatever. The Southern Pacific and the Central Pacific erased the natural advantage of Stockton's location on the San Joaquin River, but they simultaneously justified their rate structure by appealing to nature. 
In the 1870s, the Central Pacific, using short-haul rates, charged three to six times as much to haul goods from Ogden, where it connected to the Union Pacific, to points in Nevada, as it charged using long-haul rates, to move identical goods over the Sierras from San Francisco to the same places. General Manager Town regarded such rates as part of his duty to ensure the highest possible earnings and the least possible operating expenses for the Central Pacific. J. C. Stubbs of the Central Pacific justified such rates by claiming it was unfair to have the artificial advantages of the railroad trump the natural advantages of San Francisco. In 1881, when the associates had managed to make friends of two of the three railroad commissioners, the California Railroad Commission ruled that as long as the rate from Ogden to Reno was reasonable, it made no difference if the rate from Ogden to San Francisco was less, even if Reno was two hundred miles closer to Ogden and the railroad had to cross the Sierras to get to San Francisco. San Francisco had the sea, and no regulation of whatever nature can overcome these differences until railroads can transport persons and property as vessels on navigable water can perform the same service. Appeals to nature were thus opportunistic. In fact, the Southern Pacific had already overcome Stockton and the San Joaquin River, and by the 1880s it was maneuvering to overcome San Francisco. The advantages that San Francisco Bay gave San Francisco were quite real. From the completion of the first transcontinental, the Union Pacific and the Associates recognized that they were at the mercy of the Pacific Mail Steamship Company. With its connections by rail across Panama, that company could move goods nearly as quickly as the railroads and at a much lower cost. In 1873, Jay Gould of the Union Pacific complained about competition from steamships, saying, it is outrageous that we have to carry our California business at so low rates. By the late 1880s, little had changed. Charles Francis Adams testified before the Pacific Railway Commission that the Pacific Mail Steamship Company could reduce the rate until it would make the business worthless to us, and yet make something itself on traffic to the East Coast. This was an amazing statement, one worth lingering over for it meant that the railroads really were not necessary for much of the freight traffic between the east and the far west. If the Pacific Mail wished to do so, it could dominate the traffic. The question then becomes why it did not do so. The first part of the answer is that the Pacific Mail was a lazy and corrupt corporation. It had, as its name indicated, a federal subsidy to carry the mail. It carried coffee and fruit from Central America to San Francisco, and sent rice, lumber, flour, and goods from San Francisco wholesalers in return. It also carried manufactured goods from New York, and sent wine, lead, rags, and perhaps rice back. It did not carry wheat. That went by sailing ship. The second part of the answer is that the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, recognizing their vulnerability to rate-cutting by the Pacific Mail, offered to pay what amounted to a subsidy for the company to raise its rates. The Pacific Mail consented. It could make more money by doing less. The subsidy that the railroads paid Pacific Mail remained in operation for most of the period from 1870 into the 1890s. It took the form of an agreement to buy space in its steamers at above-market prices, first by the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific, and later, as more transcontinentals reached the Pacific coast, by the Transcontinental Association. The railroads acted as a freight agent, either reselling this space at the prevailing transcontinental railroad rates to shippers, leaving it empty, or, as the Southern Pacific did, shipping the equipment it needed to build in Mexico by sea rather than by rail. In return, the Pacific Mail charged rates identical to those of the railroads, did not add new ships, and refused to solicit traffic to compete with the railroads. Sometimes, when a new group took control of the line, the Pacific Mail would demand an increase in the subsidy from the railroads. The result was usually a quick capitulation by the railroads, although Gould and Huntington in 1875 attempted to create a competing steamship line to rid themselves of the Pacific Mail. 
When, as a result, Pacific Mail stocks fell, Gould briefly gained control of that company. But the Pacific Mail was itself dependent on the Panama Railroad, the short line across the isthmus between the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, that was, on its completion in 1855, the first real transcontinental railroad. Trevor Park, a speculator like Gould, took over the Panama Railroad and abrogated its contract with the Pacific Mail. He eventually attached Pacific Mail steamers for non-payment of debts owed the Panama Railroad. Gould capitulated and sold out, and the railroads and the Pacific Mail once more agreed on a subsidy. There was a second fight, in 1880, over the amount of the subsidy. The steamship company cut its rates on first-class freight in January of 1880, and prepared to contract for new vessels. They left lower classes of freight to other steamship lines and sailing ships. The railroads surrendered, raised their offer of a monthly subsidy to the steamship company from $25,000 to $110,000 a month, and renewed their agreement. Gould and Huntington came onto the board of the Pacific Mail. The threat of the Pacific Mail did much to explain how the railroads constructed space in California during the 1870s and early 1880s. Together, the dearth of transcontinental traffic and the threat of the Pacific Mail made the Southern Pacific Central Pacific System a regional road. It funneled goods into San Francisco Bay, and it transported goods, both California manufactures and imports, out. Wheat and flour accounted for 15% of the total traffic on the system into the late 1880s. It carried only a limited set of goods east. Eighteen items, chief among them sugar, fruit, initially canned, and wine, made up the large majority of this traffic. The great rise of California exports by rail in the late 1880s consisted largely of sugar and fruit, canned, dried, and green along with a brief spike in grain. Only green fruit shipped in refrigerated cars gave the railroads a clear advantage over steamships. San Franciscans thus did not initially need the Associates' railroads to connect the city to the east or the rest of the world, but they needed the railroads to connect them to the rest of California. Railroads gathered California's products for shipment out of San Francisco and adjacent ports and distributed San Francisco's manufactures and their imports to the interior. The railroads and San Francisco's powerful wholesalers reached an accommodation on the backs of interior consumers. The Central Pacific Southern Pacific charged through rates only for out-of-state goods going into San Francisco. It charged much higher local rates for all goods, except wheat, shipped within the state. The result was that it was cheaper to ship out-of-state goods by rail into San Francisco and then reship them back to their destination. The railroad's rate structure served the city's commercial dominance, and San Francisco's wholesalers accepted higher transportation prices that could be passed on to interior consumers. Frank Norris captured this accommodation in a scene in The Octopus. Norris's character, Harron Derrick, watched the plows that his father had bought pass through his fictional San Joaquin Valley town of Bonneville on the Southern Pacific on their way to San Francisco, where they will be shipped back to Bonneville. Think of it, he declaimed. Here's a load of stuff for Bonneville that can't stop at Bonneville, where it is consigned, but has got to go up to San Francisco first by way of Bonneville at forty cents per ton, and then be reshipped from San Francisco back to Bonneville again at fifty-one cents per ton, the short-haul rate. Isn't it a pretty mess? Isn't it a farce? The whole dirty business. As expressed in dollars, a straight line was not the shortest distance between two points in the relational geometry of the railroads. The transcontinentals, however, chafed under the limits steamship competition imposed. In the 1870s and early 1880s, Gould and Huntington adopted two new tactics. They formed fast freight companies to try to give the railroads a clear advantage for time-sensitive goods. But their more critical innovation was the so-called special contract system, which proved an ingenious way to construct space for the benefit of the railroads. The system created two sets of westbound rates— the rates in the first set were prohibitively high, 
Those in the second were much lower, supposedly about one-half the higher rates. Merchants could, however, get the set of lower rates, the special contract, only if they agreed to ship all their goods by the railroad. If they received any goods by sea, they had to pay the higher rates. The railroad further demanded that anyone shipping on a special contract not buy or sell from anyone who shipped goods by means other than rail. To enforce the contracts, the railroads demanded the right to inspect their customers' books to verify that they complied with the terms of the contract. The special contract system explained the sudden preference of San Francisco merchants for long-distance rail shipments in the early 1880s. Through shipments by rail to San Francisco rose from 226,585,940 pounds in 1879 to 387,174,940 pounds in 1883, even as local shipments stagnated in the early 1880s. The rise in through shipments was a mark of the Central Pacific's and Southern Pacific's ability to coerce wholesalers. Very few individual merchants dared challenge the railroad. As the California Railroad Commissioner W. W. Foote put it, the Central Pacific, under existing conditions, without competing eastern lines west of Utah, and almost absolutely controlling local traffic within this state, is too powerful an organization to be successfully resisted by any individual or firm. Even if a wholesaler received all its goods by sea, it would still have to use the railroad to distribute to the interior, and the railroad's ability to grant rebates to a rival firm could kill the non-cooperating firm. Foote clearly understood the consequences. The contract system enforced upon the merchants of San Francisco, by means of which they are forced to pay double prices unless they ship all their goods by rail, partakes more of the nature of a crime than a mere breach of duty. The special contract was precisely the kind of abuse that the California Railroad Commission was designed to correct, but two of the commissioners elected in 1882 refused to act. They were widely rumored to have become friends of the railroad. 5. The Rise of the Octopus the fight over the special contract system was an example of spatial politics. The system turned San Francisco's merchants into anti-monopolists, and this in turn created the Octopus, the only briefly successful Southern Pacific political machine of the era. Behind this paradoxical result was the blind boss, Chris Buckley, who headed San Francisco's democratic machine. Born on Christmas Day, 1845, he was a man of transformations. He had been a Republican and became a Democrat. He had once been a drunk but became sober. He had even once left San Francisco for Vallejo, but returned to reign from the Alhambra Saloon on Bush Street. In 1882 he claimed to be an anti-monopolist. The San Francisco merchants joined an anti-monopoly crusade led by the Democrats that swept the California elections of 1882. The nearly immediate defection of two of their new railroad commissioners had not been what they expected, and they were even more dismayed by two decisions of Judge Stephen Field. The Southern Pacific had nearly crippled many counties by refusing to pay taxes. Litigation culminated in County of San Mateo v. Southern Pacific Railroad Company, 1882, and County of Santa Clara v. Southern Pacific Railroad Company, 1883, which famously voided the tax bills for charging different rates for corporate and non-corporate owners, and ruled that the corporation was a person within the meaning of the Fourteenth Amendment and entitled to all constitutional protections. Field, whom his fellow California Democrat, Stephen Mallory White, called one of the most dishonest characters that has ever discharged the function of a judicial office, was also one of the associate's most reliable judicial friends. Fundamental democratic principles were at stake in Field's decisions. 
Governor George Stoneman challenged Field's conflation of corporate persons with actual living and breathing citizens, arguing that the state had a right to distinguish between the natural person who is a part of the government and the artificial person which is but a creature of the government. Field's decisions trampled logic and a core democratic practice that stretched back to the founding of the Republic. Lodging in the legislature and the legislature alone, the right to determine taxes. In 1884, Stoneman called a special session of the legislature devoted solely to railroad legislation. Anti-monopolists wanted a clear demonstration of state authority over railroads, and they wanted taxes, including back taxes, from the railroads. They also wanted the Barry Bill which would have outlawed the special contract system and prohibited any discrimination between individuals by the railroad. The anti-monopolist coalition seemed invincible. With a 61 to 19 Democratic majority in the Assembly and a 32 to 8 majority in the Senate, anti-monopolists were confident that even if conservative Democrats, who had legitimate doubts about the constitutionality of some of the measures, and representatives of areas that had reasons to support the railroads, joined conservative Republicans, the bills would pass. The bills sailed through the Assembly, but in the Senate, bill after bill ended in a tie, with the Democratic lieutenant governor casting the deciding vote to defeat them. Stoneman and the anti-monopolists were thwarted by the blind boss, even though Buckley had publicly supported the bills. Nine of ten Democratic San Francisco senators, Buckley's lambs, good fellows, who could gather in a few simoleons without overtaxing their strength, voted against the anti-monopolist agenda. For Buckley, a battle between the railroads and anti-monopolists was an opportunity that only a fool would let pass. The railroad could taste defeat, or it could sweeten Buckley's pot with the necessary simoleons, 19th century slang for the dollar. The Pacific Railway Commission later estimated that the Southern Pacific spent about $700,000 on politics that year. These funds became part of a rich stew of boodle, kickbacks from officeholders in San Francisco, payments from those needing franchises, grants, contracts, or other favors from San Francisco, protection money, and more, that Buckley used to keep down San Francisco's taxes, feed his lambs, and make himself a wealthy man. The political marriage of Leland Stanford and Christopher Buckley gave birth to the octopus. The octopus temporarily thwarted anti-monopolists, but the Pacific Mail remained the nemesis of the Southern Pacific, and with the arrival of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, and the Atlantic and Pacific in 1885, the Southern Pacific lost its railroad monopoly. As more and more transcontinentals reached the West Coast, they were unable to agree on the division of payments to the Pacific Mail made by the Transcontinental Association. In March of 1885, the Pacific Mail again flexed its muscles. It lowered its prices, driving rates on the railroads down 40% during the last quarter of 1885. Then, in December 1885, the Atchison and the Atlantic Pacific announced their withdrawal from the Transcontinental Association, which formally dissolved in February of 1886. By March, transcontinental rates were in freefall, with rates on the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific falling from 1.18 cents per ton mile in 1885 to 0.43 cents in April of 1886. The result, Albert Fink thought, was a wholly unnecessary, thoughtless, and unjustifiable difficulty. The through business had by 1885 been rendered valueless by increased competition. It was so subdivided among competing roads that Charles Francis Adams estimated it formed but 5% of the Union Pacific's entire business for 1885. In 1886 it was even worse. There seemed no bottom to the catastrophe. The managers of the Canadian Pacific thought they could capture the transcontinental trade of the chief cities of the United States east of the Rockies. 
The Canadian Pacific sought to use its continuous line, its shorter rail distance, and its lighter grades to absorb the added cost of steamship connections from British Columbia to San Francisco and other ports. It had little choice. There was virtually no through business to carry to or from Western Canada. By January of 1887, the general traffic manager of the Canadian Pacific reported a wholesale slaughter of rates and general scramble for business. Rates plummeted, traffic increased, and net revenue fell. A single commodity, sugar, reflects the dilemma of the Southern Pacific amid these rate wars. Between 1882 and the early 1890s, sugar, which meant Spreckles sugar, was the major commodity shipped east from California by rail. Sugar was, by and large, not even produced in California. It came from Hawaii and was shipped out of San Francisco. Any threat to sugar was thus a significant threat to the Southern Pacific, and in 1886 the Pacific Mail struck at sugar and at another leading California export, salmon. In February 1886 the Pacific Mail shipped only 105 pounds of sugar. In April it shipped 2,495,735 pounds, largely to New York. It was a shot not so much across the bow of the Southern Pacific as directly into its corporate offices. Sugar shipments by rail fell from just below 120 million pounds in 1886 to just above 70 million pounds in 1887, while sugar shipped east by sea rose from virtually nothing for most of 1885 to roughly 20 million pounds in 1887 and 1888. The railroad could not afford to lose this kind of traffic. In the fall of 1886, the Pacific Mail proved it could do the same with salmon. Having previously shipped only trivial amounts, it suddenly sent 597,500 pounds east that October. And in 1887, shipments of wine by sea increased dramatically while those going by rail fell. The Southern Pacific lost this traffic to sailing ships. Falling rates on land and sea meant that overall traffic increased, but the increase came largely in imports carried at a loss. Losing exports to the shipping companies did double damage, since it meant having to haul empty boxcars east. In 1886, the Union Pacific carried 35% heavier tonnage than the year before, and made 26% less money. In 1887, the Southern Pacific increased its freight by 10%, while its revenues supposedly also fell 10%. Unable to sustain their losses, the railroads agreed to reconstitute the Transcontinental Association by mid-1887. But it remained fragile. With the passage of the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, a new railroad organization, the Interstate Commerce Railway Association, took over the job of arranging freight rates. The railroad's troubles did not benefit San Francisco. Under the stress of competition, the Southern Pacific had lowered rates from eastern points to interior California towns without apparently lowering rates out of San Francisco. Although through rates to San Francisco were still lower than direct rates to an interior town such as Fresno, they were now higher than the combination of the fare to San Francisco and the fare to Fresno. Such changes put Chicago wholesalers in competition with San Francisco. The declining position of San Francisco wholesalers consolidated their political opposition to the railroads and encouraged them to subsidize steamship lines and turn to tramp steamers and sailing vessels. The Traffic Association of California, founded in 1891, moved aggressively to preserve San Francisco's status as the state's wholesaling center. Dominated by young men and younger methods, instead of the old mercantile fossils, the association did not challenge the railroad directly. Its members simply proposed to deal collectively with shippers. They were in effect a union of merchants. Their goal was high overland rail rates to the interior and low rates by sea to San Francisco. This was an ironic anti-monopoly effort aimed at ensuring San Francisco's preeminence. The merchants became formidable opponents of Chris Buckley and the octopus.
6. Regulating Space In the nation, as well as in California, the construction of relational space became a focus of anti-monopoly politics. Anti-monopolists in the 1860s and 1870s initially sought to reassert the primacy of absolute space. They advocated uniform charges by the mile within each class of goods as the easiest way to make rates transparent and fair. And, true to their liberal roots, anti-monopolists embraced competition as the way to secure such rates. The first consequence of the building of multiple lines in a single territory was the creation of a basic distinction between competitive and non-competitive points. The competitive points were where railroads crossed or converged, or came close enough together that a day's wagon trip could reach two or more lines. Competitive points tended to draw steadily closer in the relational geography of railroads, while the non-competitive points drifted farther and farther apart. As S. F. Pearson of the General Ticket and Passenger Agents Association put it, the result of rate discrimination between competitive and non-competitive points was to tax unduly the business where no competition exists. It is easy to see why many inhabitants of non-competitive points thought that the only hope was to attract another railroad. Many did just that. In 1888, Charles Francis Adams estimated that less than 5% of the stations on the Union Pacific were non-competitive. Competition worked to lower rates most effectively at large transfer points with considerable traffic, but overall it did not eliminate inequities. It just changed their logic and form. Many anti-monopolists soon regretted the results of competition. Peter Day, president of the Nebraska State Railroad Commission, explained why merchants preferred stable, reasonable rates over rate wars that caused rates to fall precipitously. If any merchants bought new goods to profit from a rate cut, they all had to do so or be undersold. But this also meant they had to sell those goods they already had in stock at the new lower price, taking a loss on these goods whose cost included the earlier, higher freight rates. Not only did losses offset gains, but present instability sowed future instability as warring railroads secretly promised customers cut rates in the form of rebates during ensuing months, ensuring further chaos. Competition encouraged pools. A pool was a formal organization among competing roads to divide the revenue of a certain class of traffic, the transcontinental traffic, the traffic in Colorado or Utah, or the traffic passing to and from the Union Pacific to the Chicago roads at Omaha. As Charles Francis Adams explained, The vital element of a pool is the payment of all money received into a common fund and the return of the money in fixed proportions to each party in the pool. These divisions of revenue were predetermined. It made no difference how much traffic a road was actually carrying, although the percentages would be periodically adjusted to reflect the changing tonnage of each road. A pool made numerous railroad companies act as if they were a single company. It demanded a unity of management, consisted, its advocates argued, with the public interests. The most ambitious pools established a permanent executive department to see that the resolutions passed and agreements made are faithfully carried out. They also had a judiciary department consisting of a board of arbitration to settle disputes. The roads agreed to submit their books to a pool commissioner to make sure that they were turning over the promised revenue. Pools offered a means of private corporate regulation. Neither they nor price-fixing were illegal under common law, but neither were their agreements enforceable in court. Charles Francis Adams had initially been one of the most enthusiastic advocates of pools. In 1879 he had joined Albert Fink in managing the most famous pool of all by accepting the position of chair of the Board of Arbitration of the Eastern Trunk Line Association, a railroad pool that encompassed virtually all of the major lines east of the Mississippi. In the West, the famous Iowa Pool controlled the distribution of traffic to the roads connecting with the Union Pacific at Omaha, and other pools multiplied across the region in the 1870s and 1880s. The Union Pacific, for example, 
had pools everywhere before the Interstate Commerce Act outlawed them in 1887. Because there was no way, legally, to enforce the agreements, pools tended to be transitory. They were vulnerable to false bookkeeping, solicitation of traffic off the books at lower rates, rebates to preferred customers, and other manipulations. They fell apart as a result of cheating, the conviction of one member that it could defeat the others in open competition, and the invasion of a pool territory by a new road. Eventually even the famous Iowa pool declined and fell apart. Each case of cheating, each incident of aggression, each cutting across of lines or invasion of new territory made it harder to reconstitute a pool. Once a pool dissolved and competition resumed, the outcomes were limited. The railroads could reconstitute a pool, or fight until only one remained, or one railroad could buy out the others. All, as Adams contended, eventually resulted in combination. In order for pools to work, they needed to be state-sanctioned and state-enforced. Although pools imposed stability only at the cost of higher rates, some customers and even some reformers considered them better than the alternatives if they could be managed honestly. William Felker, an attorney who served as a Colorado Railroad Commissioner, testified before the Pacific Railway Commission in Denver in 1887 that he favored railroad pools, if they were honest, because they brought predictability and allowed merchants to plan. But he added that he had never known of an honest one. Charles Francis Adams did not differ on the situation in Colorado. He wrote his general manager in 1887 that the Colorado pool had been arbitrary, excessive in rates, and refused to observe the signs of the times. It would bring a popular reaction. The particular dishonesty of railroad pools that Felker had in mind involved the rebates that freight agents offered favored customers in order to increase their road's share of traffic. Rebates were the children of competition. A railroad with a monopoly, like the Central Pacific in Nevada, might discriminate between places or among types of freight, but it had little reason to offer rebates. A railroad facing competition, however, had reasons to offer special rates to its most valued or powerful customers, or to places it wanted to build up. The railroads defended rebates as necessary and legal, but they also found them expensive and a source of unending trouble. They could not, however, afford to eliminate them unless their competitors also eliminated them, or they would lose traffic. Under competitive conditions, a tariff list gave a shipper merely general information about what the going rates were in sending a given quantity of goods from point A to point B. Only a fool regarded railroad tariff tables as the actual rates paid. As Joseph Nimmo, the chief of the U.S. Bureau of Statistics, put it, Published freight tariffs supplied no information whatever to the public as to the actual rates charged. Published rates, Albert Fink testified in 1880, were not carried into practical execution. They were often disregarded almost as soon as they were made. At a competitive point, a shipper confronted published rates, discounted rates quoted by local freight agents, or rates quoted by the armies of agents sent out by fast freight companies which ran their own cars. These quoted rates were not, however, the rates at which goods traveled. Those were secret, because privileged shippers got private rebates. If the rebates offered to privileged customers had been open to everyone, they would have amounted to a lower special rate on goods, but because they were secret and not a subject of direct public knowledge, they became matters of rumor, innuendo, and gossip. A shipper knew what he paid, but he had no idea what railroads were charging other customers. Rebates were abhorrent to anti-monopolists because they were discriminatory, secret, and in violation of the railroad's common law and statutory duty to offer equal access to all customers. Competition, rather than making railroad space seem legible and fair, increased the sense of disorientation, inequity, and outrage. The net effect of competition and accompanying discrimination was to make cities and towns all over the West the equivalent of railroad cars that were moving constantly backward and forward 
through relational space at the whim of the corporations. With distance a function of cost, one day a town was closer to its suppliers and customers than a rival town, the next day it was farther away. Westerners wanted to rein in the railroads, but their attempts to do so by luring even more railroads west through local subsidies in order to force rates down only exacerbated the situation. The more competition exacerbated discrimination, the more reformers turned away from it as a panacea and looked toward public regulation. Regulation faced difficulties of its own. In 1887 Charles Perkins of the Burlington engaged in an exchange of letters with William Larrabee, the Republican governor of Iowa, a leading anti-monopolist. Among the many and often contradictory things Perkins said about pricing was that railroads based their prices, or at least should base them, on the costs of doing business plus a reasonable profit measured in terms of the return on capital. Larrabee retorted that much railroad stock represented no real capital investment and that much of the actual capital had come from public subsidies in the West. This made it difficult, if not impossible, to calculate a reasonable profit. And he pointed out, because costs went down with each ton carried, predetermined rates designed to ensure reasonable profit could never reflect the actual cost of any shipment. Agreeing on fair and reasonable profits was practically impossible. Not only did it involve agreeing on the capital actually invested in railroads, but it also demanded reliable data on railroad costs. The railroad's failure to keep statistics that would allow the allocation of costs, and the high proportion of fixed costs, opened up the possibility of manipulation by apportioning costs to particular items of traffic. Economists sympathetic to regulation thought that basing rates on cost of service was, as Edwin Seligman wrote, neither practiced nor practicable. Finally, if fair meant non-discriminatory, then railroads had to renounce their quite reasonable assertion that certain kinds of discrimination were necessary to the construction of railroad space. If the railroads could not assign lower rates to low-value, high-bulk products such as wheat or coal, then the railroads' utility to the nation was diminished. The rates railroads charged, and the discriminations they practiced, became part of spatial politics. They called into question the relationships between corporations and the governments that gave them life, and more critically, the relationship between citizens. Those whom the railroads favored had advantages over all others. A whole series of words that held basic values of the republic, equity, freedom, non-discrimination, became words that took on a spatial meaning. As the railroads made and remade space in the late nineteenth century, they pulled cars as full of politics, ideology, and social relationships as of lumber, wheat, and coal. A Railroad Life Alfred A. Cohen A. A. Cohen had a wicked tongue. When he turned it on the associates of the Central Pacific Railroad, he memorably described Charles Crocker as a living, breathing, waddling monument of the triumph of vulgarity, viciousness, and dishonesty. He added, regarding his days of intimacy with the associates, I was compelled to come in constant contact with many men whose habits, whose manners, whose mode of thought, and whose conversation were not calculated to advance me either in my own esteem or in that of my fellow citizens. But I thank God, who tempers the wind to the shorn lamb, that I was not required to cooperate with General David Colton. Yet, before and after he flayed them, he was their friend. A. A. Cohen had connections. In the 1860s, he was a lesser member of the Bank of California ring that controlled much of the investment in the Comstock load and San Francisco. Through the ring, he knew D. O. Mills, William Ralston, Lloyd Tevis, whom Collis Huntington thought the ablest man on the West Coast, William Sharon, and Michael Reese. Those were, at the time, the richest men in California. Through the ring he also came to know the associates of the Central Pacific Railroad, who would become the richest men in California. 
He sold the associates the Oakland Railroad and Ferry in 1868 and the Alameda Railroad and Ferry in 1869, when the associates were forging their California monopoly. He continued to manage these properties until final payment was made, and they were consolidated with the Central Pacific in 1870. In the early 1870s, he tried to form a syndicate with Mills, Ralston, and Tevis to buy either the Southern Pacific or the Central Pacific, but his partners knew too much about the actual condition of the road to pay what the associates were asking. To Cohen's dismay, no trade was ever made. Still, Cohen remained a friend of the associates until the middle of the decade, even as the associates demeaned him, irritated him, and disappointed him. In the early 1870s, Huntington had considered making Cohen an associate, and Stanford seemed to agree, but in his usual bungling manner, he changed his mind and angered Cohen, who, as a result, did not feel very friendly to the associates. An offer to make him the railroad's attorney was a poor consolation prize. Hopkins, who was becoming a man who spent far too much time with his pets, wrote cryptically that Cohen was one of the dogs that fetch as well as he carries. Relations between our Israelite friend, as Huntington called Cohen behind his back, and the associates were souring. The language of friendship and the networks it sustained were nonetheless too important for Cohen to abandon lightly. In a letter in March of 1875, Cohen wrote to Friend Huntington, reminding him that it was a bad plan to throw off our old friends, and asking for railroad passes for himself and his wife. But the salutation on the letter thanking Huntington for the passes was, Dear Sir, Friendship was essential to business but by fall the associates no longer considered Cohen a friend. Someone, apparently Crocker, told Huntington that Cohen was cheating them on a contract to transport coal by ship for the Central Pacific, and Cohen solicited a friend, D.O. Mills, to write in his defense. By the beginning of 1876 these charges had resolved into a personal quarrel with Charles Crocker, accompanied by acts of hostility on Crocker's part friendship had gone bad. With years of knowledge and a deep well of resentment, Cohen turned railroad reformer. He accepted employment as a lobbyist to advocate, as a later lawsuit by associates put it, a bill to regulate the rate of charges on the plaintiff's railroads. Railroad politics were complicated, and Cohen's sudden turn from railroad owner and railroad attorney involved more than a sudden change of heart. Outraged, Huntington considered him a lower man in my opinion than he had heretofore supposed lived on the face of the earth. Huntington's outrage sprang more from his fear of Tom Scott, of the Texas and Pacific, than from his hatred of Granger laws like the Archer Bill, which Cohen was advocating, although that hatred was deep enough. Scott was, at first glance, an odd ally for a born-again railroad reformer like Cohen. But reform and corruption were often allies in railroad politics. In Sacramento, Cohen was lobbying for the Archer Bill, which set maximum rates and sought to end the rate discrimination in favor of long hauls, with an animus that surprised the Central Pacific's superintendent, A. N. Town. Since San Francisco was the main beneficiary of long-haul discrimination, the well-connected Cohen's devotion to reform was more than a little puzzling. Relatively few businessmen in San Francisco at that time shared it, both because it would hurt their commercial dominance and because the Southern Pacific, for all its faults, had a San Francisco terminus and favored San Francisco with through rates. The Southern Pacific was then engaged in a bitter battle with Scott's Texas and Pacific, destined for San Diego. The goal was to become the Southern Transcontinental. The key to the puzzle was that the very threat of regulation hurt Southern Pacific bond sales, and that helped Tom Scott. Scott, Huntington wrote, has a stronghold of the newspaper press of this country with Cohen to send false telegrams over here with Scott to circulate them. The associates defeated the Archer Bill, although a weaker bill passed, and set out to ruin Cohen through the same networks that Cohen was using to assault them. Huntington wrote Hopkins that he wanted to brand Cohen a thief, and send it out as news, 
although it would not be to many who know him. The associates published their charges that he was a thief in order, in Cohen's words, to crush the defendant, to blacken him in the esteem of his fellow citizens, to hold him up to execration as a dishonest agent. Only after defaming him did they sue him over claims he had cheated them in the sale of property, connected with the purchase of Cohen's railroads, and in his contract to carry coal for them. The suit was a big mistake. Cohen knew far too much about the associates, and he knew how to reveal his knowledge in ways that could do the most harm. Cohen had a powerful ally in James Simonton, the editor of the San Francisco Bulletin, enemy of the Associates, and, most significantly, manager of the Associated Press. Simonton made sure that stories on the Cohen trial achieved wide circulation, and Cohen used the trial as a stage for revealing and ridiculing the Associates' business methods, weakness, and scandals. He had Crocker and E. H. Miller, Jr., the company treasurer, on the stand, and he questioned them about the contract and finance company, which was the Central Pacific's Credit Mobilier, and the matter of the company books that had disappeared just as Congress prepared to investigate. He had Crocker, who supervised the building of the railroad, testify that he did not know who was the last president of the contract and finance company. He made Crocker look like a fool, which was not all that hard to do. As Huntington said of his associate in another context, It is very difficult for anyone to be interviewed by an unfriendly newspaper man without getting hurt, and Mr. Crocker, of all the men I know, is not the most unlikely to get hurt. Cohen, no doubt, took pleasure in his ridicule of Crocker, but his target in all this was the financial markets, and he did not confine his activities to the courtroom. He wrote a pamphlet, deconstructing lie by lie, false statement by false statement, exaggeration by exaggeration, the case Huntington made for the Southern Pacific. But it was not just the broadsides that Cohen fired. There was the constant harassing fire. There is something over the wires nearly every day to the associate press in the interest of Cohen or, say, against us, Huntington reported in May. Such things took a toll on credit and bond sales. By June the damage was becoming heavy, and Huntington wanted to settle, but the damage rolled on into the summer and fall. In October, Cohen, who until that point had not acted as his lawyer, delivered his summation to the judge, which he then published as a pamphlet. It was a masterpiece of nineteenth-century vitriol. The associates lost their suit— and they were unable to quiet Cohen. The pamphlet called attention to the mansions that the California associates, but not Huntington, were building on Knob Hill. Mark Hopkins and Leland Stanford had jointly bought a block bordered by California, Powell, Pine, and Mason Streets, and Crocker and Colton built nearby. Huntington's own New York living standards in the 1870s were such that his real estate agent complained that he could not sell his New York house until Huntington fixed the very bad smell that pervades the ground floor caused by rot from leaking pipes. Huntington would have much preferred that his associates not flaunt their wealth by building mansions that testified to their gains. Cohen turned on the mansions with glee. Crocker's new home had so much drapery, tapestry, and cloth that visitors shall be filled with doubt whether it is designed for a haberdasher's shop or a stage scene of a modern furniture drama. In December, Cohen devoted an entire pamphlet in the form of a play to Stanford, the president of the road. In The California King, Cohen mocked him as sullen, remorseless, grand, and peculiar— with the ambition of an emperor and the spite of a peanut vendor. By the end of the year, Huntington had had enough. He was in Washington in early January of 1877, making arrangements for the coming session of Congress, and staying, as usual, at the Willard Hotel. But Cohen was on his mind. He wrote Hopkins, I saw Cohen last week in New York, and I had a talk with him, a friendly talk, and got him and Stanford together. He said he wanted no quarrel with us, etc., and I take it we want none with him. 
He called at our offices in New York twice, once after he had talked with Stanford, and he told me that S. told him that S. thought they had better let the whole matter rest until they returned to Cal. Cohen seemed very good-natured, and I think wants to be friendly with us, and I think it well for us to be on good terms with him. Life is too short for us to have many quarrels on our hands with all our other business. I think it would be well to ask Crocker to make friends with Cohen, not saying that I suggested it. Cohen had the ability to inflict damage, but the reality of the Central Pacific Monopoly was that, if and until Scott's Texas and Pacific reached California, he could hurt the associates without helping himself. That there was no hint of affection remaining between Cohen and the associates was not a bar to renewed friendship. They could be friends without liking each other. Only hatred was personal. Cohen had stung Crocker and Colton, and they wanted him banished to the outer reaches of this particular capitalist kingdom. Henceforth, as Colton said, they would do business with this man as we do with a stranger or not at all. And so Cohen remained a reformer, and more damage ensued. He continued to be active in the push for regulation that resulted in the ratification of the California Constitution in 1879, with a powerful railroad commission. In August of 1879 he spoke at Platts Hall in San Francisco, denouncing the railroad as a rapacious corporation, and warning voters that unless they elected strong and knowledgeable men to the railroad commission, it would come to nothing. But Cohen was a businessman, and reform did not really pay. He continued to send out feelers to test whether a truce was possible. When Cohen was returning from Italy in 1878, he asked Huntington for a pass to San Francisco and recommended he take a trip on the railroad through Brenner Pass in the Tyrol Mountains. And eventually they reached a truce. In the early 1880s Cohen once more became a lawyer for the associates, although Huntington suspected he was doing them damage even as they employed him. He knew too much and too many people, and he could say things that hurt them. The truce came about in part because the long battles had taken such a toll on those on both sides of the Texas and Pacific and Southern Pacific fight. It had turned Colton's hair gray, and he could sleep only three hours out of twenty-four. He was dead before 1878 was out. Hopkins, already sick, had traveled to Yuma under the care of a Chinese herbalist. Yuma was then the end of the line for the Southern Pacific and there Hopkins died. By the fall of 1878, Tom Scott was so exhausted and seriously ill that he had to leave Washington. The fallout from all of this was not only Cohen's truce with the associates, but a falling out among the associates themselves, or rather between the surviving associates and the family of David Colton, the man whom Cohen had so despised. Ellen Colton, the widow of David Colton, had sued the associates for defrauding her, after they had found that her deceased husband had embezzled from them for years. In 1884 Cohen fell silent, cut down by a stroke, his speech and memory gone. He amazingly recovered, however, and testified before the Pacific Railway Commission in 1887. He was smart, and he was funny. He also acted as Leland Stanford's lawyer before the commission. He defended the Associates and the Central Pacific, but there were moments when a man less obtuse than Stanford must have wondered about Cohen's layered meanings. "'I think that your question, Commissioner Anderson, confuses the witness,' Cohen interjected at one point, to stop a very confused Stanford from digging an even deeper hole for himself. And at another point Cohen confessed to the Commissioners that, there is a little misapprehension as to the answer of Governor Stanford yesterday with respect to the net earnings of the road. Cohen hoped he and the other lawyers could correct it. They could. Cohen renounced his earlier crusade against the Central Pacific as his early ebullitions of temper when he was young and green. He would, he told the commission, be glad to explain what I thought I then knew and what I have since found to be facts. This was a common change of heart, Stanford assured the commission. 
There was a time in this state when it seemed that everybody was against the railroad, but I have lived long enough to see almost every one of these people in this state a friend of the railroad. It was good to have friends. Chapter 5 Kilkenny Cats There once were two cats from Kilkenny. Each thought there was one cat too many. So they fought and they fit, and they scratched and they bit, and instead of two cats there ain't any. In June of 1884 Charles Francis Adams became president of the Union Pacific Railroad. Fifteen years earlier, the year of the Union Pacific's completion, he had published his Chapter of Erie, which made his name as a railroad reformer, and he had been appointed to the Massachusetts Board of Railroad Commissioners, one of the first and the most famous of the state commissions to regulate railroads. He would serve for ten years. In 1878 he had been named a government director on the board of the Union Pacific, and then had rejoined the board as a regular member in 1882. Adams had often been critical of railroad practice, particularly Union Pacific practice. Western railroads issued too many securities, received too little money from them, and as a result carried large loads of debt. They were too often corrupt and run for the profit of insiders. Poorly constructed and poorly managed, these railroads expanded too quickly into regions without the traffic to sustain them, and duplicated their rivals' tracks where there was traffic. Adams came to the Union Pacific to rescue it from its latest bout with disaster and to change the normal practice of Western railroads. I do not believe in fighting, he wrote. I do not believe in wasteful construction. I do not believe in destroying business by foolish competition. We are coming to all these things with considerable rapidity. Adams knew that he was taking on a concern, in bad repute, heavily loaded with obligations, odious in the territory it served. He became president in the midst of the panic of 1883-84, to after workers had just forced the management to rescind wage cuts. Congress was demanding the immediate payment of money due the sinking fund established by the Thurman Act. George Edmonds of Vermont, the chair of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee, and a man whom Adams would come to detest, forced Sidney Dillon, whom Adams privately referred to as the Old Thief, from the presidency and anointed Adams as his replacement. If the move was not made, Edmonds would issue a report on the road that would destroy the little credit the Union Pacific had left, and recommend that board members be charged with misdemeanors for illegally paying dividends. Still, Charles Francis Adams, Jr. took the job willingly. He was forty-nine, ambitious, and a child of privilege. His grandfather was John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. His great-grandfather was John Adams, the second president of the United States. His father also Charles Francis, had merely run for president and served as ambassador to England. When Adams had left the Union Army, he had given what he regarded as his men's assessment of him. They don't care for me personally, he wrote. They think me cold, reserved, and formal. They feel no affection for me. But they believe in me, have faith in my power of accomplishing results, and in my integrity. These he regarded as old family traits. He did not lack confidence. Many of the Union Pacific's problems could be traced back to Jay Gould. Gould and Adams had circled each other since 1869, when Gould had been Adams's target in Chapter of Erie, a book that until the end of his life Adams regarded as a careful piece of literary work. The Adams family was as illustrious and well-connected as any in the United States. Gould rose from poor beginnings. Adams was a successful author, a reformer, an intellectual, a man of the world, who had faith in publicity, the establishment of facts by a fair-minded public investigation, and the appeal to an enlightened public opinion. Gould was notoriously quiet and secretive. He said little, and the little he said was often purposefully ambiguous and misleading. Adams wanted transparency. Gould lived his life in a fog often hard to penetrate even now. Adams's correspondence and writings are voluminous. He said, if anything, too much. Gould left little behind him but his wealth. 
Adams wanted the railroad out of politics. Gould knew that the railroad depended on politics. In some ways, however, Gould and Adams were not so different. Adams denounced Wall Street and gamblers, but his fortune, as much as Gould's, depended on paper, on the timely acquisition and sale of securities and speculation in property. Adams rarely speculated in Union Pacific securities, however. He considered himself the representative of the New England investors in the railroad. Both Gould and Adams had the same grim view of Western railroads as hopelessly overbuilt, badly managed, and in need of reordering. In the 1880s, Adams appeared, as one scholar has put it, as the man on horseback, while it was difficult to exaggerate the depth of vituperation heaped on Gould by his contemporaries. Joseph Pulitzer regarded Gould as one of the most sinister figures that have ever flitted bat-like across the vision of the American people. He was a vampire sucking the blood of legitimate enterprises. Adams, on the other hand, in his own eyes and those of his supporters, was not just a man of principle and probity, but also an efficient modernizer. He had brought order to Massachusetts railroads. He regarded the men who ran railroads in the 1870s and 1880s as his social, intellectual, and professional inferiors. They were dinosaurs, dangerous, dim-witted in all but money-making, and doomed to a deserved extinction. 1. Creative Destruction The Union Pacific encapsulated virtually everything that Adams thought was wrong with railroads. The posture of affairs of the Union Pacific was, to say the least, dangerous, Adams wrote. The difficulty of our position is simply this, that on any honest basis of capitalization the road would, even at the lowest rate which has ever been proposed, return not only a fair, but a large profit. Jay Gould did not differ on the essentials. In 1887 he rather disingenuously told the Pacific Railway Commission, which a coalition of anti-monopolist congressmen and congressmen in league with Wall Street bears had delegated to investigate federally subsidized railroads, that the Union Pacific would be all right if it were capitalized on a moderate basis, but that it could not compete with new roads costing $12,000 per mile. In calling the Union Pacific overcapitalized, Adams and Gould meant that its outstanding securities had a greater par value than its actual assets. Late 19th and early 20th century economists made a distinction between actual capital and capitalization. Capital was tangible assets such as real estate, rails, locomotives and cars, goodwill, contracts, alliances, and reputation. In short, all the assets of a corporation intended for continuing productive use. Capitalization, on the other hand, represented the firm's outstanding securities, the aggregate of this paper certification of value taken at par. In a well-run corporation, funded debt and other securities, money obtained from stocks and bonds, translated rather easily into capital assets, and overcapitalization signified the acquisition of debt without the parallel acquisition of equivalent assets. The commonplaces of transcontinental financing, the giving away of stock, the selling of bonds at deep discounts, and the insider contracts for construction, virtually ensured that these roads' capitalization was far in excess of their assets. A company with low capitalization could charge lower rates and required less income to pay interest and reasonable dividends than a company with high capitalization. This was the problem that Adams was describing in the case of the Union Pacific. But the real question was how the Union Pacific came to be overcapitalized. The concept of overcapitalization is now largely unfashionable and a little archaic. The idea of leverage has largely replaced it. Even in the 19th century, Jay Gould argued that the value of securities, like the value of assets, was simply what people were willing to pay for them. Sometimes it was wise to accrue large debts to acquire assets, sometimes it wasn't. Time and the markets would make it clear whether accruing debt was wise. The issue was one of risk. If you could borrow at high rates and still make a profit with the borrowed money, 
then you were simply being an entrepreneur, a risk-taker, and a person to be admired, not condemned. Leverage, however, has not completely shed the older meanings of overcapitalization, which was partially a moral concept pointing toward the real possibility of duplicity and fraud. Modern leveraged buyouts, with their extensive acquisition of debt, still have the taint of reckless men putting shareholders' and employees' interests at risk. Charles Francis Adams and Jay Gould were sophisticated men. They knew that overcapitalization might seem to be only about numbers, the tallying of assets and debts, but that it was also about stories. When Adams used words like fair and honest, his modifiers hinted at their opposite, unfair and dishonest, and a story that Adams, the great advocate of transparency, wanted kept quiet, because acknowledgment of the road's tainted past could do him no good. Gould, on the other hand, when called to testify before the Pacific Railway Commission, told stories, which was unusual. Adams was a man too often taken with his own cleverness. He often did not know when to keep quiet. Jake Gould was a famously quiet man. It was best to pay attention when both men acted out of character, and when Gould in particular was as oddly garrulous as he was in his testimony on overcapitalization. Jay Gould widely suspected of looting the Union Pacific, wanted to shift attention elsewhere in his testimony. And so he told a story that made overcapitalization the story of risk, the monetary cost of a heroic past. When the Union Pacific was built, he told the members of the Pacific Railway Commission in 1887, it paid as high as five or ten dollars apiece for ties, and the iron rails I think cost three hundred dollars a ton and men had to take their lives in their hands to go out there. You know the Indians were after them. With a minimum of 2,640 ties to a mile, Gould conjured up a road whose ties alone cost from $13,200 to $26,400 for each mile built. With iron at $300 a ton, an additional $26,400 would be necessary to build a mile of road. The unassembled, ungraded road, without spikes, wooden trestles, fish bars, bolts, buildings, ballast, and the labor to assemble them, already supposedly cost from $39,000 to $52,800 a mile. Listen to Gould's story, and overcapitalization was simple. The Union Pacific might as well have been originally built of gold. When pressed by an incredulous commissioner about the cost of the ties, which, as it turned out, actually cost from sixty-five to ninety cents apiece, Gould meandered off into a story about a scalped conductor. The scalped conductor was real, but he was also an allegorical character in a parable about risk. The reason the railroad cost so much was that such a risky enterprise forced promoters to promise great rewards and pay high prices. Economists in more mundane ways still tell Gould's story the high cost of capital in the Pacific Railway, the difference between the face value of securities and what people actually paid for them, can be taken as investors' rational calculation of risk. Gould knew all about risk, but he was also a magician. Like any magician, he sought to create an illusion by attracting spectators' eyes to one thing and away from the action that actually achieved the desired result. Gould told simple stories of a heroic past, not complicated stories about exchanges of paper. Slight, perhaps smiling, speaking softly as he always did, the small dapper man sitting at number 10 Wall Street testifying before the Pacific Railway Commission told stories and performed railroad finance. Gould was, as usual, giving the information he wanted to give, withholding more, letting people draw their conclusions thinking, with good reason, that those conclusions would not only be wrong, but also forward his interests. Gould drew attention to risk in order to attract it away from fraud. He focused on the late 1860s and not the late 1870s. That was the magician's trick. It concealed the secret that both he and Adams, in a rare moment of agreement, wanted kept quiet. Overcapitalization was more the result of fraud, deception, and insider dealing than of entrepreneurial risk-taking.
Twenty years earlier, Charles Francis Adams had argued that overcapitalization was a tax on trade, to be paid eventually by the nation's consumers, who would have to add bloated transportation charges to the cost of goods so that railroads could pay their interest and dividends on capital never actually received. Now Adams wanted to forget that fraudulent past. As if he could. Every Union Pacific train carried its consequences, and every Union Pacific customer paid its freight. Pacific Railway Commissioner E. Ellery Anderson, a corporate attorney, gave the basic plot of fraudulent finance in his questioning of Leland Stanford in 1887. The techniques in the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific were, after all, the same. It seems to be the general belief that the present weak condition of the Central Pacific Railroad Company is due to the fact that the contract with Crocker and Company, and the contract with the Contract and Finance Company, and the contracts with the Western Development Company, and the contracts with the Pacific Improvement Company, have drained the company of its resources. That certain individuals have procured to be issued to themselves enormous quantities of stock and bonds of this company, and have paid dividends on the stock, and have made the interest charge on the bonds exceedingly heavy, and the origins of its difficulties lies there entirely and nowhere else. Anderson's story of innumerable pieces of paper exchanged in complicated ways did not have the resonance of a scalped conductor. Jay Gould was better than any other man alive at selling for very high prices financial paper that he acquired at very low prices. Gould's detractors accused him of boosting Union Pacific stock prices at the cost of the road's long-term health. He cut expenses and paid dividends, but the price was the deterioration of the road. He made a killing on the stock market and left a decaying and decrepit property to others. The centerpiece of Gould's efforts was his acquisition of the Kansas Pacific in 1880. In a continent full of looted and mismanaged railroads, the Kansas Pacific may have been the sorriest of the lot. It had issued stock and bonds of every possible description to those concerned up to the full estimated earning capacity of property, and as it turned out, beyond. The result was numerous, contentious, and divided claimants whose financial paper promised them assets and dividends that did not exist, and who could not agree how to divide what did exist. What made this relict of greed and incompetence a threat to the Union Pacific was Section 15 of the Pacific Railway Act of 1864 which gave the Kansas Pacific and other branches of the Pacific Railroad pro rata rates for traffic it shipped along Union Pacific tracks. A shipment on the Kansas Pacific destined for Ogden that joined the Union Pacific tracks at, say, halfway between Omaha and Ogden should cost the Kansas Pacific rate plus half the fare the Union Pacific normally charged between Omaha and Ogden. The Union Pacific, however, charged its full rate on top of the Kansas Pacific fare. No shipper with a choice would pay such a premium, and the Kansas Pacific, losing traffic, pressed for enforcement of the law in Congress and the courts. If the Kansas Pacific succeeded, it would harm the Union Pacific, and more critically for Gould, hurt Union Pacific stock prices. Gould's solution was to bring the Kansas Pacific and the Union Pacific under common ownership. To do so, he had to make arrangements both with Henry Villard, who represented the largely German holders of the Kansas Pacific's senior securities, and with the holders of more junior and less valuable securities. The Germans had a first mortgage on the last 245 miles of Kansas Pacific track that ran into Denver, a mortgage on half the company's lands, and a third mortgage on the rest of the road. The junior security holders controlled the stock as well as bonds with precious little security behind them. Gould's first move was quite orthodox and responsible. He organized the junior security holders, who recognized that they were going to get neither the face value of their securities nor all the back interest due them. Instead, as Commissioner Anderson of the Pacific Railway Commission later explained, they would put these securities into a common fund and ascertain among themselves what each security was fairly worth, and scale them down in the reorganized system, taking some at fifty and others at thirty and others at par. 
In exchange, they received pool certificates. Reorganization would involve an issue of a new security that would be exchanged for those in the pool in proportion to each pool member's holdings. In Gould's words, this new consolidated mortgage would fund all this heterogeneous mass of securities into one uniform security, and at the same time make a saving in the annual interest charge and also in the principal of the debt. The so-called St. Louis pool reduced the junior securities from their par value of $17,330,350 to $4,855,300, and thus substantially lessened the capitalization of the company. This was supposedly the diuretic that purged watered securities from the system. Unless the bondholders represented by Villard joined the pool, however, Gould's efforts would be in vain since the Germans could foreclose on the most critical and valuable assets of the road. The negotiations between Gould and Villard in 1878 and 1879 devolved into something resembling a street fight. The struggle made Villard's reputation as a financier. Although Gould eventually succeeded in a suit to remove Villard as receiver because of conflict of interest, Villard and the bondholders retained the power to foreclose and moved to do so. Gould's attempt to demoralize the Germans actually discouraged his allies, the junior bondholders and stockholders. In March of 1879, Gould, seemingly magnanimously, moved to buy them out. He acquired a majority of the Kansas Pacific stock. In the stock and bond market of the time, the face value of a stock share, usually one hundred dollars, was par. A stock selling at par was thus one hundred. A stock selling at three sold at three percent of its par value, or put another way, brought three cents for every dollar of par value. Gould bought Kansas Pacific stock, which had been selling at anywhere from three to twelve, at an average of twelve and a half. In the spring of 1879 he withdrew the stock from the pool, while reselling shares of the remaining pool securities to associates such as Russell Sage, Sidney Dillon, and Frederick Ames, all major holders in the Union Pacific. Villard's bondholders really did not want to take over and run the Kansas Pacific, and so, although Villard regarded Gould as totally untrustworthy, he resumed negotiations. In April, Gould granted the bondholders back interest and expenses. He recognized two of the three first mortgages in full, and reduced the interest on the third only from seven percent to six percent. There would be little water squeezed out from the first mortgages. Gould could now join the Kansas Pacific to the Union Pacific, but he changed directions. Having successfully boosted Union Pacific stock from a low of thirteen to around eighty, and with a reviving stock market, he sensed new opportunities. He had second thoughts about merging the Kansas Pacific with the Union Pacific. The latter would have to pay a premium. Gould moved easily from being an agent of the Union Pacific to being an agent of the Kansas Pacific, because he was always first an agent of J. Gould. That he, Dillon, and Sage controlled the Kansas Pacific and were leading figures on the board of the Union Pacific did not excite any moral qualms in J. Gould. But then few things did. In the autumn of 1879, Gould offered the Kansas Pacific to the Union Pacific. The price was high. Dollar for dollar. A share in the Kansas Pacific and a share in the Union Pacific would each bring a share in the new consolidated railroad. In its November meeting, the Union Pacific Board, feeling betrayed, angrily refused to pay a premium for a road that over the previous ten years had on average not made enough money to pay the interest on its debt. Gould told them they would be sorry. They soon were. Gould had two tools for inducing remorse. The first one was the Denver Pacific. Arthur W. Hoyt rode it to Denver in 1879. He described it as, a single-track railroad, poorly located and poorly built, with high grades and bad curvature, part of the distance over rolling prairie, and part on level ground. It was, however, the only way to connect the Union Pacific to Denver. An even more formidable tool was yet another broken-down, would-be transcontinental, the Missouri Pacific. 
Around it, Gould grouped a collection of other roads that had proved chronically unable to meet their interest payments, the Kansas and Nebraska, which became the Kansas Central, the St. Joseph and Pacific, and the Central Branch of the Union Pacific, which was one of the original independent chartered branches of the Union Pacific proper. Unprofitable as they might be individually, they could form a system that would rival the Union Pacific. Gould was playing a difficult game. He wanted to give value to large amounts of Kansas Pacific and other securities that he could not readily dispose of on the open market, and he didn't want to drive down his Union Pacific stock. He bowled Kansas Pacific stock prices into the 80s by the end of 1879, and in January of 1880 it would vault above par, but these prices reflected the expectation that the Union Pacific would acquire the Kansas Pacific, and the rise was almost certainly the product of a made market, the prearranged sale of small amounts at inflated prices. Any attempt to unload large amounts of the stock would cause its market to crash. Most of Gould's other securities were not even being sold on the stock exchange. As Charles Hassler, a financial writer, later testified, quotes in the financial papers were no guide at all to actual prices. The only true guide was actual sales in some volume on the stock exchange. Quotes only signified that someone was putting in a bid for small amounts of stock in order to keep up the price, or that a single buyer was attempting to acquire a large number of securities. The idea was to peg a price higher and higher with nothing offered until the lambs came in to try to make purchases, thinking there was a real rise in value. Then some of the securities could be unloaded to them at five to ten times their worth. The rising quotes for Gould's stock were the equivalent of salting a mine. In January of 1880, the Union Pacific and Gould resumed negotiations. Gould resigned from the board of the Union Pacific so that there would be no obvious conflict of interest in the sale of the Kansas Pacific. Dillon and Sage, however, remained on the Union Pacific board, which agreed to buy the Kansas Pacific, Denver Pacific, and Gould's smaller Kansas roads. The newly merged roads became the Union Pacific Railway Company, to distinguish it from the old Union Pacific Railroad Company. The board then elected Gould a director of the new railroad. There followed a complicated series of stock exchanges on which Gould and his partners made a large profit. The water that had been sucked out of the Kansas Pacific through the St. Louis pool was pumped back in, so that its debt was hardly reduced at all, and the Union Pacific increased its debt by $39 million through its purchase of the Kansas Pacific, Denver Pacific, and other lines. The Pacific Railway Commission accountants later described the Kansas Pacific's books as simply disgraceful, but they could trace enough transactions to waver between horror and admiration. The controllers of the shares in the three companies constituted a ring which managed the business with highest skill and cunning. With the stock market booming, and investors believing that the end of the Kansas Pacific's threat to the Union Pacific made the Union Pacific a stronger railroad, Union Pacific stock remained high. Gould sold, as did Henry Villard, who had also speculated in Kansas Pacific securities. Gould realized immense wealth from a railroad that he saddled with immense debts. Gould took his profits from the Kansas Pacific and built the new system around the Missouri Pacific that the Union Pacific feared. Gould's enemies were never sure what he was up to. Collis P. Huntington still thought he was only, as usual, lighting down upon one thing or another and sucking some portion of its lifeblood, and then taking wing again for some other carcass. In this case, Huntington was wrong. By linking the Missouri Pacific, the Wabash, the Katy, and the Texas and Pacific, Gould was system-building. The Union Pacific staggered forward under the load Gould had imposed, and by the times Adams became president it was in desperate straits. The penalties imposed by Congress after the Credit Mobilier scandal left the company, as Adams phrased it, in the position of a man whose hands are tied fighting against men armed to the teeth. We cannot lease, we cannot guarantee, and we cannot make new loans on business principles, for we cannot mortgage or pledge. We cannot build extensions, 
We cannot contract loans as other people contract them. All these things are prohibited to us, yet all these things are habitually done by our competitors. Gould's policy of paying dividends to maintain stock prices left the Union Pacific with a deteriorating infrastructure as well as a massive debt. The Union Pacific had refused, despite losing its original constitutional challenge to the law in the Supreme Court, to pay into the sinking fund established by the Thurman Act to cover its debt to the government while it litigated other aspects of the Act. Gould's maneuvers also had made the Union Pacific a vulnerable and tempting target for Chicago roads posed to advance from the east. Charles Perkins of the Burlington recognized that the Union Pacific's life depends on high rates more than that of any company. In 1884, the road was on the brink of receivership. Adams called on the personal credit of the Union Pacific's executive committee to obtain the loans that saved the road. Dividends ceased and stock prices fell. Adams, the president, could not say what Adams, the reformer, knew. His first task was to convince the public and the government that the road was now in the hands of honest men. But to rescue the railroad, he also had to avoid antagonizing Gould and Sage, who were dangerous enemies. He was compelled to obfuscate or justify practices that, as a reformer, he had attacked. 2. The Colton Trial Making large amounts of money from roads that could not pay their debts was something of an art form in the 1870s. The men who owned the other half of the Pacific Railway in the 1870s were as adept as Gould, but more self-righteous. Collis P. Huntington claimed that the builders of the railroads, himself included, had profited very little by the building of the roads. In the kind of fearless non-sequitur that he made a specialty, Huntington thought the people of California had failed to recognize the selflessness of the associates, because Stanford, Hopkins, and Crocker had taken out something over five millions to build three dwelling houses for the communists and agrarians to look at. How people who had profited little could take out five millions to construct mansions so large that they looked like small villages seemed a puzzle. But Huntington was, perhaps inadvertently, making a significant point about railroad financiering. The associates did not make money from the Central Pacific or the Southern Pacific, although these were the basis of their fortunes. They made money from the Contract and Finance Company, the Western Development Company, and the Pacific Improvement Company. San Francisco bankers knew that money flowed to the associates, not to the railroads. As late as 1877, David Colton found that San Francisco bankers would not lend the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific money without the personal notes of the associates behind the loan. The Colton trial provided a primer on how to put very little into a railroad and take very much out. When, on November 14, 1883, the Colton trial opened in Santa Rosa, the county seat of Sonoma County, California, it shared headlines in the San Francisco newspapers with the capture of Black Bart, the notorious stage robber, who had robbed his last stage a few miles from Copperopolis, California, on November 3rd. The shared headlines were a nice coincidence, because Ellen Colton, the widow of David Colton, one of the associates, contended that Leland Stanford, Collis P. Huntington, Charles Crocker, and the estate of the deceased Mark Hopkins had betrayed her and left her in the condition of a man attacked by a highwayman upon the roadside. As it turned out, David Colton had embezzled from his fellow associates, and the associates had responded by taking securities, stocks and bonds, from his widow and leaving her, like the doggerel verses Black Bart left with the victims of his robberies, her dead husband's worthless note for a million dollars. The accounts of the trial focused on corruption. Colton's defalcation, to use the preferred nineteenth-century term, the remaining associates' response and the widespread payments to public officials that surfaced in the Colton-Huntington correspondence that Ellen Colton's lawyers submitted as evidence. It was a trial full of sentimental Victorian nastiness. Colton's embezzlement was simple and easy to grasp. 
On his father's seventieth birthday, Colton had sent him a touching note, full of premonitions of Colton's own death. Enclosed, he wrote, please find a check for three hundred sixty-five dollars, being a dollar for each day in the year that makes you threescore and ten. The check was from the Rocky Mountain Coal and Iron Company, part of the associate's properties that he managed. Colton had stolen the money he gave to his father. But buried deeper in the trial was a more revealing and elusive corruption. Among the securities Ellen Colton surrendered to the associates were those of the Western Development Company, WDC, which was the successor of the Contract and Finance Company. It was a construction company and a banking company that performed feats of financial magic. It concealed, transformed, and transferred assets so that debts incurred by the associates' properties could end up as money in the pockets of the associates. The associates never paid for their stock in the WDC. Instead, they lent funds that had been gained through the old contract and finance company to the WDC, which paid them the going interest rates on the West Coast, as high as 12%, on these funds. The WDC was a screen to obscure the activities of the men who ran the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific from bondholders and bankers. The associates, seemingly such ordinary, bulky Victorian men, were chimeras able to change form at will, and by changing form they created value. As Colton's lawyers argued, the Central Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the WDC, and others were but convertible terms with these four or five movers in them, and they were fused constantly one into the other, and there was no distinction. The corporations were the individuals, and the individuals were the corporations. The associates proffered a deal, went to the other side of the table, put on another set of hats, and accepted the deal. In the books and ledgers of these companies, trades that appeared to be between a wide variety of entities were not what they seemed. Ellen Colton's lawyers sought to demonstrate how business was conducted in this internal house of mirrors. In 1871 the Central Pacific began to make deposits into various sinking funds, as required by law, to pay off its bonded debt. To keep the deposits from sitting idle, the Central Pacific, starting in 1872, lent the WDC the money in the sinking fund at 10% per year. The loans then went into the individual accounts of the associates. As collateral for these loans, the associates in 1875 transferred from their WDC accounts 17,577 shares of Central Pacific stock. Subsequent loans in 1876, 1877, and 1878 followed the same trajectory. By the end of its own corporate career in 1879, the WDC had borrowed over $3 million from the sinking funds. Most of the debt was settled by letting the Central Pacific keep the collateral. Promoters had learned that the values of stocks and bonds were not necessarily determined by what people would pay for them on an open market. Jay Gould testified that there was no market for either Central Pacific stocks or Southern Pacific bonds in the late 1870s. By transferring them to the Central Pacific, the associates had their cake and ate it too. Now as to the sinking fund, Huntington wrote Colton, we very likely have done what was best for us up to this time. But what we have done is not a thing to talk about, and I do not think there is a careful businessman in the world outside of our five selves who would say it was well invested, while we know it is. Who was harmed by such a maneuver? It may be a transaction open to censure by proper parties, the associate's attorney, Hall McAllister, admitted. It might be very pertinent with reference to parties who are interested in the sinking fund in calling these defendants to account. But while bondholders might have reason to complain, Ellen Colton did not. David Colton helped arrange these transactions. Betraying bondholders was not the issue in the Colton case. Ellen Colton lost. Disguising the movement of money, however, created unintended opportunities within the corporations for further fraud. 
As the contract and finance company was being merged into its successor, the WDC, Charles Crocker asked J. O. B. Gunn to examine the books. The associates had known what they did not want Congress to find in the old contract and finance company books, but what Gunn found surprised them. It took Gunn only a few hours to find where John Miller had stolen three hundred thousand dollars. It took longer to find that as much as nine hundred thousand dollars, the associates made various estimates, was missing. John Miller, it turned out, was not really John Miller. He had been Ambrose Woodruff. The associates got back roughly four hundred thousand dollars, but the rest was gone for good. Miller slash Woodruff knew too much and apparently had the memoranda to prove what he knew. The associates did not want him testifying, and in Miller's words, through the testimony of the witnesses from the railroad company, he was declared innocent of all crimes. In his later testimony before the Pacific Railway Commission, Miller remembered their kindness. The commission got little from him. But even an honest Miller might not have been able to follow the cash. William Mall, whom Huntington sent out from New York to examine the Southern Pacific's books in 1889, found them virtually incomprehensible. The profits from the stocks that the associates retrieved from Mrs. Colton were still flowing in as the trial unfolded. Huntington had done his best to make sure that the Central Pacific paid dividends in the 1870s, even if he had to borrow to do so. There were two reasons to borrow to pay dividends. The first was that dividends delivered cash to the associates who owned virtually all the stock. The second was that it made the Central Pacific appear to be a solid dividend-paying road. When the U.S. Railroad auditor Theophilus French examined the Central Pacific's book in 1879, he found that it borrowed money ostensibly for investment in branch lines, steel rails, etc., but really for payment of dividends to stockholders. French never pushed his concerns. The Central Pacific put him on the payroll. In 1880, Huntington began strategically selling. And when necessary, buying back small amounts of stock to create a market largely among European investors, the associates issued five million dollars in new stock and put the money into the same general fund from which they paid dividends. It was something of a Ponzi scheme, for new investments were used to provide dividends on old and thus boost security prices. Prices for Central Pacific stock went as high as one hundred five and a half in 1881, and Huntington had maintained them in the high eighties and low nineties as he disposed of the stock. He worked hard at it, and it irritated him that, as was so often the case, his associates did not recognize his art. By 1883, Huntington had finished selling out the associates' majority interest in the Central Pacific. Which at time leased the Southern Pacific, the European shareholders who controlled the road delayed transferring the shares into their own names, fearing liability for the company's debt under California law. The stock remained in the names of dummy stockholders designated by the associates, who in turn designated the associates as voting proxies for the shares. The new Central Pacific stockholders thus had little control over the board of directors or the associates. As Huntington put it, we shall have to take the stockholders more into our confidence than heretofore. And while we can prattle about the road and its business, we need not say anything more than our credit requires, or than we care to. The British were sheep. The associates sheared not once but twice. In 1885, associates reversed the lease of the Southern Pacific to the Central Pacific. The Southern Pacific now leased the Central Pacific for ninety-nine years. The associates, having reaped a fortune from the sale of their Central Pacific stock, still maintained operational control of both roads. With no need to placate the British investors and owning little stock themselves, they cut the Central Pacific's dividend in half for 1884, and then eliminated it entirely until 1888. Prices for the Central Pacific fell as low as 26 by 1885, and then hovered in the 30s and low 40s. Too late, foreign investors realized that what had happened to them was more serious than the general decline of railroad stocks during the downturn of the early 1880s. 
Neither the associates nor Gould simply destroyed, although it might have been better if they had. The money they made from weakening existing corporations went into what Adams identified as another great flaw of Western railroads, overbuilding. The associates transformed the Southern Pacific from merely a road to hold off Tom Scott into a new transcontinental. Lower prices on capital, steel, labor, and new technologies allowed them to build new railroads at less cost than the old. Trading a poorly built road on a difficult route for a much more efficient road on a better route was the kind of creative destruction Joseph Schumpeter praised, but investors were more inclined to see fraud. There was not enough traffic for two transcontinentals in California, and so the associates diverted traffic from the Central Pacific to the Southern Pacific. Since the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific formed a single route, this also meant taking traffic from the Union Pacific. In Adams's view, the Central Pacific had become a mere bobtail road, ending at Ogden. In 1884, the first full year in which the completed Southern Pacific ran to New Orleans, the reported earnings of the Central Pacific fell by 40% from the preceding year, from $8,094,149 to $4,872,734. By the spring of 1886, the sunset route of the Southern Pacific was carrying 93.7% of the freight traffic, moving by rail from California to New York. This was a large percentage of relatively little traffic. It was an internal transfer of business that moved gains to insiders, the associates, and away from new investors. It also gave the associates the added benefit of reducing the amount of money the Central Pacific had to pay into the sinking fund provided by the Thurman Act. 3. Territory Americans, Mexicans, and Canadians built an extraordinary amount of railroad in the 1880s. It came in two great spurts, the first beginning at the end of the 1870s and then slowing down in the economic downturn of 1883-84. to 84. A second expansion came at the end of the decade. The vast bulk of railroad building in the late 1870s and early 1880s nearly 75% in the peak year of 1882, took place west of the Mississippi, in western Canada, and in northern Mexico. The railroad mileage of the Pacific states, Idaho, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, as well as Washington, Oregon, and California, increased from 4,461 miles in 1879 to 7,961 miles in 1884 while the mileage of the interior western states, the states between the Mississippi and the Rockies, except Louisiana, rose from 22,959 in 1879 to 32,741 in 1884. Mexico's lavish concessions to American railroad promoters in the north were responsible for most of the 5,866 kilometers, 3,645 miles, of Mexican Railroad in 1885. In 1881, the Union Pacific Central Pacific Route was the only railroad to the Pacific Ocean. By mid-decade it was one of many. Starting in Canada and moving south, there was the Canadian Pacific, the Northern Pacific, and the Oregon Short Line, a new Union Pacific Route to Portland, that allowed the Union Pacific to divert westbound traffic from the Central Pacific. South of the original Pacific Railroad were the Southern Pacific, which reached New Orleans in 1883, and the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, which reached Guaymas through its Sonoran connection in 1882, before breaking through the Associates' defenses to reach San Diego in 1885. In addition, the Denver and Rio Grande had breached the Rockies and reached Salt Lake, providing another connection to routes farther west. The Frisco and the Atlantic and Pacific, which the Frisco controlled, had reached Needles on the California border. The Burlington had had plans to go all the way from Chicago to the Pacific, but thought better of it and stopped at Denver. It proved a good decision, since its freight from Denver in 1878 was only 86 cars, and its westward freight to Denver only 759. 
The Chicago and Northwestern also stopped east of the Rockies. In addition to the roads connecting the continent horizontally, there were new north-south roads linking it vertically. The Mexican Central, which ran from El Paso to Mexico City and was completed in 1884, was part of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe system. The old Palmer-Sullivan concession yielded the Mexican National Railway, an extension for all practical purposes of the Denver and Rio Grande, from Laredo to Mexico City. It was finished in 1887, but by then it had passed to English bondholders and became the Mexican National Railroad. The men who built these railroads did not so much have plans as convictions. William Strong, the president of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe in the 1880s, thought the power of a road depended upon its length and territory. These long trunk lines were spears, skewering a country and pinning it to a wall for later skinning and division. A new line, as Charles Francis Adams said of the Canadian Pacific, claims all creation. Watching these railroads careen across the Rockies filled Collis P. Huntington with astonishment, even though he had built one of them. It is a great country west of the Rocky Mountains in acreage, Huntington wrote ruefully, and very few people on this side, the east, know how little business there is there. Jay Gould thought it would not be long before another crop of receivers will be in court. To Adams, who assumed control of the Union Pacific in the midst of the building, it was simply a period of madness. Still, on they came. By 1885 it appeared that traffic just sufficient to maintain the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, when they had a monopoly on the business in 1881, would have to support seven roads. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific had only 31% of the total tonnage at the end of 1886. Lower rates would not increase the traffic sufficiently to restore the old business. In 1885, Charles Francis Adams had a chance to inspect this Western Railroad progress firsthand. He left New York at midnight on April 17, 1885 eventually picking up the Chesapeake and Ohio and going south and west along the patchwork of roads Collis P. Huntington had put together to form the eastern half of a national system that connected with the southern Pacific at New Orleans. Adams hated New Orleans. He hated it generally and particularly. He hated its heat, filth, and vermin. He hated the St. Charles Hotel. From New Orleans, he boarded the Southern Pacific for El Paso, where he would take the Mexican Central for Mexico City. Huntington, Adams had concluded, was in trouble. At night, when Adams could not see beyond the darkness that surrounded his private car, he relied on his body to record the bumps and jolts, and his map and watch to gauge the time between stations, and thus the speed of the train. In the daylight he surveyed the country— counted passing trains, and looked for tank cars carrying water. He talked to conductors and porters and counted passengers. The line to New Orleans was a wretched ragtag of mismatched pieces. Much of it was poorly built. Some still had iron rails. The swaying cars and the lack of speed translated into money that Huntington would have to spend east of the Mississippi. And in 1885 Huntington could not command such capital. This system, Adams wrote, I think must go to pieces in bankruptcy. And between 1885 and 1887, much of the system did fall piecemeal into receivership. Huntington unloaded his interests. Ocean transport remained more efficient than rail. The Southern Pacific connected to New York and the East through the Morgan Steamship Line, running out of New Orleans. Adams took the Southern Pacific's Sunset Route out of New Orleans. The Sunset Route and the Texas Railroad map in general were the fruits of the Associates' victory over Tom Scott. Jay Gould, having gained control of the Texas and Pacific from the sick Scott and made it part of his new Missouri Pacific system, also inherited Scott's old war with the Associates. In 1881, Gould sued his rivals, arguing that since the Southern Pacific had been built on the Texas and Pacific right-of-way in New Mexico, the Texas and Pacific owned the Southern Pacific. During the trial, Gould's lawyers called the Southern Pacific an octopus. 
The Southern Pacific's lawyer, the associate's old friend, Senator William Stewart, called the Texas and Pacific an incubus. It was a trial in perhaps only the invective was accurate. East of San Antonio, Adams missed a connection that put the train a day behind schedule. It was symptomatic of the inefficiency of the little lines Huntington had stitched together to reach New Orleans from San Antonio. These eastern Texas roads, Huntington had admitted, included the worst he had ever traveled over. Adams was impressed with the country, which was rich, fruitful, and prosperous. He thought San Antonio one of the most attractive places that he had ever seen in America. West of San Antonio, the road improved and the country declined. Huntington, needing a Texas charter, had reached an arrangement with Colonel Thomas Pierce of the Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio that gave the Associates effective control of that road. The Associates contracted with Pierce to link San Antonio and El Paso, and he, in turn, hired their latest corrupt corporate jack-of-all-trades, the Pacific Improvement Company, to do the building. Pierce paid them in stocks and bonds that left the Southern Pacific in control of the new line. The new road traversed difficult country, but despite a washout at Eagle Pass that cost Adams another twenty-four-hour delay, he thought the road good. Once they hit the Rio Grande, the country was, however, absolutely unproductive. The small herds of cattle in the gorges did not indicate much for the road to haul. In a day's travel, Adams passed only one freight locomotive, and it pulled mostly empties. The country was without wood and water. The trains ran on poor quality coal brought up from Mexico, and lacking enough artesian wells, the railroad had to haul tank cars with water for the locomotives. With no agriculture, with no minerals, and with only cattle to be split with the Texas and Pacific, the Southern Pacific had to depend on through traffic. How the Southern Pacific sustains itself at all, Adams wrote is a greater and greater mystery to me. By 1885 its rival, the Texas and Pacific, could not sustain itself. It could not pay interest on its debts, and large portions of the road were decrepit. The Southern Pacific was a better road than either the Central Pacific or the Union Pacific, but that did not make it necessary or profitable. By May 3rd Adams was in Mexico City after a very interesting and instructive journey. He traveled the Mexican Central. Thomas Nickerson, who had been president of the Atchison until 1880, remained president of the Mexican Central. The Mexican Central was an American road, but Mexico was a more thoroughly foreign country than Adams ever was in before. It is half Indian and half Moorish, and the whole journey from El Paso to the city of Mexico is an insight into a new life. Like the southern Pacific in West Texas, the Mexican Central in northern Mexico was a very good road through nowhere. Adams thought that what little business northern Mexico might provide would be drained off to New Orleans when Palmer finished the Mexican National, which reached the United States at Laredo. If the Mexican Central leased the new road in self-defense, it would be left with 800 miles of useless road to El Paso. In this Adams was wrong only because the Mexican National insisted on building a narrow-gauge road, on which it was difficult to interchange cars and traffic. Adams's pessimism was not much relieved as the zigzag journey continued. He traveled the southern Pacific across the southwest to Los Angeles, then up to San Francisco, and took the central Pacific east to Salt Lake City. Then he went north on the recently built Oregon Short Line, a subsidiary of the Union Pacific to Portland, then east again on the northern Pacific to St. Paul, down to Omaha, and then west to Denver on the Union Pacific and its connector, the Denver Pacific. He returned on the Kansas Pacific. He thought the northern Pacific was in a hopeless position, given the Canadian Pacific to its north, the lack of traffic in the United States, and the prospect of a difficult and expensive construction over the Cascades to complete its direct link to Tacoma. Except for Western Canada, he had seen most of the vast territory that had recently been opened up by the transcontinentals. What Adams did not know 
was that the Canadian Pacific was in the midst of a financial crisis that forced it to turn to the Canadian government for more aid. Like the American transcontinentals, the Canadian Pacific was built ahead of demand across a difficult and sparsely populated territory with such a heavy debt that it had problems meeting its fixed interest charges to the Canadian government. Even before it was complete, it was offering part of its land grant in exchange for retiring $10 million of the debt it owed Canada. This was the same attempt to exchange a gift for forgiveness of a debt that the Pacific Railway had tried, except in the Canadian case it would work. As with the Union Pacific, the government's lean on its lines and its own precarious financial condition made it difficult for the Canadian Pacific to sell bonds on its branch lines. And, as with the American roads, anti-monopoly opposition, in this case the grits, the equivalent of the American grangers, hurt its ability to sell land and bonds. The Canadian Pacific responded by cutting necessary investments and upkeep to make the road appear profitable. It had not been in full operation for a year, before instructions went out in 1887, to make a good showing in the working of the railway this year, even if we are unable to keep up the property in what we would regard as a first-class condition. Surveying this massive creation of railroad space, Adams was appalled. He seemed to scour the dictionary for synonyms for insanity, illness, and sin to describe the actions of the railroads as they overbuilt and cut rates. His most common description was mania for railroad construction. Such unnecessary and I might almost say unpardonable construction and the resulting rate-cutting were most ill-considered. This was insanity, and it created foolish competition. He lived in a world where the lunatics ran the asylum. The battle between the Atchison and the Southern Pacific had precipitated a period of madness. The St. Paul and Chicago, Burlington and Quincy, have set everyone crazy on the subject of railroad extension west of the Missouri River. They're all daft on the subject of construction, and the epidemic has got to run its course. He despaired over railroad managers. There is no limit to the follies they would commit. The consequences of the accumulating madness and folly were obvious. We will be cutting and slashing at each other like fiends. The effects would be what they had been before. When the madness passed away, the country has been strewn with the wrecks of half-finished railroads. Adams condemned the first stage of overbuilding as he was about to participate in the second. Too many trunk lines built in the early 1880s had so divided the transcontinental traffic as to make it practically worthless. In the late 1880s the trunks grew branches to garner new traffic. When the U.S. Census recorded the number of people per mile of completed railroad in 1840, it was 6,194. In 1880, the number was 571. By 1890, it was 375. By the end of 1889, more than 20% of the United States railroad mileage of 161,000 had been constructed in the last four years. The states and territories west of the Mississippi, excluding Louisiana, kept pace. They had only 24% of the country's population in 1890, but they had 43% of the railroad mileage. The Pacific group now had 11,473 miles, while the western group had 58,536. In Mexico, Americans had laid 11,500 kilometers, 7,146 miles of track by 1896, and owned 80% of the securities issued by Mexican railroads. The Mexican Central alone built 1,200 miles between 1880 and 1890. The best example of this second wave of overbuilding came in Kansas. The line that divides western Kansas from central Kansas resembles the weaving path of a drunk careening from a starting point just west of the 98th parallel in the north and tilting west as he goes south. The drunk was following the line of 25 inches of annual rainfall, the amount needed to guarantee a crop. East of this line in central Kansas were three of the major wheat-producing counties in the state, Saline, McPherson, and Barton where building made sense. 
The population of central Kansas rose from 451,000 to 657,000 people between 1880 and 1887. Most of the increase occurred between 1885 and 1887. The real question involved the wisdom of building into western Kansas, the bulk of the state, and on into Colorado. The history of western Kansas did not give much promise. Prompted by the Burlington's plans to build along Prairie Dog Creek in northwestern Kansas, Charles Francis Adams had a preliminary survey run for two routes from the north fork of the Solomon River west across rolling plains, entirely destitute of wood and water, to the main line of the Kansas Pacific at Monument and Gopher. He found stockmen along the route. There had been a migration of farmers into the country during the unusually wet years between 1879 and 1882, but the drought had driven them out. Still, in 1885, five railroads, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, the Union Pacific, the Missouri Pacific, the Burlington and Missouri, and the Rock Island, were poised to expand into western Kansas north of the Arkansas River. The railroads were like racers on a starting line in a race none of them particularly wanted to run. They would run only because they feared their rivals would run without them. It was thus not in their best interests to break first. County boosters offered subsidies and railroad engineers traced new routes, often along obscure creeks toward desolate towns, even though three of them, the Union Pacific, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, and the Missouri Pacific, already ran through or into the region. Adams feared that the railroads would go to work constructing like madmen. They were, he wrote Perkins at the end of 1885, about to enter upon a Kilkenny Cat period of existence, which can result in but one thing, that is, immense waste of opportunity and wealth. If it should not result in ruin, it will be fortunate. Caution was not a key attribute of Jay Gould. The Union Pacific had leased the central branch, which ran between and parallel to the Union Pacific and the Kansas Pacific trunk lines, through a very rich region, to Gould's Missouri Pacific, in return for Gould's promise not to build lines that competed with the Union Pacific in central and western Kansas. Forbes of the Burlington was skeptical about an agreement with Gould, who had as many aliases as a London professional thief. Forbes was right. By 1886, Gould was building the Kansas and Colorado Railroad toward Pueblo under the subterfuge that it was not part of the Missouri Pacific. It paralleled a new extension of the Atchison, and both competed with the Kansas Pacific. In retaliation, the Atchison laid plans to build into northern Kansas and attack the central branch. On every side there were men whipping runaway horses because, looking around them, they saw other men doing the same and thought there must be a reason. Railroad war had begun. The Atchison and the Missouri Pacific both bolted west from the great bend of the Arkansas, paralleling each other about two miles apart to Greeley County on the western border. It was the maddest specimen of railroad construction of which Adams had ever heard, but he joined it, vowing to carry this war directly into Africa. Not to build was to die a slow death of inanition. He would carry out a bold, clear-cut, aggressive policy. In January of 1887, Adams was considering seventeen different new lines and branches in Kansas, many of them useful only to preempt other roads or to threaten their business. In this he imitated the Atchison's and the Burlington's practice of covering by their charters and by bonded aid all the territory which is or at any future time might be tributary to their roads. At Colby, in the far northwestern corner of the state, the Union Pacific met the Rock Island, which in 1888 finished building across the corner of Kansas and into Colorado. It was well beyond the 99th meridian. By 1889, six different companies had completed seven separate lines in western Kansas, between the great bend of the Arkansas River in the south and the Nebraska border, an area about 120 miles wide. Three of these lines ran to the Rocky Mountain front or beyond. 
The hope was, as P. P. Shelby, the general freight agent of the Union Pacific, wrote, that immigration will more than offset any decrease caused by new competing lines. The railroads did carry people into western Kansas, and then they carried them out again. The railroads watched the population of western Kansas fall by nearly half between 1887 and 1897 as drought and depression struck. Even Senator Ingalls of Kansas, the corrupt Candide of the prairies, admitted that the result of expansion was that empty railroad trains ran across deserted prairies to vacant towns. In 1878, Kansas had had 2,427 miles of railroad, about one-half the mileage of New England or New York. By the end of 1890, Kansas had 8,900 miles of railroad, more than either New York, 7,745, or New England. 6,840. It had more railroads per square mile and more than four times the railroad per capita than New England, a region with more than three times the population. Kansas was an exaggerated version of the entire West. The average number of tons carried per mile of railroad in the region south of Nebraska and east of Arizona peaked in 1886 at 1,482 and steadily declined to 1,312 by 1892. The receipts per ton-mile also declined. The states to the north and west where there was less building did better, but even there the average number of ton-miles stagnated after 1886 and plunged after 1892, when depression hit in 1893. In 1896 the western railroads carried fewer tons per mile than they had in 1887. In 1888, Adams delivered a Jeremiad that pretty much summarized the great expansion of the 1880s. The railroad situation, in my opinion, is as bad as bad can be. I think we are all going to the devil, and going together. Nevertheless, during the next six months, I think things will be better rather than worse. After that, the deluge, I do not believe that there is any power on earth— and certainly I am sure there is none in the heavens over the earth, which can save from destruction a system which is managed on such vicious principles, and is so devoid of all that basis of good faith by which only the business of civilized communities can be successfully conducted, as the railroad system of this country now is. It is plunging to destruction just as fast as it can go. The contempt I feel for the railroad men of this country as a whole I make no effort to express, as language is wholly inadequate for the purpose. I should never have conceived it possible that a great system could have outgrown the men in charge of it as our railroad system has during the last twenty years. It is wallowing in the mire. 4. Rationalizing Irrationality when numerous informed people engage in an activity that most of them think is mad and self-destructive, an explanation is necessary. The economist C. Nick Harley advanced a useful theory as to why railroads engaged in what seemed premature and destructive construction. Harley argued that it is necessary to separate two different things— the actual building of a railroad and the exclusive right to build a railroad into new territory to understand why overbuilding occurred. The exclusive right to build a railroad was more valuable than an actual railroad in a newly settled agricultural region, because an actual railroad in such a region would lose money, until the population grew thick enough to provide the traffic necessary to turn a profit. The right to build, however, allowed a railroad to refrain from laying tracks until population and economic activity had reached an optimally profitable point. Cooperation and respect of each other's territory remained the optimal strategy for the long run. In 1880, John Murray Forbes had succinctly stated the ambitions of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy in these terms. Peace getting fair returns for capital, and avoiding putting a cent more capital into the country than its real growth forces us to do at a profit. That road, however, became perhaps the most aggressive road in the West because, as in a game of prisoner's dilemma, 
While long-run cooperation may have been the best strategy, the worst fate was to trust a partner who proved duplicitous. Under Forbes's successor as president, Charles Perkins, the Burlington usually presumed duplicity. In Harley's view, agreements not to compete were inherently unstable, because once settlement in regions without railroads reached a point where a railroad could make a profit, albeit less of a profit than if building were delayed, then it became impossible to hold territorial agreements together. The incentive to build into a rival's unoccupied territory, or into an occupied territory with an increasing population, was economically rational. A calculated response to rising costs of cooperation and the rising gains of preemptive capture of unbuilt lines. Harley's analysis is quite useful but incomplete. His model omitted much actual nineteenth-century railroad behavior. First, he ignored the reality that many railroads remained largely speculative enterprises meant to make a profit through their financing. In such cases, the actual state of development of the territory they built into was not their central concern. As C. P. Huntington put it in regard to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe's Sonoran Railroad, as long as the Atchison could float securities so as to build railroads at a profit, their paying or non-paying after completion has very little to do with their building. And since building a railroad increased land and mineral values in the area adjacent to it, there were always speculative opportunities for those with prior knowledge of a route. Second, the creation of weak, overcapitalized railroads created targets for railroad managers, who thought they could build more efficient and less indebted lines. By building lines well under the cost of the transcontinentals, the Chicago roads could undercut them and capture their traffic. In 1885, the Burlington chartered the Chicago, Burlington, and Northern to build toward St. Paul. This was, in Adams's words, a shotgun fired into a hornet's nest, and opened a race of construction and counter-construction, attack and reprisal, which will change the whole map of that country. Adams told Charles Perkins that he thought it one of the most ill-considered railroad acts which have come within his range of observation. Third, it was not always established railroad corporations that decided to build. Railroad sharpers were ready to build a local line and then force one or another company to buy it to keep it out of a rival's hands. Adams reported that the soil teemed with projects designed to get rival companies by the ears. Such projects, in turn, were sweetened by bond subsidies voted by every Kansas town that wanted a road or competing roads. Fourth, Harley assumed that managers carefully assessed the business their firms would gain or lose if they built. But as Alfred Chandler has argued, managers did not make their moves based on any careful estimate of the demand for transportation. As the second building boom of the 1880s came to a close, Adams admitted that the Union Pacific had not taken enough time to get information about the regions in which they constructed railroads. Finally, Harley assumed that once a railroad expanded into a territory that could provide a modest profit, further expansion ceased until a similarly promising territory became available. Expansion would not extend into far more sparsely settled regions. This was very often not the case. New railroads had a billiard-ball effect. As each road lost traffic in one area, it ricocheted off to seek new traffic in another area. It was a battle between the Burlington and the Wabash east of the Missouri in 1880 that prompted the Burlington to renew expansion west of the Missouri, at the expense of the Union Pacific to make up for its losses. This building culminated when the Burlington system reached Denver in 1882. Building in Kansas triggered building farther west in Colorado, Wyoming, and Oregon, with companies seeking to compensate for losses elsewhere. Railroads could come less as opportunists than as refugees. As Adams wrote, should the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, and the Chicago and Northwestern build into our territory, and we should have to sustain that loss, we would recoup ourselves by active development elsewhere. Conflict in one region had the disconcerting habit of spawning conflict in others.
The actual causes of overbuilding thus seem less the rational calculations of managers than the consequences of an overcapitalized, speculative, corrupt, and increasingly unsteady system. Railroads caromed across the continent, creating systems that in toto made no rational sense, but that could yield vast personal fortunes through construction, speculation, and financial manipulation. Only the scale of overbuilding differed in Canada and Mexico, where subsidies tempted railroads to expand. In 1876, Porfirio Diaz, who had received substantial aid from American investors seeking access to Mexico, seized power from the elected president, Sebastián Lerdo de Tejada. Although Diaz occasionally played the anti-American card for domestic effect, he created the kind of oppressive order that American financiers appreciated. By 1896, the Mexican government had allocated subsidies in cash and bonds worth one hundred seven million seven hundred forty-three thousand six hundred sixty dollars to the railroads. American promoters rose to the bait. The associates projected the Mexican International to reach from Eagle Pass, Texas, to Mazatlan on the Pacific, but the road never made it farther than three hundred fifty miles, reaching Durango in 1892. Although Huntington claimed in June of 1882 that he had instructed John Frisby Jr., Diaz's railroad adviser and a man already on Huntington's payroll, not to bribe government officials, he sent Frisby twenty-five thousand dollars. Frisby in turn gave some of that to Ramon Fernandez, governor of the federal district and a close adviser to Diaz. Huntington created the usual insider construction company. And in the usual manner, granted stock to Jose I. Limantour, Diaz's finance minister, Manuel Romero Rubio, Diaz's father-in-law, Ramon Fernandez, and the wife of Geronimo Trevino, the governor of Nuevo León. In Diaz's railroad sweepstakes, the key concessions were the routes to Mexico City, the Mexican National, and the Mexican Central. William Jackson Palmer and James Sullivan received a subsidy of eleven million nine hundred twenty-nine thousand eight hundred seventy dollars in certificates, convertible to five percent bonds, to build the Mexican National from Laredo to Mexico City. Diaz adroitly deflected opposition by allowing the states to negotiate individual agreements with the new railroads. The Mexican National and the Mexican Central spent lavishly. To the great advantage of local elites, who realized how much they had to gain from American railroads, the subsidy to the Mexican Central eventually totaled twenty-six million six hundred nine thousand three dollars. In addition, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, aided by a subsidy of seven thousand pesos per mile, built from Nogales to Guaymas in eighteen eighty-two, creating its first outlet on the Pacific. In both Mexico and the United States, not only the same factors but the same people were involved in the schemes, successful as well as unsuccessful, to build railroads. Matias Romero secured a concession for a railroad from Mexico City to Oaxaca, and ex-president Grant agreed to join him in that enterprise. The Mexican Southern, in an attempt to build across the narrow Tehuantepec Isthmus, attracted Grant, Huntington, and a powerful coalition of American promoters. Gould also promoted the International Mexican Railway Company, not to be confused with Huntington's Mexican International, a 680-mile road for which, according to an engineer sent out to examine its route, there was no business. Gould eventually merged it with the Mexican Southern. In 1884, a business partner of Grant's son in the firm of Grant and Ward squandered both the senior and junior Grant's investments and fled. Grant was left a bankrupt. The firm's creditors, unable to collect their debts, failed, helping to precipitate a banking panic. Mexico voided the concession to the Mexican Southern. Five, superheroes of bad management. The entrepreneurship so apparent in the 1880s involved innovations that combined financial manipulation, the waste of capital and labor, and the construction of railroad lines that fulfilled little or no discernible need 
except the enrichment of the promoter. Henry Villard was the king of bad entrepreneurs. In his attempts to recover money for German bondholders, Villard had gone up against two of the great freebooters of American capitalism, Jay Gould and Ben Holliday of the Oregon and California. Personally, they could not have been more different. Gould was small, quiet, dignified, and happiest with his orchids and his family. Holliday was, in Villard's description, a genuine specimen of the successful Western pioneer, illiterate, coarse, pretentious, boastful, false, and cunning. Villard bested Holliday, stripping him of his holdings. Gould's acquisition of the Kansas Pacific came at a price that satisfied the German bondholders. The rise in Kansas Pacific securities also netted Villard his first fortune, giving him a financial standing he previously lacked. Villard went on to become a superhero of bad management, powerful, daring, able to destroy railroads at a single blow. He encapsulated virtually everything that Charles Francis Adams saw as willfully destructive in Western railroad building. Centering his investments on the Pacific Northwest, Villard gained control of the Northern Pacific, a weak corporation that he made both bigger and weaker. Villard secured the money to do this from Europe, New England, and Wall Street. Influential people in each of these places regarded him as one of them. His marriage to Fanny Garrison, the daughter of the abolitionist hero, William Lloyd Garrison, gave him New England connections that he cemented through the unlikely route of becoming secretary of the Social Science Association in Boston. This allowed Villard, who in his old age took to writing about himself in the third person, to undertake the investigation and study of public and corporate financiering, including that of railroads and banks. The subject of railroad securities especially interested him. Villard came to know Charles Francis Adams, who admitted his ability and never trusted his judgment, and William Endicott, a Boston banker and investor who was crucial to his enterprises. But it was Villard's German connections that proved the key to his success. Germans trusted Villard because he was German-born, fluent in the language, and familiar with American railroads and finance. He was admittedly fragile and prone to go to pieces in a crisis, but that was true of many of the men who operated in Wall Street and railroad circles. The obvious strengths of the charming, well-connected Villard masked his deficiencies. Beginning in the late 1870s, Villard and his representative, Charles Bretherton, borrowing in New York, Frankfurt, and London, began assembling a transportation empire in the Pacific Northwest. He bought out successful firms, such as John Ainsworth's Oregon Steam Navigation Company, which controlled the Columbia River, and unsuccessful firms like the Oregon Steamship Company. With the help of English speculators and investors, he acquired Holiday's old properties. He created the Oregon Improvement Company, which began building a line from Portland to the still uncompleted Northern Pacific at Wallula. When Frederick Billings, then president of the Northern Pacific and its largest stockholder, refused to sell that railroad and insisted on building to both Portland and over the Cascade Mountains to Tacoma, Villard countered with the famous Blind Pool. Participants invested in Villard not knowing what he would do with their money. He acquired control of the Northern Pacific in the spring of 1881. Yet another new company— the Oregon and Transcontinental Company, became a corporate bag to hold the Northern Pacific, the Oregon Steam Navigation Company, and other Villard properties under a single ownership. Villard, like most of the other financiers, knew little about running railroads. He ran, as one scholar has put it, a loose, almost haphazard operation, almost totally unconcerned about cost accounting. He once summoned Colonel George Gray to talk about branch lines, and then forgot to tell him the chief point for which he had summoned him. Villard loved to hear himself talk, and he savored the praise of others. His writing was really speaking, for he dictated his letters, which often ran from ten to twenty pages. 
His subordinates might not hear from him for weeks, and then be buried under an avalanche of prose. My multifarious business occupations do not permit me to follow up my correspondence regularly, he explained to Hermann Haupt, the general manager of the Northern Pacific, who was trying, unsuccessfully, to install a system modeled after the Pennsylvania Railroad, and I am compelled to avail myself of odd moments of leisure to attend to it. This I state simply by way of explaining the delay, even in the acknowledgment of your letters. However shaky his business skills, however careless about details, he was confident of his financial abilities. He was at home with the Northern Pacific. Villard's letters exuded a garrulous optimism. They were full of preening self-promotion. As an ex-journalist, he liked to quote others, particularly when they were full of praise for Henry Villard. During the good times, the letters virtually crowed. Making money seemed effortless, and Villard resurrected many of the old schemes of the transcontinentals. The Oregon and Transcontinental, acting like the Credit Mobilier or the Contract and Finance Company, would build branch lines for the Northern Pacific. The branch lines, organized as separate companies, would issue 6% bonds to pay the Oregon and Transcontinental twice the cost of construction, as well as giving that company a majority of their stock. The Oregon and Transcontinental would, in turn, pay for the lines by issuing 5% bonds. The difference in interest in the bonds they were receiving from the branch lines represented further profit. The Northern Pacific would secure the deal by giving the branch lines traffic guarantees that would yield the earnings necessary to enable them to pay the interest on the bonds. Success would bring rising stock prices. How could they lose? Well, they might lose because the Union Pacific was extending the Oregon short into the Pacific Northwest, and there was not enough traffic for both railroads. To counter this, Villard spun further but abortive plans. In combination with the Vanderbilt interests and the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, Villard would form a pool, acquire a majority of Union Pacific stock, and put the Union Pacific in harmony with the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, and the Northern Pacific. As things began to go sour, the letters grew even longer, full of explanations, self-justifications, and accusations. When William Endicott, in 1882, criticized Villard's initial formulation of the pool to buy the Northern Pacific, Villard modified it but insisted that sometimes rashness of this kind is really the greatest prudence. Endicott protested Villard's plans to sell bonds to raise money for dividends on stock, which in turn would raise the price of the stock. He argued against using the solvent, low-debt Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company to guarantee the debts of his more dubious acquisitions, weakening the company in the process. In both good times and bad, Villard obfuscated and lied. The lies and their contradictions were often barely separated in the letter-books. He had, he wrote the Boston banker Henry Higginson, promised to issue no new securities— and what he said was strictly true at the time, but the situation had changed. There was always a but with Villard. He would occasionally admit the falsifications, but they were necessary for the good of the company. It was as if he was channeling Jay Cook. The core problem with the Northern Pacific was at once simple and common. It cost too much to build, and it brought in too little revenue. Villard's financial maneuvers made a bad situation worse. He sold bonds, and then he sold new stock. He borrowed more money, putting up stock as security. When the stock fell, the lenders wanted more collateral. Villard chose to intervene in the market to support the stocks, which cost still more money. As financial markets constricted and interest rates rose, the situation became desperate. Cynics said that, although Villard had shown he could spend money, it was not yet apparent that he could make any. Villard's optimism and capacity for self-deception took in even the skeptical. Endicott questioned Villard's tactics, but continued to encourage friends and clients to buy Villard securities into the disastrous summer of 1883. He pointedly asked Villard whether there was any reason he should not give this advice. 
It was not a good time to ask Villard anything. By the summer of 1883 he was operating in two parallel universes. The first was a world of public acclaim, as he organized an elaborate and expensive excursion to the West to celebrate the completion of the Northern Pacific. He brought three hundred guests from Europe and the United States, at a cost of approximately three hundred thousand dollars, to join the Montanans who came to witness the ceremonial completion of the road. There were the usual politicians, Ulysses S. Grant, Secretary of the Interior, Henry Teller, and Karl Schurz, the most prominent German-American politician in the country. But there were also illustrious Europeans. The British parliamentarian and historian Lord Bryce advised Villard on the British delegation, which unfortunately included the young Lord Onslow, who, having snubbed the journalists, became the running joke of the summer in American papers. Our noble deadheads, one newspaper called him and his companions, making them into archetypal British parasites and twits. The great German social thinker, Max Weber, was there, as was the not-so-great American social thinker E. L. Godkin, who edited the New York Evening Post, which Villard owned. The guests were full of praise for Villard, which was why they had been invited. The journalists on the trip praised not just his vision, but his integrity. The best of your deeds is to have shown how, out of his own head, a man may coin millions for himself and for others without lowering his standard of high integrity or betraying the confidence of others. The Germans and German-Americans sent him a letter calling the Northern Pacific one of the great works of civilization by which not only this country but other nations will profit. The guests on train four were, by these standards, subdued. They simply thanked him for the opportunity to witness completion of the greatest commercial enterprise of history. The flattery of the guests paled before the demonstrations along the way, particularly those in St. Paul and Portland, the effective termini, and Tacoma, the terminus to be. The St. Paul celebration on September 3rd, with its parades, speeches, and dinners, set the extravagant tone for what followed. The city of Bismarck celebrated with short speeches by Sitting Bull and General Grant. As the party moved west, the Crow Indians encamped and staged dances for the party at Great Cliff. In Portland, the celebration stretched over two days, September 10th and 11th. The great ceremonies at St. Paul and Portland bookended the joining of the tracks on September 8th, at the junction of Little Blackfoot Creek and Independence Creek, sixty miles west of Helena. Fittingly, the completion was an illusion. The tracks had actually connected on August 22nd at Gold Creek. Endicott, with more admiration at the beginning of the summer than he would be able to muster at the end, had once written Villard, I cannot quite make up my mind whether it is you or Barnum or Forepaw that has the greatest show on earth. I suppose that you have no doubt on that point. By the end of the summer, Endicott had no doubt either. For each public achievement and celebration there was, as a kind of counterpoint, a business disaster. By August, the Northern Pacific and Villard's other companies were sinking like stones on the stock market. As the line was completed and the excursion departed, so did Henry Higginson. Endicott had reported him demoralized, and Higginson asked Villard to repay his loans. Immediately Villard responded in a huff. It was just such a feeling of unfounded distrust as crops out in your letter which caused the entirely unwarranted break in our securities. As the journalists praised his integrity, Villard wheedled, obfuscated, and lied. He maneuvered to hide the large interest charges on construction expenses, and he attempted to deceive investors into thinking that the expenses were a funded rather than a floating debt. The two worlds could not remain separate forever. They reunited when Villard returned east to face the financial crisis. He claimed simultaneously that anyone who had read the corporate reports would have known of the heavy cost of construction for some time, and so this could not be the reason for the stock's fall, and that he had not realized the extent of these expenses. 
in the kind of sentence that pretty much summed up his managerial style, and that of many of his contemporaries, he wrote, The trouble was not only that the cost was much greater than was expected, but that it was almost impossible to know at any one time what it would be. Hence it was unpractical to make provision in advance for current requirements, and no measure of permanent relief could be resorted to until the whole of the road was actually completed. Villard managed to be both rescued and disgraced. The banking house of Drexel Morgan headed an investment syndicate whose loans saved the whole structure from collapsing. There was no room, however, for Villard in the new enfeebled Northern Pacific. He thought of himself as a tragic figure. Officially he resigned, but actually, as the British press put it, he, to use an expressive though unpolite English term, was kicked out. Leaving under a cloud of mismanagement and financial irregularities, he was replaced by Robert Harris. Harris negotiated a pooling agreement with the Union Pacific to split the traffic from the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company, which nonetheless soon became an object of rivalry between the two roads. At the end of 1883, Villard, who always had fits of nervous depression when the seasons change, wrote an et tu brute letter to Endicott, full of self-pity but not remorse. I am already so accustomed to getting kicks and cuffs instead of thanks that I perhaps ought not to be surprised at the tone of your letter. He saved eagerly, almost compulsively, the letters of condolence and praise he received in the wake of his downfall. They composed three thick files in his papers. He retreated to Berlin with his family. He had not, as Adams wrote, outgrown his grand ideas, nor had he taken any responsibility for the failure. In a statement to the stockholders he blamed it on the engineers, and the chief engineer, Adna Anderson replied in outrage to certain assertions that differ so widely from the actual facts. Villard replied that he had no intention of blaming Anderson, and then blamed him anew. More controversy ensued. None of this was astonishing. What was astonishing was that he could ever again secure financial backing to return not only to railroading, but to the Northern Pacific. 6. A System That Did Not Bury Its Dead Capitalism was supposed to be the most ruthless of systems, punishing failure and lavishly rewarding success. Charles Francis Adams took the traditional view when he wrote that the transcontinentals were engaged in a Malthusian struggle. As usually happened in the nineteenth century, Malthus proved a bad prophet. Competition did not lead to the demise of overcapitalized railroads. The law preserved insolvent railroads as corporate zombies, the undead who preyed on the living. The original goal of receivership was to pay off a corporation's creditors, and if the corporation died in the process, so be it. By the 1870s, however, the courts were reluctant to dismember roads to satisfy creditors. Selling a road off piecemeal would sacrifice, as a legal memorandum for the receivers of the Kansas Pacific put it, the right of the public to claim the use and service of a railroad upon offer of private compensation. This was a compelling claim, but the issue was less whether railroads should continue to operate than whether failing railroads should damage healthy ones and who should bear the burden of reorganization. Because a railroad in receivership could suspend its interest payments, receivers could lower rates to increase their road's traffic. Competitors had little choice but to respond with cuts of their own, which increased their own chances of receivership. In 1884, receivership underwent further evolution in the famous Wabash-St. Louis and Pacific Railway case. The Wabash was part of Gould's new system, and like much of that system, could not pay its debts. Its managers, not its creditors, sought court protection. The court made the managers the receivers. The legal pendulum had swung to favor managers over creditors. Theoretically, receivers should have squeezed creditors and stockholders to eliminate water from the corporation. 
In practice, major reorganizations before the Depression of 1893 were as likely to increase fixed charges as to lower them. Reorganizations were more likely to restructure rather than to reduce debt. Innovative new securities, such as income bonds, where payments depended on the earnings of the company, and preferred stock, which offered the holder priority payment of dividends before common stock, did not promise annual payments and thus lessened the danger of default. Competition had created a spectacle of a railroad dog chasing its own tail. Railroads sought consolidation and stability, but all that competition yielded was a crazed, emaciated, and vicious dog. Attempts to escape this conundrum, to calm the dog, make it obedient to the public good, and have it prosper in the process, led more and more people to think that predictable, fair, and reasonably efficient railroad transportation could not be left to competition and market forces. As one specialist would put it retrospectively in the early twentieth century, unregulated railway enterprise inevitably results in discriminatory practices. Mise en scène, labor in nature. Nineteenth century North Americans accepted that the most modern of industrial products could be set in the midst of what they regarded as the most primeval nature. In the United States, in particular, intellectuals and popular writers alike regarded the machine in the garden as a defining symbol of the republic, marking Americans as both a people of progress and a people of nature. In photographs, paintings, and travel narratives, the forests, mountains, plains, and prairies dwarfed the powerful machines that penetrated them, and the machines, in turn, dwarfed the men who operated them, when the men appeared at all. The workers were so diminished, paradoxically, because they were so threatening. They were the serpents in this garden. Railroads actively promoted Western railroad journeys as modern journeys into the sublime. The elimination of workers from such journeys did not need much explanation. By definition, the sublime overawes humans who view it. The sublime is not a place of work. The 1879 edition of The Pacific Tourist made the transcontinental trip seem both an inspirational immersion in nature and a journey utterly devoid of physical effort or discomfort. It would make even the most desponding or prosaic feel there is beauty in prairie life. In sight of the mountains, without scarcely asking the cause, the tourist is full of glow and enthusiasm. The traveler had encountered the sublime. Each individual seems but a little might amid this majesty of loneliness. And all this is before the traveler even entered the mighty wonders of the far west. As they crossed the desert, the Pacific tourist reminded travelers lounging, talking, and reading in the palace car of the luxury they enjoyed, compared with the great suffering of those who attempted to cross without adequate preparation and the consequent burning thirst they and their animals have endured. But the work of crossing the desert was not a thing of the past. While the travelers lounged, men did dangerous work all around them, but such men were hidden in full view. They were on the track crews and construction crews the train passed. They were in the yards and stations. Engineers and firemen ran the locomotives, and brakemen worked the top of the cars. Except for conductors and porters, the railroads actively tried to keep the men directly responsible for running the train separate from the passengers. When they appeared, passengers complained, and the Canadian Pacific banished train men from the smoking cars and sleeping cars. The consumption of travel by passengers and not the production of travel by workers became the quintessential railroad experience. In the spring of 1879, William Emerson Strong, an army officer, left Chicago to see the Grand Canyon of the Arkansas, only recently penetrated by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, and the Denver and Rio Grande. Strong was a nineteenth-century traveler attuned to the Western sublime. He knew what to look for, and he possessed the language to describe it. Three and a half miles from Canyon City we turned abruptly. 
the base of a ragged, precipitous spur from the main range. A little valley lay at our feet, and beyond loomed up in majestic grandeur the lofty dead wall which marks the entrance to the royal gorge. Rapidly now we approached this marvelous canyon, this deep, dark, and awful pathway of the Arkansas River through the heart of a solid granite mountain. Strong did not ignore labor. He rode on the equivalent of a construction train, an unobstructed flat car without a roof where a wind blew the engine's smoke away from his party. He traveled with, among others, Mr. Clark Lips, the principal contractor, who gave him the dates of construction from October 1st, 1878 to about May 1st, 1879, and the number of men employed from 250 to 300, as well as the cost of grading and laying the eight miles of track through the canyon, a trifle less than $140,000 to the mile. Strong saw beyond Lips's statistical reduction to the details of construction. The roadbed cut from a solid granite wall, and the difficulty experienced in getting a foothold. He admired how the company lowered men, machinery, and supplies from the cliffs to the bed of the river by means of ropes, and often a distance of from one thousand to fifteen hundred feet. With the road finished, travelers saw at several points the great snubbing poles still standing on the edge of precipices, and although thirty inches in diameter and from forty to fifty feet in height appeared to us, even through strong field glasses, not larger than ordinary fishing rods, it hardly seemed possible that men had ever been lowered to the bottom of the canyon from those heights. With the construction workers gone, and only their artifacts and accomplishments remaining, the technological and the natural merged for Strong. The railroad bed through the canyon, and in fact of the entire line, was equal to any I had ever seen. The work was skillfully and artistically done. The rails were of steel, and the ties of oak. The track, open for but a few months, had been hitherto considered by the ablest engineers impracticable, in fact, impossible, until within a few months of our visit. The dark recesses of the mighty gorge were unexplored except at one or two points near the entrance, which had been reached in midwinter. By the energy, enterprise, and skill of a railroad company the difficulties were surmounted. The canyon was conquered and from the platform of a palace car the traveler could see the wonders and beauties which for all time hitherto have been hidden from mortal eye. The skill and energy of workers became those of a railroad company, and the results blended it with nature. As when Leland Stanford drove the last spike, at the final moment owners and promoters, men who had done no physical labor, stepped forward to perform the final symbolic work and take the credit. Yet if we return to Promontory Summit to look closely at the famous Russell photographs commemorating the completion of the Pacific Railroad, we find workers. As if insisting on a presence, soon to be rhetorically denied them, they swarmed over the facing locomotives. But even here, the Chinese workers were already fading out of the pictures, present in laying the final rails at the beginning of the series of photographs, and then gone from the final, culminating shot. Pictures of workers in yards and shops and other industrial settlings remained abundant, of course, but instead of noticing the labor that went into the operation of railroads in nature, Americans and Canadians emphasized the labor railroads displaced. Industrial workers, the men who produced the technology and operated the machines, were banished, not just from the sublime, but also from the pastoral, the settled or middle landscape that was neither wild nor urban. And this was more mysterious, because the pastoral clearly involved human labor. The famous Courier and Ives print, Westward the Course of Empire, pictured the creation of the pastoral and puts the railroad at its center. The engraving was full of human life. The Indians observed and retreated. The settlers built, and the signs of their work, the schoolhouse, the newspaper, and the railroad station in the foreground, were the signs of progress. 
The locomotive was the engine of progress, and it called into being the very labor that created the garden. But that labor was agrarian and not industrial. Passengers are visible on the train, but the viewer can see no railroad workers. Why some workers and not others? Nineteenth-century Americans thought labor was itself natural, and its result was to finish nature and apply the last touches that turned it into the garden. The spontaneous energies of the earth are a gift of nature, Thomas Jefferson wrote in a characteristic passage, but they require the labor of man to direct their operation, and the question is so to husband his labor as to turn the greatest quantity of this useful action of the earth to his benefit. The plow is to the farmer what the wand is to the sorcerer. Its effect is really like sorcery. Jefferson, like Emerson later, saw both nature and the nation as realms of becoming as yet incomplete. Jefferson posited a natural world that was only partially finished, and that human labor and technology completed. Jefferson and the agrarian tradition went further. Through labor in nature it was not only the natural world, but human beings who were finished. The farmer's finishing produced the pastoral, and in doing so the farmer produced himself as an independent Republican citizen. Work in nature was thus doubly transformative, but only certain kinds of work done in certain kinds of ways. Here was the problem. In Western nature industrial workers did the wrong work in the wrong place. American conceptions of nature met their ideological limits. Jefferson had distrusted industrial workers as completely as he celebrated farmers. Whereas labor on the land ennobled, wage labor in industry degraded. In the antebellum United States, Republican free labor had expanded the realm of ennobling to include craftsmen and other small independent producers as well as farmers. But industrial workers remained both few and suspect. After the Civil War they grew far more numerous, but no less suspect. Railroads catapulted industrial workers into nature, but they seemed out of place. Although their work in nature was essential to the creation of a Western pastoral, they were not transformed by it. They remained wage workers and not autonomous producers. Industrial workers remained threatening, foreign, and degraded. The labor of creating the railroads thus could be fully celebrated only if it was transitory. The results could remain, but the workers had to disappear. The images of the moving construction camps, the hells on wheels, the instant towns of saloons and whorehouses could be winked at as temporary local color. Workers should similarly vanish. Otherwise they threatened what they had called into being. Workers, however, Absent though they became from tourist literature and descriptions of the sublime, did not vanish. They were everywhere, for the simple reason that the railroad could not run without them. If they ceased work for even a season, the railroad would inexorably crumble into two streaks of rust pointing west across the continent. Chapter 6 Men in Octopus Suits they, the stockholders, frequently awake at an eleventh hour to a realization that the underpinning of their stockholdings is entirely rotten, that assets have no foundation in fact, and that the respective companies are to all intents and purposes positively bankrupt. The Financier, 1893 since the late nineteenth century, writers and scholars have used the transcontinental railroads and the men who controlled them to encapsulate their age. They have become symbolic, although what they symbolize and the valence of the symbol have shifted, sometimes radically. They began as robber barons, standing for a gilded age of corruption, monopoly, and rampant individualism. Their corporations were the octopus, devouring all in its path. In the twentieth century and the twenty-first they became entrepreneurs, necessary business revolutionaries, ruthlessly changing existing practices and demonstrating the protean nature of American capitalism. 
Their new corporations also transmuted and became manifestations of the visible hand, a managerial rationality that eliminated waste, increased productivity, and brought bourgeois values to replace those of financial buccaneers. These images often have not so much replaced each other as existed side by side. By the twenty-first century you could dress Huntington, Villard, and the rest most any way you wished. They were so many portly male Barbies. Observers and scholars have tried to capture the railroad corporations that these men created through organic metaphors, the octopus, the visible hand, and organic metaphors invite evolutionary trajectories, which lead to a triumphant corporate form. Businesses which in both size and capitalization were larger than anything known before. They held multiple units whose operations covered vast amounts of space. They demanded not only specialized personnel but salaried managers arrayed in hierarchical organizations. Managers staffed the positions below president and the board of directors, while the board and the offices of president and treasurer were the domain of either investors or spokesmen for investors. Each group had a different goal for the corporation. Managers preferred long-term stability and the health of the organization. Presidents and the board favored maintaining dividends over new investments in the road. The speculators sought profit from construction companies and other ancillary operations and the manipulation of securities. The corporate form, however, dictated that some functions would win out over others. Speculators, financial buccaneers, and personally run railroads yielded to professional corporate managers. At any time, entrepreneurial figures could arise and change the functioning of the whole system. Once the revolution had occurred, however, corporate evolution reverted to its course, returning the corporation to its ultimate managerial form. By 1880, according to the standard account, Alfred Chandler's The Visible Hand, the managerial corporation, was dominant and other railroads moved to conform to its practices. All there remained to accomplish was inter-firm cooperation and system building. In these histories, form followed function, and railroads pioneered the inevitable triumph of the American corporation. There were two major problems. The first is that although there were certainly managerial corporations and the earliest ones were railroads, not all American railroads were managerial corporations by the 1880s. The second is that if corporations were the functional response to multi-unit businesses whose operations covered vast amounts of space, then American corporations should be much like those elsewhere faced with similar conditions. They are not. In different countries, railroad corporations were products of different societies, histories, and legal regimes. Successful economies did not necessarily reproduce the U.S. corporate model. Economic growth did not depend on doing so. Great Britain, Germany, and France managed to institute reforms in law and corporate governance that contained the kinds of fraud and insider manipulation that made controlling U.S. corporations so lucrative in the late 19th century. Their reforms came long before those in the United States. There were multiple solutions to problems and many possibilities for corporations. If we distinguish more sharply between form and function, we can see American railroad corporations as containers that could hold different kinds of purposes. Most of the men who organized Western railroads, and many of the managers of those railroads, knew how many ways people could use corporations. Categorizing businessmen as managers, speculators, or entrepreneurs makes them ideal types, personas, rather than actual people. Actual people had several different personas, either at different times or simultaneously. Tom Scott was, depending on the place and moment, a salaried manager, an investor, and a speculator. Were Henry Villard or Collis P. Huntington or Leland Stanford investors or speculators? It was not always easy to say. Was Jay Gould a speculator? Well, certainly, but he was also by some accounts a knowledgeable railroad manager. All of these men could shapeshift as opportunity warranted. These men also knew a big truth that has no place in evolutionary models. Corporate failure as well as success could be lucrative.
It was possible to wreck these trains and walk away with millions. Others would have to clean up the mess. The smooth internal functioning of these corporations was not necessary to their persistence. They could be internally chaotic, financially undisciplined, prone to failure, and tremendously attractive for insiders nonetheless. Attached to this big truth was a little one. If failure could be lucrative, then ignorance, incompetence, and disorganization were not incompatible with the corporate form. Incompetent managers and dysfunctional corporations are compatible with evolutionary metaphors only if the bad managers disappeared along with the dysfunctional corporations. Supposedly only the fit survive, and so the one constant in the otherwise contradictory literature that makes railroads a model for American corporate success is to make them fit. Whatever the railroads did, rob, create, organize... They supposedly did it ruthlessly and effectively. Believing this is easiest if writers and scholars watch from a distance and do not descend into the bowels of these corporate beasts. If the goal is to have great villains or powerful heroes, don't read the mail of the men who ran the transcontinentals. Frank Norris's The Octopus, which appeared in 1901, the year after Collis P. Huntington's death, was the literary apotheosis of the power, ruthlessness, and efficiency of the transcontinental railroad. The novel leaped from the mechanical power of the locomotive to the soulless power of the corporation. The galloping monster, the terror of steel and steam, with its single eye, cyclopean, red, shooting from horizon to horizon, symbol of a vast power, huge, terrible, flinging the echo of its thunder over all the reaches of the valley, leaving blood and destruction in its path, the leviathan with tentacles of steel clutching into the soil, the soulless force, the iron-hearted power, the monster, the colossus, the octopus. The fictional Southern Pacific in Norris's novel was the Pacific and Southwest Railroad, and its president, Shelgrim, was a giant, a man with an ogre's vitality, who had sucked the lifeblood from an entire people. He was a man who could destroy whole states, and yet know in detail and sympathize with the travails of a bookkeeper. He insisted that he only rode and did not control the railroad. It was a creature of forces, conditions, laws of supply and demand, the equivalent of nature itself. Spend time in Collis P. Huntington's correspondence, and all this is laughable. He and his associates were not giants. Their railroads were not forces of nature. And the Southern Pacific had no operative as terrifyingly competent as S. Behrman. Everything the Southern Pacific could do, Norris encapsulated in S. Behrman. If the freight rates are to be adjusted to squeeze us a little harder, it is S. Behrman who regulates what we can stand. If there is a judge to be bought, it is S. Behrman who does the bargaining. If there is a jury to be bribed, it is S. Behrman who handles the money. If there is an election to be jobbed, it is S. Behrman who manipulates it. It's Behrman here and Behrman there. S. Behrman was a fiction, but he was also a composite of men who were real enough. W. H. Mills, Creed Haymond, W. W. Stowe, Boss Billy Carr, and others who looked after Southern Pacific interests in California during the 1880s and 1890s. Behrman did what actual railroad operatives did. What made Behrman an implausible character was how competently he did it. Looking for Behrman's equivalent in archives is like looking for Superman and finding only Clark Kent. The agents of the Southern Pacific were not only fallible, they were often bumbling. The actual octopus was a sadly conflicted monster. Those tentacles of steel were likely to be slapping at each other or poking into the monster's own cyclopean eye as to be securing prey. The soulless force of the corporation actually amounted to a group of divided, quarrelsome, petulant, arrogant, and often astonishingly inept men. With the possible exception of the Canadian Pacific, it was true of all of the transcontinentals. It was true of most Western railroads. There was an octopus, but it was usually less fearful than funny and fantastic. It was like watching a group of fat men in an octopus suit. 
Much of the modern history of corporations is a reaction against the robber barons and fictions such as the octopus. More mundane corporate types replaced Shelgrim and Behrman, but looking for entrepreneurs and managers who embodied Behrman's competence and efficiency is as futile as looking for the octopus. Examining corporations through nineteenth-century Western railroads is like looking at them through a funhouse mirror. It is certainly possible to see, particularly in Charles Francis Adams's Union Pacific, an example of the managerial corporation, but it exists in a seemingly monstrous form. There were attempts at bureaucratic rationality, but they ended up either comic or frightening. Entrepreneurs were certainly present, but whether any corporate success, let alone larger social good, emerges from their efforts, is not always readily apparent. In all these cases, to discover anything about the workings of the nineteenth-century railroad corporations, it is necessary to go inside these organizations. And so, on to the funhouse. 1. The Visible Hand Corporate organization and bureaucratic rationality have become markers of modernity. Railroads helped pioneer both. This is the truth of organization charts with their hierarchies of work and responsibility. But there is also another truth. As Charles Perrow, perhaps the leading scholar of organizations, has put it, one must know the hierarchy to survive it. Surviving it could mean subverting it. The actual chart could not only mask disorder, it could be a source of disorder, a guide to what had to be subverted in order to satisfy personal ambition. One of the most impressive and influential organizational charts in the West was the work of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. It borrowed the basic decentralized line and staff divisional form from the Pennsylvania, and this became typical of Western roads. The chart did two things. First, it divided men by occupation and arranged them hierarchically. Second, the railroad replicated these hierarchical networks over space by splitting their long lines into divisions, often named for a town or geographical feature, of 100 to 125 miles. In each division there were trainmen who worked on the moving train. There were trackmen and sectionmen who repaired the track. There were shopmen who repaired and manufactured equipment. There were station men, the baggage men and telegraphers who worked around the station, and there were yard men who assembled and disassembled trains at division points. These workers did not normally go beyond the bounds of their divisions. Each division also had a superintendent, a master mechanic, and other officers. Overseeing them all was a general superintendent and his staff, generally located in a major city along the line. The road's higher administration often worked in a separate corporate office, sometimes far distant from the railroad. The officers who oversaw the day-to-day -day operations of the road for the Union Pacific, for example, were either in divisional towns or in the offices at Omaha, while the financial officers, the president and vice presidents, and their staffs were located in Boston. In essence, railroad corporations developed hierarchical organizations, repeated this basic organizational form within separate spatial divisions, and put the whole under a single centralized office. On paper, all of this was quite impressive, but an organization chart did not necessarily describe actual practice. Like so many railroad publications, the railroad organization chart was often a fiction, and the charts dissolved into particular networks of dependence, cronyism, and kinship. Job classifications were hopelessly porous. The organization chart depended on managerial capacity, the ability to communicate orders and monitor their implementation, honesty, competence, and ultimately intent. For what ends was the railroad being operated? It also demanded subordination. Those on the bottom rungs of the ladder were supposed to do what those on the upper rungs told them to do. The charts often attributed capacity, honesty, and subordination that did not actually exist. Western railroads were giant corporations employing thousands of men, but into the 1880s they were less tightly centralized organizations than collections of fiefdoms. To a remarkable degree, Upper echelon corporate officers in the late nineteenth century failed to establish their authority in either the hiring of workers or the formulation of work rules along the railroad. 
There were no clear standards for any position. A system that was supposed to yield the most honest, most reliable, and most capable men often worked out differently. Gifts to foremen and superiors became customary. They were an extension of the kind of corrupting friendship that shaped railroad politics. To rise to the level of a construction foreman or section boss was to gain control over some small division of railroad space and the men who worked within it. Master mechanics, train masters, station masters, and superintendents had larger domains and greater power. Even a brakeman often controlled half of a freight train when it came to levying tribute of a dollar for the division on those who sought to catch a ride on a freight. The railroad workforce was the product not of an imaginary, idealized labor market, but rather of patronage, favoritism, nepotism, and extortion. There would be attempts to centralize, standardize, and control these organizations, but they had not succeeded by the 1890s. The struggle of executive officers at the upper levels to gain control over subordinates mirrored a second struggle at the lower levels, that of workers to gain and maintain control over their own work. This struggle was over rules. Workers fought over the petty injustices and tyrannies that made a working man's life so frustrating, and over the work rules that controlled the length and dangers of their days. These disputes over hiring and firing, the length of a work day, what a foreman could and could not demand, and the rules that determined how a job was done and under whose discretion, were the very stuff of workers' lives. They marked an attempt to carve out a republic of work within the corporate kingdom. Foremen resisted in order to preserve their own prerogatives, and corporate executives persisted because for them the principle that ownership meant control was at stake. He who paid, they proclaimed, got to say how things were run. But for workers, this was a principle that undercut the manhood of Republican citizens. It was not a principle suitable for a democratic society. Work is always a matter of praxis, and there is no understanding workers' conditions without paying attention to the details, but work was also more than a practical affair. It was ideological and political. It was in the details that workers perfected tactics and worked out larger principles that would give them substantial control over work. The Brotherhoods preceded the Knights of Labor and would survive them. The Brotherhoods had essentially taken the classifications of skilled work on the railroad, particularly in the so-called running trades, and made them the basis of their own organizations. A Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers first formed in 1863 on the Michigan Central. A Brotherhood of Railroad Brakemen arose in 1883, and a Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen arose in 1873. There was a Switchmen's Mutual Aid Association and an Order of Railway Conductors. While the Knights sought an overarching organization that would take in all workers, the Brotherhoods modeled themselves after older fraternal orders and benefit societies. They recruited the skilled and semi-skilled workers who had always proved easier to organize and more difficult for employers to coerce than unskilled workers. The Brotherhoods were never eager to strike, and the monopoly of skill they assumed that they possessed often proved imaginary, but they were not paper tigers. They were quite effective in small work actions, and most effective of all in what amounted to the guerrilla warfare they waged around work rules. The railroads laid out no clear standards for any position, and executives reasoned that if subordinate officials were to be responsible for results, they should have liberty to select those who worked under them and determine their duties. The Northern Pacific's Manual for its Workers in 1883 ran to 105 pages, but the bulk of it had to do with trying to govern the priority and management of numerous trains running on a single track. It took only eleven sentences to describe a brakeman's duties outside of his responsibilities as a flagman. In this lack of specificity, the Brotherhoods found their openings. The virtual absence of clear rules about work and the variety of technologies employed on supposedly unified systems allowed skilled workers to institute their own practices and to a remarkable degree impose them on the companies. Neither workers nor management ended up happy with the original system that gave foreman and master mechanics authority over hiring workers and governing their work. 
Charles Francis Adams certainly recognized the problems caused by the bull-headed blundering of some subordinate bent on having his own way, and he wanted to hammer into managers' brains that they were mistaken if they thought their sweet wills, and their sweet wills alone, are to rule in matters of hiring and firing. But when Charles Francis Adams met with the Knights of Labor in Denver in 1885, he found that the sweet wills of officials were already under attack from below. Adams wanted to solve the problem by standardizing job criteria and bringing hiring and wages under the control of the general superintendent. But centralization challenged not only foremen, but workers themselves. Conflicts between workers and management were so time-consuming because they centered on particular practices, and because particular practices came from both the organization of work and the nature through which the railroads ran. Like many others, William Pinkerton chafed under the wage cuts, the petty tyrannies of foremen, and the physical demands of the job. In thousands of daily dramas, a working man confronting a superior might be forced to swallow his pride, or he might quit on the spot. Pinkerton worked as a fireman, fueling and managing the pressure on the locomotive, and acting as a second set of eyes for the engineer on the Southern Pacific in the early 1880s. When Pinkerton boarded his engine in Los Angeles, his engineer told him, You are not worth as much money on this trip as you were when you began. His wages had been cut. Pinkerton dismounted and ran into Master Mechanic Greg, who had lowered the pay for firemen working on the specific engine type, the monkey motion of Stevens, that Pinkerton was operating. Pinkerton stood on the platform, reading the bulletin announcing the wage cut, while Greg berated him for delaying a passenger train. When Pinkerton finished, his inexperience, as he explained tongue-in-cheek, led him into the error of abusing the Master Mechanic. Greg promptly discharged him. The locomotive, the train, and all the passengers sat for several hours before a new fireman arrived. Multiplying such incidents along a line created no end of problems and inefficiencies that higher management sought to eliminate. Pinkerton did not need to confront Greg to disrupt the workings of the railroad. When workers, with the support of their unions, complained, they could slow the turgid administrative machinery of the railroads to a crawl. Their complaints, Adams told the Knights in 1885, already took up a great deal of his general superintendent's time. They were meant to. In these confrontations, skilled workers had an advantage. They usually understood the details of railroad operations better than managers did, because they, in part, created the machines they operated. The Stevens behind Pinkerton's monkey-motion engine was Andrew J. Stevens, a New England mechanic who migrated west, and beginning in 1870 worked in the Sacramento shops of the Central Pacific, where he experimented with new designs and built prototypes. They tended to be large locomotives with large tenders, thus demanding more work from firemen. It is no wonder that a cut in wages infuriated Pinkerton. Specific details and large principles were not easily separated, and this made railroad conflicts so esoteric and so bitterly fought. Andrew Stevens was exceptional, but many lesser versions of him were working on western railroads in the 1870s and 1880s. Railroad technology remained a process of developing and passing on innovations without patents. It developed much like open-source software today. Mechanics tinkered with locomotives. They redesigned them and on some roads manufactured their own, developing distinctive and individualized machines, which workers recognized and named. Innovators collaborated and disseminated along an informal but effective network of technical experts. Master mechanics and the workers under them created a pool of techniques and innovation that the original builders of locomotives in eastern factories often tapped. As a young man, Terence Powderly, the head of the Knights of Labor, worked as a machinist in the shops of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western in Scranton, Pennsylvania. To Powderly, a finished or repaired engine was a beautiful piece of machinery that stands on the track almost a thing of life. Workers were honestly attached to these machines. 
On the Union Pacific, the practice of assigning a particular crew to each locomotive persisted into the 1880s. Engineers took great pride in their locomotives, decorating and personalizing them. Although the engines did not need to rest when the crews rested, they sat idle rather than being taken out by a new crew. This struck higher management as absurd, but master mechanics also resisted the change. The workers' ability to prevent machines from being used as machines was an assertion of power that could also check the company's desire to treat humans like machines, particularly as locomotives became larger and more powerful. Finkerton's fit of pique over his cut in pay foreshadowed the strain put on firemen by bigger locomotives demanding more fuel. This informal technical network was, however, already weakening after the Civil War, as the Patent Office grew increasingly liberal in issuing patents, limiting the informal diffusion of technology. But these changes did not necessarily give an advantage to the corporations. The railroads, almost comically and without embarrassment, stepped into Granger and anti-monopolist clothing to cast themselves as innocent victims of monopolies created by patent holders. They battled powerful patent holders such as George Westinghouse, as well as their own skilled workmen. Simultaneously, however, the railroads were also creating a new system that placed technological change in the hands of educated and professionalized engineers, a system that would not be fully in place until the end of the century. Because work rules and compensation could not be easily separated, the more complex work rules became, the more the brotherhoods stood to gain in negotiations. Setting wages for most workers assigned to a specific site a section, a station, a yard, or a shop was a simple calculation of setting a rate of pay for each hour worked, but setting compensation for trainmen was more difficult. Railroad trainmen could not be paid by the hour because it was not at all clear when they were working and when they were not. Since so much of their freight traffic was unscheduled, railroads always had to have crews available to depart on short notice. Trainmen were told that their entire time belongs to the company. They could not take on other work when they were off duty. They always had to be ready to depart. When a locomotive and crew did depart, they did not necessarily proceed directly to a set destination and then return. A scheduled train crew might face a considerable but predictable layover. An unscheduled freight crew might sit somewhere for days awaiting a new train or might have to deadhead, that is, to ride as an extra crew on a departing train. The railroads always balked at paying for idle time, even as they demanded that train crews remain idle as a condition of their jobs. By the early 1880s, trainmen and managers alike had agreed that the basic unit of compensation would be some measure of mileage, but this yielded new disputes. As Henry B. Stone, the general manager of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, argued, Nothing could be more fallacious than the claim that a mile run on one railroad should be paid at the same rate as a mile run on another, and that a mile run on one part of a large system should be paid at the same rate as a mile run on another part, regardless of all other circumstances. Variations in equipment, schedules, and types of trains, whether the trains were through or local, and whether they ran on main or branch lines, all resulted in differing amounts of labor. Freight trains, except for livestock trains, always ran more slowly than passenger trains, and thus their crews worked longer hours on runs of similar distance. Scheduled freight crews, however, had it better than unscheduled or wild freights whose runs took longer still, because they had to yield the right-of-way to virtually all other traffic, and thus spent hours on sightings. Nature, too, influenced practice, and therefore how men organized work. The frequency of snowstorms, hills and mountains, traveling at night rather than during the day, and the strain and danger of moving freight and switching cars on slopes all added up to distinctions in labor. Workers on the Northern Pacific in 1893 gave a detailed geography of difference. Edgeley, North Dakota was a very hard place to do switching. The Y there is about three-quarters of a mile away from the station, and it is a very steep grade. On runs west of Mandan, the topography of the country and the difficulties under which the work is performed justify the higher rate of pay. Near Fertile, 
Two very bad hills were hard on short crews. The run in Canada from Winnipeg to Portage is in continual snow. They have to run a snowplow nearly every day ahead of it. Each division was different. Each run was different, sometimes very different. In Washington Territory, the Palouse branch was a branch peculiar to itself. And natural differences mattered not just because of work, but also because of where workers had to live. Wallula being a very undesirable place to live in meant that its workers deserved more hours paid at overtime rates. Specific differences in compensation had to be added to balance the scales. Equity demanded the recognition of difference. Recognizing difference was not the same thing as agreeing on how to compensate for it, and the result was the endless negotiations over work rules that served the Brotherhoods so well. The railroads would have preferred to have it both ways. They wanted a standard run and a standard work day. If crew members finished a run in under ten hours, they would owe the company the remaining hours in labor. In 1893, J. B. W. Johnson, a conductor on the Northern Pacific, presented the Brotherhood's counter to the railroad's logic of compensation. Once the trainmen had completed their assigned trip, they deserved extra compensation for any other work done that was not an integral part of their original run. The company could not unilaterally decide to compensate by miles when it was to their advantage and by hours when that was to their advantage. If pay was going to be normally determined by hours worked, a man should be perfectly free to follow his own will wherever it may take him, or engage in any other business outside his hours of work. No railroad, as Johnson knew, could effectively run its operations if its train crews were not always on call. Two ways of bridging this difference emerged. The first depended on paying trainmen by the run and then equalizing the difference between the runs with so-called arbitraries. Arbitraries were fictitious miles added to long runs or runs made under difficult conditions. They were the wage equivalent of constructive mileage, imaginary miles added to the actual haul of branch lines to increase their share of the revenue. It appears that engineers negotiated the first systematic schedule of arbitraries on the St. Paul and Manitoba in 1885. The agreement paid the engineers by the run, with the average run defined as 100 miles at an average speed of 10 miles per hour. The standard day for a trainman thus became 10 hours, 100 miles at 10 miles per hour, and all work above 10 hours qualified as overtime. If an actual run was over 100 miles, then workers would be compensated for the extra distance at a specified mileage rate. Pinkerton's wages as a fireman on the Southern Pacific, which contained some large divisions, also included arbitraries. He received $2.97 a hundred miles and allowed an excess mileage of 200 for 150. Or, in other words, if his run was 150 miles, he was paid for 200. In the West, arbitraries served the Brotherhoods well. Until 1894, both the Northern Pacific and the Union Pacific trainmen could appeal directly to the general manager in regard to disputes over work rules, and on the Northern Pacific, so the general manager claimed, such appeals took up more than half his time. By coupling grievances with demands for extra compensation, Workers and their representatives made small but cumulatively substantial gains, since the determination of these matters at these meetings necessarily takes the form of a compromise, with the net result that the men have continually gained ground. After ten years of negotiating with the Brotherhoods on the Northern Pacific, the managers of that railroad found that the incremental changes in the work schedules had helped to increase the wages of trainmen more than twenty per cent by 1893. Other classes of employees, without elaborate work rules, had gained far less, and section workers nothing at all. The situation was similar on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe.